so on. Good morning, everybody. So we are starting one minute early. We got enough quorum for that. So without much ado, I welcome everybody for the Hartfield Association of India meeting. And this is a unique session because of many factors. This one meeting where the European Society of Cardiology Hartfield Association, as well as the Hartfield Society of America and the Asian Heart Federation are formally participating. And we welcome Dr. Vidya and other foreign faculties who have come all the way. In fact, he has taken a three-stage three ride with Bhattagad going to Austria, Germany, and Dubai, and India, I think. So thank you very much for coming at a very short notice. So we'll start on time. The Another important thing which I would like to thank is the, the cooperation uh, from the nephrology community and the internal medicine community because we all say cardio metabolic but uh, we don't talk the walk so we uh, or we don't walk the talk but we decided to uh, do that dr edwin is there thank you very much so without much ado i invite the the first session the moderators dr sharanan dr balasubramaniam dr anjali muthu dr subhashree and dr patma and their roles will be to moderate this there are five sessions and please be on time because it's, it's a completely packed session thank you very much and let's the uh, let's start absolutely on time Very good morning to one and all. I wel welcome all for this first session. Uh, we are starting with the second speaker. Uh, the uh, speaker is Dr. K. Tirumal Valwan. He's, he's going to talk on potassium binding as RAS inhibitors enabling therapy, current insights. So over to Dr. Uh, Tirumal Valwan. Good morning. A warm greetings from Stanley Medical College. Myself, Dr. Thirmal Alam from Stanley Medical College, Assistant Professor. My topic is potassium binding as RASI enabling therapy, current insights. As you all know, the recent a ACC guideline recommends RNA, ACA, ARB, as well as mRNA as class 1A agents for the treatment of heart failure. However, we know these RAS inhibitors always come with the rider that is most of them increase the serum potassium level. And this study by Epstein et al. showed nearly 50% of the patients on maximum RASI were either downtitled or discontinued RASI because of this hyperkalemic event. And this magnitude of uh, reduction is more as the degree of hyperkalemia increases. And this submaximal dosing and discontinuation of RASI in turn is associated with poor outcomes in whichever scenario the patients are being treated with these agents. The, so, the same is evident in heart failure too. So how are we managing current hyperkalemia? We begin with dietary potassium counseling, then we go with managing RAS inhibitor which is as described either down titration or discontinuing the agent and third effective diuretic therapy especially uh, bringing loop diuretic which have a tendency to waste, uh, cause wasting of potassium and last in the list is the potassium binders. This potassium binders uh, definitely because of this hyperkalemia as already described the risk of mortality increases to the tune of 42 percent and risk of heart failure hospitalization is to the tune of 66 percent because of this submaximal dosing of RASI therapy. 
and the potassium binders we have got is older and new older would be the well known potassium sodium polystyrene sulfonate and the newer agents would be sodium zirconium silicate and partylomer sorbitol complex how do these potassium binders act basically in the set, most of the patient with heart failure do also have ckd and there is an increased potassium excretion uh, through the feces so uh, they basically cause uh, increased potassium excretion through the gut and uh, uh, this hydrogen potassium atps which is expressed in the gut is over expressed in the setting of uh, renal failure in the along with presence of heart failure so what are the key characteristics of the old and new so to begin with the older is well established it is more than 6 decades now it is fda approved in the year 1958 basically this causes uh, binding of potassium with the sodium and uh, causes excretion through the gut however these older agents are associated with significant uh, gastrointestinal adverse effects and, and there are reports of intestinal necrosis and earlier it was combined with sorbitol however uh, fda in 20, 2009 gave a black box warning not to add sorbitol to it as the chance of intestinal necrosis was higher so coming to the newer agents we have got two agents which is partylomer approved in the year 2017 this is basically a polymer exchange resin it differs from the older agent in in the sense that it causes calcium uh, it exchanges calcium with that of the potassium uh, this is also uh, this can be used in the setting of uh, acute hyperkalemia however uh, it's also not observed and uh, this uh, tendency for hyperkalemia gi effect is less however hypomagnesemia is well documented in most of the studies uh, in using this party rumor coming to the third compound sodium zirconium silicate this was approved by 20, uh, in the year 2017 by fda and 2018 by the european medical agency this uh, selectively binds the cation uh, it, it uh, the however it also exchanges sodium but the affinity for potassium is very high when compared to that of the earlier agent the risk of adverse effects are less with the use of these agents So this was the review article by Andrea Montagani published in uh, Journal of Clinical Medicine published in 2021 they basically tried to the objective of this review it was basically a meta analysis was assess whether these newer potassium binders could enable the optimization of rasi therapy more than the usual care or placebo that we currently use especially in the setting of hyperkalemia and heart failure so type of studies they included only rcts as this was considered the reference study for evaluation of any treatment the studies included were up to july 21 and uh, those in english were alone taken into the study however those studies which are not yet published but had results available in the international inter, international registry were also taken into consideration the patients were they either a patient who is at risk or had heart failure the intervention was this uh, they tried studying the intervention with the only the two newer agents the sps was excluded from the study and the compared raw mat either a placebo or a usual care or a patient with the potassium binder with the different dose or with different treatment protocol the outcome that was measured was primary was the proportion of patients who continued mri therapy compared with placebo or a patient who continued acrb compared with the placebo the secondary outcome included patients who who were on ornithotherapy at the end of the study compared to placebo and the safety of treatment in patients with heart failure so these were around 12 studies were included these were in, uh, these were included for the review however the meta analysis was only on three studies which are landmark amber trial pearl and prioritize heart failure so in this study the results were like the optimization of mri therapy was possible with the newer potassium binders however partylomer only seemed to have an, have an effect however the other compound ezc did not have any effect on mri optimization coming to optimization of acarb partylomer did not seem to have an effect on aca or arb optimization and in this review they did they could not find any data for optimization of arni however there, there was a this was there was a comment on this review by dona zarzula published in uh, may 2022 in the journal of uh, clinical medicine in this they said it was the limitation of the methodology and the data interpretation which inappropriately conferred an overall favorable bias towards partylomer then came this review published last year in 16 july 2022 which uh, tried to uh, review the role of potassium binders and optimization of optimizing therapies in heart failure this review was done by petro cincinato and all so these were the studies included on uh, included for the review regarding sodium polystyrene sulfonate 
as you can see most of the studies were of retrospective observational study however with only one rct and the mean reduction in serum potassium uh, was varied however the mean reduction was to the tune of 418.8 percent with the uh, with the sps that is the older agent and regarding the studies on sodium zirconium cyclosilicate we can see most of the studies are of rct nature and they included both the short term studies the harmonized trial which was uh, studying the outcome for 28 days as well as the harmonized extension which uh, studied for a period of a year and in this they were able to show the mean reduction in serum potassium was to the tune of around 17 percent then these were the studies reviewed in the uh, with party number as the study molecule uh, this was a mix-up of RCT as well as the retrospective observational studies and this included the uh, famous studies of amethyst DN which had an one-year study period as well as the pearl heart failure study. In this, the mean reduction in serum potassium was to the tune of 14.4 percent and adding to the list of patinomer is the recently published diamond trial which tried to study the RACI enablement in the and compared to placebo. This had a run-in phase and it was seen, and this, this study by Butler et al showed around 85 percent of the participants were optimized on guideline directed medical doses of RACI with the use of patiromer. So this is a busy slide which actually uh, inculcates only how you can go about and use uh, newer potassium binders when you encounter hyperkalemia. So to begin with if the patient has got a baseline serum potassium you just have to introduce RACI and wait. Uh, there is no need for RACI therapy at this, uh, sorry, newer potassium binder at this point, but you need to keep monitoring at two week interval. If the patient has uh, potassium falling within 5.5 to 5.5, you continue the RACI therapy and introduce newer potassium binder. To begin with, uh, this SDC is usually started at 10, 10 gram and then the maintenance dose 10 gram TAD for a 48 hours and then you need to maintain them on 5 gram. Party number is begin with 8.4 gram per day. So this, uh, when the potassium is uh, between 5.6 to 6, again, you don't upgrade the RACI therapy, but introduce NPB to the maximum dose and try to maintain them on the uh, guideline directed medical therapy. And when it is more than 6, uh, you do not introduce RACI and introduce only NPB, get their potassium into normal and then uh, try to maintain their guideline directed medical therapy. So with this uh, reviews, what is the current stand of potassium binders as per ACC, AHA, it only says the recommendation is we actually class 2B and the level of evidence is level B are randomized which is nothing but a moderate quality evidence from one or more RCTs or it is a meta-analysis of moderate RCT. So it goes on to say uh, in patients with heart failure who experience hyperkalemia while taking a RACI uh, to uh, the role of potassium binders to improve the outcome by facilitating the continuation is uncertain. So with this what are we current indications? We have known that novel potassium binders definitely have improved the overall number of pharmacological weapons in counteracting hyperkalemia. They can be used only in the setting of chronic hyperkalemia. Now there is no study to support their use in the setting of acute hyperkalemia. However, the long term results promote the implementation in clinical practice because of lower side effect and absence of GA absorption. And future studies however with good evidence on RCTs and meta-analysis is needed in the setting of heart failure, hyperkalemia and NP, newer potassium binders. So we have a lot of trials in the pipeline like the lift trial, realized K, stabilized CKD, OPRA heart failure and realized potassium trial. All these studies mostly have heart failure as a study population and utilizing most of them have EZSA as a molecule. With this publication of the results, we will be in a better position to place NPB in the treatment armamentorium of heart failure and hyperkalemia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh we can have two questions, so uh, if there are any questions at the end of the session. So can you share your experience on this molecule, sir? You no, ma'am. As of now, uh, we don't have these molecules outright, so we don't have any personal experience, neither in the setting of CKD or in heart failure. Okay, sir. <laughs> the pertumer petum actually causes hypomagnesemia. Yes, sir. So sir, actually most of these molecules are not designed exactly to bind only with the specific, uh, these all bind cations, sir. Only the, with the newer agents, the specificity and the affinity keeps increasing. When compared to SPS, with the, if you take EZSC molecule, it is, they say roughly it is 10 times more uh, potent in binding selectively for the potassium. The molecule is so designed that the cation fitting site is specific for potassium and compared to calcium and magnesium. 
So these since they don't have a specific uh, orientation only to bind potassium, definitely this. Uh, and again, hypomagnesium is seen in various studies that is reported. Actually, it's not an uh, specific. Uh, Any supplementation helpful? Supplementation? Uh, definitely, uh, all guidelines say we need to keep electrolyte monitoring whenever these patients are on uh, binders, and whenever there is an uh, uh, deficiency, we need to supplement. Also, nobody is actually studying the intracellular potassium. Yeah. Because you know, many times, yeah. actually, you know, the intercellular sodium, intercellular calcium, potassium, they are also very important. Yeah. Because they are all actually connected. Yes. Thank you. Uh, there are no more questions. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Now, we will go to the next session. Uh, cardiorenal syndrome and worsening renal function in acute heart failure on diuretics. Are they the same? Uh, by Dr. A. Pongudi. Good morning all, I am Dr. Pungudi, Assistant Professor at Stanley Medical College. Uh, my topic here is Cardiorenal Syndrome and Worsening Renal Function in Acute Heart Failure on Diuretics are the, the same. Uh, as per definition, Cardiorenal Syndrome can be generally defined as a pathophysiological disorder of heart and kidneys where acute or chronic dysfunction of one organ may induce acute or chronic dysfunction of the other. There are uh, two entities uh, which means that acute heart failure patients who present already with AKA and there is a subgroup of uh, uh, acute heart failure patients who develop worsening of renal function during hospitalization. Worsening of renal failure is defined as 0.3 milligrams per deciliter increase in serum creatinine or 25% fall in GFR developing in the first five days of hospitalization for acute heart failure. Here we should note that urine output criteria is not taken into account considering the patients are already on diuretics. This worsening of renal function could be a part of pathological mechanisms of cardiorenal syndrome which we call it as true worsening or it could be a physiological response to diuretics which we call it as pseudo worsening. Uh, so AK means kidney injury has already occurred whereas worsening of renal function represents a functional decline in GFR which may be present without the renal injury and may or may not be associated with worsening clinical outcome. So what is pseudo worsening? increasing serum creatinine with good urine output. Uh, this was a study uh, published in American Journal where they uh, analyzed the outcome of uh, patients with acute heart failure who got admitted with acute kidney injury and those patients who developed worsening of renal uh, function during their hospitalization. It was inferred that patients who got admitted already with AKA had a worse outcome in the form of increased mortality and increased heart failure events when compared to patients who had worsening of renal function during the hospital stay. So mechanism of cardiorenal syndrome type 1. The cardiorenal syndrome uh, in, in uh, acute heart failure there occurs a decreased cardiac output that is forward failure where there occurs hypovolemia. This hypovolemia results in impaired renal perfusion and this results in reduced GFR and renal ischemic renal tubular injury. This hypovolemia also activates renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway and also sympathetic nervous system which results in increased vasoconstrictor substances which also reduces GFR and also results in ischemic tubular injury. There is another uh, uh, terminology, uh, another uh, uh, pathomechanism mechanism of heart failure which, is, which has recently got importance. That is the backward failure. In backward failure, there occurs increased central venous pressure and increased venous uh, congestion which results in increased pressure in the re renal veins and also this increases the pressure in the renal interstitium. This results in decreased renal blood flow and this, uh, this uh, causes a decrease in GFR and also ischemic tubular injury. There is also an increased in uh, inflammatory markers in uh, cardiorenal syndrome and this also causes uh, renal injury. Along with this, therapeutic interventions also have a role in worsening of renal function. Uh, so, the cornerstone treatment uh, for uh, acute decompensated heart failure is the use of oral and intravenous loop diuretics. These agents represent a double-edged spot as they may resolve congestion but they worsen the renal perfusion by arterial underfilling and heightened activation of sympathetic and RAS activation leading to type 1 cardiorenal syndrome. But uh, there are other mechanisms of worsening of renal function with diuretics. It could be just a contraction of intravascular volume which may lead to just an increased serum creatinine concentration. 
Also, it may reflect the tubular glomerular feedback due to greater diuresis and natriuresis, which is a physiological response to salt loss that leads to renal apparent vasoconstriction, thereby reducing the glomerular uh, perfusion pressure and filtration. So, this physiological renal response to increased diuresis that is associated with worsening of renal function might not necessarily be related to worse clinical outcomes. Uh, so, our concern is whether the therapeutic intervention such as aggressive decongestion for acute heart failure is associated with the benign or serious worsening of renal function. Uh, it is commonly thought that worsening of renal function in patients on diuretics is a result of tubular injury, but patients with worsening of renal function due to diuretics did not have an increase in tubular injury biomarkers, unlike uh, where there occurs an increase in tubular ma injury markers in cardiorenal syndrome. Further, the increase in biomarkers were not associated with worse outcomes. The experimental platform used to infer the above findings was Rose Acute uh, Heart Failure Study Cohort. In this cohort, high dose diuretics was used and also in the study population, they had the base, baseline GFR of this population was less than 60 ml per minute, which represents the population, of, population at risk of developing AKI. This is an uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, article published in an uh, American journal uh, in 2018, which showed that worsening of renal function in patients with acute heart failure undergoing undergoing aggressive diuresis is not associated with tubular injury. So, what are the other inferences of this study? There are no correlation between the increase in biomarkers and increase in creatinine. No significant difference in levels of these tubular injury biomarkers in patients with or without worsening of renal function. Population who had an increase in biomarkers were the ones who had a better diuresis and much improvement in symptoms. Furthermore, in this aggressively diurist population who had both worsening of renal function and increases in tubular injury biomarkers over the intervention period were not associated with adverse outcomes, rather there was a paradoxical trend towards improved outcomes. Uh, so this is this gra graphical picture uh, shows that uh, patients who had increased cystatin C and tubular injury biomarkers had a good survival, cumulative survival was good. The, the uh, red curve, red line curve denotes the patients who had worsening of renal function who had a better cumulative survival when compared to patients who did not develop worsening of renal function. So, this data suggests that the small to moderate declines in GFR that commonly occurs during aggressive dialysis, uh, aggressive diuresis colloquially referred to as bump in creatinine may not primarily be a manifestation of tubular injury to the kidney, rather they are likely to represent clinically benign changes in filtration. In clinical practice, however, it remains unclear whether treatment induced worsening of renal function episodes are truly innocuous or whether there is a meaningful renal damage. This finding of no significant change in three well established markers of tubular injury in patients with treatment induced worsening provides a substantial reassurance that small to moderate treatment induced bumps in creatinine that inevitably occurs in the setting of aggressive diuresis should not carry negative connotations and trigger withdrawal of potentially beneficial therapy. Uh, this is a, a recent article published in a European uh, heart failure journal uh, where they analyzed the outcomes of patients with heart failure who, uh, who had a worsening of renal function uh, during their hospital stay in the context of diuretic response. Here two cohort of uh, study population were included which were protect and relax acute heart failure cohorts. In these a substantial population developed worsening of renal function during the therapeutic uh, uh, during their hospital uh, admission. Uh, in patients who had a worsening of renal function, uh, uh, they were segregated into patients with, with a good diuretic response and patients with poor diuretic response. It was inferred that uh, patients who had worsening of renal function and with a good diuretic response had a, a better outcome that is their 60 day and 180 day death rates were low and also the cardiovascular and renal events were less in patients who had, who had, had an aggressive or a good diuresis. Even though, they, when, even though when they sustain worsening of renal function. Mm, this graph also uh, uh, represents that patients who had a good diuretic response even when they had worsening of renal function had a better survival probability when compared to patients who did not develop worsening of renal function due to diuretics.
So, uh, worsening of renal function in the setting of aggressive diuresis is often considered acute kidney injury and thus further diuresis or RAS blockade was suspended. However, several lines of recent evidence challenge this paradigm suggesting that it is the context by which worsening of renal failure develops rather than simply its presence that is the principal determinant of adverse outcome. For example, worsening of renal function in the setting of uh, successful decongestion or titration of ASC inhibitors may not have negative uh, prognostic implications. Other studies like PROTECT, CARES and DOSE uh, and also EVEREST uh, studies also uh, favor the similar finding. Uh, these are the basic difference between uh, the uh, cardiorenal syndrome and worsening of renal function due to di diuretics. In cardiorenal syndrome, the mechanism, uh, petho pe mechanism is mainly pathological, whereas the worsening of renal function due to diuretics, it is mostly physiological. The injury biomarkers are mostly elevated in cardiorenal syndrome, which is, uh, but uh, it is not so much elevated in worsening of renal function due to diuretics. And the diuretic response and outcome are good in cardio uh, or, or poor in cardiorenal syndrome, whereas Whereas it was worse in the, uh, uh, sorry, it was poor in the cardiorenal syndrome, whereas it was good in the worsening of renal function due to diuretics. So, take home message is that worsening of renal function with the diuretic use should be analyzed in the context of diuretic response. Worsening of renal function with diuretic therapy is relatively benign. So, decongestive therapy should not be withheld when serum creatinine rises in patients who have good diuretic response. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was a good take home message. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is there anything uh, one is protective and uh, they can they like this uh, synergetic effect of the two drugs? Uh, sir, I mean coming to your second question, I, I don't have a very clear idea about your second question. Maybe the rest of the speakers may give you uh, a clear picture about that. Uh, when coming to your first question, actually uh, there are many studies available uh, in the literature which compares this uh, worsening of renal function and cardiorenal syndrome. But none of the studies could point out a bedside investigation which could differentiate these two. Actually, uh, as per peto mechanics, uh, we cannot completely differentiate this cardiorenal syndrome and worsening of renal function due to the diuretics because uh, both can overlap. Actually, both can overlap. So, what was the inference in from most of the studies was that uh, it is the clinical response which we should. Uh, which we should analyze. That means when the patient is getting uh, a good decongestion and he is, he is diuresing well means it could not be probably a cardiorenal syndrome because in the cardiorenal syndrome there occurs tubular injury. So when tubules get injured, they cannot diurese properly in the initial phases at least. But in uh, worsening of renal function due to diuretics is mainly hemodynamically mediated than tubular injury. The, those studies were uh, available which denotes that there is no much increase in biomarkers of uh, tubular injury in worsening of renal function due to diuretics and hence those patients usually diurese properly and they get decongested properly and there is a good outcome in those patients. Hence it is a clinical uh, scenario we, uh, that can differentiate these two and there is no bedside proper investigation yet available. Uh, if there are no more questions, thank you, ma'am. I will go to the next session. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Ram Prabhahar. And he is going to talk on CKD in diabetes, prevalence, pathophysiology, and impact on cardiometabolic diseases. Over to Ram Prabhahar. A pleasant morning to everyone. Uh, apologies for little delay. Uh, first things first, I thank the organizing committee and Dr. Edwin for uh, giving this opportunity to me in uh, to speak about this particular topic about the basic introduction of diabetes uh, and kidney disease, epidemiology, pathophysiology and so on. I will be a little fa fast and uh, furious in these slides. So, 
kidney disease is a most under recognized underrated complication or a consequence of diabetes and we all know today you go wherever across the world this is the leading cause of chronic kidney disease as well as end stage kidney disease many times people thought or give most of the focus is given to end stage kidney disease due to diabetes but we don't recognize that majority of patients with diabetes and kidney disease die due to cardiovascular disease and infections much before they reach the end stage kidney disease requiring dialysis so this is uh, data from the international diabetes atlas published last year you can see the numbers in 2021 the diabetes prevalence is around 537 million population and it is going up by 46% you just go down the over our region the majority of increase of diabetes population happens in the middle and lower middle income countries that's the paradox you know we see get more in africa middle east and southeast asia that gets the most burden of uh, diabetes we are much better than the africa though so if you look at the indian numbers this is the 21 data you can see the indian diabetes prevalence is 9.6 percent but if you look at the absolute number of population because of sheer population size our numbers are around 74 million population of diabetes now so we are we need to know about uh, diabetes kidney disease in diabetes what we know is there is increasing prevalence of kidney disease in diabetes and this is parallels almost the increasing prevalence of diabetes in general it develops in 30% in type 1 and 40% in type 2 diabetes and the numbers keep going up with the duration of diabetes as we see in the slide you know as the duration is more than 20 years somewhere close to 45% is the number of diabetes and kidney disease so what about the indian data you know the indian the problem in india is we don't have a proper data in most of the prevalence studies because the even the diagnosis of chronic kidney disease definition kept on changing so one such data which is published recently based on the present standard diagnostic criteria of taking acr and egfr this is a study uh, which screened around 3000 patients you can see 48.4% of ckd in type 2 diabetes around 23% stage 3 and beyond and you get 0.7% in in stage kidney disease so that's quite a bit number almost like one in every two have some kind of kidney disease so if you look at the numbers from idf age adjusted prevalence is 9.09% and with that the number of people of diabetes around 74 million if you extrapolate to the kidney disease you can see there is almost 34.56 million of diabetic kidney disease and 5.3 million of diabetic ESKD which is quite a bit number almost close to 50 lakh population with in stage kidney disease due to diabetes in india again this is not an actual number this is the extrapolated number from the available data but the pathetic part of it is neither patients nor the practitioners are aware of the the magnitude of the problem not only in india you can just see the us numbers 40% of family physicians fail to recognize ckd in diabetes in india you can see in diabetic opd most 54% never had a single acr or a creatinine number that is the data which, which which we are living in again regarding patients almost 50% or 60% of them are not aware that they have kidney disease this is where the awareness comes in so in general diabetic kidney disease is a clinical diagnosis this is a prototype patient that comes with albuminuria with long duration of diabetes with reduced gfr they have concomitant retinopathy and the gradually they progress to end stage kidney disease this is the so called typical patient but the that doesn't uh, work in every patient and the, there is a tremendous change in epidemiology of diabetes and kidney disease now it is understood that it is more common than what we thought initially and some people it presents with massive proteinuria not like very mild proteinuria in fact we have been taught in our student days massive proteinuria is an indication for biopsy saying thinking that it is non diabetic kidney disease we have more non proteinuric on the other end of the spectrum and people have microscopic hematuria now the present data says almost 10% of them can have microscopic hematuria many of these people won't have retinopathy more people having non diabetic kidney disease and many patients now undergoing biopsy also compared to the earlier days so the it is important to 
understand that kidney disease in diabetes is not always diabetic nephropathy and all patients with diabetic nephropathy won't have typical features what I have told you earlier. In many of these patients you need to evaluate them even including renal biopsy. So if you look at the spectrum of kidney disease in diabetes, what we call as in one group called diabetic kidney disease, in the other group there is a significant amount of non-diabetic kidney disease. A spectrum of diabetic kidney disease fits into this typical presentation whereas there are quite a bit of population where non-proteinuric even with kidney disease in diabetes biopsy to have diabetic kidney disease. So it is important to understand that you to use the term diabetic kidney disease rather than diabetic nephropathy. So coming to the pathogenetic part I am not going to the details but generally what we need to know is these are all diseases with multifactorial causation no single factor works here but if you look at this basically this has been divided into factors that makes them prone to develop kidney disease initiators of kidney disease and factors that causes progression. Of this the most important point we always focus is on diabetes, blood pressure and weight. So coming to the pathogenesis in brief, in general there are three factors that work in, one is hemodynamic, other is inflammation, other one is metabolic factors like hyperglycemia. So basically there are three pathways, I am not going to the details, generally we, we look at the polyol pathway, protein kinase C pathway, age rage pathway with current glycolysis end products, then there is a quite a bit of inflammatory markers. So the first change that happens with diabetes is hyperfiltration, this is due to interplay of factors that work in afferent and efferent arteriole and uh, from there on it progresses to uh, quite a bit of interplay of various cytokines and the predominant one that is involved in is in NFKB. So what the last part of the lecture we are going to focus on the cardiovascular risk of diabetes, you can see that it is like a double whammy when somebody has diabetes and kidney disease together. So the data clearly says in presence of diabetes and kidney disease, if you look at the all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality, there is a tremendous increase from without these risk factors. So something like compounding happens. So the compounding goes to the level of 6% higher risk when somebody has diabetes and kidney disease compared to no diabetes and kidney disease. Even with CKD or diabetes alone, there is a 2 or 3 fold increased risk when somebody has uh, and this combination. So now people have come to a stage that this has been recognized as a distinct subspeciality among nephrology and there is a need to have a cardionephrology subspeciality. So what is the lifetime risk of kidney disease or cardiovascular disease in a patient with type 2 diabetes? This is the largest data analysis which is published last year involving around 4 lakh population. You just look at it is an astounding report. So now people look at what we call it as we used to call it as make outcomes and and MACE outcomes. Now they have been merged together called MARS outcomes. These are all major cardiovascular, renal and cardiovascular endpoints. You can see the risk about in a 45 year old man to have any one of the renal or cardiovascular endpoint is close to 80 percent. That is quite high. And if you look at individually you can see this is the baseline data. Look at the blue bar, dark blue bars. MARS outcomes are close to 90, 80, 85 percent in most of the population. Next comes is the CKD, then CV death, heart failure and stroke and people are more worried about myocardial infarction and peripheral arterial disease but whereas we get more of non-atherosclerotic disease as a uh, disease advances. So if you look at this particular data you can clearly see 4 in 5 diabetic people have some kind of Mars outcome, 1 in 2 almost 50 percent have CKD, 3 in 10 almost 30 percent have some kind of heart failure. And to stratify the risk among patients with diabetes and kidney disease, two markers are used. One is estimated GFR, other one is an ACR. You can clearly see as the ACR increases even above 10, there is increased cardiovascular risk. Similarly, as the GFR falls below 75, there is increase in cardiovascular risk. So there is risk prediction based on the baseline ACR rate. If the ACR is quite high, there is 80% chance of an even in, 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 in almost 10 years time, you can clearly see it's around 80% if the baseline ACR is more than 1000. So both kidney outcomes and cardiovascular outcomes are bad when you have high ACR. Even with ACR, there is a gradate, in, increased gradation based on the GFR. So the bad combination is the GFR with which is less with more albuminuria. 
Similarly, if you look at the risk of hospitalization, cardiovascular events, death for any cause goes up as the GFR goes down. So this makes people to identify this uh, heat map. You can clearly see as we move to the right side when the GFR is high and the ACR is high, there is more than fourfold rise in uh, kidney, kidney disease. And if you look at the pattern of kidney, pattern of cardiovascular disease predominantly as the, as the GFR goes down, you get more non-atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease like arrhythmias, LVH, sudden cardiac death and so on, heart failure and so on. As we see in the subsequent slide, the incidence of heart failure is as the stage advances is almost 50% as the each stage 5. And this is because of predominant non-traditional risk factors. I am not going to the depth. So to summarize my talk, type 2 diabetes in India at the moment is around 74 million. 40 in some data, it's around 50% developed kidney disease. The term DKD, diabetic kidney disease is preferred than nephropathy and many people have atypical presentations. I have shown you how the pathogenesis works. And it is important to understand presence of kidney disease increases cardiovascular risk tremendously. And we get both atherosclerotic and non-atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in chronic kidney disease, in diabetes. And the important prognostic factors are albuminuria and GFR. With that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so Thank much you. for the clear presentation, sir. Yeah, it's an excellent uh, update. Uh, any questions from the audience? So, uh, if you look at the multifactorial causation of chronic kidney disease, there is a population based study where they stratified people according to their protein intake and risk of C, uh, chronic kidney disease in follow. So if you, the, based on that particular study, people who had high quartile of protein intake found to have more risk of chronic kidney disease. This is again an epidemiological studies. We don't have a randomized study to say high protein causes kidney disease. This is an observational data where people with high protein intake are found to have higher incidence of kidney disease. Uh, you told sir uh, about the protein uric and non protein uric. So, uh, grossly, can we differentiate like on ultrasound we are doing with CMD maintenance and other things? How we'll differentiate between the it is protein uric or it is non protein uric? Uh, one is urine protein examination. Uh, Obviously, with albumin protein, albumin excretion only, we can differentiate between albuminuric and non albuminuric. We are, we are not much focusing on proteinuria these days. So, we are, we are discussing about albuminuria as an endpoint. That is the marker. We look at urine albumin excretion rate. That's all. Ultrasound is an observer dependent test that can give you a lot of different picture in different different centers with different observers or ultrasound is done just to know that whether there is any obstruction or any structural change in the kidney. Good morning, sir. Sorry if I missed it. Uh, diabetes with CKD, how do you differentiate it between uh, from diabetic kidney disease? Diabetes with CKD is a spectrum. Correct. So there can be diabetic kidney disease and non-diabetic kidney disease in a person with diabetes and kidney disease. There are quite a bit of non-diabetic kidney disease like people can develop infection related glomerulonephritis, membranous glomerulonephritis, all other form of glomerulonephritis, chronic pyelonephritis due to recurrent UTI, nothing prevents them from developing an other form of kidney disease in a person with diabetes. That's why he said it's like a spectrum. In a, in a diabetes with kidney disease, we divide into diabetic kidney disease, non-diabetic kidney disease. Even with diabetic kidney disease, people can have proper biopsy proven proteinuric nephropathy as well as non-proteinuric nephropathy. For want of time, I'm not going into the details. Are the outcomes uh, different? So outcome, yes, obviously in person with non-diabetic kidney disease depends on the natural, uh, that particular disease to know the natural history of the disease. So diabetes doesn't influence much. For example, a person develop an anti-GBM disease in a diabetes, it is the anti-GBM disease that is going to decide the outcome, not the diabetes. Thank you. Thank you. We may, we may move, move on to the next topic. I have immense pleasure, pleasure in inviting the next speaker, Dr. Suganya Govindan. She is going to talk on optimal assessment of incident underlying renal dysfunction and cardiogenic shock. Over to Dr. Suganya. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ranjini, and uh, thank you for the organizers and especially Professor Edwin for asking me to talk on this uh, topic. 
Um, so in the next uh, few minutes, I'll be discussing on what uh, impact does renal dysfunction have on patients with cardiogenic shock? Why should we even measure or look for renal dysfunction? And uh, how can we optimally assess renal dysfunction in a patient who has cardiogenic shock? Uh, so we all know that cardiogenic shock is a state of end organ, severe end organ hypoperfusion due to cardiac failure. And uh, the causes could be anything that would result in severe acute LV or RV dysfunction. And uh, myocardial infarction with LV failure remains the most common cause of cardiogenic shock. It can be complicated by a variety of complications as this August audience would know. The end result is hypoperfusion which could be picked up clinically by cool extremities, low urine output and alteration in mental status. Not only the setting of cardiogenic shock, but also the various treatments that one would attempt for treating a patient with cardiogenic shock can also result in uh, or confer an increased risk of AKI. There might be many drugs like uh, vasopressors and inotropes that can cause renal vasoconstriction that would decrease the renal perfusion in addition to the endorgan hypoperfusion that the cardiogenic shock entails. There are also uh, RAS activation blockers which sort of uh, impair the GFR maintenance and uh, uh, there's also supports like ECMO and IABP, which also confer a very high risk of AKI in this subset of patients. Um, in um, the context of cardio, in the context of cardiogenic shock, most often we look at type one cardiorenal syndrome because there is an acute decrease in organ perfusion and there is an acute uh, heart failure, which is leading to AKI. In the other forms of uh, CRS, especially type 3 and 4, renal dysfunction obviously influences the outcome in many different ways. I'll be just briefly touching upon that. Uh, so the impact of AKI in a patient with cardiogenic shock. Approximately almost 30% of patients with decompensated heart failure have either an acute or chronic renal uh, insufficiency. This is uh, from the other data. And AKI incidence when these patients are in the coronary unit uh, varies anywhere between 9.6 to 27 percent. But what's very important is having AKI confers a very high risk of mortality ranging from even up to 50 percent in these patients. And an all-cause in-hospital mortality was higher in patients with cardiogenic shock and AKI compared to patients only who had cardiogenic shock. So having AKI is going to confer a very additional uh, mortality risk in this already high mortality risk uh, uh, condition. And patients who have the severest of AKI who require renal replacement therapy have the highest risk of mortality overall. This was very elegantly presented in uh, <clears throat> one of these famous uh, studies, which showed that patients who have MI compared to patients who have AKI, they have a higher mortality risk. So AKI confers a very high mortality risk and even compared to a patient who has isolated MI. And when these two events are going to be uh, together in a patient, the impact on mortality, the impact on cardiovascular events, the, impo uh, the impact on renal events and death is very, very high. So it's really a situation we are looking at too many risk factors for mortality and we would like to assess them earlier to sort of prevent and also to decrease the progression. So what do we do to currently diagnose AKI? The tools that we have are very, very little, and that's really sad. But we use uh, traditionally the KDGO uh, classification for AKI, which depends on the creatinine rise and also depending on the drop in urine output. Uh, so stage two and three AKI will confer the highest mortality risk of a patient. But nonetheless, even having stage one AKI would increase the mortality risk significantly uh, compared to a patient who does not have AKI. And that is something that we have realized more and more in the last ticket. Uh, coming to this conceptual model of AKI, this tells us why we have to catch AKI early. And um, this just shows that patients who are at risk of AKI, uh, you have to catch them at this stage to avoid any sort of kidney damage. So kidney damage starts very early and starts and progressively increases at the stage of AKI increases. We currently do not have any tools that is clinically and readily available and readily applicable across all centers to catch AKI at this stage where we can stop the damage from uh, happening and stop the pro uh, progression. So this is where we would like to catch AKI or like to test patients for AKI, but unfortunately, clinical tools are currently not available to do so. 
and once this state sets in the reversibility and the progressiveness of the disease is really really not uh, much under our control we can do certain therapeutic uh, uh, things to sort of decrease the progression but not much can be done beyond this stage um, we do have uh, certain uh, clinical markers to sort of catch patients at this risk stage, at the risk of AKI. This is a pediatric index, which later on has been uh, adapted for adults. This is one of the very few um, uh, criteria that has been developed in pediatrics and later adapted to uh, adults. So this is the renal angina index, which computes the score of risk of AKI and an uh, injury uh, score for AKI and gives a composite score which is called the renal angina index. It can be anywhere between 1 to 40 and in children an RAI of more than 8 confers a higher risk of AKI. This also gives you a subset of patients in whom might benefit from using a biomarker other than creatinine to identify patients at risk or to identify patients early even before a creatinine rise or a urine drop occurs. Do we have something like this for adults? Yes, the same index was modified for adults, wherein an uh, incidence where diabetes and sepsis were included into the criteria and also fluid overload. Over the last few years, we have uh, realized that not only creatinine or drop in urine output, but also having a fluid overload accumulated from the time the patient lands up in the ICU till the time you are evaluating the patient. A gross accumulation of fluid in the body, anything over 10% confers an increased mortality risk. So fluid overload is an important criteria in this index and majority of patients with cardiogenic shock also they even though they suffer from chronic uh, organ hypoperfusion there's still a lot of fluid in their body which needs to be removed so this modified RAI uh, score of more than 10 is shown to increase the risk of AKI and this is a subset of population who you would identify at risk of AKI and uh, either apply novel biomarkers or start measures to decrease the risk of AKI so do you have something? So do we have anything that would uh, really work like the troponin that you guys have for picking up an MI early? So we uh, try and, uh, you know, uh, sort of, uh, there are many candidates which have been tried to be uh, called the renal troponin. We all know that in the setting of cardiogenic shock, the proximal tubule is the one that is going undergoing necrosis or acute tubular necrosis. The proximal tubule being the most um, a vulnerable portion because it's very metabolically active. Markers that would be elevated when there is proximal tubular damage are being investigated. Uh, many such uh, markers are being investigated now. The most prominent ones of those are uh, probably the NGAL, the KIM1 and the LFABP. So these proteins have been tested in many, many studies. Some of these markers elevate very early. Some of them persist even after the injury has come down. Some of them uh, increase very late, uh, sort of telling you which patients are more likely to have a chronic renal dysfunction after having an acute kidney injury. So these uh, markers are everywhere. And how would you interpret these markers? So in the clinical scenario, if you have these markers available, um, when there is no damage, there is the markers are or the low, uh, the biomarkers are also low and your serum creatinine is stable. So you don't need biomarkers here. You know that there is no um, uh, rise. But this is the subgroup where these biomarkers are going to be very, very useful. Where you have your serum creatinine, which is still stable, but your biomarkers are going to be high, which says that already there is a risk of damage setting in and there is already damage happening. This is something a normal serum creatinine would miss, but a biomarker would pick up. So this is where your biomarker is going to help you. Again, when the serum creatinine is already elevated, you do not need a biomarker telling you that there is kidney injury. You already know that there is kidney injury. Again, in hemodynamic AKI, which some of our patients with cardiogenic shock or very early cardiogenic shock are going to have, where it is completely reversible and there is just a hemodynamic component, the renal damage or the proximal tubular damage has not yet set in. Again, there your serum creatinine might be elevated because of the hemodynamic component, but you know the damage hasn't set in where the biomarker is still going to be low. So these are the two situations where the biomarker can come in helpful, where your traditional markers like decreased urine output and serum creatinine are not going to be of much use. 
But the search for the ideal troponin is still continuing. We have many agents which are being um, uh, investigated, but there is also consortiums which are looking at uh, many of these uh, markers, whether four or five markers together can improve your predictability of AKI. Unfortunately, we do not have an answer to give you today, but definitely because there's so much research and so much promise in this area, we're going to look at some ideal marker other than creatinine to tell us this. Um, how does chronic kidney disease would influence an outcome in cardiogenic shock? We all know as your GFR progresses, there is increased cardiovascular risk. There is increased uh, risk of progressive volume overload because both your kidneys and your cardiac uh, state is sort of confers an equal risk of volume overload. The additional risk factors which could also result in chronic kidney disease and also cardiac disease are also going to be progressively increasing as your stage of GFR uh, comes down. So chronic kidney disease, uh, we know uh, data as of yet shows almost about 40 to 50 percent of patients with heart failure have coexisting CKD and also even slight reductions in GFR will strongly cause an increase in all cause cause mortality in your patients with heart failure. And CKD stage three or higher has a threefold risk in uh, increased risk of heart failure. And having an ESRD on dialysis, almost uh, 10 times or 30 times the risk of all cause cardiovascular mortality. So in a patient with CKD and cardiogenic shock, you're looking at even a heightened risk of mortality here. They are really, really the most uh, worst patients that you can get. We also know that just having an episode of AKI with cardiogenic shock confers a future risk of something called an AKD and CKD. The AKD is just the interim period where there is some improvement in the AKI, but the patient has still not, uh, but they still has some renal dysfunction, which is residual. And when it crosses a period of 90 days, that's when the term of CKD comes. But we are more and more recognizing that CKD alone is not enough, uh, is not important. We also uh, uh, recognize the importance of this interim uh, uh, spectrum, which is called the AKD, between 7 to 90 days. So non-recovery of renal function, even before 70 day, even before 90 days, would increase your all-cause mortality. So this happens in cardiac patients as well. So the tools currently in use for renal assessment, whether it's AKI or CKD or AKI over and pre-existing CKD are the urine output and your serum creatinine. We all use in our ICUs, subjective and various tools of objective assessment for organ perfusion and fluid overload. But nonetheless, these are not enough currently and we would like to catch them early to prevent the AKI, AKD, CKD conundrum and also to decrease the impact of renal dysfunction over a patient with cardiogenic shock. So we are really looking forward to biomarker application in at least these high risk population. In some areas like the NGAL and KIM1 kits are easily available, the cost is coming down, so it might be feasible in some centers at least to start using biomarkers in your high risk patients. Um, and why this is important, why to catch AKI early? Because currently we do not have therapeutics or pharmacological agents to decrease creatinine or to decrease AKI. We only have supportive care. We all practice fluid vigilance, especially important in a patient with cardiogenic shock. We avoid nephrotoxic interventions. We have very few drugs to prevent uh, AKI, like NSTL cysteine in the setting of contrast, which is again very debatable. And early initiation of renal support or dialysis is what most of us find end up doing when we are no longer able to control the um, onslaught of AKI. So the balance is between overdiagnosing and underdiagnosing AKI and the future looks probably at consortiums for biomarker research and definitions of AKI which include biomarkers and novel molecular targets for AKI treatment. Um, your future uh, AKI definitions could somehow look like this incorporating all the biomarkers that we would use and um, I would end this uh, by summarizing that cardiogenic shock imparts a high risk of AKI and having renal failure either with acute or a chronic kidney disease confers a high mortality risk and a morbidity risk in these patients and identifying at-risk patients, at-risk conditions and treatments that can aggravate this risk is very essential in your patients and tools for decision making currently are urine output, creatinine and biomarkers and practice fluid vigilance, avoid nephrotoxins and initiate early dialysis if everything goes uh, bad. Thank you very much. Thank you so much ma'am. Uh... I hope uh, we get a cost-effective renal troponin soon. And uh, thank you. Uh, we can have one question. Is there any, what is the treatment? 
just like uh, our worsening uh, hemodynamic metabolic status. So more and more we realize that fluid overload is independent of, you know, creatinine increase or a drop in urine output. Fluid overload in itself confers a very high mortality risk in our patients. And that is uh, a paradigm shift in our understanding of how we select patients for renal support or dialysis. So we are moving towards early initiation of dialysis in many of these patients and not waiting for traditional indications for dialysis. Does it alter the clinical outcomes? Uh, yes, although there is no very concrete data as of yes. now, and There's especially no with continuous renal replacement therapies coming, we are not yet able to prove whether these definitely have an influence on mortality. We need more studies to tell, but if you ask any intensivist or uh, person in the ICU, they vouch for CRRT and early initiation of CRRT, at least in the uh, adult ICU settings, where they feel that the fluid uh, management sort of is easier in these patients, where you can liberal use of fluids and also nutrition uh, plays an important role when you are thinking of renal support for non-traditional indications of dialysis. So we are right, moving towards no it, but we do not have concrete data yes. yet. Yes. It may be right, but there is no data. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you. I'll call upon uh, TK Sharavanan, sir, uh, HOD of uh, Tagore Medical College to chair with, uh, with us in the session. The next topic, uh, angiotensin receptor nephrilisin inhibitor versus angiotensin receptor blocker as a cardio protective agent by Dr. Dinagaran, Director and uh, Chief Nephrologist, Madhuri Kidney Center. I welcome you, sir. Respected chairpersons, dear friends and colleagues, I think it's a honor for me to deliver this lecture in front of this tightly packed cardiology forum. And the topic is something which crosses the borderline of cardiology and enters into nephrology, or you can call it the other way also. ARNI versus ARB. Can I have the first slide? As a cardio reno protective agent. ARMI, you are aware, is angiotensin receptor, neprilysin inhibitor. How does it score over the conventional ROS blockade in cardiorenal protection, especially when these two systems are affected simultaneously, maybe to varying extent? We will go into the topic. I will just try to touch the topic on these four headings. What is the link between the heart and the kidney in health and disease? Why should we give special care when they are affected in a combined way? And going to angiotensin receptor and adding an aprilisin inhibitor, where do they act? What is the role of natriuretic peptides and their role beyond RAS blockade? Because till a decade ago, we were talking about RAS blockade as one of the major steps to be taken for cardiorenal protection. Now we are going one step ahead and what is the basis for that and what is ARMI and what is its role in cardiorenal therapy and coming to the topic allotted to me, how ARMI scores over RAS blockade. So I will try to just speak of these headings two minutes each. The heart and kidney are interlinked in physiologic states to maintain salt water homeostasis and normal BP, we are aware of it. When both organs are diseased, they adversely affect each other's function. That poses a significant challenge in the management of patients with a compromised heart and kidney function. And they have some common pathologic mechanisms which affect both the organs and cause simultaneous dysfunction. But added to that, when you try to treat heart failure, it influences the renal outcome. When you use drugs for renal failure or when you want to overcome the volume overload, sodium retention caused by renal failure, it affects the cardiac outcome. 
so how to manage between these two in disease the kidney and heart can adversely affect each other so we take one hand the kidney when it is poorly performing fails to excrete salt and water and abnormal renin secretion occurs from the ischemic kidney this increases the cardiac preload after load and heart failure this is how kidney influences the heart failure on the other hand poor kidney perfusion doing owing to a low cardiac output due to a cardiac failure will cause venous congestion right heart failure and that will contribute to kidney failure this is one of the ways by which an acute congestive heart failure leads to an aki so and when we treat there is a paradoxical situation the neurohormonal interactions between the two organs are complex the natriuretic peptides which induce diuresis and which go up during a volume overload of the heart or they help to remove the fluid retention through the kidneys the natriuretics which accumulate but when you treat heart failure with the diuretics although congestive symptoms and natriuretic peptides level may come down kidney function gets worse because of a reduction in kidney plasma flow stopping of diuretics may improve kidney function may avoid the hypoperfusion of the kidney but will worsen the cardiac volumes and levels of bnp so this is the therapeutic paradox when you try to treat one situation the other might get worse so we have to strike a balance how often it happens this cardio renal link in disease state a strong independent predictor of adverse outcomes in heart failure if there is a renal dysfunction the coexistence of heart failure and renal dysfunction is a marker of poor prognosis and cardiac and renal disease are extremely common frequently coexist worsening of baseline kidney function is a powerful indicator risk factor for adverse outcomes in heart failure this is what i explained earlier when you try to treat heart failure use more diuretics try to induce a natriuresis and reduce the fluid volume status that may influence the renal function so that's a paradox ckd causing heart failure this is something that the nephrologists have been talking for decades as kidney failure worsens as we go through severe stages of ckd the most vulnerable stage in ckd is stage 3a and 3b that's where the creatinine clearance is between 15 ml and 59 ml that's the most vulnerable stage of ckd where 8 out of 10 patients with ckd stage 3 develop a cardiac morbidity and mortality and we lose them on the way only 2 out of 10 progress to stage 4 or 5 and reach a dialysis requiring renal disease or ckd i used to say that a specialist is one who does not allow anyone to die through his specialty maybe the nephrologists hand over this risk to the cardiologists and the nephrologists do not allow their patients to die because of renal disease that's not a very welcome situation so we have traced the cardio renal link now we let us try how to overcome this therapeutic paradoxical situation between treating heart and treating renal failure and what is the role of natriuretic peptides this is a complex cartoon that i try to explain the two systems that try to manage the balance between the output renal perfusion and renal failure so far we have been talking very much about renin angiotensin system which goes through angiotensin 1 2 and an angiotensin acting on the angiotensin type 1 receptor and we know that an angiotensin receptor blocker will inhibit further degradation of at1 angiotensin 2 and if doesn't happen suppose you allow this cycle to go through the angiotensin levels or high they act on the receptor it will cause sodium and water retention vasoconstriction cellular proliferation and increased sympathetic tone this if angiotensin system is left uncovered or not blocked but when we block it we will get over these complications and the other side is the natriuretic peptide system which is being recognized within the past decade it goes through pro bnp bnp and its action is it induces natriuresis diuresis vasodilatation anti proliferative action decrease sympathetic tone anti hypertrophic action which are all welcome changes which will help both heart failure so somehow we have to stabilize this and this system is degraded by neprilysin 
we try to inhibit that, we may be able to utilize these protective mechanisms for the betterment of the patient. Are we able to do it? Let us see. If you have a combination, a drug which is a combination of sacabutyl alsartan, this gets activated and then it inhibits the nephrolysin destruction, this action. If nephrolysin is allowed to act, the sacabutyl and the peptides will go into inactive fragments. But if you inhibit it, we will have the protective action of the natriuretic peptides helping us in the management. And Valsartan will take care of the angiotensin IT1 receptor actions. And once that is blocked, you will have vasodilatation, reduced sympathetic tone, natriuresis, and increased parasympathetic tone, which are all welcome changes that will help in cardiorenal protection. And this nephrolysin comes mainly from the kidney. And what is ARNI? Its role in cardiorenal therapy. We will just run through that. Nephrolysin degrades natriuretic and other vasoactive peptides, including some other substances like bradykinin, substance P, angiotensin 2. And so, nephrolysin inhibition enhances the activity of the natriuretic peptide system. And that facilitates natriuresis, diuresis, BP reduction, inhibition of RAS, and the sympathetic nervous system. But when you do a nephrolysin inhibition in an isolated way, that will cause reflex activation of the renin angiotensin system. So, development of nephrolysin inhibitor has always been combined with ACRARB. That is the genesis of this combination of angiotensin receptor nephrolysin inhibition. Sacabutyl valsartan is the first in class army, though before that omopatrilat, which was a combination of sacabutyl with an ACI, it failed because of the severe angioneurotic edema that it produced. And this is a very useful combination. It has effects on BP more than ARB alone. And compared with those assigned to enlapril, participants assigned to sacabutyl valsartan in this path making study showed a definite 20% reduction in endpoint of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. That started the arrival of ARMI. And in addition to its known benefits, both in heart failure with reduced rejection fraction and some benefit in heart failure with preserved rejection fraction, it also has benefits on the kidney. This is where ARNI scores over the RAS blockade in isolation. Appears to slow. So, sacabutyl is now recommended as early as 2017 by the European Society and also by the ACC and it has come to stay in the armamentorium of cardiorenal protection. Uh, can you sum up, sir? Uh, How ARNI scores over? Uh, I have a few more slides. I will finish it in two minutes. How ARNI scores over RAS blockade? It has an effect on all cause mortality in heart failure patients and CKD. The classical difference is like this this cardiovascular and all cause mortality in heart failure, renal failure patients without CKD. There is not much difference between sacabutyl valsartan and ARB. But when you take patients with CKD, you see a marked difference. Sacabutyl has a better cardiorenoprotective effect in people with CKD. And that's why we use this as a specific agent, as a cardiorenoprotective agent. Impaired renal function is lower with sacabutyl valsartan. The cardioprotection is better with sacabutyl valsartan. That is seen at both stages 1 to 3 and 4 to 5 of CKD. The hyperkalemia, which is a major risk when we combine RAS blockade, menulocorticoid receptor antagonist, and the ARMI, is less with ARMI compared to ARB. So, the benefits are they have a lower risk of acute renal events. There is no increase risk for chronic renal events, and hyperkalemia risk is lower. So, with all these benefits, it definitely is a cardioprotective agent. And the place where it should be used, it is now the first line drug as recommended by the cardiology societies, either ACRBI or if you feel that it is better, use sacabutyl valsartan and all other measures are become add on steps in managing heart failure. How to use it? When somebody is on ACI, stop it for 36 hours and then add ARNI. ARB, no need for a gap, leave one day and from the next day you can start can start depending on the severity of CKD from 50 milligram, 100 milligram or 200 milligrams. This is how it is used in practice. So, to sum up, 
Why is sacrobital valsartan safe for the kidney in heart failure? Heart failure, the kidney is highly exposed to reduction in renal blood flow that will result in decreased EFR and increased tubular reabsorption. So, decreased EFR and increased tubular activity leads to increased oxygen demand, but it is not available. Oxygen delivery becomes less with drugs like RAS blockade alone. But natriuretic peptides, they increase GFR and decrease tubular reabsorption and they afford metabolic protection to the kidney by improving oxygen delivery and reducing oxygen consumption. The resistance to the action of natriuretic peptides is overcome when we use this combination of drugs. Therefore, to increase renal availability, it will help to overcome the tubular resistance to the available remaining peptides. So, in this conceptual framework, Inhibition of NEP, neprilysin by sacabutin valsartan adds further benefit to heart failure treatment because it restores natriuretic peptide mediated actions that improve renal function and reduce the renal metabolic risk. So, we are using an agent for heart failure that will not increase the renal risk and facilitates cardiorenal protection. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for the excellent presentation. Uh, as it's, the session is running late, we will not have any questions at the end of the session. Uh, we thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity to chat the session. We will close this first session. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I request the next session people, please keep, keep time because we started one minute early and we are now uh, 15 minutes behind schedule. So please uh, keep timing. Chairperson, moderators, to please take care. Thank you, moderators and speakers, for enlightening us. Moving on uh, to our next section of ninth annual uh, conference of Heart Failure Association, may I take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Prabhu Kumar, Dr. Uh, Pratip Nair, Dr. M. Edwin Fernando, Dr. Ram Prabhakar, and uh, Dr. Priya Dashini to chat the session. We invite the moderators to start the proceedings. General announcement, delegates are requested to keep their mobile phones on silent mode during the session. Thank you. So good afternoon uh, everyone. Since we are running short of time, I uh, call the first speaker, Dr. Subhashri, a nephrologist from Tutukudi Medical College. She will speak on why and when to screen for heart failure and kidney disease in diabetes. A very warm greetings to all. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Edwin for giving me this opportunity and the organizing committee. So my topic today is why and when to screen for heart failure and kidney disease in diabetes. It's such an elaborate topic, I'll try to keep it short and stick to the basics. Um, so enough has been said that diabetes is a risk factor for heart failure. But what is interesting is even in pre-diabetes, the risk of um, developing heart failure is as high as 10 to 60 percent. and this confers a higher risk of all-cause mortality and cardiac outcomes in patients even with pre-diabetes having heart failure. So clinically around 30 percentage of patients with type 2 diabetes manifest with heart failure and 40 percentage of all heart failure patients can have prevalent type 2 diabetes. What is the trend of diabetes prevalence in the last decade in our country? This is a paper published in 2021. Um, so here you see a standard steady rise of prevalence of diabetes in our country. And in multiple cohorts, both in heart failure and in diabetes, the prevalence of the other risk factor has been as high as 20 to 40 percent. For each 1 percent increase in HbA1c, of course above 7 or 8, the risk of incident heart failure is around 8 to 36 percent, which again increases if the patient is an elderly individual with a problem in the arterial tree, longer the duration of diabetes, obesity or a con con concomitant diabetic nephropathy. So these are the study data which shows that the presence of diabetes means there is an increased relative risk 
for somebody to develop heart failure. So why does this happen? So to put it in a nutshell, regarding the pathophysiology of heart failure and diabetes, in a diabetic milieu, there is hyperglycemia, insulin resistance, and hyperinsulinemia, which predisposes to an inflammatory milieu, dyslipidemia, and endothelial dysfunction, which uh, leads on to an ischemic cardiomyopathy. Whereas on the other hand, the left ventricular hypertrophy, the uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone act system activation, with an increased preference of using fatty acid as an energy source, along with autonomic dysfunction, leads on to what is called diabetic cardiomyopathy. So also in the subclinical level, the cardiac abnormalities in diabetes includes uh, uh, just, uh, both the functional and uh, structural dysfunction. The presence of each of these risk factors is associated with increased risk of symptomatic heart failure and death, which puts a patient with diabetes in stage A of heart failure. So what do we know about the initial risk assessment of cardiovascular uh, risk assessment in asymptomatic individuals in diabetes? So you have to routinely look for whether the patient has got a microalbuminuria, which is a telltale sign that the patient has at an increased risk of renal dysfunction and high risk for future CVD. Uh, resting ECG in a patient with diabetes diagnosed with heart, uh, uh, sorry, with uh, hypertension or a suspected CVD is mandatory. Along with that, an assessment of carotid or of femoral plaque burden will help as a risk modifier in asymptomatic patients with diabetes. Moving on to the uh, recommendations for initial testing of heart failure, it is imperative to find out if there is any other specific cause underneath that is causing heart failure rather than just being diabetes. And once a patient is being diagnosed with heart failure, your entire laboratory panel should include a complete hemogram, how is the kidney, kidneys and the liver functioning, the urine analysis, also have a watchful eye on the INN uh, thyroid status. So it goes unsaid that a patient presenting with heart failure at 12 lead ECG is mandatory at initial presentation so as to optimize the management. To talk about biomarkers, I'll stick to the basics, only the uh, uh, pro, NT pro BNP and BNP. Regarding, regarding these biomarkers in the initial diagnosis and risk stratification, based on how the patient presents, like is it just with dyspnea uh, or with an established chronic heart failure, or a chronic heart failure patient getting hospitalized, these biomarkers can be used either for diagnosis or excluding heart failure, helps in risk stratification. And finally, a patient who is hospitalized for heart failure, a pre-discharge BNP and anti-pro BNP can help in telling the trajectory of what will happen to this patient post-discharge. What are the values that will help you in ruling out heart failure with respect to BNP in a patient who is ambulatory, it is less than 35. In hospitalized patients, it is less than 100. Regarding NT-pro BNP, a value less than 125 in ambulatory and less than 300 picograms per ml in hospitalized patients will help you in ruling out rather than diagnosing heart failure. Regarding the cardiac imaging, I leave the, uh, the higher uh, cardiac imaging modalities to the uh, uh, cardiologist because it's their arena. But it is imperative for us to know that in a patient who has been suspected or having a new onset heart failure, it is mandatory to do a chest X-ray to find out the heart size and the pulmonary conjunction, and also to know whether there is an alternative diagnosis affecting the lungs and the heart. Also, a, thora a transthoracic echocardiography is performed to assess the cardiac structure and function. Do we have any risk calculator uh, tools? Uh, we have one that was published in 2019, which is called the Online Pool Cohort for Prevention of Heart Failure. You can just Google it. it you have to put, uh, uh, give the inputs of multiple parameters, which will tell you whether a particular patient is having an increased risk of heart failure at 10 year interval. And that was about heart failure. Moving on to the second part of screening kidney disease and diabetes. What is the CKD burden in India? We had a recent study published in 2021, the Indian CKD study, which said out of CKD population in India, one fourth was being contributed by diabetes. So such is the uh, impact of diabetes on CKD. So when does this renal injury start happening? In This is the conceptual model of natural history of diabetic kidney disease. So it's essential for you to know that after five to 10 years of onset of type two diabetes only, the microalbuminuria starts in. And 10 years after that, there is going to be complications of kidney. Regarding the pathophysiology of DKD in a nutshell, 
In the diabetic milieu, we have the advanced glycation end products, the hemodynamic and hormonal changes happening along with the role of growth factors. There is glomerular hyperfiltration, altered glomerular composition, renal hypertrophy and hypertension, which translates to clinically albuminuria. There is deposition of extracellular matrix, which culminates in glomerular sclerosis and interstitial fibrosis. So how do you screen for kidney disease in diabetes? The two essential tests that we ask for is urine, albumin, and EGFR, which is assessed in patients with type 1 diabetes who are having the disease for more duration more than of, or equal to five years. And in all type 2 diabetes patients, regardless of treatment initially, and then you repeat these two tests, tests annually. For those with established DKD, the urine, albumin, and EGFR is monitored uh, monitored and the frequency is uh, de frequency depends on the stage of the kidney disease. The commonest question that we encounter is which urine test to be used. So we have dipstick, urine PCR, urine ACR. You have to remember that a urine dipstick is a semi quantitative one and is used only for screening purpose and it will detect the test will turn positive only when the urine albumin is more than 300 mg per day so there is no point once the urine dipstick turns positive it's not necessary to do to quantify what is the amount of microalbuminuria in a patient's urine which one of these functions best the urine acr as advocated by the kdgo guidelines as well also keep in mind to screen for the other selected complications of chronic kidney disease. Look for whether the patient goes for uncontrolled hypertension, presenting with volume overload. Is there any evidence of dyselectrolytemia? What is the uh, metabolic acid, uh, what is the metabolic acidosis status or the bone metab uh, metabolic bone disease profile and run the appropriate test. Two lines on renal and retinal relationship. So the concordance ratio of diabetic retinopathy in type 1 diabetes individual is as high as 100% and is just 60% in patients with type 2 diabetes, which means diabetic nephropathy and diabetic retinopathy can happen in the absence of the other. So as mentioned in the earlier talks, kidney disease in diabetes does not always mean it's diabetic nephropathy. So this is a paper published in 2015. We have had multiple papers late after that. And here what you see is more than 50% of patients with kidney disease in the context of type 2 diabetes mellitus and proteinuria of more than 1 gram, when they were biopsied, more than 50% per percentage had a non-diabetic kidney disease, either in isolation or superimposed on a diabetic kidney disease. And the most common isolated NDRD was membranous nephropathy. So you have to know that earlier in the, uh, in the uh, diabetic duration, it is likely to be an NDRD, whereas in the later stages, again, it's likely and it is not uh, always exclusive to diabetic kidney disease. Now, there's the uh, algor clinical algorithm which one has to resort to when you encounter a patient with diabetes and proteinuria. So exclude UTI first. Look into the patient's urine, whether there are RBC or WBC cast. Quantify the proteinuria. Check for the kidney size by using an ultrasonography, and if you suspect there is an underlying glomerulonephritis, we can resort to looking for complement levels and other antibodies. Now, biopsy may not be required if the patient has a type 1 diabetic for more than 10 years, has a concomitant retinopathy, you have documented a previous microalbuminuria in this patient, there is no macroscopic hematuria or no red cell cast, so, so it is imperative or it is important to check the urine analysis for diabetics and if the ultrasound shows it's a normal or an enlarged kidney. A kidney biopsy can help in a patient with type 1 diabetes lasting for less than 10 years if there is no retinopathy, no, uh, if, the, if there is nephrotic range proteinuria without microalbuminuria previously documented or a macroscopic hematuria or red cell cast present in urine. So this will help you to know whether it's an NDRD or a DRD or an NDRD superimposed on a DRD. Finally, why should you screen for kidney disease in a patient with diabetes? You need to progress this, uh, uh, monitor the progress of CKD, find out if could be another superimposed kidney disease, especially AKI, where if you treat the patient according to the cause, patient can go back to the baseline. You assess the uh, risk for uh, CKD complications. And all this armamentarium of drugs which we use in treating heart failure, diabetes, kidney disease, hypertension, etc., it is imperative for you to know the GFR so that you dose the drug appropriately. And finally, you can know when to refer the patient to a nephrologist. A likewise equation that you have to assess the kidney failure risk, where you input the age, the gender, and the GFR along with the urine proteinuria. 
and the uh, risk calculator will tell you what is uh, the underlying uh, risk of this particular patient developing a kidney failure in 10 years. So finally, so patients whom we see are not just exclusively diabetics or hypertensive or heart failure patients. We have a dual burden of CKD and cardiovascular mortality in patients with type 2 diabetes and it is imperative for us to reduce the prevalence of both these two major risk factors. Thus, we use the agents of cardiovascular and kidney uh, failure as a fourth pillar of diabetic complication management. If you think I was too, it, it just went off in a flash, just Google it. Um, in, so in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, very nice presentation and very detailed. Any questions from the audience? I don't have any questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I'd uh, request Dr. Sanjeev Nair to come up on stage. He will be discussing renal responses to novel chronic heart failure therapies. Do I need to do anything? That's it. Uh, the slide is not playing. Is it? My slides are loaded here, but they're not coming up there. The technical team, please check out. We're already short of time. I was a little concerned about uh, being a nephrologist invited to a cardiology conference. Some of that tension is building up some more now. But I think we have safety in numbers today, so that's okay.
So they just uh, just start off. We could uh, catch up. All right. You just want to see if this works? Yeah, this works. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll start off uh, before the slides come up. My top, uh, thank you to the organizers uh, for the opportunity. Uh, my topic today is uh, renal responses to novel chronic heart failure therapies. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, no conflicts to declare. So uh, the, there is considerable organ crosstalk between the kidney and the heart. Heart failure does affect uh, the kidney's functioning and this is driven by the bidirectional uh, neurohormonal as well as hemodynamic pathways that underlie this relationship. Uh, the complexity of the uh, cardiorenal syndrome model uh, is an outline of how complex this is. Uh, it stands to reason therefore that uh, therapies which will be directed at heart failure will direct uh, will affect the uh, underlying pathways and will affect both organs uh, both the heart and the kidney and this has clinical implications for both nephrologists as well as cardiologists but before we move on to that first some physiology now i'm not going to spend time talking to a room full of cardiologists about the intricacies of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system but uh, ras is central to heart failure and which is why it was the first neurohormonal pathway that was studied for heart failure because of its role in uh, systemic vascular resistance and which is why AC inhibitors and ARBs are now first line therapy for heart failure and also along with MRAs uh, form the dual blockade therapy. But in, uh, but the uh, kidneys glomerular filtration rate is dependent on cardiac output as well as uh, do I keep going? I keep going? Yeah. Uh, the kidney's uh, glomerular filtration rate is dependent on cardiac output, uh, and which also drives the renal blood flow. Now, in the presence of uh, heart failure, Uh, in the presence of heart failure, we have a situation where there is decreased cardiac output and the kidney then uh, responds by activating RAS and via angiotensin 2 and aldosterone. We have uh, improvement of the GFR because of salt and water retention as well as improving the blood pressure. But in a system where there is increased uh, glomerular filtration, the other uh, autoregulatory mechanism of the kidney comes into play, which is the tubular glomerular feedback. Uh, so you have increased GFR, which delivers more salt uh, and salt sodium and chloride to the distal tubules, and then the juxta glomerular apparatus uh, uh, comes into action, uh, constricts the afferent arteriole, and uh, relieves GFR. Now, what happens here is we've established that because of heart failure, RAS is activated. We also know that in heart failure there is an upregulation of the uh, sodium transporters in the distal tubule, which means that there is increased salt and water retention at the, at the, sorry, at the proximal tubule. There's increased salt and water retention at the proximal tubule, which means less of it reaches the distal tubule, which the kidney senses as decreased renal blood flow. And therefore, RAS gets further activated. What all of this means is that in chronic heart failure, you have persistently uh, reduced renal blood flow, which re results in increased uh, filtration uh, fraction. That leads to a state of increased salt avidity. As we've already said, the heart failure also leads to an upregulation of sodium receptors in the proximal tubule, which re results ultimately in activation of inappropriate activation of the RAS. All of this means that the tubular glomerular feedback's ability to protect the nephron from hyperfiltration is thus impaired. Heart failure patients, therefore, face persistent intraglomerular hypertension, resulting in sustained nephron loss. What is the clinical implication of all this? It means that the kidney and renal markers are central to uh, heart failure prognosis. In fact, it has been suggested that uh, GFR is a stronger predictor of clinical outcome than left ventricular ejection fraction in heart failure patients. But we need to differentiate between a decreased GFR due to uh, hemodynamic changes versus permanent uh, nephron loss. All worsening renal function is not always associated with poor outcomes. 
in an acute setting, an elevated central venous pressure, low cardiac output, low uh, blood pressure, and an elevated intra-abdominal pressure can cause a worsening of creatinine. But these are impacted by therapeutic agents and can be corrected, which means the creatinine can either stabilize or even improve. On the other hand, persistent and progressive declining creatinine is a marker of progressive nephron loss, which is what we see in chronic heart failure. So the assessment of GFR slopes is significant and is an important uh, marker for randomized control trials which look at drugs in heart failure. This was not initially done for your original uh, AC inhibitors in ARBs, but with the novel therapies, it is increasingly being looked at. So I'm not going to spend time talking about uh, the mechanism of action of RNA after Dr. Dinekran says book, but the two trials which looked at RNA in heart failure were the Paradigm HF, which looked at it in uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and Paragon HF, which looked at it in heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction. So in Paradigm HF, the uh, study excluded patients with a GFR of less than 30. Paragon included patients up to a GFR of 20. So this is significant. These are the, this is the outline of those trials and I'll focus only on the renal endpoints. Uh, what we can see here across the board is that whether it was uh, progression to ESRD or a 50% decline in uh, kidney function from baseline, the uh, study group did significantly better than the control group, which was the standard of care, AC inhibitors and ARBs. In both trials, uh, sacubitril valsartan reduced the risk of uh, renal events, which was already outlined. But in addition, uh, it, we've also seen that they slowed the annual decline of EGFR both in uh, reduced ejection fraction heart failure as well as preserved ejection fraction heart failure. This is uh, especially marked, this is from the Paragon HF trial, in patients with diabetes, where the improvement in uh, the slope of GFR is much more pronounced in those with diabetes. In addition, combining uh, sacubitril valsartan with MRA seemed to have a beneficial effect on hyperkalemia and increases the tolerability of MRAs as well in this population. As I've said already, um, in heart failure, we've established that there is an impaired tubular glomerular feedback. Uh, what SGLT2 inhibitors does is it blocks the uh, receptor at the proximal tubule which results in an increased uh, delivery of salt, uh, sodium and chloride to the distal tubule. What that does is it restores the tubular glomerular feedback, which means afferent arterial constriction happens and normalization of GFR happens. That means we are starting from a higher GFR and coming back to a normal GFR. So in the short term, when you start this drug, you will get a dip in GFR as well as a rise in creatinine. But in the long run, that ameliorates the effect of uh, the noxious effects of uh, uh, hyperfiltration. So again, the, the studies which looked at SGLT2 inhibitors excluded GFR below 20. And these are the studies which looked at uh, SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure. Uh, as we can see, most of them, uh, all of them had uh, decreased ejection fraction and there was a good chunk of CKD patients in the study population. Both dapaglifosin and empaglifosin cause an acute drop in GFR at after initiation, like I said. But subsequently, both of these drugs attenuated the annual decline in GFR. And this was most pronounced, uh, the drop, initial drop in GFR was most pronounced in diabetes, potentially reflecting uh, the effect of a higher interglomerular pressure. The presence of CKD at baseline did not influence the temp uh, treatment efficacy with these drugs in both the uh, primary cardiac as well as secondary renal endpoints. And again, with SGLT2 inhibitors, we see that combined use with MRA seems to have a protective effect uh, with regards to hyperkalemia. Uh, this is uh, the summary of the uh, renal out, uh, outcomes for these trials. What I would like to show here is that the Emperor Preserve trial, which looked at uh, preserved heart failure, showed only uh, an improvement with the annual decline in GFR and not the combined end product, but the uh, those with the reduced heart failure had improvement across the board with regards to the combined renal endpoint, which is the composite of uh, renal death, uh, progression to ESRD, and a 50% decline in uh, ESRD. SGL2 inhibitors also uh, significantly uh, cause glucosuria and natriuresis, which lowers the intravascular volume and interstitial volume. So this uh, picture is an idea of what happens when you have... Uh, progression in, uh, see, uh, in the uh, GFR. After age, you have a decline. 
which is the green line, which is normal, about one, one mil uh, per minute. And the maximum decline is seen with diabetes. Heart failure decline is somewhere in between. Now, what happens when you add a RAS inhibitor or an SGLT2? There is going to be an acute drop. And that acute drop does not diminish treatment effect. Uh, what you see in blue line is the uh, effect with RAS inhibition, which runs parallel to the heart failure lines. But in pink and in green, we have the RNE and SGLT2 inhibitors respectively. And you can see that there is actually an improvement in the rate of decline of GFR with the addition of these drugs. The other newer drugs that have been uh, recommended in select patients are Ivabradin, which works as uh, which works via negative chronotropic effect on the SA node. Uh, the risk factor here is bradycardia and AF because there is no neurohumoral activity. The relative safety profile from a kidney point of view is good. Uh, Verisiguat stimulates the activity of soluble guanyl cyclase, increasing the amount of uh, cyclic GMP available for uh, nitric oxide mediated uh, uh, vaso and uh, cardiac relaxation. And this action is independent of uh, RAS inhibition and uh, sympathetic nervous system uh, inhibitors. Omacaptive macabal is a myotrope, uh, myosin specific activator which works regardless of calcium fluxes. And studies have shown that compared to placebo, uh, the renal dysfunction, there is no significant renal dysfunction. The three big trials which looked at these drugs were SHIFT for Ivabradin, Victoria for Verisiguat, and uh, Galactic HF for uh, Omacamptive. And uh, again, all three trials had a, uh, were looked at in uh, patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and had a good chunk of uh, patients with CKD. Um, the Ivabradin study, even though there was a an increased risk for progression of, uh, of a worsening renal failure with higher heart rate. The drug itself did not alter the GFR over time. The Victoria trial did not show any interaction between baseline GFR and the effect of Verisiguat and had no effect on the incidence of worsening renal failure over time. And Omicamtiv did not affect the renal function uh, either way and also did not affect potassium uh, during a 24 to 48 week follow-up compared to placebo. So to summarize, you have this, uh, slide where we can see that MRA, MRA and RNAs can be used up to a GFR of 30, SGLT2 up to a GFR of 20, uh, very sequoid and omicaptor up to a GFR of 15. You can see an acute drop in GFR with AC inhibitors, MRA, RNA and SGLT2 inhibitors. But with the use of RNA and SGLT2, you're actually also improving the slope in GFR decline. So to conclude, chronic kidney disease is common in heart failure. The various pathophysiologic processes coincide with the progress of CKD. Kidney dysfunction is the single most important reason why the guideline recommended drugs are not used to its full potential. And the better we understand uh, how those uh, drugs work with the kidney, uh, the better the benefits for both heart failure as well as CKD in this population is going to be. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Sanjeev. This was a good old talk. And uh, despite the obstacles you face, anyway, uh, because of shortage of time, any questions? You please make it fast. Any questions? Okay, Sanjeev. Anybody? No. We can have the qu questions together with the next session. Oh, oh. So the question and answer sessions of the two sessions will be combined. So let the con we talks continue. And the chairperson change, but chairperson will be here. And can be a final common discussion. Let's move on to the next topic. I call upon Dr. Manoj Kumar, nephrologist, who is going to talk on renal failure and cardiovascular diseases. Renal markers, what do they tell us? Over to Dr. Manoj Kumar. Thank you, ma'am. I am grateful to Dr. Professor Edwin Fernando for giving me this opportunity to address this august audience. So today we'll be talking about uh, renal failure and cardiovascular disease. Uh, what do we learn from the renal biomarkers? So whenever we see a reduction in GFR, so we divide that into three syndromes. So one will be your uh, AKI. So we have an, we already had an exhaustive discussion in the last session about acute kidney injury. Then we have acute kidney disease. The concept of acute kidney disease is as old as the rifle criteria for AKI. The name has just changed. The L in rifle stands for the loss of kidney function. So that has been rechristened in 2012 KDIGO guidelines as acute kidney disease to describe the entity that has a persistent kidney dysfunction lasting more than seven days and less than 90 days. 
and we have CKD. So now the incidence of AKI in acute decompensated heart failure varies anywhere between 20 to 40 percent and 50 percent of heart, heart, heart failure patients tend to have uh, at least some form of CKD with a GFR of less than 60 mils per minute. So what are the things that we need to look in here is one, whenever you look at AKI, is it actually AKI? That was the uh, session, the last session totally about and this is what we are going to discuss AKI reversible and the with respect to AKD we have a separate discussion on that at the end of this talk and CKD. So here we will look at whether adding kidney disease biomarkers is going to improve heart failure prediction. So this is your uh, reno cardiac biomarkers. So one, this is the UK biobank study. So what they basically did was they collected blood samples of uh, individuals aged between 39 to 70 years who did not have diabetes, hypertension or heart disease, kidney disease at baseline. So then they followed these people for a decade and then they picked up people who had heart failure. So there were 1730 events of heart failure that occurred in the 10 year follow up period. So then they went back and they looked whether addition of cystatin C EGFR, creatinine EGFR and your urine albumin creatinine ratio to your ARIC equation, atherosclerosis risk in community study equation. So whether it improved the prediction of 10 year cardiovascular disease risk. So they found the highest change in the uh, prediction happened when they added cystatin C EGFR compared to the creatinine EGFR. And when they combine proteinuria, urine albumin creatinine ratio and addition of EGFR to the heart failure prediction equation, the performance characteristics improved dramatically. So this group of investigators suggested that we should also add urine ACR and EGFR to our heart failure prediction risk equations to get a better result. So then what about a biomarker? So that can tell us uh, whether the patient has CKD in a patient with heart failure and vice versa, whether a CKD patient will develop myocardial fibrosis. So the common link here is galactin-3. So it is a beta galactoside binding lectin. So basically it is released from macrophages and it is responsible for proliferation of the myofibroblast and laying down the collagen to cause tissue fibrosis. So those who have an elevated galactin level, so they have a higher risk of accelerated GFR decline over the next three years and they also have a higher risk of cardiac remodeling, providing a common link between CKD and CAD. So we have already seen at length about the pathophysiology of cardiorenal syndrome type 1. So I'm going to draw your attention to this. So, so far uh, we have been through the journey where we understood AKI as a co consequence of pump failure with reduced mean arterial pressure. Then we came to recognize that not only reduced mean arterial pressure, the organ perfusion pressure matters. So a patient with venous congestion alone can also develop AKI. Now we have the third concept that the venous capacitance system is not a benign tissue. It can uh, activate the inflammatory pathways whenever it is distended. So it can activate your IL-6 and other pro-inflammatory pathways like TNF. It can cause increased NF kappa beta transcription. This itself can cause an intrinsic ATN. So this mechanism of ATN should also be kept in mind whenever we look at AKI in cardiovascular disease. So with this, we are going to dive into the kidney stroponin. So Sukanya ma'am had already mentioned that we are looking for the kidney stroponin. But there's one thing that we need to understand that you cannot find the kidney stroponin because kidney is not a single tissue. It does not have a single function unlike the heart. So kidney has different compartments. It has a glomerular for filtration. It has tubular, which has reabsorptive functions, synthetic functions. It also has a vascular compartment. So that is why as we see the evolution of cardiac biomarkers happening in the last half of a century. So since 1886, our vintage creatinine still holds strong. 1886 was the year when the first assay for creatinine was described. So till then creatinine is the only marker of kidney function that we use. What is the problem here? Two problems. One, 
there is a time delay from the onset of kidney injury to the rise in serum creatinine that can be up to 48 hours so the early window of opportunity is completely lost and the patient who is critically ill so their creatinine production from the muscular tissues is reduced and with the edema there is dilution of the serum creatinine so the magnitude of rise in serum creatinine will not be commensurate with the magnitude of dip in gfr so why do we need a biomarkers we need biomarkers to identify early and we need to identify the risk of progression and most importantly we need to know which stage of aki my patient is in so that i can in, uh, make targeted intervention at the relevant stages so here we can divide the biomarkers into uh, different functionalities the tubular function markers are the one that uh, are responsible for telling us whether the patient has developed a early tubular injury so these are markers that are completely reabsorbed and metabolized by the proximal convoluted tubules can anyone help me with the mic so the other one will be the tubular injury markers so these are the ones that tell us that the aki is already established so that is the markers that are released from the inflammatory cells and you have the repair markers that say that the atn is progressing from the extension phase to the repair phase so we can anticipate a early renal recovery so then you have the tubular health markers so these are very very important because this will tell us whether the given patient who is an aki survivor is going to develop a ckd in the future so this is where the uh, akd will come in so these are the different uh, biomarkers that have been studied so far so ngal kim1 l type fabp fabp is a uh, injury marker il18 is a marker of uh, tubular inflammation tim2 and igf bp7 are cell cycle arrest markers so this was studied in the sapphire study and it has received approval as a dipstick nephrocheck kit to identify patients at risk for aki so the product of tim2 and igf bp7 has a potential to detect aki early so these are the stages of aki in which they are used so we look at it in this tri aki study graph so here uh, this was already shown in the previous talk but we will look at look at it from a different perspective like we look at the cardiac biomarkers with time so the first biomarker that jumps up with aki is plasma ngal the problem with plasma ngal like your initial cardiac biomarkers like ck ckmb and myoglobin it is non specific so it can also be elevated in conditions other than aki in any condition that has other organ injuries so a little specific marker like your troponin will be your urinary ngal so you can see the urinary ngal going up initially and then it comes down and then your urinary l type fabp which is a marker of tubular injury so as the aki progresses so you can see that this urinary ngal is going to come down and it is going to reappear again during the extension and repair phase so and then you can see the urinary il18 spiking during the injury phase and then you see the urinary il18 coming down and then you see the kim1 going up to herald the maintenance and repair phase of atn so the by looking at the profile of these biomarkers in urine so we'll be able to get a fair idea in what stage of aki my patient is in so what is going to happen in the next few days am i expecting a recovery am i going to expect the patient is going to uh, have a oliguric phase should i prepare the patient for dialysis so this is a text uh, version of the graph so here you can see if the patient is having more of il18 less of ngal and fabp and tim2 it means it is going to progress to severe aki and if you see kim1 you can see okay it's going to recover and the patient is going to come out of dialysis or going to come out of aki but we need to understand that none of these biomarkers are not specific to identify ckd progression uh, when you compare them with egfr and urine albumin creatinine ratio so this uh, is the recommendation from acute disease quality initiative so they have suggested to add biomarker to stage 1 aki to say that if creatinine stable biomarker positive that is a four times higher risk of progression to aki and even in a patient with established stage 1 aki if the biomarker is positive so they have a 12 times higher risk of progression to higher stages of aki so these are two trials that studied whether using a biomarker to identify patients at risk of aki is useful so you can look at the absolute risk reduction numbers these are very good 21% with this big pack study in post op aki 
and 16.6% in prev AKI which is post cardiac surgery associated AKI population. So the NNT was around 6 to 8 which is fairly good and you can use TIM2 IGF PP7 not only for risk stratification, you can also identify the group that will have the greatest benefit. So when they have a TIM2 IGF BP, uh, IGF BP7 product between 0.3 to 2, so they stand to gain the most by applying the KDAGO care bundle for AKI prevention. So now we will look at the furosemide stress test. This is something that can be applied at bedside. This, we, uh, this is something we would have observed in our practice. A patient with heart failure, AKI, administering furosemide, the patient uh, shows a good amount of diuresis and the patient improves. So that can be standardized into a furosemide stress test. So you give 1 milligram per kg of furosemide to a volume loaded patient and 1.5 milligram per kg to a patient who is already on diuretics and then you observe the urine output for the next two hours. So if the patient throws up a 200 ml urine in the next two hours, the test is said to be positive. And why do we need to do this? We need to understand the physiology. We are looking at the two most oxygen consuming segments in the nephron, the proximal convoluted tubule and the MTAL, the medullary thick ascending limb. So the PCT is responsible for secreting furosemide into the lumen. So it takes up furosemide from albumin from the basal lateral side, it secretes it by an active transport through the MRP4 pump and then you have the MTAL that is responsible for the natriuresis. Okay, so when I know my FST is negative, when I know my FST is negative, right, yeah, this patient is either going to progress into a higher stage of AKI. If the patient is already in a higher stage of AKI, I know this patient will require kidney replacement therapy, so I need to be ready. So is it enough? So this is where we need to deconstruct the furosemide stress test. So here we see, we divide the proximal convoluted tubule and mTAL by assessing the furosemide excretion in the urine and the urine sodium. So if I have good excretion, good urine sodium, it is a positive test. If I have low excretion, but I still have high urine sodium, it means the mTAL is already gone, it's an established ATN. So if I have low urine sodium, but I have intact excretion, this is where we have the severe heart failure patients. If this is the situation. We had an audience question. When do you consider starting ultrafiltration? So this will give us an answer. So I've given furosemide, PCT is functioning, mTAL is not responding because of high uh, neurohumoral activation. I need to pitch in with the ultrafiltration. So this is where your biomarkers will be useful. So one, you can identify whether the AKD is hemodynamic or intrinsic injury and post AKI recovery, you can use urinary beta 2 microglobulin or UMOD as a marker of nephron, surviving nephron mass in the patient. So this is just a repurposed algorithm where you can use these markers in step one and then you can go, go directly to your decision making whether you are going to give diuretic, whether you need to start kidney replacement therapy instead of going uh, step wise and uh, wasting around 24 to 48 hours before the creatine goes up. Thank you very much. Thank you. So very lucid and nutshell presentation. It's top. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Anjani Muttu on amplification of CV risk and diabetes with CKD. Please. Very good afternoon to one and all. Uh, I thank the uh, organizing committee for uh, inviting me for this talk. Uh, <clears throat> technological advancements have, have improved the cardiovascular outcomes uh, to a greater extent on one side, but also there is a parallel increase in the uh, prevalence of, of non-communicable uh, non uh, non diseases in the form of diabetes and chronic kidney disease, and there is a significant cardiovascular risk, and we'll see in the subsequent slides uh, how and when, how and why. CVD is a, a leading cause of chronic kidney disease mortality and 50% of ESRD die from a cardiovascular cause and this mortality is higher in the CKD population as compared to the age match general population and it's also interesting to see that that uh, the younger population if he's on dialysis almost has got the same risk of ca 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 cardiovascular risk as, as compared to a individual who's 85 years, uh, years old and not having chronic kidney 
uh, disease. Chronic disease is uh, recognized as a highest risk group by American Heart Association in their recommendation for cardiovascular disease management. Seeing the spectra, in the initial uh, chronic disease stages, the mainly the brunt is because of the atherosclerotic event, which is mainly ex explained by the traditional risk factors as compared to when we uh, go on with the later stages of C uh, CKD, it is mainly the non-atherosclerotic risk factors which contribute uh, to the injury, mainly in the form of left ventricular hypertrophy, arrhythmia, sudden cardiac death and calcifications, which is not explained by the traditional factors and novel factors play an important role. And as we near the dialysis onset, the risk of cardiovascular events are much more and dialysis itself can trigger the events. Uh, we have both traditional and non-traditional risk factors. Traditional factors play a very minor role as compared to the non-traditional factors. Uh, because of want of time, we'll dwell only upon few factors, the hypertension, diabetes and dyslipidemia. Uh, hypertension is one of the important modifiable risk factors, highly prevalent in chronic kidney disease. It is associated with renal worsening in diabetes and albinuria. It's a major risk factor for coronary artery disease, LVH and mortality. Mask hypertension, which is uh, picked up only at home and not at clinic, it's strongly linked to diabetes, uh, uh, CVD and CKD. And it is uh, seen that with a good blood pressure control in early stages of CKD, it is associated with good, good cardiovascular outcomes. But once the dialysis stage is reached, this relationship is lost because of the J curve, because the uh, low blood pressure is associated with adverse outcomes reflecting the reverse causality. So the blood pressure targets have always been the uh, topic of debate and controversy and we have guidelines from time to time. So based on the current evidence, we have the target blood pressure less than 130 by 80. So uh, this is based on the pressing that for the most of the patients with cardiovascular disease, a cardiovascular event is much more likely as compared to the end stage renal disease. And the evidence, the cardiovascular benefit is see, see, uh, shown in two trials. The one is the SPRINT trial, which showed the cardiovascular risk reduction in non-diabetic individuals with CKD. Uh, 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 with benefits shown when the blood pressure was tightly controlled to 120 millimeter of mercury. This was also uh, extended by the uh, post hoc analysis of the SPRINT eligible accord group to include the diabetic individuals in them and they also showed similar benefit uh, when the B B blood pressure was tightly controlled. In one of the meta-analysis it was shown that this cardiovascular benefit reduces with BP lowering in presence of advanced CKD. So now uh, based on this we have two guidelines which is the uh, AHA uh, 2017 and European Society of Hypertension 2018 which have kept the uh, target to less than 130 by 80. But we have the KDGO 2021 guidelines which is uh, mostly followed by most of the nephrologists throughout. Uh, we have kept the target as less than 120 millimeter of mercury only. But we have also kept uh, in mind the uh, evidence is weak when it comes to advanced kidney disease and diabetes. So the benefit lies somewhere between 120, 120 to 30. And if the patient is having advanced kidney disease, it could be around 130 to 139. So whatever the uh, guidelines may be, we have known that now the uh, targets have been reduced. So now we have increased number of patients who have not met the BP targets according to any of the latest guidelines. So this was depicted nicely in the study which was uh, published in Kidney International in 2022, uh, which compared all the three 2017 AHA guidelines with uh, 2012 KDGO guidelines and the 2021 uh, KDGO guidelines which said that there's almost 50% of individuals who have not reached their targets up till now and only around 39% of individuals are on AC inhibitors and ARBs. So there's a high cardiovascular burden because the uh, targets are not yet reached and hypertension is an important risk predictor and uh, uh, bad adverse uh, uh, predictor for kidney disease. Uh, statins have played a very important role in general population and have controlled the dyslipidemia to a great extent in general population, but this has not been replicated in the uh, CKD population because of various reasons. The CKD dyslipidemia milieu is quite different because of impaired lipolysis and reverse cholesterol transport. There is an increase in the triglycerides level and the low HDL level, uh, and the cardiovascular death is mainly because of non-traditional factors. Pleomotric, uh, pleiotrophic effects of statins are mainly attenuated in CKD because of inflammation, oxidative stress, and proathogenic factors. And last but not the least, ESRD with uh, low cholesterol levels uh, are associated with poorer outcomes, the reverse epidemiology uh, theory. So statins have got only limited role in CKD population with, uh, with only in non-dialysis individuals more than 50 years or earlier if they have a comorbidity in the form of diabetes or CAD. Fire and forget. We don't have to repeat the measurements. Uh, then uh, we don't have to 
to treat to target. And if the patient has having triglyceride levels, lifestyle my management is sufficient, and there's a weak evidence for fibrate, especially when the GFR falls below 30. And the patient, if reaches dialysis, statins are normally not initiated, but continued if they are already on. Diabetes also is an important risk factor. It's a CAD equivalent. More people die from vascular causes as compared to those without diabetes. Uh, CVD accounts for 60% of life years lost from diabetes. So uh, because uh, hyperglycemia is an important risk factor, every 1% rise in HbA1c levels is associated with 30% rise in CVD. And optimum outcomes are there only when the target is between 6 to 6.9. Uh, diabetes is also a leading cause of CKD worldwide. There's a disproportionate higher risk of CVD in diabetic nephropathy individuals when compared to pa patients with diabetes, but we don't have, have uh, kidney disease. In absence of nephropathy, diabetic mortality is almost similar to the general population. So this cardiovascular benefit of good glycemic control is not seen in advanced CKD individuals because of risk of hypoglycemia, because of uh, uremic uh, nephropathy prevalent in them. So this is just, just to show that there's only uh, uh, factors like hyperglycemia, advanced, uh, ad, ad, advanced glycosylated end products are not only the factors which contribute to the milieu of cardiovascular disease, but there are various factors which are pertinent to the chronic kidney disease and also are interlinking with other factors which are non-traditional in nature contributing to cardiovascular disease in them. So, despite cardiovascular risk management, there is an increased diabetic related mortality more so in type 2 individuals. Traditional factors don't fully account for the heightened risk. Hypertension, dyslipidemia and obesity have inverse association with, diabetes, uh, with CVD, especially in advanced CKD. They are underdiagnosed, undertreated, underrepresented in most of the cardiovascular trials. RAS inhibitors, SGLD2 inhibitors and mineralocortical receptor antagonists are underutilized in advanced CKD because of risk of hyperkalemia and fall in GFR. Angiography is underutilized because of risk of contrast-related injury and anticoagulants are not used to the fullest potential. Uh, it is good to keep the HbA1c level below 7% to delay the microvascular complication in both type 1 and type 2. But once the macrovascular complications are set in, especially in the later CKD stages, HbA1c target is not kept below 7 because of risk of hyp uh, hypoglycemia and adverse uh, cardiovascular outcomes. Non-albinuric uh, diabetic kidney disease is increasingly being recognized as told by my speaker, previous speaker, Dr. Prabhakaran. Um, there is an increased association of cardiovascular mor mor morbidity seen in them. So coming on to the non-traditional factors which are mainly contributing, the mineral bone disease, albinuria, oxidative stress, uremic toxins and gut dysbiosis, we'll see one by one. First is the uh, lab EGFR. Uh, by CKD EPI formula and the urinary uh, albumin creatinine ratio are the gold standard for CKD diagnosis. This graph uh, depicts that on the x-axis we have the increase in the cardiovascular events and we have the CKD staging according to the KDGO guidelines. For G1 is more than uh, 90 ml and G5 is end stage disease with EGFR uh, below 15 and uh, this, uh, this graph this depicts A3 and brown one is the A2 and blue one is the A1, which is less than 30 milligram per gram of proteinuria. <clears throat> so both albinuria and low EGFR are independent risk factors for cardiovascular and renal events in diabetic CKD. And even small amount of proteinuria without falling GFR is associated with increased cardiovascular mortality. Microalbinuria is linked to non-dippers and left ventricular hypertrophy. And there's a potential role of MRAs in lowering the renal, uh, renal failure and card cardiovascular morbidity as shown in the landmark trials. This, this shows that uh, uh, all the major cardiovascular events, cardiovascular death and all cause mo mortality is higher in individuals with a low, low GFR uh, with, uh, below 60 as compared to individuals with GFR more than 60. There is a good chunk of non-albinuric diabetic kidney disease, which my earlier speaker had uh, dealt with. There's a higher risk of hospitalization for heart failure and CKD progression than no uh, DKD. This graph shows that this is the blue line is the maximum risk because of combination of proteinuria and EGFR uh, in them as compared to the uh, lowest risk, which is seen in the diabetic individuals, but not without al albinuria and falling GFR. And the intermediate groups are the green one is the individuals with diabetic and albin al albinuria, which has got a lower risk as compared to the individuals who have got diabetes, but no proteinuria, but there is a fall in GFR. So this group is quite in in interesting. We have uh, elderly females, fewer smokers with uh, less prevalence of diabetic retinopathy, but higher risk of CVD. 
and also they have higher risk of CKD pro 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 progression, and they are more prone for heart failure. So there may be a uh, they may benefit from SGLT2 inhibitors. This is ju just to show that if the individual is having only heart failure, there could then there is around 35% risk of hospital hospitalization. But in case if he has, uh, it, it increases massively to 82% if he has got concomitantly chronic kidney disease and diabetes. Um, Cardiorenal syndrome 4, which is, which is uh, chronic uh, heart failure secondary to chronic kidney disease is explained by mainly by the non-traditional factors. Initially, the, uh, the calcific uh, ab ab abnormalities and the hypertension which contribute to the pressure overload, uh, followed by anemia and sodium and fluid retention contributing to the volume overload, uh, leading to congestive heart failure. Next important risk factor is the vascular calcification. This is mainly because of the imbalance between the promoters of calcification, that is the calcium phosphorus product more than 55, FGF 23, and inflammation, as compared to the inhibitors of calcification, which are the matrix GLA protein and the fetuin A, which falls in CKD. Um, this Because of this, there's an increase in the endothelial injury leading on to atherosclerosis, but there is also a contractile uh, uh, smooth muscle cell which get uh, transitioned to the osteoblastic like smooth muscle cell leading on to vascular smooth muscle calcification. This calcification is mainly medial and not intimal leading on to heart failure. This starts even early in the early stages of chronic kidney disease and the coronary artery calcium score worsen with the worsening CKD and there is a role for non-calcium based uh, phosphate binders which uh, have shown uh, some, some benefit. So this is just to show the extensive calcification which can occur uh, throughout, including the skin. Uh, there are uh, novel cardiovascular risk factors available in patients with um, diabetic kidney disease, uh, but the promising ones are the FGF23 and Clotho, which not only predict the myocardial infarction and stroke, but also predict cardiovascular mortality and predict the fall in EGFR. There are some more uh, risk factors, but for want of time, I will just run through it. The important one is the gut dysbiota because of indoxyl sulfate and p chrysol sulfate, which are released from the gut, contributing to the uremic toxin and the array of events contributing, leading on to uh, cardiovascular disease and pro progression of kidney disease. Uh, so there's a potential role of uh, prebiotics and, pro and pre and probiotics here. There's a role of oxidative stress and endo endothelial dysfunction also, which contribute to kidney disease, a fall in nitric oxide, and there's an increase in the ADMA levels contributing to endothelial dysfunction. Pro this is a post-translation uh, post modification product, which is released because of increase in the urea levels contributing to vascular damage. Luckily, there, there, there is an advantage with the intensification of the hemodialysis, which can benefit this. Metabolic acidosis is also associated in the form of uh, diastolic dysfunction. It has got association with high sensitive CRP. There are other factors like cystatin C, uh, cytokines, IL-2, and selectins, which contribute to various uh, cardiovascular risk parameters in diabetic kidney disease. To, so to conclude, diabetes add to the CKD burden, and it's a vulnerable and undertreated group. Both traditional and non-traditional factors amplify the cardiovascular risk. Control of traditional cardiovascular risks are not beneficial in advanced CKD, which is associated with reverse epidemiology with the paradox. Albinuria and EGFR are independent risk factors for CVD and diabetes and should be included in the CVD risk stratification to better understand the risk factors and to come up with newer treatment. Cardiovascular events for each EGFR category is higher in individuals with diabetes with CKD as compared to general CKD population and there is a need to uh, develop novel therapeutic targets to achieve renal and cardiac benefits. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, moderators and panel members, to give us an insight on uh, kidney failure, uh, kidney disease, and heart failure. Moving on to the third session of today's conference, may I take this opportunity to welcome Dr. M. Bhatibramanyam, Dr. Ranjini Mukhu, Dr. Prabhudas, Dr. S. Chandrasekhar, Dr. Sulaiman to chat the session. We invite the moderators to start the proceedings. May I request your speakers and moderators to stick on to the time, please? Ten minutes for each uh, talk. Thank you. May I now uh, request our first speaker of the session, Dr. M. Edwin Fernando, to deliver the lecture. Good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, 
I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity. The first speaker is Dr. Edmund Fernando, Professor of uh, Nephrology, Professor in HOD Nephrology, Stanley Medical College, a long time friend, a great academician, excellent teacher, as some of the speakers who spoke previously were all his students. And he'll be talking about shifting the treatment paradigm for, for chronic kidney disease and type 2 diabetes, the role of uh, non steroidal MRIs. Edwin, you can take your own word. Thank you. Good afternoon, all, and uh, respected chairpersons. I shall be talking to you about the burden of diabetes and what, what else we can do for the cardiovascular disease as well as the kidney disease. So we all know that the burden of CKD because of type 2 diabetes is exponentially increasing. And despite glycemic and BP controls, more than 30% of patients with type 2 diabetes develop CKD. And we know that as the urine ACR and the EGFR influence cardiovascular mortality, as the UACR increases and as the EGFR decreases, cardiovascular mortality is significant. CKD progression in type 2 diabetes has three main components. One is the hemodynamic component, the metabolic component, and the inflammation and fibrosis. Now, tubular interstitial damage and inflammation, glomerular sclerosis, mesangial expansion, and glomerular hypertrophy, these contribute to kidney fibrosis and progression of CKD. Now, we have hemodynamically, we could uh, tackle this with ACE inhibitors, ARBs, thiazides, the other uh, uh, antihypertensives, SGLT2 inhibitors. But what do we do for inflammation and fibrosis? There's no existing treatment, primarily targeting inflammation and fibrosis. And despite the RAS blockade and SGLT2 uh, inhibition, patients with type 2 diabetes and advanced CKD are at a risk of progression of CKD, as evidenced even by the renal, the credence, and the DAPA CKD trials. Aldosteron is an old hormone with renewed interest and the renoprotective effects of spironolactone have been shown to be useful in proteinuric chronic kidney disease patients and it is strongly uh, believed that the aldosteron excess was strongly associated with cardiovascular and all-cause mortality in patients on chronic hemodialysis. Now we know that aldosteron under angiotensin 2 hyperkalemia, hypovolemia, and corticotrophin is produced in the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal gland. It acts on the mineral corticoid receptor and has actions on the brain, the blood vessels, the heart, and the kidneys. And using an MRA, like a spironolactone, epidrenone, and fendronone, is likely to produce beneficial effects in terms of control of hypertension, heart failure, and progression to CKD. Now, what is this mineralocorticoid receptor? It's a nuclear receptor expressed in many tissues and cell types, the kidney, heart, immune cells, and fibroblasts. Directly affects the target gene expression, primarily fluid electrolyte and hemodynamic homeostasis. It's less appreciated that it has a role in tissue remodeling. And the pathophysiological overactivation of the mineralocorticoid receptor is the primary driver of inflammation and fibrosis in cardiorenal disease. So the mineralocorticoid receptors regulate the gene expression through cofactor recruitment and multiple factors overactivate the MR, including aldosteron, cortisol and others. And overactivation of the MR signaling pathway drives inflammation and fibrosis via pro-inflammatory cytokines and other fibrotic proteins. So we all know that MR overactivation results in deleterious effects on the heart and the kidney, promoting cardiac remodeling and progression of both renal and cardiovascular disease. Binding of fendrinone to the mineralocorticoid receptor disrupts the transcription of pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrotic factors, and this is the beneficial effect produced by this drug. So the fendrinone reduces the cofactor recruitment to to the mineralocorticoid receptor, thereby reducing the downstream expression of pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrotic factors following the MR overactivation. Now, how to target this MR overactivation and slow down the progression? Fendrinone has been approved uh, by the FDA and available in our country. It's a non novel non-steroidal selective MRA. It's a bulky non-steroidal molecule. It has a unique structure, results in 
selective potent interaction with the MR regulation of gene expression. It exhibits anti-fibrotic and anti-inflammatory effects. Fintanone is a selective non-steroidal MRA. Uh, we had the steroidal MRAs earlier, namely spironolactone as well as aprilinone. Now, fintanone is a bulky molecule. It's got a shorter half-life and there is a differentiated risk of renal electrolyte disturbances and effects on the markers of inflammation and fibrosis. The selectivity is high and it's got short half-life. We have a lot of literature on this that has been recently published. This is the Fidelio DKD and the Fidelity studies. And the evidence for fintrinone is from two major studies, namely the Fidelio DKD and the Figaro DKD study, which use the key inclusion criteria that UACR 30 to 300, a EGFR of more than 25 to 60, and a UACR more than 300 to 5000, and EGFR of more than 25 to 75. Treated with either an ACE or an ARB at maximum tolerated dose and a potassium of less than 4.6 at run-in and screening visits. And this is the Figaro DKD study. Again, the, uh, uh, the inclusion criteria are uh, clear here. And both these studies used a large number of patients. So these were the uh, characteristics of the, both these studies. The median follow-up of 2.6 years in Fidelio and 3.4 in Figaro. Nearly 98 to 99% of patients were treated with maximum tolerated dose of ACE or ARB respectively. And adherence was very good. Nearly 92% of patients had uh, adhered to the fentanyl dose. Now, out of these, two, of these two trials, what are the efficacy and safety outcomes? So, what was very clear is on top of maximum tolerated RAS inhibition, Fintrinone significantly reduced the primary kidney outcome by 18%. And this is the Fidelio DKD study and the Figaro that I mentioned to you. So what was very clear is that is an 18% reduction in prime, combined primary endpoint, that is CKD progression, renal failure, death, and a good safety profile in normokalemic type 2 diabetes with albuminuric CKD, G2 to G4, and A2 to A3. We have this KDGO staging of CKD. And in patients, the, uh, the Fidelity study is a pre-specified pooled analysis of the Fidelio DKD and the Figaro DKD trials. And it showed that the, uh, the reduction in the risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality was 14%. And uh, the progression to CKD was reduced by nearly 23%. So this Fidelity used a 13,000 odd pre-specified pooled analysis and then the overall summary here is there is a 14% reduction in the risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality and a 23% reduction in the risk of CKD progression with the use of finrinone, which is now shown to be an effective treatment option for cardiovascular and kidney protection in patients with CKD stage 1 to 4 and type 2 diabetes mellitus. So finrinone had a modest effect on the blood pressure, the A1C levels and blood uh, body weight were similar. No differences in AKA between both the groups and the sexual side effects like uh, gynecomasia were rare and balanced between the groups. Fintanone is well tolerated. The overall incidence of emergent uh, adverse events and serious adverse events was similar. It led to a mild increase in hyperkalemia, which is uh, corrected by temporarily withholding fintanone. The hyperkalemia was increased, but the clinical impact because of hyperkalemia there uh, was low and there were no deaths due to hyperkalemia. So, in the Fidelity SGLT2 subgroup analysis, Fintanone improved UACR in patients with CKD and type 2 diabetes, irrespective of their baseline SGLT2 use, which is an added advantage. So, the AHA scientific recommendation, the ADA guidelines, and the, uh, the CKD and CVD risk management groups have included Fintanone in their guidelines. So how do you give uh, fintrinone? <clears throat> Measure the serum potassium and EGFR. Uh, do not initiate if the potassium is more than 5. If the EGFR is more than 60, use it at 20 milligrams. If it's 25 to 60, 10 milligrams. Below 25, do not use. Monitor the serum potassium every 4 weeks and adjust the dose between 10 to 20 milligrams. And the EGFR is less than 25, do not use the drug. Or if the potassium is more than 5.5, do not use the drug. So it is contraindicated in patients who are using other 
CYPRI-A4 inhibitors like most of the antifungal agents or with Addison's disease. So the right patient for finrinone would be somebody with a GFR of more than 25, type 2 diabetes, serum potassium less than 4.8 for a 20 milligram dose and albuminuria despite maximally tolerated RAS inhibition plus an SGLT2 or unable to tolerate SGLT2 inhibitor. So very clearly it shows that the multifactorial intervention with uh, a RAS inhibition with uh, first is BP control, RAS inhibition, SGLT2 and finally with MRA you find that the graphs definitely go down. So these are the take home points, mineralocorticoid receptor overactivation is a major driver of kidney damage. This overactivation contributes to inflammation and fibrosis and is a potential treatment target to slow CKD progression. Fendrinone is a novel non-steroidal selective MRA blocks the MR overactivation and reduces albuminuria. It is different from the available steroidal MRAs. Slows down CKD progression, prevents cardiovascular events by directly ta targeting inflammation and fibrosis and the Fidelio DKD and the Figaro DKD results indicate that fentanyl is an effective treatment option for cardiovascular and kidney protection in patients with CKD stage 1 and 4, 1, and 1 to 4 and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Thank you for the patient listening. Thank you, Professor Redmond, for this crystal clear, coherent uh, and very lucid presentation. Uh, and thank you for sticking to the time. Thank you. Any questions? So just asking one question, is uh, phenerinone has any effect on interleukin 11 because last week there is a Singapore paper, it's a collaborative study, they used an anti interleukin 11 strategy, at least in the mice model study, they showed first time in the world literature, regeneration of damaged kidney, decreased fibrosis and then actually you know, the, the chronic disease actually progression is actually coming down. Probably, you know, that should be... Yeah, maybe you know, a game changer. Feature, yeah. But, uh, whatever uh, data is available shows only uh, effect on IL-6. Okay, okay. Thank you. Well, uh, this molecule is non-steroidal, selective, and that's the advantage as shown in the trials. So, if somebody is on nepralinone and stable, uh, probably you would not rock the boat. But uh, somebody uh, you had uh, not on nepralinone and somebody you're following up uh, with an addition of each drug, then probably it would be useful. Yeah, that's. <laughs> now, here we, we are looking at the targeting both together, the cardiovascular risk as well as the, uh, the progression to CKD. So, both ways it seems to work. Thank you, sir. Okay, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Jaya Nivesh Nivash. He's going to talk on sodium restriction in heart failure reduced ejection fraction. Will urinary sodium become a surrogate outcome in heart failure? Over to Jaya Nivash.
Right. So good afternoon and thank you. Uh, amidst the flow of topics, I would say a bit of an, an unconventional topic or rather a uh, less discussed one. But I started, as I started prepping up for the talk, I did realize that there is a huge amount of literature available on the same. In fact, most of this literature is restricted to cardiology journals. No surprises that it's somewhat a less discussed topic as far as a nephrology forum is concerned. So the flow of talk would be in this way. Let's just look into what are all these urinary indices in common practice. Very, very relevant physiology. And just let's look at the literature that's currently available. And let me see how much of application in day-to-day -day practice we can make. So from a nephrologist perspective, these are the three urinary indices that we commonly use. So that's the 24-hour urine sodium, the random spot sodium, and the fractional excretion of sodium. Now, each of these has its own merits and demerits. The 24-hour urine sodium might be the gold standard one, but then it's not practical to do it every in every patient for every follow-up. Soon to, it was replaced by the spot sodium. But both these tend to be affected by the urine volume, and that's where the fractional excretion of sodium came into the play. From a nephrologist perspective, to be honest, the utility of urine sodium has come down to evaluation of hyponatremia per se. There's not much of other areas we are practically using, though there is a huge list of theoretical possibilities that we can do with urine sodium, which means a role in the heart failure. It's something that we'll look up. So let me go through the relevant physiology that we have handled a lot uh, from the morning. So one thing here is, remember kidneys are the master of the orchestra as far as sodium handling is concerned. So whatever they do, they decide how much of sodium is to be retained in the body, how much of sodium is to be excreted out of the body. So they either filter, they reabsorb, they secrete, and they handle this through two major hormonal systems. It's the renin-angiotensin system and the atrial natriuretic peptides or any, any natural peptide system. So what do we expect in a patient? So when a patient is volume depleted, so what we expect is the activation of renin system and thereby the urine sodium to be low. On the other hand, when a patient is volume overloaded, what we expect is the natriuretic peptides to take over and the urine sodium to be high. But then it's not so straightforward in most of the cases because there are lots of confounding factors. So the first thing amongst that is the dietary salt. Remember the amount of sodium that is excreted in the urine is directly proportional to the kind of salt based diet that we take. And the kidneys precisely manipulate this. So if you load up a patient with a low salt diet, with a high salt diet, within 24 to 48 hours, the kidney ensures that the sodium excretion will reach a new steady state. So without knowing what kind of a diet the patient is on, it might be very difficult to interpret in urine sodium. And put into the scenario, the cardiac failure. In general, what we expect is these patients with cardiac failure have an expanded ease of volume, which means their urine sodium should be very high. But what happens is once the renal perfusion pressure or the other systemic perfusion pressure comes down, the effective arterial blood volume comes down, which means the urine sodium tends to be low. So again, it has to be interpreted based on the clinical scenario. And add to all these things, the diuretics. So again, the effect of diuretics on urine sodium is going to be highly, highly variable. So if you're going to check the urine sodium as soon as a dosage of diuretic is given, of course, there's going to be an increased load of urinary sodium. But you allow the patient to go to a new steady state and then assess the urine sodium, it tends to be variable. There are so many reasons as to why to explain this phenomenon, but the most common, in, the most important one is the breaking phenomenon, where the different parts of the nephrons will tend to overabsorb the sodium and then trying to compensate for what it has been losing in a different segment. So let's put all these confounding factors in a given patient. So the patients might, with a cardiac failure, will be on a, a diet, a low salt diet, or it might be a highly variable salt diet as the literature is coming up. The patient might be volume overloaded with a low effective arterial blood volume. He might be on diuretics, he might not be on diuretics with a GFR which is normal or not normal. So this is where the trick comes as to how to interpret urine sodium in these patients. So as I looked up into the literature, all I wanted to do is to answer any of these questions. Will urine sodium provide an additional value? Already there are so many markers for cardiac failure, the BNPs, the GFRs and everything. Will they provide any additional value? Will they be able to predict some kind of decompensation? Will they be able to predict the response to the diuretics? Will they predict or correlate with the hospitalization and mortality? and that way bringing about a change in the management. Basically, this is what I was trying to look up into the literature, and I was surprised there's quite a bit of uh, data available. Now look at this first of the studies. Let's start with patients who are having a stable heart failure. Does urine sodium have any role in these patients? Now in this particular single center study, what they did is they observed the urine sodium on a weekly basis for 30 consecutive weeks. And they also measure the 24 hour urine protein, urine sodium on four different occasions, just to find out the correlation between the spot sodium and the 24 hour analysis. Now, what they did is they classified the group into two groups, the high, sodium, the high urine sodium excretors and the low sodium excretors. And what they found is 
the group which had low urinary sodium excretion had a higher rate of future acute hospitalizations for cardiac failures. So the key observations were this, these patients, though there was a high inter-individual variability, the, in general the patients tend to have a stable urine sodium and those patients who had frequent hospitalizations had very low urinary sodium and more importantly, just prior to their episode of hospitalizations, their urine sodium levels dropped even further, which means there is a, a predictive capacity that is being shown here as well. So the authors concluded that yes, it might have a role in patients with stable heart failure to predict hospitalizations. Now let's move on to the next set. Now that the patients are hospitalized, does urine sodium have any value in patients who are already hospitalized for a cardiac failure episode? Another study, now, uh, almost in 360 patients. So what they did is, does urine sodium correlate with the length of hospital stay? Does it correlate with the degree of weight loss and ultimately diuresis? And they did find that patients with lower urinary sodium tend to have a higher length of hospital stay. And in fact, naturally their weight loss was less, which means they were less decongested. And there was also a non-statistical favoritism towards an increased rate of death as well as hospitalization in these patients with lower urinary sodium. Again, so significant predictor for weight loss and length of hospital stay. Now, let's say if they have a direct effect with a mortality or with an all-cause mortality or a cardiac mortality or something, Look at this literature, again 175 patients with heart failure, they classified them into three tertials, the low urinary excretors, the, the intermediate one and the high urinary excretors. And what they did find is the survival was least in the group over a period of follow-up of almost two years in the patients who had a very low urinary sodium. So means there is a key role in predicting the mortality in the immediate period as well. From here on, I went into look into studies where if we can predict very long term prognosis, like for example, over 30 years or 40 years. Now here in this uh, interesting study, what they did is they followed up the cohort of patients who were enrolled for some other cardiac study, the Coupier ischemic heart study, and they followed up these patients and they tried to correlate urinary sodium with either a major cardiac adverse event or mortality. Though it was not statistically significant, they, on to, they went on to show that there might be a, a prognostic value in predicting all cause mortality, if not the mace. They also showed that it is a kind of a new shaped relationship, which means not just the low urinary sodium, extremely high levels of urinary sodium might also interfere with the mortality benefits. As an icing on <clears throat> top, here is a recent uh, meta-analysis or systematic review as late as December 2022. So what they have done is they have tried to look up all the parameters that we have discussed. So it's almost 16 studies. They looked into all these variables. Does urine sodium have any correlation with urine output, weight loss, deterioration in the GFR of a patient? In worsening of cardiac failure or in predicting uh, hospitalization or in mortality. <clears throat> Very surprisingly, there was quite good correlation with urine volume and weight loss, which means patients who tend to have a good urine sodium, they tend to have a good urine volume as well as a good weight loss, which means better decongestion. There was not much of uh, correlation in terms of worsening renal failure or in length of hospital stay, but most importantly, there was a very, very significant correlation in terms of mortality at 30 days, which means patients who had a lower urinary sodium, despite hospitalization, despite the background of diuretic therapy, despite the alterations in GFR, if they have low urinary sodium, they tend to have a higher mortality at 30 days. So that were the key observations of this systematic analysis. And uh, Though not statistically significant, again, low urinary sodium people had a higher length of hospital readmission as well as worsening of heart failure. So that's the conclusion of this meta-analysis. However, what are the limitations of the study? If you look at them, most of them are smaller studies. Most of them are observational studies. The, the study designs were highly heterogeneous. Most of them are unblinded, which means there is a chance for bias. And there was no standardization in diuretic dosing and so on. And again, we do not know what additional value it brings over the already existing markers like BNP or serum sodium or your GFR. However, have I answered some of my questions? Yes. Looks like urine sodium can predict decompensation in a patient with a stable heart failure. Looks like it, it does correlate to the response of diuretics in these patients. It to some extent can predict hospitalizations, the results were equivocal. And definitely it does have some role in predicting the mortality. With this, will I be able to call urine sodium an ideal marker? The fact that it is very easily measured and is a very low cost and it does give some additional data over the existing markers, yes, I would give a thumbs up to that. But then the evidence being limited is somewhat, we have to take it with a pinch of salt. So the need of the HAR is randomized control trials to see whether a low sodium uridium group differs from a high sodium uridium group. With that, I'll conclude. Thank you, Dr. Sharma.
Thank you, Dr. Jayas Mahesh. It's very, very important. Any questions from the audience? Thank you, sir. Is there any correlation between serum and Yes. Yes. Definitely not. Uh, it's not a linear correlation, sir. It is not a linear correlation. It, mainly because of the neurohumeral activation markers that you say. The patient might tend to have a low serum sodium, but then they might have a high urine sodium in the urine. So that seems to be a lot of discrepancy here. Ultimately, it depends upon the effective arterial blood volume of the patient rather than the absolute overall total body content of sodium. Yes. Yes, that's where uh, that's that, that's what they say. This the interplay is not so straightforward. It's not so linear. The kind of uh, crosstalk that's happening between the kidney and the neurohumeral markers seems to be highly variable. That the current, I mean, it, it in fact they say it is dynamic. The patient might be having a different kind of sodium before the diuretic dosage, one different six hours after the diuretic storage. So it's not going to be a so straightforward thing that we can say it will be low in that group of patients, it will be high in this group of patients. That's where we have to be extremely cautious in interpreting the same. Thank you. Sir. If there is no questions, thank you, Dr. Singhash. Thank you, sir. The next. Okay. Moving on to the next topic, I invite Dr. S. Sujit, a nephrologist from uh, Stanley Medical College. He will speak on SGLT2 inhibitors as cardiorenal protective agent. So over to Dr. Sujit, please. Thank you. Very good afternoon to you all. Today I will be talking about the wonder drug SGL2 sodium glucose co-transport inhibitors. The cardio-renal production, how does it uh, protect the heart and the kidney? So this uh, sodium glucose co-transporter drug inhibits the SGL2 transporter in the proximal tubule. So it blocks the sodium entry coupled with the glucose. So this leads to increased excretion of sodium and glucose. This we tell as a diuresis. The diuresis caused by this class of drugs is different from the diuresis caused by the traditional diuretics that is thiazide and loop diuretics in that. Here the diuresis is there is a loss of interstitial volume compared to the traditional diuretics which cause intravascular volume. So there is a less compensative stimulation of neurofumeral activation when there is a loss of inter, intravascular volume. And this diuresis leads to uh, reduction in ventricular preload and it improves the ventricular load, uh, loading conditions. And this drug uh, reduces the plasma volume and improves the endothelial uh, function and it inhibits the central sympathetic flow thereby reducing the blood pressure and afterload and improving the cardiac function. And these drugs by increasing the ratio of glucagon and uh, insulin and causing lipolysis and improving uh, the glycemic control leads to weight loss which is beneficial. And this group, group of drugs also reduce the ATP consumption in the proximal tubule and the reversion of myofibroblast to uh, erythropoietin producing fibroblast and increasing the hematocrit. So as you all know in diabetes, there is a uh, afferent arterial vasodilation leading to increased pressure in the glomerulus. This SGL2 drugs by restoring the tubular, glomerular, uh, tubular glomerular feedback, it uh, leads to constriction of the dilated afferent arteriole thereby reducing the pressure entering into the glomerulus and emulating the protein area. Then how SGL2 drugs are beneficial in heart? This, uh, this group of drugs causes improved myocardial energetics by increasing the metabolism and mimicking a state of fasting leading to increased glucose excretion and increased ketone body production. It creates an alternate food fuel instead of fatty acids and glucose. These failing arts are better uh, functioning when they use ketone bodies as a substrate. So this increases the AT ATP generation and in in increases the performance of the heart, particularly failing heart. And along with the inhibition of sodium hydrogen exchanger in the heart, it reduces the intracellular sodium and re re restores the sodium calcium exchanger. In failing heart, there is a flooding of calcium and sodium in the cytoplasm instead of the mitochondria and sacroplasm reticulum. So it restores the deranged pathology in the 
uh, failing out. So leading to improved intracellular calcium transits and improved cardiac contraction and improves the efficiency of the failing heart. This SGL2 drugs cause an atrophic induction. By increasing the glucagon to insulin ratio, it increases to uh, urinary glucose excretion. It activates the AMK that is adenosine monophosphate activated protein kinase, HIF that is hypoxia inducible factor and SRD serotonin. It, it leads to clearance of autophagy vacuoles that is the damage organs and reduces the oxidative stress and inflammation, thereby leading to improved cardiovascular outcomes. And there is a suppression of leptin secretion from the adipocytes. So when there is a reduced serum leptin, there is a reduced epicardial fat and improves to cardiovascular performance of the failing heart. So these are the outline of the mechanism how XTL2 drugs are inhibitor drugs are beneficial for heart. So there is a plethora of uh, trials particularly with the cardiovascular uh, benefits. So the proven uh, trials which are shown efficiency I will categorize as one at risk of uh, heart failure and one is established heart failure. So the studies with the which study the there are trials which studied the population at risk of heart failure. Overall, the risk of heart failure, hypertension, atherosclerotic disease, diabetes mellitus, chronic kidney disease, obesity, and metabolism include empire outcome, canvas program, declared TME 58, credence study, British CV, DAPA CKD, scored and MPA kidney. The trials which studied the patients with the structural heart disease, that is when they developed acute myocardial infarction or LV remodeling that is left ventricular hypertrophy with low ejection fraction include impact MI study and a DAPA MI study. And that uh, studies which targeted the patients with the structural heart disease and developing heart failure but they are manageable in OP setup include deliver study and emperor preserved which, uh, which studied the heart failure with the preserved ejection fraction. And the DAPA heart failure or EMPA reduced study which studied the heart failure with the reduced ejection fraction. And the trials which studied the patients with worsening heart failure despite goal directed, uh, guideline directed medical therapy include solar assist WHF trial, EMPLS trial and DAPA ACT HF TIMI uh, 68 trial. I'll, I'll briefly outline the trials. So this uh, study that is a uh, EMPA reg outcome studied EMPA glyphosate with uh, placebo and uh, it has proven that uh, this study uh, reduced statistically the primary outcome that is the cardiovascular death, non-fatal myocardial infarction and non-fatal stroke. The next study is a canvas study. This canvas study in, uh, studied canoglyphosate with uh, placebo it, and it actually it has two uh, sister arms. One is canvas uh, population study and this canvas are included uh, renal failure patients. So this uh, study they have found that compared with placebo there is a statistically significant reduction in cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI and non-fatal stroke. So then, then come the uh, declared TIMI uh, trial. So the, here they used the DAPA glyphosate which constantly reduced the risk of cardiovascular death, hospitalization of heart failure. This credence study, we were uh, uh, Stanley uh, Medical College with other uh, multi-center study. We had the opportunity to be a part of this trial. And this study, we used canoflyosin, which showed a significant reduction in major adverse cardiac events and uh, cardiovascular death and uh, hospitalized heart failure. The Vertis CV used uh, ertuglofacin. Here, these patients studied the diabetic patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. The study, the conclusion was ertuglofacin was non inferior placebo with respect to major adverse cardiovascular events. Next, we have the DAPA CKD study. So in DAPA CKD study, uh, they used DAPA glyphosate compared with the placebo. There is a significant reduction in cardiovascular death or hospitalized heart failure. And the score study studied uh, SOTA glyphosate, but uh, even though it showed good outcomes, uh, for lack of funding, it was stopped. And in EMPA kidney study, used EMPA glyphosate, there, there is a statistically significant reduction in of hospitalization of due to congestive heart failure or cardiovascular death. So these two trials are ongoing trials that is impact MA and DAPA MA. These are uh, ongoing trials, uh, results are expected soon. And this DELIVERS trial, DELIVERS trial studied uh, diabetic population particularly and this uh, treatment with the DAPA glyphosate compared to placebo significantly associated with the reduced risk of cardiovascular death or worsening heart failure events and improved health status 
across the NOHA heart failure groups. This emperor, uh, emperor uh, preserved study used to empagliofacin. Here uh, the patients have included non-diabetic also. Here they targeted uh, with preserved ejection fraction. So this study has shown that uh, there is a secret, satisfied significant reduction of uh, cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. This included non-diabetes also. The emperor reduced again included uh, non-diabetic patients. Here they used uh, uh, preserved uh, reduced ejection fraction. So here the study conclusion was empagliofacin group had a lower risk of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure than in the placebo group regardless of the presence of absence of diabetes. So DAPA heart failure study. So this study was done using DAPA cliofacin with the placebo. So this study concluded that DAPA cliofacin reduced the risk of worsening heart failure or death from cardiovascular causes compared to the placebo. So this EMPL study they used empagliofacin and uh, here the conclusion was initiation of empagliofacin versus placebo in patients hospitalized for acute heart failure resulted in significant clinical benefit within 90 days and there is an improvement in quality of life, greater reduction in NT, NT pro BNP and no safety concerns. This sotocliofacin inhibits uh, what we, till now we talked about SGL2 inhibition. As you all know SGL type 1 inhibition is there predominantly in the guts. So this is a combined inhibitor. Sotoglyphosin inhibits both uh, type of there is an, uh, conclusion was worsening heart failure. Sotoglyphosin reduces the cardiovascular deaths, heart failure urgent disease and heart failure hospitalization. So brief outline of uh, proven benefits of uh, uh, renal failure patients. We tell us a CKD and this uh, categorization has been uh, dealt with in detail by previous speakers. That is G25 and A23. So this credence population studied this group, renal failure patients, EGF are more, more than 30 and less than 90 with the albin, urine albury excretion rate more than 300. So here the conclusion was canagliofacin decreased the incidence of kidney related events highlighting the renal safety of canagliofacin in this patient. The outcome was studied was a less decrease in that is a less than 50% drop in EGFR and uh, to uh, delay in the progression of CKD. Uh, that will be tell us an end stage sequel, uh, end stage renal disease that CKD last stage 5. So then came the DAPA CKD side. Here the peculiarity is it includes non diabetes patients also. The study targeted in renal failure patients with EGF for more than 25 to less than 75 and urine albumin uh, excretion, albumin creatinine ratio uh, more than uh, 200. So this study has show, shown that. Uh, it reduces the risk of heart failure, cardiovascular death or hospitalization of heart failure and all cause mortality in patient CKD with or without diabetic mellitus. So next is the EMPA kidney study. This also included non-diabetic patients. It targeted renal failure patients of EGF for more than 20 to less than 45 with the protein area and protein area excretion is more than 200. If EGF criteria is included of more than 45 and less than 90. This study concluded this empagliofacin led to lower risk of progression of CKD or death from cardiovascular causes than placebo. So then these three trials are the CANVAS, EMPAREG and the DECLATIMI which targeted the, the, the renal failure of 60 to 90 EGFR and albin creatinine ratio of less than 30. So here the CANVAS and CANVAS study showed, showed reduced the risk of sustained loss of kidney function, attenuated EGFR, decline and reduction in, ab, in albinuria. And as the REMPAREG study also showed that the empagliofacin renoproductive is independent of the other medications that alter the renal hemodynamics. The last is the DECLATIMI trial which has shown proven benefit of kidney uh, worsening. So I would like to conclude that as we all know, uh, SGL2 uh, inhibitor drugs as a plium, as a plium or pleiotropic drug with the proven hemodynamic profile and a proven benefit for uh, cardiovascular events and renal events. So based on this, uh, these are the important trials which have shown the uh, risk reduction. This is the stage of CK, uh, this cardiovascular uh, stages of uh, worsening uh, heart failure and this is the uh, renal failure spectrum. So always use SGL2 inhibitor drugs to improve the heart failure outcomes in, in particularly in patients with or without diabetes, with or without a CKD and in all stages of heart failure. This American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology advocates 
in patient with symptomatic heart tonic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction use sgl2 inhibitors to reduce the hospitalization of heart failure and cardiovascular mortality irrespective of the presence of type 2 diabetes always use sgl2 inhibitors in patients with ckd with or without diabetes so i would like to thank the uh, the inventors of sgl2 actually the invention started with uh, forlorsin it is a derivative of apple uh, apple bark apple tree bark so as we advocate uh, eat uh, da, apple a day keeps doctor away so we should advise uh, you take uh, sgl2 away yes yes i take sgl2 drug so that we keep away our patients from cardiovascular and renal failure thank you for want of time we'll take the questions at the end of the session uh, thanks for the extensive talk i invite uh, uh, professor uh, padmanabhan to come to the uh, podium for uh, his lecture uh, i know sir for uh, quite some time he was uh, when in, in srm days so he's a quite knowledgeful uh, professor uh, welcome sir the kind introduction um, i thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity and i bring to you greetings from srm uh, please bear with me the slides will not be that good as my predecessors and If you take into account cumulative survival of heart failure patient with CKD, you can see that it is significantly low compared with heart failure patient without CKD. And this is a National Heart Failure Registry of India. It showed that for every milligram increase in creatinine, the mortality increases by 9%. And this is our neighborhood. Trivandrum heart failure study where they showed that mortality is associated with two important factors. One is the guideline directed therapy which significantly improved the survival and the presence of renal failure which considerably worsened the uh, incidence of mortality in heart failure patient. This is the same uh, study. It showed that compared to guideline directed therapy Suboptimal guideline directed therapy resulted in significant increase in mortality. You can see in all the four at admission, at discharge, and reduced ejection fraction during hospitalization under discharge, and all the ways, suboptimal delivery of guideline directed therapy worsened the mortality rates. So, the benefits of treating heart failure with guideline directed medical therapies improved survival and decreased hospitalization. And most often what we notice is these guideline directed medical therapies are reduced in dose, they are withheld, they are discontinued and very, very rarely and most often they are not restarted, which is very important. So in order to improve the survival, in order to improve the outcome of heart failure patients with CKD, we have to break few barriers. The most important barrier which is the paucity of data available today. The second one is there are few challenges in diagnosis of heart failure in presence of CKD and provision of optimal guideline directed medical therapy in this population. And we don't, we are not clear that how to treat congestion, whether in acute decompensated heart failure or in chronic heart failure stage. And we have the triple whammy of hyperkalemia, worsening kidney function and uh, hypotension in this group of RAS inhibitors and ARNI management of anemia in this group and RRT issues. So these are the barriers which I am going to address in my talk. 
the paucity of data you can see here in this uh, projection in 2016 of all the cardiology publications 60 percent of the publications excluded patients with ckd and this exclusion is almost coming to nil if egfr is less than 30. so much so the acc aha guideline issued last year mentioned it as a evidence gap that efficacy and safety of these guideline medical therapy is not available if gfr is less than 30. in fact i would call it as evidence desert in which this desert is going to have impact on the provision of guideline directed medical therapy then coming to suboptimal or interrupted treatment which is most often delivered to patient with ckd in this uh, trivandrum heart failure registry you can see at the bottom arrow the optimal therapy was delivered at admission only to 16 percent of the patient under discharge to 21 percent so even those most of these heart failure registry patients had normal kidney function despite that the delivery of gdmt was very very low at admission and at discharge and this is a very big uh, swedish heart failure study consisting of over 50,000 patients in which patient with heart failure and ckd were uh, looked into for prescription of these drugs pers filled prescription that is buying from pharmacy adherence and participant and what they noted was lesser they were prescribed less often the goal directed medical therapy and less often these prescriptions were filled by the patient and more importantly there is a low adherence and persistence by the patients to stick to guideline directed medical therapy and above all among patients who stopped medications those with ckd were less often restarted on them which improves survival and in an accompanying editorial it was mentioned that this is called CKDism, where there may be a reluctance to prescribe guideline recommended therapy for patients with concurrent CKD, which leads to suboptimal clinical effects, which could be called CKDism, which we should try to prevent. Then coming to challenges in heart failure diagnosis in CKD patients. The challenges are too many. The first one is overlap of symptoms in CKD between fluid overload and congestive heart failure and also there is a delayed in diagnosis of heart failure therapy heart failure uh, identification because most of the CKD patients have symptoms similar to heart failure so there is always a delay in diagnosis of heart failure in CKD patients and above all the ancillary tests which we use routinely like ECG echo and biomarkers are not that predictive take for example biomarkers like nt pro bnp and highly sensitive tnt these biomarkers are renally excreted and their levels are already increased in ckd again giving us a problem in diagnosis of heart failure and look at the left ventricular mass by echocardiography most of patients even without heart failure about 50 percent of them more than 50 have lv hypertrophy and increased lv mass so the diagnosis is rather challenging in patients with ckd and this is a study from Kansas City cardiomyopathy scoring where when they analyzed 3000 patients without clinical diagnosis of heart failure, at least 25% of them satisfied the criteria of heart failure, thereby proving that whether this score can be applied for early diagnosis and treatment. Next comes the most important part, how to treat congestion in CKD, whether to give diuretics or whether to do ultrafiltration or other RRT renal replacement therapy modes and we know that the fastest way of to treat failing heart is through the kidneys acute decomposition heart failure there is no doubt that our only armamentarium is decongest and decongest and regarding diuretic dose the problems of diuretic resistance was alluded to earlier and we all know and we we are doing this sequential nephron blockade combining furosemide with torus with uh, metalazone along with salt and water restriction and what is new is the concept of total nephron block i will come to that in the next slide regarding ultrafiltration the unload trial though it favored ultrafiltration the subsequent caris heart failure trial showed that there is no difference between ultrafiltration and diuretic therapy but what is noteworthy is the uh, presence of or the rise in creatinine 
by at least 0.9 to 1 in most of the patients with Keras heart failure trial. So this is frightening. When, when you do ultrafiltration, the creatinine rises and with that uh, ultrafiltration is no more favored, but it can be still offered to patients with resistant to diuretics. So this is the concept of total nephron blockade where all the segments of nephron, proximal tubule, middle erythic ascending limb, distal tubule, and collecting ducts are involved. They give astrozolamide 250 milligram three times with, along with IV furosemide, metalazone, and spironolactone. In this study, what it's a single center study from Detroit. You can see here the red uh, one, 32% were non-responders to this total nephron blockade. And these non-responders, most of them happen to be CKD patients. So CKD patients respond poorly to diuretic and in this study, they subjected these non-responder to dialysis and the death rate was 25% even after good dialysis. And you know the problems of hemodialysis in a patient with congestive heart failure, intradialytic hypotension causing myocardial stunning, arrhythmias, extremes of potassium related problems and high flow AV fistulas which gives rise to a left to right shunt and pressure on LV again. And renal replacement therapy, we are not sure when to start RRT. Even in our own AKA, the timing is still not clear. And modality, whether you, you have to do HD, hemodiafiltration, or ultrafiltration alone has to be decided. And frequency, how frequently, frequently you have to dialyze the patient has to be addressed. You see here hemodialysis mission, the aqueduct system, which is available in a few corporate hospitals, in which you can do the ultrafiltration using cannula inserted peripherally. And we do slow continuous ultrafiltration using CRRT machine also. Peritoneal dialysis, the neglected uh, uh, part of heart failure management in CKD. We, we all love peritoneal dialysis because it causes less hemodynamic stress and putting pressure on the heart at a milder way, not like hemodialysis. And response to diuretic, these patients preserve the renal out, urine output. So the, in, in the presence of a good urine output, the response to diuretic will be very good. So diuretic peritoneal dialysis is a neglected one and it was looked into by German group of uh, nephrologists and they found that hospitalization rate decreased significantly if you do peritoneal dialysis. And another group also looked into it. You can see the bar graph, uh, significant decrease in hospitalization, hospitalization rate following peritoneal dialysis. So what we require for improving outcome with regard to RRT is personalization. Don't offer all the modalities for one patient. For patient with uh, good urine output, peritoneal dialysis may be a good option. For ESRD, naturally hemodialysis. And studies have noted that in contrast to center hemodialysis, home hemodialysis is associated with better cardiovascular uh, outcome. And also nocturnal, daily nocturnal or short dialysis is good for patients with persistent hypotension. Iron deficiency, we approach iron deficiency in a different way than uh, cardiologist. We in uh, heart failure, even though the hemoglobin may be elevated, still iron administration helps this patient. And EPO is associated with poor outcome in heart failure patient with the normal kidney function. In contrast, in CKD, we have to use, we are forced to use it because the response will be very poor because of this associated cardiorenal uh, syndrome, cardiorenal anemias, which is heightened due to inflammation taking place. And these are the two trials which looked into anemia management in CKD population. And they observed that IV iron was equally beneficial in patients with EGFR less than 60. Coming to the problem of triple whammy of hypotension, hyperkalemia and renal impairment. If it results in treatment dose being decreased, medication discontinued, but you know, they don't tend to do well, especially in acute decompensated heart failure. You can see in this Trivandrum heart failure study, uh, sorry, uh, I think this, uh, you, in this projection, you can see the patients who have been stopped RAS inhibitors had more all cause mortality, 49% increase in all cause mortality and 29% increase in MACE outcome. So decreasing RAS blockers or RNE is associated with worser outcome, even if we force to discontinue, try to restart them so that for the betterment of the patient. And how to facilitate these uses of these drugs in uh, uh, these patients, you give dietary potassium restriction before starting the drug, discontinuation of potassium supplements like salt substitutes and drugs which can potentially cause hyperkalemia, add potassium wasting diuretic, 
oral potassium binders and newer drugs patromer and isotest 9 and it is my opinion isotest 9 may not be suitable to cardiologists because it causes sodium retention so patromer may be a better alternative this is a trial which showed that patromer is a very good enabler of ras therapy and it is being used in the west maybe in western india uh, i understand nephrologists are using patromer and now how to use it in presence of hyperkalemia if potassium is between 5.5 here even in potassium what we notice is cardiologists are very nervous with the potassium is 5 and 5.1 and they refer back the patient to us even in come the icus i see 5.1 patient is on uh, say sps sodium polystyrene sulfonate or calcium uh, binders but what, what is happening is nephrologists are a little bit rigid we wait till 5.5 you know so uh, 5.5 may be the better option 5.5 to 6 you either reduce the dose and observe if it is more than 6 then you have to terminate it temporarily and try to find out whether you can restart it and this is the algorithm for mrea the algorithm is different in that if it is 5.5 to 5.9 you can add sgl2 there is a scope for uh, decreasing the incidence of hyperkalemia by adding SGL2 inhibitors. And this is the, uh, about ARNI, hypotension, renal impairment and hyperkalemia. This hypotension, we, we use ARNI. In fact, off-label use also is being done we, in our department. We have used it even in dialysis patient. But watching the, they come to us every weekly twice. So we do watch their potassium. And in this uh, situation, the hypotension, we had two patients with severe hypotension. In fact, hypotension does not mean that our knee has to be stopped. It, hypotension would be symptomatic. We give more importance to symptomatic hypotension and our level is around 100. Anything less than 100, we don't wait. We just uh, decrease the dose. Though I boldly say symptomatic hypotension, the, there is a fear that it may worsen. And we have to stop diuretics. We have to stop the other anti apprehensive drug, especially alpha blockers. If the patient is on, you can very well stop them. And treat with other hypo, hypotensive uh, agents and correct hypovolemia. That is most often these patients would have you no know, sick day rules. Sick day rules are not followed by our patient when they have diarrhea, any illness. All SGL2 inhibitors and ARNI have to be reduced or stopped for, during sick days. Regarding renal impairment, 60 to 90 ml GFR, no alteration. 30 to 60, 25 milligram or 50 milligram two times. This is what we use in our patient, and less than. 30 better to avoid and how to titrate in the presence of renal impairment this is a UK, uh, European guide it is slightly different from what we practice they say wait up to serum creatinine increase up to 50 percent but we tolerate up to 30 percent only beyond 30 percent we tend to decrease and uh, we stop if it persists and in acute decompensated heart failure when a patient comes to us, see the brown one, he has uh, uh, worsening renal function, creatinine from 1.5, it goes up to 2.5, immediately you get jittery and stop ROS inhibitors. Once you stop ROS inhibitors, what happens? The creatinine comes down, potassium comes down, but the patient's symptom worsens and he dies. So we have to follow this step. We have to continue ROS, observe the potassium and creatinine, and if you do that, the patient improves, the myocardial function improves, heart failure improves, the renal perfusion improves and creatinine may improve. So we have to cut this samsara cycle of Buddhism. And regarding gold directed medical therapy, this slide has been dealt with already, but we must know that despite initial dip, heart failure therapy reduces the subsequent decline in rate of GFR. SGL2 inhibitors, in nephrologists, there's a group of nephrologists, we are called the flozinators. Flozinators are increasing in, in our group of late. And these flozinators, use uh, SGL2 inhibitors and it was alluded to earlier by our uh, Sujit. So it's a fourth pillar. Now uh, ACC, ASC new guideline, we are, we are yet to use it, we are not aware, but roughly what I can tell you is if the GFR is more than 60, you can use all the four guideline directed medical therapy with the normal dose of SGL2, all other drugs low dose, increase it after a week or uh, fortnight. If it is 30 by 60, 30 to 60, use three drugs. Keep MRA as a reserve. If the, if the potassium does not rise, you can add MRA after two weeks. If it is 15 to 30, use two drugs. And if the GFR is more than 20, you can use add SGL2 inhibitors. Use three drugs in this group. And EGFR less than 15, 
Only one drug can be used, beta blockers, because they have the drugs which is proven to have benefit of survival in ESRD patient and stage 5 CKD. And in these patients also, if the potassium is not rising, there is a role for AC inhibitors. So, Kindly sum up, sir. Yeah, yeah, I am summing up. So, beta blockers have shown real survival benefit in this population. ICD uh, and uh, CRT, equivocal results are there. And we have to have a multidisciplinary approach in, in a musket, cardiologist and nephrologist, diabetologist and nephrologist, we used to sit together and conduct a diabetic nephroclinic. So also cardiologists and nephrologists can sit together and conduct a multidisciplinary clinic to improve the heart survival. And thank you very much. Thank you for patient listening. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was a wonderful talk. Any questions from the audience? Uh, In the SGL2, SGLT2 trials in uh, kidney failure patients, renal failure patients, once they reach the renal replacement therapy in the trials, what happened to the SGLT2 inhibitors? Were they stopped or did they continue? If they were continued, what was the adverse outcome? Sir, uh, what you are telling is going to come. The emperor reduced, they are looking into less than 20. You know, when they treat less than 20, during initial, they, they may slip into stage 5. So. The emperor uh, reduced trial subgroup analysis is going to come. They are looking into less than 20. What then I understood, only we will come to what I understood even in the previous trials, they continued and nothing happened. You may not get a hypoglycemic action, but yeah. renal protection and cardio protection will remain. I, I suppose, I suppose, I am not a nephrologist, but I suppose there is no contraindication from renal or cardiac perspective for SGLT2 inhibitors. Am I right? So uh, we were doing both emperor reduced and emperor preserved. And if a person was taken with an EGFR of over 20, and during the trial it came down, the drug was continued. And because you know, yeah. we know that uh, yeah. this is an artificial reduction of yeah, true, uh, EGFR true. because of uh, reduced pressure inside the glomerular, and that's how it is protective. Yeah. And the proof for that was that once the drug was stopped, then the EGFR has jumped up again. So there is no contraindication. Yeah, true. But there is a fear amongst people. If you start SGL2 inhibitors, that initial dip may push the patient into severe Yeah, but that failure. is an artificial. Yeah. They, we have that to tolerate is, it. Yeah, we have to tolerate it exactly. and pursue the drug. So we have to understand that, that it is, the EGFR will come down on paper, but otherwise on a long term, it is nephroprotective and it is only an artificial dip. Yeah. Continuation was Chopra sir asked, uh, the patient uh, whom I have been following for years and now it's a gradual decline, nephro, uh, nef nephrological volume loss, uh, uh, parenchymal fibrosis and in, in, in kidney gamma. So the EGFR is, I started at 34, the earnings and all quadruple therapy. Now EGFR is 22, 21 and some acute insulin it plummets and comes back again. So, would you continue with RAS inhibition? As you said, that in during hemodialysis, in in, in your deliberation, you you still use uh, uh, Arnis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, any unscrupulous nephrologist would stop all RAS inhibition, we, which we build up with much ado. So, is there any role of ongoing cardiovascular protection? As all this symposia has been, kidney disease is a is a risk factor for for ongoing uh, cardiac worsening, and then we build up with much ado. And then it's some, some goes to somebody, oh, yeah, this is a nephrotoxic drug, stops. So all form of RAS inhibitions are stopped. So would you vociferously say here, so RAS inhibition, of course, with potassium monitoring, has to be continued, even if the EGFR, as Sir is asking, below 10 or... No, uh, see, it depends on the nephrologist. For example, some of us are very much scared about hyperkalemia. If a patient is dependable, if he can come to your office for checking up potassium and creatinine, we, we do have patients who are, in fact, there is a recent study uh, published in CALM trial where they have shown that using RAS inhibitors in severe renal failure, it is associated with preservation of GFR. It is associated with preservation is the current trial result. So it, it all depends on one's mindset. If one is bold enough and if the patient is reliable, you can prescribe, ask him to come back and he should adhere to the dietary restriction. And we have to see that other drugs which can potentially elevate potassium are not there. And you know, because cardiac, cardi cardiovascular benefit sake, they have to be on it. 
that is my feeling oh, most Thank of the the kdgo trials all that mention that ras inhibition and as inhibition are the only proven benefits of reducing uh, retarding progression of kidney disease so they say maximize the dose if there is hyperkalemia start these patients on patiromer and continue the ras believe it or not our ckd patient most of them do not reach a develop dialysis they do have cardiovascular disease no if you thank take hundred patients thank you yeah you, thank you professor patnavam just we close you, the thank, second session yeah uh, thank you for having us as chairpersons thank thank you very much uh, we are <coughs> today was the carmi day cardio renal metabolic so we are moving from renal into the metabolic arena and we are on time so i request dr babu ayumalai dr girish dr mohan rao dr tilakudi to join on the dais and start the proceedings and if uh, and i i understand that at least two people have come so we'll start the session so dr babu ayumalai dr mohan rao 66 dr tilagavathi you can start the proceedings i think uh, dr venkatakrishnan and dr aishwarya are already here dr mohan is also here so dr chatpasa chandrashekar also i think is here so you can start the proceedings and thank you for a full house very rarely you see a full house in uh, on a working day good afternoon everybody so uh, we will be starting with uh, this our uh, session on diabetes and heart failure and i would request uh, the first speaker to uh, deliver the talk dr uh, venkata krishnan on identifying high risk patients physicians perspective good afternoon everyone so very important topic for me i thank the organizers for giving this topic this will be more without pictures but a topic which was very interesting to me which i wanted to talk this will be based on as a physician if a patient with diabetes is coming to me how will i identify this patient is going to have a cardiac failure is he at risk of cardiac failure that's what is the core topic i'll uh, try to finish within 10 12 minutes so we can have some discussion i will try to help and as fast as possible so smooth slides from a species species perspective what is my call on a diabetic patient that's what we are going to discuss here everything is diabetes is an independent risk factor everybody know we all know all the theory i am not going to discuss what is coming a heart study said was two fold in men and five fold in women that is a risk of heart failure in a diabetic patients that's definitely increase and after adjusting the other risk factors we know all the risk factors age hypertension and various risk factors in spite of that being a diabetic there is a increased incidence of heart failure that's what the observation from the framingham study this is very important this is what is a core one in any diabetic patient there is ventricular dysfunction in spite of a normal bp no evidence of cad that is what is diabetic cardiomyopathy this is due to increased vulnerability of the myocardium to dysfunction in individuals with diabetes there are various trials 
ACAD, UKPDS, advanced trials. What they told was, they were not uh, concentrated on heart failure alone. They assess the risk of mortality from cardiovascular event. What they observed was intensive glycemic control definitely had a higher risk of cardiovascular event and morbidity and mortality. That's what was the message from ACCORD, UKPDS, advanced trials. Despite very important, despite achieving HbA1c with multiple drugs, various therapies did not address cardiovascular outcomes. This was a previous drugs, what are the drugs? The newer drugs in line, in pipeline now have very good effects on cardiac function. Apart from this, are there any additional factors in diabetic patient, in a diabetic patient, which contributes to a cardiovascular disease, cardiac failure specifically? The observations that just glycemic control is not sufficient to prevent increased hospitalization and mortality from heart failure. It is a clear fact that with a tight glycemic control, in spite of that, a patient may develop heart failure. That's what is a catch in diabetes. This explains the fact that there is an independent mechanism which in interlinks the therapy and LV remodeling. Beyond the structural and functional changes that occur with ca diabetic cardiomyopathy as we discussed, there is a complex physiology which underlies. So one of my slides may be overlapping uh, Dr. Chantasekas, Professor Chantasekas. With, without that, I could not, uh, uh, physician's pers perspective is not complete, which we should know to say it how a diabetic patient, what has to be assessed in a diabetic patient to find out the risk of cardiac failure. What is important, as everybody knows, there is a LV mass which is thick in diabetic. LV wall is thick, progressively worsening, which is subclinical initially. The ARIC study provided evidence for subclinical myocardial damage, which a prop I in patients with diabetes and found that there is a elevation from the mean baseline value in a diabetic patient. Apart from this, tissue hypoxia induced by a microvascular dysfunction and impaired myocardial perfusion. Apart from a CAD, this happens in a diabetic patient which further contributes to the alteration in LV remodeling. Various therapies are there which can contribute to increased risk of cardiac disease in diabetes. So previously we thought if you have a diabetic, good diabetic control, you may have a very good control on all comorbidities. But heart failure is somewhat different from others. How other mechanisms with current anti-hyperglycemic therapies link cardiac failure? That's what is a slide. Next slide. I'm not going anywhere, Dr. Chantasekhar will be discussing everything about this. If you see, these are the things we should concentrate. Altered myocardial substrate metabolism. Myocardial biogenetics. Oxidative stress. Lipotoxicity. Inflammation. Endothelial reticulum stress. Insulin signaling. Beta 2 adrenergic receptor signaling. GRK2 signaling. Renin angiotensin signaling, autophagy is which happens in ribosomes and advanced glycation end products. These are the aspects how these are addressed with respect to each therapy will decide whether a, a diabetic patient is going for a heart failure at risk or you are going to increase his risk because with the therapies. So you should know what are the therapies used with the advent of anyway SGLT2 in the pipeline Definitely, it is going to be the next molecule to prevent a cardiovascular or a renal disease. So, with this, the mechanism will be discussed separately. I am not going to. So, finalize whatever said and done, these two definitely 
without glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity there is no heart event i cannot say that sir you told me intensive glycemic control is going to affect the heart it is nothing like that it is definitely useful you should have a optimal glycemic control that's what occurred ekpds and advanced trials too these two is definite the component of insulin resistance high ras activity and oxidative stress this is the almost a concealed one how we get oxidative stress being a diabetic what are the ways you may be exposed to increased oxidative stress anyway uh, all the mechanisms will be discussed in a separate uh, the next talk so from my perspective as a physician what i know as the risk factors what i know in a diabetic who will go for a cardiac failure so we all know obesity age sedentary lifestyle hypertension smoking ethanol abuse duration of diabetes cad ckd definitely ckd is almost a has a increased risk of cardiovascular event which was discussed in the previous session sulfonylurea and insulin so something you should be amused why insulin is there in the list insulin causes subclinical retention fluid and in case increase the interstitial edema and weight gain and it has some concealed effects on the cardiac function so insulin not that previous insulins that is why we got analogs in pipeline analogs and coming to degludec and we have the fast acting insulin as part analogs definitely had effects on the cardiac stabilization conventional insulin have a st stacking effect what do you call the stacking effect is there is definite fluctuations in a 24 hour which is not good for the heart which is minimized glycemic variability is minimized and fluid retention is also minimized with the analogs sulfonylurea definitely there are two receptors ser and SU, ser1 and 2 the sulfonylurea first generation second generation were not specific for the ser1 receptors it causes other effects that is why sulfonylurea specifically have effect on the ischemic preconditioning that's what is the problem with they deter or inhibit ischemic preconditioning and prevent new collateral coronary vascular formation that's what happens with the sulfonylurea the newer third generation glycoside and glimepiride except for the risk of hypoglycemia they are very good drugs okay. so anyway time is up others what we should know is these are the concealed aspects toxins uv radiation heavy metal which we don't know what we are taking which we don't know why what we are taking whatever fast foods whatever in the market whatever vegetables what you get pesticides pollutants we don't know what we are taking i am without any abuse smoking it still i get a cardiac failure mostly it is due to oxidative stress the last one the last slide from my side a genetic aspect is definitely there you can now genetic studies are there any diabetic patients who have been diagnosed you can have a microRNA done microRNAs are specific RNAs which can predict not alone the cardiac disease any disease specific in association with microRNAs these are the specific RNAs cardiac hypertrophy heart failure and DC to take some points this is a summary anyway what we discuss glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity we can never ignore free fatty acid accumulation in the heart it is it's never ignored drugs as i told you you should know what drug to be prescribed in a diabetes to prevent heart injury oxidative stress i have discussed various gene testing and risk sources are available who can which can say whether you are at risk of heart failure or not thanks for the opportunity given thank you thank you dr vangri krishnan for highlighting the importance of both diabetes and heart failure so as you said the risk factors are more towards the age and also hypertension obesity and ckd so these are the predominant risk factors so apart from that since there is an interval in, there are about uh, 10 to 30 percent of the patients with uh, diabetes are more prone for heart failure likewise 30 to 40 percent of the heart failure patients will present with uh, 
diabetes. I think it is a very good presentation, a crisp presentation. I think it's time for the forum to discuss. Any queries to be addressed can be addressed now. So other than that, we can, we can move on to the next topic, diabetes and heart failure, to be presented by Professor Chandra Shekhar from Stanley Medical College. Professor HOD of Stanley Medical College. Yeah, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, uh, my thanks to Dr. Habregam. Uh, today, Yeah, my talk is on uh, the diabetes and heart failure, and uh, most of my talk is being uh, made easy by the, my previous speaker, Dr. Venkateshwaran. Yeah. Okay. We all know that, like, uh, we uh, <coughs> micro and macrovascular complications. Like, uh, so we talk much about these micro and macrovascular complications, but one thing which we uh, forget is the heart failure. So both the micro and macrovascular complication, most of the time, it culminates in a heart failure, which is most of frequent in our diabetic population and it's fatal to and unfortunately it is one of the forgotten entity but after the covid like we have been seeing witnessing the lot of awareness on the cardiac failure part of it and there is a lot of concern about this cardiac failure also so this is a slide just to it's a bit old slide but still it's worth uh, uh, mentioning here uh, even after a decade of its publication so this is a study which is done in 581 patients with diabetes who have been diagnosed as having a heart failure after the echocardiographic assessment and of these 581 patients and uh, 161 patients were had previously unknown heart failure so this is very much alarming so it's a bit old data but it's worth uh, remembering this data and of them like 133 were having a preserved ejection fraction heart failure and uh, 28 almost 4.8 percentage of them were had reduced ejection fraction so there are some staggering uh, statistics like uh, nearly 70 percentage of the people with uh, type 2 diabetes they show signs of loss of cardiac uh, uh, function within five years of diagnosis and many of them, they land up with heart failure if the, uh, the high risk factors were not being properly addressed. And diabetes is not just a bystander, it can contribute to the development of heart failure by various uh, pathophysiological means, which I uh, show it in the next slide. In simple, the diabetic begets heart failure and heart failure begets diabetes. So this is uh, the slide which illustrates the how the, uh, the diabetes uh, increases the propensity to develop a heart failure. I just want to have your attention a bit on this. We all know the fact that like every one percentage increase in the HPA1C increases the heart failure by eight percentage. So there are various means by which heart failure can cause, uh, uh, I mean diabetes can cause heart failure. Like uh, there are the three main uh, factors, the hyperglycemia, the insulin resistant and hyperinsulinemia. We know that like all these things can increase the risk of one developing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease as well as hypertension. So those things can cause cardiomyopathy and can result in cardiac failure. But what is more interesting is the metabolic disturbances. Nowadays we talk more about the, as we know the scientific advances, we learn more about the the metabolic functions of each and every cells like uh, so that's where like most of our we do have mitochondrial modulator we do have sglt2 inhibitor all these things are acting at the enzyme level and the cellular level so this is one thing is the decreased glucose oxidation not only the oxidation the uptake as well as the glycolysis is affected in patients with uh, uncontrolled diabetes in addition to that we all know that like the heart is a very energetic uh, metabolically active organ so it derives almost 60 to 70 percentage of its energy from the free fatty acid but what happens in patients with uh, uncontrolled diabetes the energy is almost 90 to 100 percentage from free fatty acids so as a result what happens you get lipotoxicity not only the lipotoxicity once this uh, the free fatty acid uh, free fatty acid goes for oxidation the end products also so say for example the diacylglycerol triacylglycerol and uh, ceramides which accumulates inside the cell and results in fibrosis and stiffening of the uh, the cells eventually the the fibrosis cell apoptosis and the cell death and the loss of function in addition to that there is reduced expression of the circa we all know that there is a reduced ability to take up the calcium inside the sarcoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum inside the cardiac myocytes as a result there is a 
impaired calcium handling hence there is a poor contractile function so this is not only that there are some structural alterations also in the form of cardiac myocyte hypertrophy as well as age deposition so these are all some of the things like which occurs at the cellular level causing alteration both in the structure as well as in the function resulting in cardiac failure of course the slide which you see on the right side which illustrates the the various pathways the up regulation and down regulation some of them were mentioned by my previous speaker if you see this slide it's quite alarming to see that the uh, a patient with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease the risk of uh, having a cardiovascular death is almost to four to five times more in patients who have a heart failure a patient with a stable heart uh, a patient with a reduced ejection fraction patient with a diabetic with heart failure with the NUHA classification 2 and no reason hospitalization carries the risk of 10 percentage but once they develop a, a worsening of the heart failure or hospitalization the risk goes to up to 40 percentage so this is a very humongous value which one should remember so let us see the uh, so these are all some of the statistics which uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, the uh, illustrates the, the heart failure can be deadlier than many of the cancers when compared to the colon or lymphoma or leukemia and so on. The risk of death in five years is almost 48 percentage once they develop a yeah, heart failure. Let us briefly see the stages of the heart failure. So this is stage one is someone who is at risk of developing a heart failure. Say for example, patient with hypertension, CVD, or obesity or sleep disorders and diabetes once they develop the uh, pre-heart uh, stage i'll show you in the next slide they'll go to the if they are not uh, treated they go into the stage of symptoms and uh, the advanced stages once they go into the stage three the trajectory can be of new onset or resolution of the symptoms or they may go for the persistence of the heart failure or worsening so these are all the some of the structural changes which can take place inside the heart with the uncontrolled diabetes, systolic as well as the diastolic dysfunction. The diabetes per se is known to increase the left ventricular mass and the thickness and volume also. There is chamber enlargement and it can result in increased filling pressure. So the classification, of course, we all know how we can classify reduced and improved ejection fraction and mid-range and preserved ejection fraction i don't want to dwell on that but what we need to remember is a patient even with a class 2 can progress to develop a, a cardiovascular morbidity so this is the slide which illustrate even in patients who are on class 1 and class 2 they can end up facing the fatality almost by 34 percentage when compared to one who is in the class 3 and class 4 where the mortality rate is 42 Again, this is a very basic slide. I don't want to go into how we can diagnose a heart failure. This is uh, the, uh, with regard to the investigation, which we can do start with ECG. Normal ECG essentially rules out a heart failure in 90 percentage of the cases. So this is very much important. We should not only look for the rate, uh, I mean, chamber enlargement, the QRS, QT prolongation, uh, LEA overload, uh, bundle branch block there are so many variables which we should look for in the the 12 lead ecg of course or the cornerstone in the therapy of diagnosis of uh, heart failure is the transthoracic tte chest x-ray is a valuable tool and of course natriuretic peptide i like to dwell a little bit on this the utility value of these biomarkers particularly in patients with the dyspnea it help us to diagnose or exclude the patients with heart failure Similarly, as somebody with uh, at risk of developing a heart failure, this is again a class of recommendation 2A, the uh, bio serial and uh, evaluation of the, the uh, uh, NT pro BNP will help us to uh, predict the development of or even prevent the development of heart failure in the patients with diabetics. So one which we need to remember is the, the patients with the diabetic with the elevated NT pro BNP or troponin S. They have got almost 10 times the event rate than those who have neither. This one has to remember and this is another prognostic scoring which you can get it in the net very easily. Like this is a kidney score for heart failure in diabetes. 
which is more common, which heart failure is more common in diabetes. We do have some uh, data. Of course, the Indian registry is something different. And uh, this is a Swedish registry where it shows that the most of our diabetic patients, they do have more than 50 percentage of them. They do likely to have the preserved ejection fracture. Most of them are older, female, and having a history of CKD and hypertension. The, those people with ejection fraction less than 40 are more likely to have ischemic heart disease. Whereas the, uh, the Trivandrum uh, Heart Registry is one of the first organized heart registry uh, developed in India, which shows that most of our patients they had in the study population in the registry, most of them, almost close to more than 70 percentage of them, they had reduced ejection fraction. Again, this is the uh, guidelines which is issued by the API with regard to the, uh, the management of heart failure. So the components of heart failure therapy, of course, we need to correct the underlying factors, including the obesity and sleep disorders, and much is being said about the, the importance of uh, the CKD part of it. And of course, they need to adhere to some strict lifestyle modification, and of course, the drugs. So this is the pillars, the five pillars, using AC or ARB in a prelicin inhibitor, ARNI, we have beta blocker, MRA, and SGLT2 inhibitors. We have some new drugs are also in the kit. So I don't want to again go into how we can treat a patient with heart failure with diabetes. And most of the recommendation, they endorse the, or the usage of SGLT2 inhibitor, both empagliflozin and tapagliflozin, and of course, canagliflozin in patients with heart failure. So I just skipped some of these slides for want of time. These are all some of the drugs. Ivabradin is a very good drug when the heart rate is more than 70, particularly in patients with reduced ejection fraction. Vesicuat and uh, digoxin and PUFA and uh, potassium binders were some of the drugs which can be used. But it did not, those drugs, they do not have any mortality benefits. So this is my last slide. So showing that like the, the importance of targets. So there is an article which was published in Indian Heart Journal way back in 2017, like it shows that the heart rate should be in patients with heart failure. It should be less than 70, blood pressure should be less than 130 by 80, and preferably we need to have an optimal HPA1C with a BMI of less than 25, and six minute walk test, the patient should be walk up to uh, 400 meters. So never forget the iron deficiency is one of the most common thing which we can see in patients with heart failure with or without anemia. So one has to address that preferably with the FCM and adult vaccinations like uh, the influenza and pneumococcal vaccines are also must in the uh, therapeutic ornamentarium when we are treating a diabetic patient with heart failure. So finally, to conclude, there is a strong bi-directional association between diabetes and uh, heart failure and the diagnosis of heart failure is most of the cases it's missed and uh, heart failure is the most important, most preventable and uh, importantly, it's, it's a treatable cardiovascular complication of type 2 diabetes. Patients with type 2 diabetes and heart failure have multiple pathophysiological mechanisms such as the hypertension, CAD and CKD, and of course, some of the immune dysregulation also. Optimal HPNC control is must in patients with the diabetes with heart failure. And of course, the use of ARNI and uh, SGLT2 inhibitors can influence the evolution and progression of the heart failure. So with this, I conclude my talk and thank you all for the patient listening. So thank you, Professor Chandra Shekhar for that uh, eye-opening presentation. But uh, the one, only one thing which, which I noticed in this, you have missed by giving it metformin. So both metformin and empagliflozin have proved to be more effective in the management of heart failure. So but I, you have covered the entire uh, picture. I think it is open for the forum to discuss. Any queries, please? Yes, sir. So, yeah, so I think the, uh, the journal did not uh, mention that, but uh, as per the ESC guidelines, anything more than 125, uh, picogram, it should be taken as uh, the value of importance. Of course, it's a dynamic value, it varies with the age 
and uh, some of the even the indian references say that like more than 500 gram uh, 500 picogram is uh, said to be the uh, the uh, the uh, yardstick which we should look for particularly in the aging population so uh, as per the esc guidelines the value the cutoff value is 125 picogram yeah Patient is already on SU? Yeah, both the drugs. Both the drugs. Yeah, with the modern uh, SU, like uh, we don't find anything, like uh, particularly with the glycoside and uh, glimipride. So there are some articles. Uh, of course, we have learned much about the uh, the recently concluded Carolina, where they used glimipride with uh, linagliptin, which uh, the uh, did not show any non inferiority to linagliptin as far as the CV safety is concerned. So as far as the patient is able to tolerate and patient uh, uh, is not going to likely to go for a, a hypoglycemia, I would like to continue it. So because the patient is already on board with uh, sulfonylurea and SGLT2 inhibitor, as you said. So what would be the optimal uh, glycated hemoglobin? Because they say it's 6.5 or 7, because irrespective of the glycemic control, so people are at risk for developing this uh, cardiovascular risk and going for uh, yes, heart failure. Yeah, we need to be very careful with that kind of thing, sir. We need not be more stringent and it should be individualized and preferably uh, HPA1C between 7 to 8 would be of better as far as uh, the uh, glycemic control is control, uh, concerned. So but we need UKPDS, not be so strict UKPDS about UKPDS the... UKPDS study says optimal would be around 6.5. So the patient has Indian... already developed complication. The patient has... A, it's a burnt out case. The patient already developed a failing heart. Like in such patients like... Uh, uh, the uh, hypoglycemia would be a great threat to his uh, life, sir. It could be even fatal. Sir, I have a question. Um, so, thanks for uh, lucidly explaining about the various mechanisms leading to heart failure and diabetes. So, which among these is there any study which states that, uh, you know, you have told uh, lipotoxicity, cellular signaling, sexual alterations, which do you think or is there any study which says that which among these may be contributing more? So uh, the thing is glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity equally contributes because the, the culprit is starting with the glucotoxicity. So the thing is, so when the glucose is not being met utilized properly, when there is an excess of glucose, the thing is converted into the enters the, uh, the uh, fatty acid oxidation cycle and you will have more elevation of the thing. So the thing starts with the glucotoxicity and uh, goes via the lipotoxicity and culminating in a cellular dysfunction, probably a mitochondrial a dysfunction as well. Marker. So I think Dr. Parandaman would be able to answer that question. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> EPI e prime is for cardiac function. And the same thing, sir, as asked, its optimal control will be 7 and not less than 7, sir. We cannot bring less than 7, especially to prevent the cardiovascular mortality. The So keep it seven and seven above seven. So that so thank you so much for your uh, outstanding presentation. One more, yes. We all know that heart failure is a very morbid condition, and it's a state of chronic inflammation, and which contributes yes. to the stress at several levels, be it microcellular, be it in the macrocellular level. Does it have, I mean, in the patient who is having a, a heart, a, a, for example, if a patient comes to my clinic for HFREF, do I need to uh, keep in mind that 
the RN metabolism along with the chronic heart failure, like for example, uh, transferrin saturation or something like that, in its long term therapy. Long term therapy. In its in the long term elevation of the in the long term ameliorating the symptoms of the patient. Since heart failure is a chronic condition, it's a uh, condition of chronic inflammation. Does it have any correlation with the iron metabolism? And does iron uh, an iron profile needs to be checked at, at different iodine. intervals? Iodine. Iron. 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 Iodine. Iron. 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 Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, iron is a very important thing. Like because like, yes, yes, yes. yes it's I'm a valid you. question. Like because like uh, the thing is, uh, patients with the heart failure. They do get uh, the alteration in the uh, iron no, absorption and other things. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Like we need to look for that. That is one of the. That's what I have projected in one of my slide. Like the iron metabolism. Definitely, it's a cause and effect of heart failure. So which we need to remember. And if the iron saturation, we need to do some uh, markers. So if the iron, uh, I mean serum ferritin level less than hundred, and the uh, the uh, saturation if it is less than twenty percent, definitely they need to be given FCMs. And second is in the four foundational pillars of heart failure, in the MRA, what do you prefer? Do we go with the steroidal, and now do we go with the non-steroidal, which like finlanone? Yeah, of course we do have some after this uh, the uh, recent drug. Like uh, we do have some evidence, but I don't have much evidence with that. Of course, we have used a lot of uh, the uh, the uh, steroidal MRAs, like uh, the uh, uh, spinolactone. spinolactone and plirinone. And another thing is, is there a correlation between heart failure, worsening of heart failure along with underlying stress and anxiety? Suppose if a patient is a, a patient of depression, does it contribute to the progression of heart failure? And do we also need to tackle that problem also? Along yeah, with we failure? need to have a holistic approach, like because the, that's where the counseling to the patient, like what the heart failure means, what are all the symptoms of heart failure, and what when they should press up present to the doctor how often they should go for the monitoring and yeah, other things what most, all these the most important component is maintenance of compliance isn't yes, it yes yes so all those kind of things so the counseling definitely will alleviate the, their anxiety and stress because in the, lo in the long term yes therapy. definitely it's one of the uh, component which has to be looked upon yeah thank you thank, thank you, you dr chandrasekhar Thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor Chandrasekhar. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, so your talk topic has uh, kindled a lot of interest, and everybody has started discussing. So good. Uh, with the same spirit, we'll go to the next topic. I invite Dr. K. Morgan uh, to talk about uh, glucocentric drugs in cardiovascular disease protection and heart failure. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me start with thanking. Uh, Dr. Abraham Mooman and Dr. Chandrasekhar for giving me this podium to interact with you. I'd be talking about the glucocentric drugs in cardiovascular disease protection and heart failure. See, uh, this is off to cited slide. We understand that there's an increase in cardiovascular mortality and morbidity, including heart failure and atrial fibrillation, secondary to diabetes. We also understand that there's a lot of link between mortality and diabetes. But the minus point is that we still haven't proved what till the SGLT2 and GLP-1 analog scheme, we didn't have armamentorium which could directly affect. So what we were doing is we were taking care of the smoking cessation, lipid, blood pressure, weight loss, and the metabolic syndrome we were addressing. The downside is none of this treated heart failure or mortality secondary to this thing. UKPDS, which is the biggest proponer of saying that control of diabetes is very important, also put it as the third factor beyond hypertension and just once the failure or uh, any complication is established. So what we could do was very little. That is from where we are moving. But we need to understand that there are other uh, factors playing havoc in a CV mortality of patients. Like in fact, we used to, when the, in nephropathy talks, we used to say like, in India, most people don't go for PVD or nephropathy because they die due to a heart condition earlier than that. Those things have changed a lot. But that said, we still understand that they are threefold higher to have, an, uh, 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 have a, a CV risk factor or a stroke compared to an risk of MI or death, number one. Number two, 
the lesions are smaller, much earlier, much longer. Any person having an MI, a diabetic having an MI, fares worse even with the best treatment. Therefore, we still are groping for something better to do. This is the evidence to show that metformin, the first drug which I like to address about in terms of glucocentric drug which has some effect on heart disease is metformin and this slide shows that it is able to reduce myocardial infarction, all cause mortality and any diabetes related event. The finding that metformin can mo moderate or small, small the myocardial infarct size and helps in remodeling in animal models. This, need, this has not been shown in human beings, but it has been shown in animal, animal models, number one. Metformin has reduced the risk of reinfarction and all-cause mortality once started. It has, in, in, in fact, it has decreased CHF also. Protection against cardiovascular diseases appears to be independent of its uh, glycemic uh, reduction. As I already alluded to, UKPDS was able to show that reduction of diabetes is very, very important, the thing. Secondary in work analysis with 342 overweight patients treated with metformin showed a greater beneficial effect on all diabetes related endpoints including 39% risk reduction for myocardial infarction. This is what we have, right. Thiosulidine dions, this the, the what do you call uh, the uh, pioglitazone and rosiglitazone was available. Rosiglitazone started the idea in 2008 that every drug which is coming new should undergo a cardiovascular evaluation. Because even at that stage, we were looking at only non-inferiority or do not harm a patient if possible with your diabetic drug. That was our idea even in 2008. Compared to ROSI, PIO showed that it was able to lower triglyceride, one of the few drugs which can increase HDL. We still don't know if increasing HDL helps and has got a neutral effect on LDL. It can lower blood pressure, it can lower microalbuminuria, it can exert anti-inflammatory property, it can effort uh, antioxidative uh, stress. And it is one of the two drugs in diabetology which has shown regression of the carotid edema of medial thickness, which previously we used to accept it as a uh, as, as an alternate sign to say that your atherosclerosis regresses. post hoc analysis with patients of previous myocardial infarction showed that there was significant benefit up to 20% reduction in non-fatal myocardial infarction and around 37% reduction in acute coronary syndromes. And a meta-analysis of 19 different studies showed that there was a lowering of risk of composite death and myocardial infarction bar stroke. We also see, saw that in the non in the stop NADDM trail, these were one of the few drugs which could help us in IGT because number of years we spend in IGT, more and more we spend in IGT, longer our macrovascular problem starts than itself. Alpha glucosidase inhibitors, mainly acarbose needs to have a word here. Again, these have shown to be beneficial, not curative. Acorbos can lower the lower triglyceride levels, body weight, and systolic blood pressure. When used in people with impaired IGT, acorbos slowed the progression of carotid edema medial thickness with a 50%. This is the one another drug. Moreover, in stop NADDM trail, acorbos subjects with impaired IGT, a significant reduction in the risk of myocardial infarction, a 34% relative risk reduction in the incident of new case of hypertension was also observed. So, and we all already see it because it is an, uh, you know, it prevents the, uh, uh, prevents the increase in the postprandial hyperglycemia, the oxidative stress which occurs due to a, like a tsunami we've seen the slide many times, the oxidative stress is reduced because of that factor, so it is shown to be helpful. These were all drugs which were meant to be cardiac supportive, and many of the other drugs could be cardiac neutral, but we'll come to the two drugs which could help in treatment of cardiac problems, the GLP-1 analog and sglt 2 The GLP-1 analogs we all know, of which there are lots now, including the initial liraglutide, semaglutide, albiglutide, once a week exenatide, dulaglutide and oral semaglutide, which is the latest split on the block, of which lexinatide did not show any reduction in mace, oral semaglutide is still undergoing such uh, uh, this thing. These are the doses which it can be given. We should see that there are only some of these things need a dose reduction when you use it in CKD. So in a common problem, that is very easy if you can continue the same dosage because this don't cause hypoglycemia also, it doesn't cause weight gain, so it is much easier to continue these drugs. 
of the drugs that has been studied, the leader with liragrotide, uh, 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 XL with weakly exenatide, and rewind with dulaglutide are the three things which showed superiority. Other, other drugs showed non-inferiority in reduction or treatment of maze point points. Meta-analysis of cardiovascular outcomes trailed with GLP-1 RAs examined an overall effect of this class of drugs. In the meta-analysis, which included 33,000 dot patients, it showed that there was a significant reduction of three-point maze, cardiovascular mortality and all-cause mortality when compared to a placebo. When this one minus point is that some of these people had uh, developed uh, pancreatitis, but when they looked up for, when they took away this problems also, side effects also, what they say is across the board, all trials, did not increase the mortality due to cardiac death. They both, uh, the GLP-1 RAs both impact on cardiovascular risk factors such as blood pressure as well as direct effects via atherogenesis, inflammatory pathways and endothelial function. GLP-1 RA treatment has demonstrated a consistent reduction in weight and blood pressure from 1 millimeters to 3 millimeters. We need to understand that this is 24, 365, this effect would be there. In addition, GLP-1 peptides have been linked to a reduction in reactive oxygen species in the endothelial cells and cardiomyocytes. Infusion of GLP-1 in human subjects has resulted in improvement in the left ventricular function, hemodynamics and ischemic injury. That is the reason we have this, uh, these drugs have been kept up front. The SGLT2s, which have, which are, which have been there almost a decade now with us, the three main SGLT2s best studied are the EMPA, CANA and DAPA. And they are not usually, so far they are not recommended below an EGFR of 30. There are studies for EGFR below, below 20 as it's already been alluded to. The mechanism seems to be on twofold. One, it changes the way in which the metabolism works in the heart. So there is a direct effect, number one. Number two, there appears to be an a predominantly reduction in the atherothrombotic drugs due to GLP, whereas here, the burden of heart failure seems to come down in, by these drugs. This may be because it alters the mito mitochondrial at the level of mitochondria or improves the fibrotic uh, structure itself. There, newer, you know, every year we've been listening to newer and newer uh, addresses there. It increases red blood cell protection, production and thereby increases the release of hormone called erythropoietin. This helps increase in the oxygen carrying capacity. So there are multiple ways in which it seems to affect the heart's pumping. It also has an effect on the sympathetic activity, reduces intravascular volume and increases circulating ketone bodies. These are different effects through which their primary effect of protection of the heart has been alluded to. We, okay, there are one more question is that can it be used as a primary this thing? We should understand that primary the thing is usually due to atherosclerosis where GLP-1 RAs would do better, whereas if you're looking at primary chance of heart failure, then an SGLT2 would do better. In a patient without diabetes, SGLT2s have been tried with some amount of success, including reduction of heart failure. Drugs under investigation, dual mode of action. There, is, uh, several, there are several drugs which are under investigation of which the dual incretin therapies of GLP-1 and GAP hormone seems to be very promising, it's yet to come and yet to see what it is. So finally, I leave you with this thought. Possibly if in patients who do not have other comorbidities where you can either start in GLP-1 or SGLT-2, a person with history of heart failure or chance for more or need for more renal protection would go in for SGLT-2 as the first drug. A person with a burden of atherosclerosis, overweight and weight loss is important, possibly and GLP-1 would go first. So that would be a way of where to use which would be the, the thing. Thank you. So thank you for that mind-blowing presentation, Dr. Mohan. Thank you. I think you have covered the entire uh, uh, issues with regard to the usage of uh, anti-diabetic and in heart failure especially. And bringing and uh, highlighting the importance of SGLT2 also. So any, 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 any queries to be addressed to the forum, please. It's just started, if you don't mind. Sorry. No, you can just ask. Fine. Is it 
still better to uh, continue with metformin? As of today, there is not much again in metformin. We have got something called remitrimin which works at the same level, but we still don't. It's a very new kit on the block. But that said, metformin has proved itself to be, you know, it, and it's just, just what it is. It's meant to be anti cancer as anti aging drug. It's meant to do well on the AP, AKT side. It's meant to do well on the mRNA side. It's got so much a plethora of benefits. There's no real to kick off metformin as of today. It has not, except the GHB side of it, it has not seemed to worsen anything well. In fact, because of its cost and advantages, people are saying that, you know, in more and more, uh, you know, it, it has not shown to cause lactic acidosis. Like Fenformin, you need not be worried. It can be used even at the low EGFR on paper. So, yeah. they are looking at ways and uses of but using it much earlier and earlier. So, I don't think it is there yet to go. Okay, thank you. The housekeeper is the HFT tool, sir. So, if you are looking for mechanical benefits in the long term, HFT tool still would be my option. Diabetes, yes, maybe HFT tool is not thinking. But in terms of uh, you know, ketone body, metabolic uses, those sort of things, HFT tool still scores over as a protein with the uh, extrapolated mechanism. I think we have landed to the final session. Any more? Please, please. <coughs> Sir, I would put my personal in the thing. I am overweight. I turned out to be an uh, <laughs> IGT person. No drug work except and glitter. So early use, very low dosage use is something to be done with, one, number one. Number two, pleiotrophic benefit starts with 7.5 that has been alluded to in India very well. So weight gain is much lesser, other things are lesser. lesser. The original uh, the thing of when Dr. Milmer came, he was, I don't know when the person who invented Saramnetazar came, he was talking about us. It is a touch of Pipargam effect. Even that amount which is there with your uh, telmisatan would do in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, insulin sparing. So a small dose of type of pyrolytazone would be something which would be wonderful. We are under using, and many people once they start using it, they go for 15, 30, which may not be done. Metformin, I still believe we have overhyped about lactic acidosis, but then I wouldn't use it in today's, uh, you know, for everything and anything they can go for a case, I wouldn't try using it because obviously insulin is going to be my choice for the time being. After that, I will come back for it. Uh, doctor, is there any tolerance issues? And, and, and sorry, DPP4 seem to reduce the dosage of insulin, so can be used acutely. Metformin need not be there, that's the reason. Uh, doctor, is there any tolerance issues when it comes to the long term therapy with SGLT2 inhibitors? I do see that, but I ask this particular question in many forums. They say it doesn't occur. With DPP4, some people taper off. So it can be. Time it's the same. So it can and be. Studies have already shown that till for eight years it's not tapered off. So it can, be, it can be safely uh, given to all and on? I feel so. No, that's right, but in acute even where there could be lactic acidosis, we wouldn't want to just think tomorrow it can turn against you. So generally go into insulin and get away. Okay, nobody else in the world has ever seen, but that you will just do on the test Yes. And very educated knowledge that you have. Very Thank you. Thank you. So what type of insulin you prefer in the presence of uh, preserved uh, failure, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Sir, as of now, they say in the ICO it is better to use a continuous infusion, then only segregate it, sir. They say it's much easier because hypoglycemia comes, you can stop it. Any of the analogs, uh, the longer analogs, the, to reverse it becomes difficult. So they say a continuous infusion would be a better rather. So thank you so much. I thank think you. we have landed to the final uh, last topic of uh, topic for this session. I think Dr. Aishwarya will take up the forum. So she'll be discussing on the biomarkers for the prediction of heart failure and uh, cardiovascular events. Good afternoon to everyone.
So I'll be talking about biomarkers in the detection of heart failure and cardiovascular events in diabetic population. So biomarker by definition is a, it's a characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic processes and pharmacological responses to a therapeutic intervention. So heart failure usually presents with non-specific symptoms. So the delay in the accurate diagnosis and treatment are associated with worse clinical outcomes and increased healthcare costs. So this is where our biomarkers come into play. So biomarkers provide a low cost, low risk, quick turnaround method to diagnose, prognosticate and provide information on the pathophysiology involved. So diabetes is obviously a frequent comorbidity in patients with heart failure and up to 22% of diabetics can develop heart failure and that is four times higher than the general population. Obviously this is the US data, so for us it should be much higher. So diabetes can lead on to heart failure through various uh, mechanisms. And one thing would be uh, along with the other comorbids like the dyslipidemia, hypertension, obesity, and smoking, and other contribution should be through uh, atherosclerosis. And the other contribution is through insulin resistance, which is very important, uh, which we uh, tend to forget, and hyperglycemia, lipotoxicity, and white, uh, white adipose tissue inflammation. So insulin resistance, so that is very important. So what that, I mean, what, the, what happens in the heart is that because of insulin resistance, there can be uh, some molecular changes, mitochondria uh, can get damaged and the repair mechanisms can get damaged. This is apart from ischemic heart disease. So uh, insulin resistance per se can affect the heart and it can cause uh, cardiac hypertrophy diastolic filling abnormalities and adverse cardiac remodeling and uh, the term what they give for this is uh, diabetic cardiomyopathy although that is very less frequently used because mostly uh, diabetic patients have ischemic uh, heart disease as well. So the biomarkers of heart failure in diabetes is the same as for any other cause for heart failure, nothing different. Whereas in case of uh, heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction for which diabetes is a major cause, it is difficult to diagnose uh, with the biomarkers. And the first reported biomarker uh, was an early CRP by the famous Dr. Braunwald. And he did that in the year 1956. So from then on until now, we have a huge list of biomarkers. Uh, they are divided according to the pathophysiology involved. And now we have four major categories. And uh, they are the biomarkers of myocardial insult, which are the major chunk, and uh, uh, biomarkers of neurohumeral activation, biomarkers of myocardial remodeling, and biomarkers of comorbidity. So myocardial insult biomarkers are in turn categorized into myocardial stretch biomarkers, the most important ones, BNP and antipro BNP, and cardiac necrosis biomarkers, which is high sensitive troponins, and uh, paranormenser oxidative stress biomarkers uh, are myeloperoxidase and uric acid. So natriuretic peptides, the types are uh, BNP and antipro BNP, and obviously they are the gold standard biomarkers for heart failure. So when there is uh, LV wall stress because of uh, uh, pressure overload or volume overload, the pre-pro-BNP pre is uh, released. So and that is converted to uh, pro-BNP and that is cleaved into anti-pro-BNP and BNP. In healthy adults, it is low, the BNP values are low, but women have slightly higher values, whereas uh, it, it, it won't be affected if the patient develops, if women develop uh, heart failure. and. Uh, BNP and antipro BNP are the most accurate uh, predictor for uh, acute decomposited heart failure. So in case of acute heart failure, BNP more than 100 microgram per ml, and antipro pro BNP should be more than 900 microgram per ml. Whereas in case of chronic heart failure, it's very difficult to uh, come uh, to a single cutoff because of individual uh, variability. And that is why we have a ruling out cutoff. So if the patient uh, um, comes as an outpatient and we check BNP and anti-pro BNP, we can rule out heart failure if uh, the values are less than 20 in asymptomatic patients and if it's less than 40 uh, in symptomatic patients, that is BNP. And anti-pro BNP, for anti-pro BNP, we have age-adjusted values less than 50 for less than 50 years, less than 75 for 50 to 75, and less than 125 for uh, more than 75 years. 
So regarding the limitations, naturetic peptides are the gold standard, but they are not perfect because they are elevated in many other conditions where, like uh, the increasing age, with increasing age and uh, renal insufficiency, atrial fibrillation, pulmonary embolism, sepsis. And they are lower in cases of obesity, constrictive pericarditis, and cardiac tamponade. In case of preserved ejection fraction, uh, uh, they, uh, patients have lower values than heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And that is why it's very difficult to diagnose. And that is because they have a smaller LV and a lower wall tension. So what do we do in case of preserved ejection fraction? That is where clinical uh, judgment comes into play. So when it comes to prognostication, serial measurements, not just one measurement, serial measurements pre predict future cardiovascular events in ambulatory chronic heart failure patients uh, than single assessment. So we take uh, the anti-pro BMP um, on the day of admission and then on the day of discharge and then uh, months later on. And regarding prevention, patients with the diabetes and other risk factors with BNP screening had reduced cardiovascular events. So uh, natriotic peptides in the management of heart failure. So they have a very high prognostic value. And, uh, there, and the, there is also this problem where many patients do not reach the target doses of medications of heart failure as per the recommendations because uh, many studies say that uh, cardiologists are being too careful because, uh, because of the side effects and everything and patients don't uh, get to the optimal drug uh, dose. So uh, those patients were included under uh, NP-guided therapy, I mean uh, NP-guided uh, therapy studies and uh, what they found was measuring uh, natriotic peptides may help doctors to up titrate the medications without hesitation. So apart from anti-pro BNP and BNP, troponin T and troponin I and SST2 and galactin 3 are the other approved biomarkers by the ACCAHA recent guidelines. So what about uh, angiotensin receptor uh, neprilysin inhibitor effect on um, natriotic peptide levels? So the pro BNP, uh, once it's cleaved into anti-pro BNP and BNP, so uh, anti-pro BNP is passively cleared by the kidneys and BNP is passively cleared by the kidneys. Also, it is degraded by the neprilysin. So when we inhibit like neprilysin, there will be a slight increase in the BNP. And because of the slight increase in the BNP, the pro BNP values uh, will go in for a, a negative feedback loop and they'll reduce. And uh, so anti-pro BNP will reduce. So in clinical trials, succubitral valsartan resulted in a reduction in anti-pro BNP as well as a small increase in BNP. But however, this does not impair the clinical utility of natriotic peptides to rule out heart failure. So we need, we need not worry about patients who are on RNA when they develop heart failure. And we can uh, definitely do uh, the natriotic peptides. So the second uh, set of biomarkers are the neurohumoral biomarkers which are norepinephrine, adenomedulin, and uh, arginine, vasopressin, and copeptin, endothelin-1. And myocardial remodeling biomarkers, the important ones are soluble suppressor of tumorogenicity-2 and galactin-3, the approved ones, and matrix metalloproteinases, uh, microRNAs, GDF-15, and insulin-like growth factor binding protein-7. The last category is the biomarkers of comorbidity. And this is where uh, HSCRP uh, comes and it's very very important uh, and because uh, heart failure is uh, it's a complex syndrome and inflammation is one of the major causes for heart failure whatever be the risk factor whatever be the cause of the heart failure and the other biomarkers are tnf interleukin 6 ngal chem1 anemia increased red cell distribution with hypoalbuminemia and increased adiponectin and uh, neprilysin so multi-marker strategies. So in this, we have a panel of biomarkers representative of each, uh, each pathophysiological pathway. So we don't just check for one biomarker. We, we uh, check for a panel of biomarkers, a set of biomarkers. And this increases the sensitivity and specificity of a single biomarker tool. But uh, in the studies, they only added a little to the known risk factors. So they are not preferred much uh, in the clinical practice. 
but the most important contributor for heart failure in diabetic population is insulin resistance, which uh, is very, very important to look into. Rise in serum insulin happens before the rise in blood glucose level. So if you wait for the patient to develop pre-diabetes and diabetes and then treat the diabetes, so it's not going to work. He, he, will, he will already, uh, his mitochondria are already damaged in the heart. So the complications like heart failure can happen even when the blood glucose is normal. So please check fasting insulin levels. Ideally, they should be less than five and HOMA IR score can be calculated. And uh, insulin also should be checked along with OGTT. So with OGTT, we give 75 grams of glucose and then measure the uh, blood glucose at 30, uh, uh, 30, 60 and 120 minutes. So along with that, we have to do the insulin also. And um, uh, if the insulin values are more than 25, then uh, it's a problem. And HSCRP is very important because inflammation causes insulin resistance. So this discussion is not complete without mentioning precision medicine, an emerging approach that takes into account individual variability in genes, environment, and lifestyle. So it includes proteomics, metabolomics, transcriptomics, and genetic analysis of individual patients. And functional medicine is a branch of uh, precision medicine where they look into the root cause of the disease and they uh, remove that. So take home messages, um, BNP and anti-pro-BNP are the gold standard biomarkers for heart, fail heart failure in diabetes and other approved biomarkers are troponins, high-sensitive uh, high troponin and SST2, galactin-3. Multimarker uh, panel strategies are the next in picture and precision medicine and functional medicine are the future in the prediction of heart failure in diabetes. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh crisp presentation on this last topic. Yes, please. Uh, Dr. Ashwari, I must first thank you for the wonderful uh, elaborate presentation of the biomarkers. My simple question is a very valid and a very practical question. Even after 75 years of the country's independence, we are far, far away from an egalitarian society. We know the biomarkers are there, but a majority of the patient is not able to afford the biomarker testing. Yeah. Then what to do for them? Sir, uh, and nowadays say, heart failure is extremely common. So what to do yeah, in that case? What they say in the studies are uh, that uh, they say uh, going for a, going for an echo study is costlier than going. I mean, doing a anti pro BNP virus. But here it's the reverse. So I would say, I mean, um, clinically uh, in our setup, I think uh, echocardiography and uh, clinical. Uh, judgment yeah that is what is important than the bnps of course if the patient is able to afford uh, it's around 2000 or something depends on the hospital so if it's a uh, if it's affordable for, for the patient then it's very important uh, for prognostication and as well as patients uh, especially in elderly more than 75 years we don't usually uh, you know uh, give, uh, give the patient high dose of uh, um, uh, frucimide or any other drug, any drug, you know, we are very careful. We don't want them to develop hypertension or anything. So in those cases, probably a nitrotic peptide, measuring them in a um, monthly basis or two monthly or three monthly. So that will be definitely beneficial. And, but in the not so distant future, I mean, we still regard as antiprobin as a gold standard for, as a gold standard biomarker for heart failure. In the not so distant future, do you see any other biomarker taking its place? Because like you, you yourself mentioned in one of the slides, nt probin P, is, though it is a gold standard, but it is not always specific. Yeah. In other conditions also, it sometimes gets increased. Do you see any other biomarker taking its place, which is more precise and more specific than nt probin P, as far as the condition of heart failure is concerned? Uh, as of now, uh, there are nothing like that in the papers I, I read. and. Uh, Mostly, whatever biomarker they're studying, they're comparing it to the efficacy of anti-pro-BNP and what it could do uh, to the value of anti-pro-BNP. And almost always, you know, uh, anti-pro-BNP takes the higher hand. What about and, the uh, cystatin C? Is it is it also reliable marker? Yeah, in that the, is main. That is mainly in patients with the renal impairment. Yes, but then uh, plainly speaking about heart failure and diabetes, then yeah, anti-pro-BNP is the biomarker best. of choice. Yes, 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 sir. But cystatin C actually it is the alternate for uh, EGFR actually. And the evaluation of renal parameters. ST2 also yes. is uh, because the uh, fibro uh, it predicts the fibrosis of the heart. Soluble tumor is the factor two. 
so um, it is recommended we can check but i don't know yes, what sir, are it the is rates recommended for, for prognostication but for the diagnosis it is not um. please dr paramdaman actually More, no more discussions. I think we can wind up this session by telling uh, thank you for the organizers for giving this opportunity. So thank you one and all. Thank you very much. Uh, next is <coughs> on to the cardiorenal metabolic, uh, uh, the, the combination part. As moderators, I request Dr. Chandrasekhar, Dr. K. Mohan, Dr. D. K. Sriram, Dr. Uh, Vigneshwaran, and Dr. Hari Krishna Parthasarathy to come to the dais and each talk will be five to seven minutes because very crisp so don't overshoot the time and there will be a pro and uh, rebuttal so uh, over to the chairpersons please stick to the time we have to finish at four and four to four thirty there's another session so uh, please stick to the time thank you very much general announcement for the audience delegates are requested to keep their mobile phones in silent mode during the session Uh, good afternoon to everyone. I think move, move on to the session proper, this uh, pharmacological reboot. The first one is the when will I use SGLT2 inhibitors in my practice? Uh, it will be dealt by three people, the internal medicine part of it and diabetology perspective by Dr. Kannan, nephrology perspective from uh, Dr. Hashavadhan and cardiologist from Dr. Santosh Satish. Over to Dr. Kannan. Good afternoon. Post lunch session. Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank all the organizing committee people and Dr. Chandrasekhar for giving me this opportunity. Uh, it's a pharmacology topic, but I'll make it interesting. Uh, I'll talk about HGLE2 inhibitors uh, as a physician, how I'll use, what are the newer things, and its usage. I divide into six headings, just briefly. What are the basics? A lot of things have happened from 2018 to 2023. Uh, a lot of changes have happened. So I'll talk about that. I'll talk about uh, related to diabetes, little bit about uh, diabetic kidney disease, non-diabetic kidney disease, heart failure and overall and what is the conclusion? What is the take home message? For example, basics. For example, if you see very carefully, there are two HGLT. One is HGLT1 and HGLT2. HGLD2 is very important because 80% is reabsorbed. It is in segment, different segments you can see here. Segment 1, segment 2, segment 3. Segment 2 and 3 is in HGLD1. But S1 is HGLD2 where maximum reabsorption occurs. That is why HGLD2 is used. Actually, uh, we have better understanding of HGLD2 because initially it started as an anti-diabetic drug. Later on it went to nephrology and cardiology. Now everybody is using and it's like a universal drug. Next one, the normal physiology, the, uh, when we read physiology in Gaitan or Genang, we can see the uh, tubular glomerular feedback. There is a hyperfiltration which occurs in diabetic nephropathy. That is altered, that is altered. You can see here in, when HGLE2 is given, there is uh, increased sodium delivery and normalization of GFR and afferent arterial constriction occurs. That is why the glucosuria and we have a very good effect. So now we talk about HGLE2. We can see the three important drugs, CANA, DAPA, and EMPA. These are the three important drugs which uh, being used in practice by almost uh, all of us. All of you know the drugs and uh, we can see here, it has got an extensive coverage. For example, uh, in glycemia, effect on lipids. Lipids, for example, it leads to increased adiponectin. Weight, it reduces around two to four kgs and uh, it increases glucagon, particularly it reduces the weight circumference, subcutaneous adipose tissue and visceral adipose tissues are being reduced and we can see here in glycemic control, we can see here HB1C is changed, 
fasting glucose is changed, beta cell function is improved, glucose toxicity is improved, insulin sensitivity is increased, endogenous glucose production is increased, insulin resistance also reduced. Then we can see the cardiovascular effects and it reduces fibrosis, liver function, fatty liver also it plays a very very important, nowadays lot of uh, studies are going on fatty liver and kidneys and bone density that is one of the side effect, it can produce osteoporosis. Then inflammatory markers and it increases erythropoietin, all those things, oxidative stress is ready. So extensive coverage, extensive reviews are available in the literature. For example, what are the adverse effects? Very important adverse effects, as a physician we should know, hypotension we cannot give. Genital infections, recurrent genital infections, particularly male and female we cannot give. Bone fractures, very common, osteoporosis. Diabetic ketoacidosis, very common. Euglycemic ketoacidosis is also very common. For example, many times we may wonder whether patient is taking uh, AGLE2 or not. Very simple clue will be, patient will come to us, urine sugar 3 plus, 4 plus, but blood sugars are normal. That means patient is taking SGLE2 inhibitors. Very simple clue. Then urinary tract infection, they may, they may develop amputation of lower limbs, hypoglycemia, fornis, all are very important side effects which we have to keep it in mind. Next, I will talk about diabetes related to SGLT2. We can see here very good review in nature. Nature reviews gives very uh, important uh, in diabetes. What they say is, compared to Asian and uh, Chinese, both have insulin resistance. What is the difference? Indians, they have insulin resistance based upon the liver. Chinese, skeletal muscle. So they say we can read here, in Chinese population, beta cell dysfunction might predispose to uh, impaired insulin secretion. Both first phase and second phase is reduced in Chinese. In the Indians, only first phase is reduced. So, we can see here, in Indians, uh, they have very early predisposition for diabetes at a, at a early age. Impaired fasting glucose, very common. Chinese people, impaired glucose tolerance. They have more skeletal muscle. We have more liver problems. So, sometimes there may be overlap. That is what the literature says. So, they say, uh, sedentary behavior, insufficient sleep, high carbohydrate, fat, all those things causes this. So, we can see here now uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, all the three are linked. We have very high CV risk in diabetes and heart failure. And suppose uh, a patient has got diabetes, he is at high risk for all of us know, acute myocardial infarction, stroke, amputation, ESRD, death from hyperglycemic crisis. So, the rates of many serious complications have fallen, but the numbers have not. So, very good uh, literature in uh, Lancet 2022. What it says is, HGLE2 inhibitors safely reduces the risk of kidney disease progression, acute kidney injury, cardiovascular death, hospitalization of heart failure, everything is reduced because it changes, whether he is diabetic or non-diabetic, we can give and we can try that. It has got a very good effect in the patients. For example, how it happens? Basically, it affects whenever glucosuria occurs, it reduces weight, lipolysis is increased, gluconeogenesis is increased, liver, it reduces fatty liver, kidney, it reduces blood pressure by reducing angiotensinogen, endothelin, all those things, it reduces fibrosis. In the heart, it reduces once again the hyperfiltration, in the kidney, it reduces hyperfiltration. So, we can see here, it plays a very, very important role in the liver, kidney and in the heart. So, finally it causes reduction of heart failure, fatty liver, blood pressure reduction, sugar reduction, lipids reduction, weight reduction. So, it is a com combination, but only thing is it may increase the ketone bodies, it may increase the ketone bodies. So, they have tried in type 1 also. Uh, lot of things are being given, but type 1 we have to use very carefully. What they say is third point. Use the lowest dose, you can try the lowest dose and we have to reduce the prandial insulin 10 to 15 percent initially, later on we can adjust the dose of insulin. Suppose they are at risk for ketoacidosis, you should not give. So when to give? This is the algorithm which is given. Whenever we want to give HGLE2, please assess the volume status of the patient, volume status, euolemic, hypervolemic or hypovolemic. If hypovolemic or hypotension, better avoid HGLD2. Hypovolemic, hypertension, better avoid. Normovolemic, hypertensive or hypervolemic, we can try. But we have to adjust the dose of other drugs. Very, very important message. Then, we have to tell them, urine may be increased, 
urine flow may be increased and BP may fall. BP drugs has to be adjusted, very, very important message. Then blood sugar may fall, hypoglycemia. Then very, very important, whenever they get admitted, they are at acute condition, it may not be very useful because ketone bodies will be positive. Then they may have recurrent urinary tract infection. Suppose uh, they are at risk for urinary tract infection, better avoid. So now we go to the diabetic kidney disease, non-diabetic kidney disease. Uh, many diabetic kidney disease is not recognized in patients with the type 2 diabetes. We can see here more than 50, 57 percent stage 3A and 3B, 30 percent is not recognized. So what happens exactly? Uh, whenever diabetes occurs, we can see here dilated afferent arterioles and fibrosis occurs, protein urea is increased. SGLE2, what it does is it produces afferent arterial constriction, reduces intraglomerular pressure. So that intraglomerular hypertension is reduced. So that proteinuria is reduced. That is the beneficial effect when we give the SGLT2 inhibitors. It reduces intraglomerular hypertension. Proteinuria is reduced by producing uh, glycosuria, all those things. So it is very effective. And finally, uh, in the kidney, it reduces uh, uh, insulin resistance. You can see here, glomerular hyperfiltration is reduced. Metabolic stress is reduced. Endothelial function is increased. Volume overload is reduced, particularly in chronic kidney disease. Diabetes or non-diabetic kidney, both volume overload is reduced, sympathetic activity is reduced, natriuresis, sodium excretion is increased, water excretion is increased, then sugar excretion is increased, everything so that patient becomes thin and uh, he gets a beneficial effect. And the progression of CKD is also reduced, the progression is delayed. Then finally, heart failure. Heart failure, what exactly it does is you can see here, it produces left ventricular hypertrophy, it produces inflammation, cytokines are produced. Remodeling, extracellular matrix, remodeling occurs, apoptosis is increased. So when we give this, all the effects are reduced. We can see here, ventricular preload, afterload is reduced, cardiac metabolism is changed, and myocardial uh, ion exchange is changed, necrosis reduced, fibrosis reduced. So ultimately, it is very beneficial. So we can see here, uh, it produces increased hematocrit weight loss, ventricular changes, and it produces all the effects. Particularly, they say it's a new concept. They say it reduces epicardial fat. Epicardial fat is one of the important marker. They say it reduces epicardial fat, reduces leptin levels also. And these are all novel mechanisms, they say. So, all the trials, you can see MPARAC trial, DECLARE, CANVAS trial, CREDENCE, all the trials, CANA, DAPA, MPA, all the trials, they say that hospitalization is reduced, MAC levels are reduced. So overall, what is the picture of overall? Overall, it produces natriuresis, diuresis, uricosuria, glycosuria, so that we have reduced insulin resistance and uh, it has got a beneficial effect. So this is summary. You can see uh, it increases the uh, uh, very good control of blood sugar and reduces blood pressure. I'll, I'll go to the conclusions. Conclusion, it is very useful. Uh, FDA approves all the three drugs. EMPA, DAPA and CANA. We can see here the algorithm given by ADA, SGLE2 can be used both in diabetes as well as in type 2 kidney disease. And uh, what they say is uh, with or without metformin based upon the glycemic needs, it's very appropriate as an initial therapy for individuals with the type 2 diabetes who are at high risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or heart failure or chronic kidney disease. Who diabetes? With the chronic kidney disease, with the heart failure, with the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, it is very useful. We have established already also it is very useful. So thank you. These are the very good references you can see here in heart failure. Very good review has come in February 2023, annals of review and other, other uh, Lancet article and development articles. These are all very useful for postgraduates. So uh, this, this is actually a very good review in the SGAD2 for the treatment of type 2 diabetes in nature. Thank you. Just for summary, there's a very nice presentation, elaborate one. For summary, three key areas where you definitely use it as a general medicine person actually. Where do you use it? First thing I will use for diabetes, definitely number one. Number two is people who have got a volume overload with diabetes with the kidney disease we use. Then now new spectrum is we use non-diabetic chronic kidney disease also or with heart failure who are at high risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease we use. Previously we have been using left and right for diabetes. Now they say 
it is more used by cardiologists rather than uh, general medicine or uh, diabetologists and even nephrologists they try but only thing is we have to use calculating the gfr very very important gfr less than 30 25 20 definitely we have to be very careful and definitely side effects we have to check very carefully doctor we all know that sgl2 inhibitors are i mean they are really miraculous molecules who would have thought that a diabetic molecule that a oha can be used in a non diabetic heart failure patients it can be used in even non diabetic kidney disease also my simple question is this that we as physicians encounter on a day to day clinical practice in your slides you have shown us we also know it that sgl2 inhibitors have a tendency to cause recurrent utis suppose if a patient comes to us be it with type diabetes be it with heart failure be it with kidney disease do we assess the risk and the benefit or on what weightage should we give should we outweigh the risks because of the benefit then what is the solution if the patient develops recurrent uti with the long term sir, therapy of sgl2 inhibitor sorry then, sir i think the questions are supposed to be at the end only sorry sir here okay. we'll we'll end at the okay, end at the thank end. you thank you sir. thank you thank you thank you okay sir sure thank you so we welcome uh, who is the next? Dr. Harshavardhan, please, from nephrologist perspective. Um, so I think sir has already covered a large part of what I would be anyway talking. So I, was start, I thought I'd start off with renal pharmacology looking at the SGLT2 inhibition, but sir has already spoken about it. The most important thing as far as a nephrologist is concerned is that uh, the tubuloglomerular feedback, when there's increased sodium delivery to the macula densa, the tubules ask the glomerules to start working less. So basically the tubules ask the efferent arteriole to constrict, reduce filtration and decreases the trafficking across the tubules. Now this is affected in diabetes, in diabetes because there's too much of glucose reabsorption in the proximal tubule there is less sodium delivery to the juxtaglomerular apparatus and as a result of this there is less tone on the afferent arteriole and this causes afferent arteriole vasodilation more vasodilation in the afferent arteriole increases the intraglomerular pressure increases hyperfiltration injury and more albuminuria and that's what we are trying we are seeking to ameliorate by giving sglt2 inhibitors now renal benefits so largely the most of it is got from reduction in intraglomerular pressures in addition to that, we also have some neurohormonal improvement in terms of uh, lowering of RAS activity. There's also some amount of metabolic activity in the kidney in terms of decrease in hypoxia and also decrease in the amount of fibrosis. And this uh, in turn protects the kidney. The usual clinical scenarios where I would start an SGLT2 inhibitor, diabetics who come to me with poor glycemic control after metformin, I would probably use this drug, but that's a uh, general medicine perspective. In nephrology, the three broad indications would be diabetic kidney disease, non-diabetic kidney disease with proteinuria and with some query, uh, non-diabetic kidney disease without proteinuria. So over 40 years, if you look at the initial 20 years in the 80s and 90s, we had a lot of evidence with AC inhibitors and ARBs. We, uh, almost there was a gap of about 10 to 15 years where we did not have much of therapies to modify the course of chronic kidney disease. And that changed with cardiovascular uh, outcome trials, MPRI, CANVAS and diclatimi where we found out that this molecule could be of good benefit in CKD as well. So credence, DAPA, CKD changed our perspective and we said that we could alter the course of CKD. So I'm not going to go too much into these trials because you, most of you already know about them. But when I start an SGL2 inhibitor, what are the general precautions I would take? As a nephrologist, I would first assess the volume status. If the patient is hypervolumic, if the patient is, uh, if I feel is dehydrated, I would think twice before starting an SGL2 inhibitor. I would keep a note of diuretic doses in such patients and antihypertensive patients, antihypertensive agents also while starting because if they are slightly hypovolemic, I would actually reduce the dose of diuretics, reduce the dose of antihypertensives because I know that SGL2 inhibitors, especially in borderline patients, can produce a hypotensive and a hypovolemic effect. In addition to this, if I'm starting for a non primarily diabetic indication, if I'm going to start it just for modifying the course of CKD. I would also keep it in mind that these patients could have some hypoglycemia, especially when they are already on uh, sulfonylurease. Uh, so uh, especially if their fasting sugar is quite low. Now to a nephrologist, the paradigm still SGLT2 inhibitors is last in my armamentorium. I would still start with salt restriction, BP control, glycemic control. F most importantly, I would ensure that there is complete RAS blockade to as much maximum the patient tolerates, as much maximum potassium allows me to go. And third is SGLT2 inhibition for me. 
Now, before coming to this, uh, to this talk, I just thought I'd do a small survey of my own colleagues and seniors in Chennai. I sent a survey to all of them, about 25 leading nephrologists responded, and I'm going to present you some data on what they feel about uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors. So nephrologists still, a large overwhelming majority, rely on AC inhibitors and ARBs for CKD progression, retarding CKD progression, but the remaining 36% usually combine both. If you look at non-diabetic low kidney disease, would I use it? Yes. But after a maximal RAS inhibition, in whom? In patients especially with IG nephropathy, FSGS, proteinuric CKD of non, of unexplained cause. And when would I start it? Once they have burnt out disease. Once they have burnt out disease and they are at least six months off immunosuppression, that's when I would start them on SGLT2 inhibitors. Would others use it? Incidentally, no. The overwhelming majority of nephrologists across Chennai at least are saying that they would not primarily use SGLT2 inhibitors for non-diabetic glomerular kidney diseases. But what is the evidence? If you look at DAPA CKD, which gave us a large cohort of non-diabetic kidney disease, uh, about 695 patients, this gives an overwhelming evidence for use in non-diabetic kidney disease. Uh, this also looks at smaller trials like Translate and Diamond, where predominantly FSGS, IG nephropathy have been included. Most trials, however, have not looked at I have not included patients with lupus nephritis, anchor vasculitis, and though not a glomerular disease in ADPKD. ADPKD, there are animal models which shows that SGLT2 inhibitors may be detrimental to their to cyst, uh, uh, to cyst formation and thereby they may worsen disease. So therefore, we do not have evidence in these three diseases as of yet. So at what GFR would I start an SGLT2 inhibitor? Because that's something that I, I have to be careful about. So would I start it in CKD4? So how many people in this audience would actually start it for CKD4? Can you raise your hands? So not many people. So at present evidence is there for use up to GFR of 25. But if you look at CKD4, it's anywhere between 15 to 30. So at lower GFR, all the mechanism that we talked about is not going to happen. So probably it has very poor efficacy. There's variable use among even nephrologists if they would give it in CKD4. 52% uh, said no. A small group, a smaller group, about 48% said they would try. So what is, uh, is there a comfortable creatinine limit? Sometimes in our OPD, we don't have time to actually sit down and calculate the GFR. So we're going to just uh, eyeball it. What number would you be comfortable with? A majority are comfortable with a creatinine of up to 2 to 2.5 to start an SGLT2 inhibitor. A smaller proportion are comfortable with up to a creatinine of 3. A very small proportion would be much more conservative and stop it, would, uh, would stop it or not start it if creatinine is more than 1.8. So what is the evidence in this regard? So DAPA CKD again had a 14% cohort of CKD4, but this was up to 25 to 30 mLs per minute. It was not patients who had a lower GFR. And these patients also had a sustained reduction in their cardiovascular and renal outcomes. And they also had a delay in progression to ESKD and mortality. However, there is no evidence to support the same for people who have a GFR less than 25. So what are the concerns for a nephrologist if you're using it at CKD4? Precipitating infection, dehydration, would it worsen kidney outcomes? Would it tip the balance to ESRD? Would it accelerate the progression towards dialysis requirement? And simply looking at the physiology of it, it probably would not have any effect. So again, CKD5, most nephrologists would not give it, but I've seen a couple of prescriptions from fellow nephrologists who, who do prescribe it in CKD5, although there's no evidence about uh, its use in such patients. What about non-proteinuric CKD? Do these benefits also extend to a patient with non-diabetic kidney disease with minimal or low proteinuria? So earlier we were not sure, but however now EMPA kidney trial which has just come out has been stopped early. The EMPA kidney trial actually looked at about 6,600 patients with variable cause of CKD, be it diabetes or non-diabetes, and also looked at a huge variation in the albuminuria levels in people who had very low albuminuria as well. And the results were consistent in patients with or without diabetes and with or without significant albuminuria. So therefore across a wide range of albuminuric patients, whether you're non-albuminuric or albuminuric, you probably have some benefit with SGLT2 inhibitors. So CKD patients without albinuria also benefit from SGLT2 inhibitors and this study will probably markedly expand the population eligible for therapy. So in, in summary to look at the amount of evidence, uh, minimum evidence is probably there in non-diabetic kidney disease without proteinuria because there is just one study. More evidence is emerging in non-diabetic kidney disease patients with proteinuria and you have a lot of strong evidence for patients with diabetic kidney disease with GFR more than 25. No evidence is patients with CKD5, CKD4, GFR less than 25, and a small cohort that I already mentioned, lupus, ADPKD, and anchor vasculitis. Thank you. This is uh, two, heads of, uh, uh, two sides of a coin. I'll be presenting the other side in a short while. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashwatan, for the lucid talk. Yes, uh, we are eager to listen to your other version also. Sure. Next, we move on Thank to you. the uh, cardiologist perspective. Over to Dr. Satosh Satish. So, thank you so much, the organizers, for the uh, uh, invitation for this talk. Only my request to the chairperson is that I did not make two separate slides; it's just single slide. So, can I just finish off in one single presentation? Or do that is I'll use and not use both. I'll finish in one. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, when will I use and not use? So, I think uh, all of you are. With the Dr. Condens and uh, our nephrologist and medicine perspective has seen, it looks like it's a magic bullet which can cure almost everything <laughs> under the sun. Means uh, so. With that introduction, let us go into this. So this will be the brief uh, agenda of this uh, small lecture. That benefits to the cardiovascular system. I will focus on and what is the evidence for its use, and what are the current guidelines, and when will I use and when will I not use. So, as the previous speaker speakers had uh, explained very clearly, so this heading only I want you to remember because so many complex things happens in the kidney. Very complex. That's why we are cardiologists. We look at the pipes. We don't look at all the elect what is it uh, special effects that happens in the pipes. So, only thing that we have to remember is HGL2 two inhibition causes excretion of the filtered glucose and sodium. So filtered, the word filtered I'm emphasizing because if the person has got diabetes, glucose gets filtered. Once the glucose is filtered, it doesn't get reabsorbed. If you are using SGLT2 inhibition, you're getting it. That is, if the person's blood sugar is normal, the glucose doesn't get filtered. So initially it was used as an anti-diabetic agent. And now even in non-diabetic people, we are using it. And uh, it doesn't cause, in, what I'm trying to emphasize is it doesn't uh, cause hypoglycemia in non-diabetic patients. And that is normal people also we are using SGLT2 inhibitors. Correct. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, yes. So that is one of the, some of the confusions that actually happens because many people feel one of the hesitation is that this is actually anti-diabetic drug. Why should we use in non-diabetics? Will it cause hypoglycemia? So this is one fundamental mechanism. And then coming to the uh, what exactly happens in the kidney, a lot of things happen. But what we need to understand, which actually benefits the kidney in a big way, the nephrologist has explained very clearly, very beautifully. What happens is it reduces the intraglomerular hydrostatic pressure, which actually happens, which is the major help to the kidney. That is what actually benefits the kidney uh, by um, the efferent arteriole and the efferent arteriole both are affected by this and ultimately you will have the decreased intraglomerular hydrostatic pressure. This is what happens in the kidney which leads to the short term as well as long term effects. Now the effect is not limited to the kidney, it is limited to different parts of the body. As I said they, they use the word ultimately for this thing for something which can cure almost everything. So coming to the specific atherosclerosis limiting effects, it can reduce dyslipidemia, it can reduce endothelial dysfunction and oxidative stress, can reduce inflammation, inhibition of leukocyte adhesion and transmigration, inhibition of form cell formation, the reduction of plaque burden and size, increase in plaque stability. All of them are caused by SGLT inhibitors. So the cardiometabolic and renal effect in summary, this is all happens. Glucose lowering happens in diabetics. Reduction in body weight, lowering of blood pressure, natiuresis, anti-inflammation, anti-fibrotic, reduction in extracellular matrix turnover, amelioration of intrarenal hypoxia, restoration of tubular glomerular feedback, reduction in natiuretic peptides, reduction in energy demand, reduction in liver fat. If you look at it, many of these things were actually targeted by so many different classes of drugs that physicians and nephrologists and cardiologists were using. So that way I would say that this is something like a magic bullet. So, as I said, it affects from head to feet everything. It, it has got beneficial effects on the kidney. It has got beneficial effects on the adipose tissue. 
it has got beneficial effects in the liver, in the pancreas, in the blood vessels, in the blood plasma. So it is just a all rounder. So what is the evidence, so the major evidence as a cardiologist I look at two things that is what is the benefit in patients with heart failure. So this is the DAPA HF emperor reduced emperor preserved and soloist WHF uh, uh, studies which showed that page, this is trials which are specifically targeted at patients with heart failure. Uh, you can see the, the box, the blue color box is the type 2 diabetes, what percentage of patients were in this each of these trials. The first four trials it was around 40 to 50 percent whereas the last one it was all the patients were diabetic. So to put things in perspective if you look, look below the National Heart Failure Registry of ICMR, Dr. Hari Krishna is the PI and we can see that 42 percent of the 10,851 patients were diabetics. So the proportion of diabetics in these trials in which the heart failure patients were targeted was almost similar to the heart failure pattern of the patients that is there in India. And you can see that cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure or hospitalization for heart failure both were significantly lower in the group uh, in the, the all of them are randomized control trials. So in the group of patients who received the uh, uh, SGL2 inhibitors. Now looking at the patients with type 2 diabetes. So these are the uh, declared to me 58 that is one of the earlier studies and then after the scan was MPRG outcome, vertice CV, credence code all of them have shown that with higher you can see the number of events per thousand patients this particular beautiful graph what is showing is whatever be the number of events that means in different studies number of events are different that is in declared to me number of events are much less whereas in the score the number of events are much higher. Whatever be the number of events, the SGL2 inhibitors significantly reduced the event rate in patients with diabetes. So what were the event? Cardiovascular death or hospitalization or cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure. So that means even in diabetics, all this without heart failure, cardiovascular death and heart failure is reduced. So now in comparison with other drugs that all of us are using, we use AC inhibitors, angiogenic receptor blockers, beta blockers and all, all, uh, all these agents are cur currently we are using. When you look at the effect of SGLT2 inhibitors to look at the relative risk reduction and the number needed to treat, we will focus on the number needed to treat for simplicity basis for all cause mortality that is the third. Uh, column here you can see it is 63 whereas for AC inhibitors or ARB this is in patients with heart failure reduced ejection fraction you can see it is 77 all the others are much lower but SGLT2 inhibitors is 63. So that means SGLT inhibitor is at least as good as or even better than AC inhibitors and uh, uh, not may, may not be as good as beta blockers to uh, reduce mortality for patients uh, with heart failure with redu reduced ejection fraction. So in short our brown world has told that this is the statins of the 21st century. So now coming to the guidelines, AHA uh, American Cardio uh, College of Cardiology and American Heart Association guidelines of 2022 has put this as a um, class 1 indication A. So in addition to ARNI as well as beta blocker and mineral corticoid antagonist and diuretics SGL2 inhibitors has walked in as the strong uh, what is it uh, class 1 indication that means we have to use this must to use in all patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. What is the status in the other group with a lot of confusion was there is heart failures mildly redu reduced moderately reduced all the things was there with European guidelines but this has changed that made, made it very uh, simplified in 2022 AHA. So now it is class 2A indication in patients with reduced resistance fraction. That means we should probably use if there are no uh, significant risk that the risk the, uh, the benefits outweigh risk that is why it is class 2A. So this is for patients with preserved ejection fraction that is more than or equal to 50 as per the AHA guidelines. Now what about diabetic patients? Dr. Karna had showed that patients with established uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or patients who are at high risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease 
the early, the first slide that I showed the evidence, you can say that American based on that American Diabetic Association has recommended treatment with SGLT2 inhibitors for type 2 diabetic patients and any of the three following. First,
perilous. Why you should avoid? Your patient already on this drug with the insulin and other drugs, sulfonylureas, you reduce the sulfonylureas by 50%, you reduce the insulin dose by 10 to 20%, and if such this patient is sick, better avoid. What are situations you stop, patient already taking, now you stop the drug. What are these? Recurrent myocardial infections, not the first single episode. Single episode, you can treat it with, with the local application or give a fluconazole or whatever so, but recurrent applications are better stop it. I don't contribute because it leads to ketosis and severe infection. And uh, this should not be given in, uh, when of course the EGFR is less than 46. If you see that SGLT inhibitor, if SGLT, the, the day one, it decreases the EGFR by 3 ml per minute, the day first dose. So if it already decreases in EGFR, you give us further worsening of EGFR. That's the reason we should not give that. And the dehydration I've already mentioned, elderly individuals. What is about elderly individuals? If already taking, better stop it more than 65, 85. The reason is that When they are on drugs, those type of diabetes severely insulinopenic, insulin-deficient individual, and of course the excessive reduction in the the caloric intake. Diabetes with the pancreatitis. The diabetes if you if, if you put them on SU2 inhibitor because there is no insulin secretion they go for ketosis of course the metabolic derangements like you no know, infection as well what are the strategies to reduce these complications when patient is on SU2 inhibitor if you want to stop it yes you stop it and you don't stop the insulin Suddenly, ratio will go up and glucose and ketosis will be there. So, and also when patients, please take increased hydration. If any symptoms of decay, please come back. And also, you stop the drug before the surgery, whatever you plan for. And it's critically ischemia, of course, I already mentioned. There, there was a tra study, trial, canvas trial. Uh, the that there is increased uh, uh, amputation with the carnalicolosin. So there is increased because of the volume reduction and hypotension which worsen the complications. What about the limb, limb ischemia? Limb ischemia increased by twofold by the, the SEO inhibitors. That's being found with the, the Apagliflozin. So you have to be very careful, and with the Kana as well as, and uh, these are infections. The double infections 
double, double. So when you give as your inhibitor or infection is there, it all the meta-analysis shows the vulvar vagina is very common. So vulvar is mild than the heart. So but you can give symptomatic. You give improve the hydration. You give improve the hygiene. There we can continue it, but it's a recurrent. You have to treat with antifungal drug and uh, uh, if the recurrent is there, you have to stop it. And urinary infection, why they, they develop urinary infection? Stress and of course the urinary infection is more prone. You can reduce the dose because these side effects prior directly proportion the dose you would use so that so in but it is uh, it uh, Personal hygiene should be insisted and urinary infection that has been found. But one good point is that the nose, nothing is got the beneficial effect of this. What is the one thing more important is that um, that uh, the, the tubular global feedback is already mentioned. So friable patients, why the friable patients? It is that increased absorption of sodium increased absorption of phosphorus and decreased is increased excretion of calcium the resulting in stimulation of uh, the fibrocyte growth factor fibroblast growth factor that's supposed to increase the glycosuria and increase the or reduce the 125 dioxide polycalciferol that's supposed to inhibit the calcium absorption and increase the uh, secondary parathyroidism resulting in bone, bone fractures very co very common with those individuals so volume depletion the, what the volume depletion says if you give acid inhibitor it increases the hemoglobin concentration by three to seven percent and albumin increases urea curtain increases even with the first few weeks of the therapy so better you be very careful with them and these are the other drugs we already mentioned and of course the hypertension it be worsened if the and the, especially in elderly individuals they develop a sort of electrode imbalance the frequent falls hypertension hypoglycemia syncope all this can occur especially in elderly individuals so the, the all the trials they shares that that a dehydration patient should not use and that resulting in uh, the complications like uh, NIG AKI and uh, uh, the frequent falls and the same. Of course, the tumor growth feedback already mentioned, and this is, should not be used in the elderly. As I already mentioned, the interstitial volume, the overall, the, the water content of the body is less for them, less than, uh, more than 85 years. So if you add this drug, you add to the complication, better avoid for elderly. And of course, this should not be used in the elderly. And it's been there are these are the papers which is uh, quoting that it should not be given. And of course, the surgery that is the surgery before three days before surgery, you ought to stop. The reason is that I already mentioned because of starvation and it can worsen diabetic ketosis during complete surgery and resulting in all the complications. All fractures, yes, the hip fracture is more common. If you there, there's study that if you take a dapagliprosin for more than two years, the, the hip fracture is more common. They found that after two years of this, uh, the osteopenic effect and hyperparathyroidism effect, it results in uh, the fractures in the hip is with common with the dapagliflozin and there's the drug the certain drug interactions you should mention especially the rifampicin when you're taking the rifampicin you have to cut down rifampicin or you continue rifampicin you stop the SGLT inhibitor because the drug interaction will be there it worsen the complication there are few reports about pancreatitis recently published and uh, this will be very cautious but be cautious not that it should not be used this is not a contraindication there are few studies and uh, three papers which are published recently that there is associated with the pancreatitis so these are few conditions you have to be very careful there are certain situations we can use but you all cautiously use and you see the, all the pros and cons of the treatment and weigh the patients uh, benefit of the drug in the, in the match with the complications thank you very much for patient thank you dr we will take the questions at the end yes and now again dr harshavadan now to put on the next side of the coin which is hanging there and tell us about where he'll not use it as a nephrologist.
Okay. Uh, so the other side of the coin, as Sir said, uh, as nephrologists, we are a little circumspect about SGL2 inhibitors in general. We think of ourselves as the guardians of the kidney. And uh, if you know, if you come around for IP consults, we generally tend to knock off many medicines. So definitely where SGL2 inhibitors are concerned, most nephrologists will think twice before continuing them, in, especially in, in patients. Uh, so when I looked at the same survey that I did, uh, majority of nephrologists generally in the routine practice have to constantly add or delete SGLT2 inhibitors from the routine practice. It's a small uh, group that completely stops the prescription when it comes to them. Uh, what are the main concerns? It has already been addressed largely. Sick day rules, mainly we are concerned about volume depletion and dehydration which may worsen AKI, uh, urinary infections and uh, infections. Now, euglycemic ketosis sir, has already handled. The other important thing is does it worsen acute kidney injury? Does it potentiate acute kidney injury? Can it co uh, cause acute kidney injury? What is the data on that? Now, the common scenarios where I stop, where we stop is sick days. Patients coming with diarrhea, vomiting, fever, decreased intake of water, they're already having some pre-renal AKI component. We stop SGLT2 inhibitors. Generally, IP patients who come in sick, they will have a component of dehydration, hypovolemia, and sepsis in them. It would be better, more prudent to stop SGLT2 inhibitors in them. Rising creatinine acutely, if you're thinking it's a component of acute kidney injury, I would definitely stop SGL2 inhibitors. Perioperative period and if there is a significant component of acidemia, we would stop SGL2 inhibitors. Now patient education is more important because it's not just important in us stopping SGL2 inhibitors at the right time, but it's also that patients who have been started on SGL2 inhibitors are asked to stop it on sick days when they're having any uh, even outpatient surgeries or because most of the time when they come they're already on those medications when they get admitted for the particular surgery or when they come ad admitted for the angiography so therefore we must try to just like we look at ac inhibitors and arbs perioperatively SGLT 2 inhibitors are also some drugs that we must look at perioperatively now what about infections so genital mycotic infection studies have shown that there's a higher risk two to four times risk of causing these infections they are more seen in the first few months of starting SGLT2 inhibitors, more in women and also women who already have pre-existing infections such as these. However, as Sir already said, this is not a contraindication to starting or continuing SGLT2 inhibitors. You can always give them antifungals and continue the SGLT2 inhibitors. Urinary tract infections and fornia gangrenes, earlier studies, there was an association. However, the later studies, especially all the CKD trials, have not shown a significantly raised, statistically significant uh, risk of infections however however we must use them in caution when patients with recurrent urinary infections patients with long dwelling in uh, uh, foley's catheters patients who have a bladder which is not functioning normally and patients with complicated utis we must think twice so when you asked a group of nephrologists have you encountered more urinary infections uh, overwhelming group said yes or maybe a smaller group about 30 percent said no now, this is a question that I'd like to pose to the audience. If patient develops acute pyelonephritis while already on SGLT2 inhibitors, imagine he's a diabetic. Would you consider restarting SGLT2 inhibitors after some time? Raise of hands if you would. No. Okay. So most nephrologists would not. Some of them are unsure of what to do being nephrologists themselves. And a good proportion, 46%, especially the younger lot of nephrologists, say that they would start in about three to six months. What does literature tell you? If it's not a complicated UTI, if it's not a recurrent UTI, if you do not have any anatomical pathology causing the UTI, you can actually restart the SGLT2 inhibitors in three to six months with close monitoring of for recurrence of urinary infection. I personally would not. What about acute kidney injury? So this was an editorial that came out in the American Journal of Kidney Disease in 2020, which looked, which said that we can finally stop worrying about SGLT2 inhibitors and acute kidney injury. So when I get a cardio consult for a patient with, acu with acute heart failure, patients admitted on high-dose diuretics, I usually tend to stop SGL2 inhibitors. But studies looking at subcohorts of most large major uh, cardiac and renal outcome trials have shown that there is no higher risk of AKI when SGL2 inhibitors are used. In fact, they have some amount of protective effect against acute kidney injury. But these are long-term follow-up trials who are looking at progression of CKD, progression of heart failure. The same editorial at the end gives a caveat. It is prudent to temporarily withhold SGL2 inhibitors along with diuretics, metformin, NSAIDs and RAS blockers under conditions of intercurrent illness, procedures involving contrast media because they can potentially cause acute kidney injury. The same editorial is a two-edged sword. 
the start they this is the title that they give but at the end of the end of the editorial they say this so the risk factors for aki in these patients is dehydration hypovolemia there's a decrease in glomerular filtration because this, this the, the same thing that we say decrease glomerular filtration pressure also decreases the gfr so in a state where they're already predisposed to aki i would think twice before giving them sgl2 inhibitors and they also produce some amount of hypotension and they predispose to infections as well acidosis the fda monitoring surveillance studies have shown a higher risk of acidosis which already has been talked about the acidosis is predominantly because of hypovolemia some insulopenia and direct effects on the pancreatic beta cells so i'm not going to talk too much about that nephrologists surprisingly have not encountered too many uh, uh, cases of acidosis in patients with SGLT2 inhibitors, probably because the, di the diabetologists and the physicians are handling them. So, are you a flozinator? So, if you look at this flow chart, the most important thing is before becoming a flozinator, look at the volume status of the patient. If the patient is hypovolemic, if the patient you think is volume depleted, please think twice before starting an SGLT2 inhibitor. If they are volumic, you can go ahead. What would we say? Advise the patient on sick day rules and follow up the creatinine at about one to three month interval to see if there is a more than 30 percent rise there's more of more than a 30 percent rise just like in ace inhibitors and arbs we would tend to stop them now finally the overall picture do nephrologists generally support the rapid rise of sgl2 inhibitors in diabetic practice what, what are we seeing from our spectrum of cases that come to us on referral so a uh, overwhelming majority still support the rise of SGLT2 inhibitors. We think there is good evidence, but especially older nephrologists, senior nephrologists think twice. They have a lot of reservations about this. Some the reasons that they quote is real world evidence. Real world evidence needs more time. We, this is too uh, soon that we have, sir. Yes, but we are looking at AC inhibitors, ARBs for 30, 40 years. We this is 10 years. We do not. Uh, this is a small cohort of nephrologists who feel so. And there are more adverse events than expected. And there's also suspicion of a pharma driven rise. Now, with your personal experience, are you overall for or against uh, SGLT2 inhibitors? Uh, overwhelming majority are pro, and a few of them are neutral towards SGLT2 inhibitors. The jury may be out as far as uh, nephrologists are concerned. So, I had also given a last column for comments, and one senior nephrologist said this prescribing to the right beneficiary with a good thought process. The mechanism of action, the effects of this drug is multipotent. So therefore, you must think about each patient, look at the physiology that is happening in each patient with a good thought process before prescribing for each, each and every individual patient may be different. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. As a first line, was it or just like? No, sir. Uh, most nephrologists feel that they would use AC inhibitors, ARBs first line, and only then SGL2 inhibitors. So no, they were not against using it, but no. they just as a first but line. But practically, most of the time, what happens is when you use AC ARBs al already, they are already having a slight AKI. Their creatinine goes up by around 0.1 to 0.2. At that point in time, most of us are not comfortable with adding on an SGL2 inhibitor, thinking that patients are already panicking. Creatinine is 1.3, now it's become 1.4. So if you add an SGL2 inhibitor at that point, so most of the time we are not able to reach that third step where we add on an SGL2 inhibitor. That's practically what we see yeah. okay. in real world scenarios. Uh, uh, what about the, uh, if a patient comes to you with, uh, who has uh, just uh, recently diagnosed diabetes and already he, is, he has CKD, would you like to start uh, this uh, galifalosins first? So I would so first fine. do salt restriction, BP control, glycemic control, ACE, ARB, maximal RAS blockade, and only then I would add on SGL2 inhibitors in my protocol, in my mind. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think it's a wonderful uh, uh, session, like where uh, the three different specialties they spoke about for SGLT2 and uh, again uh, come back and uh, where we need to be more cautious and we are concerned about that. And uh, uh, yeah, sorry, you sorry, have sorry, you sorry. got a question to complete? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Complete after that, I will ask. Yeah, <laughs> please complete. Yeah, uh, sir. Actually, uh, there are two, three questions. Uh, one is uh, about these fractures uh, because uh, sir def uh, beautifully uh, elaborated on the vitamin D deficiency and fracture possibility. Very nice presentation and presentation. The art was also very nice. So uh, whether we should uh, uh, this uh, evaluate for the vitamin D deficiency. And we should we can give them routinely the vitamin D's as vitamin D's has been there were some studies that it is beneficial in the cardiac but that was not those were small studies so what about the vitamin D levels 
another question is for my uh, sir is about uh, hydralazine and nitrates uh, what about the cardiac patients who start and this yeah dr santosh would you like to answer that the hydralazine and nitrates so i'll step off yeah. the oh, who had asked this question ah uh, yeah so the hydralazine and nitrates also have been shown to be beneficial so the question is if that is causing in a patient with hypovolemia or hypotension because all of all of them can many of the drugs that we are giving for heart failure can cause hypotension and hypovolemia the most important thing is we need to assess that hypovolemia and hydro or what is it uh, hypo, hypotensive effects of other drugs cautiously that is why i'm saying along with because this is costly compared to the other drugs but the, the cost benefit ratio is there that is why it is sh shown as class 1 indication so one of the most important thing that we have to advise the patient is that patient has to have a bp apparatus at home at home blood sugar monitoring and home blood pressure monitoring has to be strictly uh, what is it complied with in the patients whom we are starting uh, what is it uh, this sglt2 inhibitors and in addition of course a home three equipment they need to buy one is bp apparatus one is glucometer and uh, one is a weighing machine so whatever we advise a patient with heart failure we just you need to tell them that this particular drug when you are starting it has to be extra careful about all these things but it is benef benefit is also there because it is having uh, what is it all the other drugs were given in all these trials because standard of care because currently all the other drugs that were standard of care was given even in the placebo group so in addition to that this particular drug has shown benefit in patients with heart failure whatever kind of heart failure that is preserved as well as reduced and in diabetics also they were receiving the standard of care for all that is they were on statins they were on arbs they were on ac inhibitors they were on beta blockers but in addition this actually added to the benefit so what i suggest is most important thing is this uh, volemic status and the blood pressure all the other see the problem is when as i said this in one slide i showed you as many of us showed in all our talks when one drug is going to act from head to feet in so many systems we had to be it will have very significant beneficial effects but it will also may have a lot of extra side effects so we should be like fornius gang gangrene and so many other like on the effect on the bone and uh, multiple systems may get affected so we have to start there is benefit uh, but we have to be cautious about uh, even unreported side effects from other systems the positive effects seems to be more that's the crash of the story Thank you very much. And, uh, uh, fragile patients, already very sick patient, lean individual, elderly individual. They definitely, they will be a sarcopenic, and the, that is as two process will be there. Those individuals, you should not start AG, AG inhibitor. If at all, if you want to add, maybe AG is lesser. But still fragile. If you want to use, probably you can go for a vitamin D levels, and probably you can improve the levels. Thereby, you can prevent the fracture, which is supposed to be the better and complication. One, one, one announcement, please. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It may not reverse. If you want to give, probably you have to address that issue also. Dr. Parandam, and this debate can continue. So I. like uh, so we are 10 minutes short of time so there's one uh, announcement the chairperson please be there so uh, two faculty have to leave so they are kindly consented to give the talk so i invite dr murli dharan to give his talk followed by dr sandeep seth and i thank both of them because dr sandeep just came from delhi just for this talk so i think uh, our murli has to leave and uh, thank you very much both both of you and uh, so Ten minutes talk each, and we'll back on track. And thank you, the the chair persons, for bearing with us. Thank you.
Thank you for allowing me to be here. <coughs> it's a great evening. Thank you, Abraham. Thank you, Sundar. Nice meeting and it's a pleasure to be here this evening. And I'm going to talk with you for the next uh, say 10 to 15 minutes about the the new things that have developed in the pacemaker, relatively new. Uh, cardiac resurfacing therapy by the standard bioventricular pacemaker or the fancy of today, conduction system pacing. So which is the first line of therapy, what should you do? So to see like uh, here, uh, when we take cardiac output, stroke volume, performance, is a well known thing years ago that we have a uh, preload, contractility, afterload, heart rate. This is one of the reasons so many of our patients are doing very well, even in the contractility down, if you optimize, like what we discussion are going on, like SGLT inhibitor and uh, isolazine or hydrazine or AS inhibitor or knee. But one important thing we recognize the last two to three decades is uh, ventricular dyssynchrony. So in a person, if you have a dyssynchrony, apart from preload or alteration or afterload or contractility, he is prone for cardiac failure. The reason is very simple, as evidently seen in this cartoon, if there is a Leibniz block, the hallmark of dyssynchrony, if there is a Leibniz block, there is going to be a AV dyssynchrony, where the left ventricle is going to get activated later. Number two, there is going to be interventricular dyssynchrony between the right ventricle and left ventricle. Number three is going to be a intraventricular dyssynchrony. So the ventricle is going to contract in an asynchronous way inside the ventricle, in relation to the right ventricle, and in relation to the, the atria where there is a diastolic problem. So what was the solution? We had a simple solution, as I always say, a simple solution, never a perfect for a complex problem. But for all this dyssynchrony, atrioventricular, interventricular, and intraventricular, we had this uh, bioventricular pacing, wherein we placed a, a pacemaker with a lead in the right ventricle, right atrium, and one through the coronary sinus going to the epicardium of the left ventricle in the posterior lateral vein and synchronize. So this was a state of art therapy for more than two to three decades. And impressive results we have had over time. So like a, just a simple thing, one of the patient with the RA, RV lead and the LV lead. And you can see how the ECG shows narrowing of the QRS. A Leibniz block completely narrows down. This doesn't happen every time, but there are one of the very few patients, super responder doing very well. Similarly, we can see one of my patients where you can see what's happening, the ventricle pre and post, a good improvement. So evident treatment, Excellent treatment was available for several thousand patients and with the randomized trial also. Looking at uh, CRT trials even from 2001, we had Mustaik, Path 3HF, Companion, Miracle, Care HF, Madit, Reverse, up to Raft. Several trials, several thousand patients touching more than 18,000 patients in various subgroups, they showed excellent change in the patient's outcome like uh, looking at things like from DPDT to ventricular volume or survival, survival from heart failure or overall survival. A defined treatment and you can see it, if you see NYHA class and CRT efficiency, there's a good reduction in heart failure, was the heart failure, better the outcome, uh, mortality reduction. And importantly we realize why does the QRS better the effectiveness. So why does the QRS by all these trials from compared thing, looking at the QRS duration wide, not only the why does the QRS we saw improvement comparing to a narrow QRS to wider, there is a significant improvement by the log ratio, but also look at the QRS morphology. This was eye opener. In 2000s, we were putting for everybody with a wide QRS, but we realized, yes, if there is an LBBB, it is better. Non-LBBB, you can see the forest plot, no significant improvement. If the LBBB, there is significant improvement. So we, we learned a lot. We learned a lot. We did a lot. So many trials have come. They told us finally indication of CRT in patient sinus system. Highest responders are widest QRS, Leibniz block, women, non ischemic cardiomyopathy. Other extreme is non responders are people who are narrow QRS or non LBBB. So, well defined, lot of trials, good indication. This slide is very familiar to all of us where we look at it. The green one is class 1 indication, LBBB, or class 2 a non LBBB if it is very wide QRS. And occasional situation wherein you are going to pace a patient for some other reason and he is going to be a pace a dependent. Like in a atrial fibrillation, I go and update the AV junction and I have to pace. If he is having already a pre-existing LV for dysfunction, RV pacing will be deleterious, so we are going to add it. So 
these all the ways it has evolved over years and we know by v is a presently gold standard for comparison it improves the cardiac function reverses the ventricular remodeling improving the nih status reducing heart failure hospitalization and increasing survival then came the next one it was cumbersome it was challenging it was initially considered the mother of all pacing procedures now technology improved but the idea also improved thank to my friend one of the proud thing from india pogalendi vijayaraman to deshmukh and dr hoang from china we started looking at the conduction system itself forget about right ventricle forget about lv epicardium aim at the conduction system itself aim for is bundle or left bundle how do you do you can either pay the is bundle itself directly or you can go to the distal is bundle or go to the left bundle itself then we learned within we within years in fact the pace conference what we did in chennai in 2018 opened a big avenue in our country also it opened immediately we realized you need not pay the left bundle even a left to the septal pacing you can do non selective left bundle pacing you can do selective left bundle pacing do we started calling them in the single term left bundle branch area pacing and a little challenging initially with is bundle particularly like this where is bundle has to be carefully mapped interestingly we do in the atrial side of the uh, uh, ventricle that means the av septum and we place it so we see good research in that also and many times we put a backup lead in the right ventricle also for certain reasons which if time permits we can discuss so is bundle pacing was a catchy thing you can see here one of my patient is bundle very narrow the qrs will look normal because we are hitting the crux of the conduction system and same thing we could do even with the fluoroscopy recently we started doing with the fluoroscopy a te guider you can see the sheath abutting on the right side of the septum and as you are placing it you can see it is being screwed into the intraventricular septum deep up to the left side of the thing a yeah, three three dimensional reconstruction same thing you can see the lead is sitting here beautifully and uh, the results are extremely good we are doing and in reality i want to the seekers for my younger friends here left bundle branch area pc is one of the easiest to think the learning curve is small very wide safety margin excellent result easy to do it is not all a cumbersome something very easy to do i don't want to go into the depth of it we can discuss later if time permits but we knew it scores better than is bundle pacing for various reasons so to come to the this point now we have three things conduction system pacing with eastern left bundle are going to the standard uh, biotical pacing by v is non physiological from epicardial to endocardial whereas csp is more physiological homogeneous activation by we able to correct peripheral conduction block uh, two because it is a peripheral block whereas csp usually for proximal conduction block only and by we limitation or lack of suitable vein or phrenic nerve stimulation or in right bundle branch block absolutely no role by any studies whereas csp there can be a problem particularly in spacing increase in threshold limited use in uh, patient ivcd or higher incidence of ficus regurgitation this being recently recognized in bundle pacing by several group quickly looking at in another one minute the various trials interestingly there are trials like is alternative trial where they compared by v versus is pacing and they found similar improvement in various parameters and uh, ejection fraction but small number like you have a six month follow up only single center study more of a non ischemic cardiomyopathy and small sample size moving to the latest one just few months back uh, level 80 trial again they use a uh, ECG imaging technology, looking at the activation, LV activation time greatly improves. But again, six months follow up only, and the county conduction pacing was non-inferior to by V, and but the significant crossover one was the other. And coming to the other thing like recent pilot trial also, again you see a good improvement, comparable, but again six months only in complete left bundle branch block, significant crossover. These are the small trials only available. And looking at the pooled data by Pugalain the group and Desh took everything, where it was seen as the rescue uh, is bundle pacing or the primary is bundle pacing, the numbers are limited. Numbers are limited. The improvement is excellent. And looking at various trials being portrayed in the literature, you are seeing most of them are observational. So compared to CRT standard biotical pacing, most of the things are observational in our group by all the trials. and coming to the european society of cardiology guidelines also when they quote all these trials they come with a single comment that is there is growing evidence mainly from observational studies only that is bundle branch pacing may be safe and effective in these settings but large rcts are avoided that's a reason thing so coming to guideline what do they say 
in patient treated with bundle pacing device probing should be carefully tailored i will reserve it for discussion and crt candidate where it is unsuccessful you can continue with bundle pacing class 2a indication only and patients who have a high risk of pacing failure which may be detrimental to them think of a rv backup and looking at thing the s bundle pacing with ventilator backup may be considered in patient where the pace and update strategy is useful so very limited indication as of today but of course this guidelines are 2021 only after that several papers what i showed we as emerged supporting leg bundle pacing more than s bundle pacing so to conclude my friends there is no evidence for harder endpoints compared to biventricular pacing for conduction system pacing like maze or a heart failure hospitalization conduction system pacing may be a better alternative particularly non ischemic cardiomyopathy with complete lbbb and conduction system pacing and by we should rather be complementary that is we are going for heart crt or lot crt than to choose one over the other and trials in ischemic cardiomyopathy are lacking maybe coming years going to make it so it is an interesting strategy beckoning more data or more proof to come to maybe we will be combining all these things in the coming days thank you i'll stop here maybe if there are some question we can discuss thank you dr murli thank you dr murli uh, since start of time we'll take the questions afterwards if you have time so i uh, invite dr sandeep thank you very much and thank you for coming only for this meeting flying all the way down from delhi Uh, thank you, Dr. Abraham, for accommodating my request. That my talk was actually tomorrow, but I had unfortunately c committed to another conference for tomorrow. So my talk, in a way, is a continuity of the last session. So I'll be talking about practically the same drugs, and I won't repeat that data. So heart failure with preserved ejection fraction has come back into vogue. Till maybe two, three years ago, when we used to give talks about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the talk was very simple. It's an entity which we have. We don't see too much of it. And we don't really have much of drugs for it. We just treat the cause. So the cause is hypertension. The cause is renal failure. And we treat that. We're not doing anything for this, except maybe you're giving mineral cortical receptor antagonists. So there was really no data and all the data was only for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And this is the typical patient, patient who's elderly, female, hypertensive, maybe has atrial fibrillation. Echo is relatively normal. But then you find, if you look at it in more detail, there's subtle changes. The Doppler shows evidence of increased LA pressure, so E by E dash is elevated. The LA is relatively larger than what you expect. And when you do a BNP, the values are relatively high. So this is a typical patient with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. What is the burden in India? The burden of uh, heart failure per se is calculated to be about 10 million patients. And if you look at the various registries, about 17 to 25% of the patients have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Even a survey that we did in villages around Delhi showed that uh, majority of the patients there, which we screened, these were not patients who were symptomatic, these are patients we picked up from their houses and who had short symptoms of shortness of breath and pedal edema. Two thirds of the patients actually had heart failure, preserved ejection fraction. These are not patients who were coming to the hospital. The terms have been gradually changing from diastolic dysfunction where it was just E by E, e by A is abnormal to a better definition of diastolic heart failure but now that we have defined heart failure with reduced ejection fraction now to match that the term is now heart failure with preserved ejection fraction the causes you're all familiar with M many of these patients can have non-cardiac causes so renal failure obesity iron deficiency anemia coad these are causes which can be there or it can be related to the heart patients with uncontrolled hypertension can also be resulting in heart failure preserved ejection fraction. I won't dwell too much about the diagnosis. We all know the diagnosis. The first thing is patient should be symptomatic. So there's no point trying to define diastolic dysfunction because you're not going to treat diastolic dysfunction. If you do an echo in anyone who's 75, 80, 85 years of age, you will find some subtle changes on the echo. You're not going to treat that. Patient has to have some symptoms. Patient should be coming to you with shortness of breath. Fraction is normal. 
and then you start looking for some additional evidence. So you're finding natriuretic peptides which are high and you have some more evidence on echo. So you find left ventricular hypertrophy which is there in many of our hypertension patients when you look for it carefully, patients with renal failure, patients with aortoarthritis and other diseases, you find that something or the other is abnormal. So this constellation is what constitutes heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The ESC has given a very good algorithm which is essentially the same that first you suspect heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, look at the symptoms, do a basic echo, then do a more advanced echo, look at the natriuretic peptide. Majority of the patients will be diagnosed with just that. In patients, we are still finding the patient has shortness of breath, but your criteria are not fitting in. Then they suggest advanced tests. You might want to do a wedge catheterization. You might want to do a diastolic stress test. We basically you do the stress test, but you're looking at diastolic parameters instead of systolic parameters. And finally, you look at the causes. So you try and find the cause. The cause actually can be something which is more actively treatable. It could be hemochromatosis, a myeloid, an infiltrative cardiomyopathy, or renal failure uncontrolled hypertension, there might be a reversible cause for that hypertension. So you have to, besides treating the symptom, you have to find a specific cause. So essentially, the cutoffs that we use is that the E, e dash is less than 10, the LA volume is more than 34, there's evidence of elevated PA pressures, the GLS comes down, the walls are thick, and NTPRO BNP is elevated. So if you get a constellation of this, you're secure that you're dealing with the patient with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So with that, now what are we doing in terms of management besides giving simple symptomatic treatment? Currently, we think in terms of a tailored approach, we, we know what is happening. Patients are having congestion. You have to treat the congestion. Patients have pulmonary artery hypertension. You treat the pulmonary artery hypertension. You have to also look at the comorbidities, comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, obesity. Along with that, these patients are often bedridden, you have to provide exercise training to improve their myopathies. And this is, this is a very good table which focuses on the symptoms and also focuses on the type of phenotype the patient has. So if the patient is obese, has a metabolic syndrome, has diabetes, on top of that he has congestion, we would give diuretics, we would reduce the calorie to reduce the weight. And the two new players in the, the management of heart failure preserved dejection fraction, the SGLT2 inhibitors, ARNI, and the older drug which was being used for a long time, spironolactone. So you would reduce the, the lung congestion. If the patient has bradycardia, you would think of uh, giving possibly a pacemaker if the patient doesn't respond to usual measures. If there's pulmonary congestion, you would add pulmonary vasodilators. Many of these patients are asymptomatic for uh, quite some time. And then when they get atrial fibrillation, then suddenly the balance tilts to become symptomatic and they come to us. So they will need rate control for atrial fibrillation and they would need anticoagulation. So what is the current evidence which has come, which has suddenly brought heart failure with preserved dejection fraction into prominence? This was the older trial, the TOPCAT trial, which showed that mineral corticoid receptor antagonists are useful in heart failure preserved dejection fraction. After that, for quite some time, there was hardly any trial and we were really not showing much of interest in this entity. And then the two new players came in. Arnie came in, but Arnie was trying to get into heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It was not succeeding. The data was not coming in. In the meantime, the SGLT2 inhibitors came in from a diabetic drug. It became a heart, heart failure drug initially with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And surprisingly, with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, it was showing benefit with all subgroups, quite a bit of which was discussed in the former session. I'm not going to go into the mechanism. In simple terms, it acts on the proximal tubule. It causes glucosuria, causes water loss, and causes sodium loss. But the sodium loss here is much less than what we get with pure diuretics. It's also antifibrotic. There are a number of trials which have now come in, which shows that these drugs work in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And whether it's empaglyphosin or dapaglyphosin, both work in the various ranges of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Just going to two of them. This was one of the first trials, heart emperor preserved, which gave empaglyphosin to patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So these are patients who had a EF of more than 40% and they had elevated BNP and they had some echo evidence of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. In that, the primary outcome was 13.8% versus 17.1%, a clear benefit. 
and this benefit was not restricted to any particular ejection fraction. This was the data and the curves of uh, the adverse events separate very fast. This is the latest trial, the similar kind of evidence, much larger trial with less sick patients with the dapagliflozin. Patients who are being otherwise very well treated with diuretics, ACE inhibitors, ARB, beta blockers, MRAs. What is of interest is that the patients in the emperor trial, in the deliver trial, very few patients were on ARNI. But even in that, the patients who were on ARNI, there was an additional benefit of SGLT2 inhibitor. So even if you give ARNI, the, there is an additional top up benefit which comes in SGLT2 inhibitors. So, this is Arni. Arni tried very hard to get into the field of heart failure preserved ejection fraction, but surprisingly, the Paragon trial at first analysis was not very successful. Given to patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, if you just look at the graph and don't look at the statistics, it looks as if there is a clear cut benefit in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. But if you look at the p-value, if you are, you are a pure statistician, then the p-value is 0 0.0585. Had there been some more patients benefiting, the value would have come just below 0 0.05 and this would have become a miraculous drug. But there is a clear trend that ARNI works in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So where does it work? If you combine all the patients, it doesn't seem to show significant value. But if you look more at the data from women versus men, there's a clear benefit more towards women that it works in patients with heart failure preserved ejection fraction and women. Similarly, if you have a ejection fraction of less than 57%, the benefit is there. Beyond 57%, the benefit goes away. Based on that, the FDA approved this drug for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So now if you look at all the drugs, if you combine all the drugs, each of these drugs, drugs which have been reducing blood pressure like Velsartan and Charm, even Digoxin, there's an ancillary trial which shows that there is some improvement in diastolic function, then Topcat, Paragon, Emperor. All these drugs have shown benefits in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So there is no reason why we should not be combining all the drugs in patients who are actually so symptomatic. And like you have four pillars for the management of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Similarly, if you think of the pillars for management of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, you have MRAs, SGLT2 inhibitors, loop diuretics, and ARNI. So all these four drugs now have sufficient evidence that patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction can be treated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep. I think it's very clear that like, uh, so the uh, concept of uh, the preserved ejection fraction is keep uh, rising, like uh, we do see more awareness and more cases are being detected. And you are rightly put the, uh, the therapeutic ornamentorium, what is the thing which is uh, available right now for the treating HPF. Thank you, Sandeep. Can we take a couple of questions from the floor? There is, yeah, please. Dr. Sandeep, you got a question to answer. We are, we are. Not for sir, actually for uh, Murli Dharan sir. Uh, sorry, it is actually I want to thank sir for the beautiful classes on the YouTube, uh, very uh, explanatory. And uh, I just uh, want to ask him about this. Uh, what is the difference between the backup that RV pacing and CCM, and why CCM has not taken up? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the backup RV pacing they have mentioned specifically is why like his pacing it was done not for LB. What happens is sometimes we pay the his we have had encountered what happens is acute threshold self is going to be not great. The RV is very small and later there can be sensing failure sometimes even pacing failure. Rising threshold is one of the major problem we faced with the inbital pacing. So if the pacing fails suppose in a patient who is dependent on pacemaker then we may, it may be lethal to his life itself. So we keep a RV backup. But CCM is actually you given another pacing current during the absolute refractory period to improve the contractility. Somehow uh, we need more data on that. There are few trials, only one or two trials which showed CCM can help in improving the contractility. Otherwise, there are no great data and an expensive therapy. So maybe coming years it may come. It came in the market, but we didn't take up. Maybe Santosh Jipmer, Raja, they can tell our Apollo Abraham can say that's the reason. Sir. So it's a little different. So here are we pacing it only to give a backup if the is bundle fails, sir. Dr. Satya Murthy. Thanks. For 
example, if you take the example of top cat, they used as minimum as 12.5 milligram. Is that if you give 25, it's better, or if you give 50, it's better. I see a lot of prescriptions coming with 50 milligram also. Of course, if you go back to the basics, myocardium itself has got uh, MR receptors. So what is your take on this? Actually, look, look at most of our combinations of drugs that we use, where there's a diuretic and aldectone added. We are in fact effectively giving much higher doses. So if you're trying to just treat for all the on the basis of evidence just to reduce outcomes, then 12.5 to 25 is sufficient. But if you're also trying to retain potassium, then yes, you need higher dose. But there's no data that if you give very high doses, the benefit will go up. So benefit will also persist. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sandeep, Dr. Satyamurti. Thank you, chairpersons. So thank you very much. Uh, next session is about woman and heart failure. Uh, to the uh, people who do not know, this hotel is totally run by women. From the guards to the everybody, everything is run by women. So, so for, because of that, we thought to give the longest session of the meeting for uh, woman and heart failure. So I request the chairpersons. So the, the chairpersons are Dr. Lavanya, Dr. Jayanti, Dr. Babu Erumalai, Dr. Rohini and Dr. Kote, are they there? I think uh, they said that they would not be able to come. So Dr. Jayanti, Dr. Uh, uh, Lavanya and Dr. Babu Erumalai, please start the proceedings. And the chairperson is, of course, Dr. Mijja Landstack. He's come all the way again they have taken great pains because he has traveled about 14 hours to reach today morning and he's leaving tomorrow so we have to give a big hand to him because these people they are taking so much of pain so dr Mijia, please because this they come only for this meeting they're not coming for bharat darshan they're not coming for mahabalipuram visits they are coming only for the meeting and that has to be applauded because Here's a person, very eminent person from ESC, and yes, four changing of the flights. So with that, he has come, and he has come at short notice. So thank you very much, sir, and over to you uh, to moderate and ch chair the session. It's one and a half hour session, and uh, Dr. Jyotsna could not come, but we managed with technology. The talk will be presented uh, virtually. So all our, uh, Dr. Justin will be joining us soon. Thank you very much. It feels, it feels uh, so, uh, women are as such very special and uh, women cardiologists are extremely uh -huh. special. I feel and uh, talking about diseases cardiovascular diseases in women I think is one of the most important uh, topics in the field of cardiology sometimes mostly ignored also so I call upon the first speaker Dr. Rajeshwari Naik to give her talk on are women with heart failure treated equally well thank you Dr. Jainti um, very delighted to be here with the August chairs and uh, thank you, Dr. Abramoman, for me being here today. So, are women with heart failure treated equally well? Slide show panel. Okay. So, are women with uh, heart failure treated equally well with regard to prevention, pharmacotherapy, clinical trials and registries, and devices and uh, heart transplant? See, there are major gender differences with regard to cardiac structure and cardiac physiology, etiology, and symptoms of heart failure. 
pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of therapeutic agents, response to treatment, and enrollment in clinical trials and registries, and prognosis and outcome. Coming to major differences in cardiovascular physiology, women tend to have smaller heart, lower LV mass, increased LV contractility, and they have more preserved LV mass with age. They have less myocyte apoptosis, smaller coronaries, faster resting heart rate compared to men, and they have lesser catecholamine-induced vasoconstriction. They also have estrogen protecting them with regard to collagen synthesis and degradation, estrogen inhibited RAS, both these favorably affecting the premenopausal women. Oh, and there are certain gender differences with regard to calcium handling, NO system, and natriuretic peptides. Uh, premenopausal women will have increased nitric oxide and natriuretic peptides. So following a myocardial injury, there is reduced LV function, increased wall stress, both activating the RAS and NS, ASNS. And women, it causes reduced apoptosis, reduced cellular death, causing concentric LVS, and late onset of cardiac decompensation. However, in men, it causes increased apoptosis, increased cellular death, eccentric LVH and LV dilatation, and early onset of cardiac decompensation. Coming to prevention of heart failure, there are certain gender-specific risk factors and mechanism of disease which predominate in women. They are postpartum cardiomyopathy, hormonal changes happening in women at menopause, certain autoimmune diseases, certain psychosocial stress, which can cause stress cardiomyopathy, and variety of cancer treatment, especially breast cancer treatment, which can lead on to heart failure, which are uh, specific to women. Coming to prevalence of risk factors, women tend to have more of microvascular dysfunction and hypertension as uh, risk factors compared to men where it is more of macrovascular disease, CAD, diabetes, and obesity as risk factors. Coming to gender differences in pharmacodynamics and uh, pharmacokinetics, plasma levels of ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers are nearly two and a half times more in women compared to men for the same dose of drug given. And this is thought to be because of lower body weight, lower height, and higher body fat in women. They also have lower peripheral distribution of the drug and lower hepatic and glomerular filtration rate, causing reduced drug clearance and increased plasma concentration. That is why we need to be careful why titrating the drugs in female patients with heart failure. So women are highly underrepresented in uh, clinical trials. A systematic review of several trials from 1985 till 2006 showed that women were represented only less than 30% in most of the clinical trials. So this slide shows major landmark trials done in heart failure with reject reduced rejection fraction. And you can see women representation is hardly less than 30 percent. There are certain gender specific ADR, adverse drug reactions, which are many a time not reported in the clinical trials. In the far, past four decades, we have had only about 10 to 11 percent of the clinical trials reporting ADR. That is gender specific ADR. So coming to gender in clinical trials, women are highly underrepresented, maybe because women tend to have more of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. They are more elderly. Uh, elderly people are usually excluded from clinical trials. Malignancy-related heart failure is common in women. Again, they are excluded from clinical trials. And there are certain ADR which are specific to gender. However, the the data on this is very scarce. So coming to gender specific heart failure outcome and prognosis, women tend to report lower quality of life, 
they report more emotional problems like anxiety and depression. However, they tend to have better outcome with treatment. Both Framingham Heart Study and Preserve Study showed that nearly 20% of the nearly 20% lower risk of death and hospitalization in women compared to men. So, so women in heart failure registries. So this is a European Society Cardiology Heart Failure Long Term One Year Follow Up, which showed that there was only 37.4% registration in acute heart failure uh, in women with heart failure and only 28.8% registration in the chronic heart failure. And across the regions of Europe, this, this is the registration rate in chronic heart failure, it is less than 30% and in acute heart failure, it is less than 40%. So does it matter being included in a heart failure registry? I feel it is yes, because there is association between enrollment in a heart failure registry and subsequent mortality. This study, it is a prospective cohort study, which followed nearly 2,32,000 patients. And they showed that enrollment in heart failure registry is associated with reduced all-cause mortality. And this is explained by maybe better utilization of cardiovascular services and high heart failure medications. This kaplan meyers curve shows that there is better survival in heart failure patients who are registered in the heart failure registry. Both inpatients and outpatients heart failure patients who are registered in the registry, as shown by the green uh, graph, has had a better survival. And they showed that male gender, younger age, higher level of education, and being registered in a registry are the predictors of better survival in heart failure patients. So coming to gender differences in device therapy, women are less likely to receive device therapy, could be because of implantation related complications are more in women. The many women refuse to undergo procedure. There is physician inertia to refer for patient uh, patients for device therapy, and women tend to receive less ATP and less shocks. This could be because non-ischemic heart failure is more common in women. They tend to have less scar and less arrhythmia. And however, response to CRT is better in women compared to men. Again, could be related to smaller heart size and um, prevalence. So LBBB is more common in women compared to men, and they do, tend to have wider QRS compared to uh, men heart failure patients. So gender differences in ICD counseling and out, uh, implantation. This is an observational study which included something like 21,000 patients who were admitted with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. They assess the rate of ICD counseling and implantation and they showed that women were counseled less like less frequently than men and among those however among those counseled both men and women were similarly uh, likely to receive icd so both madit 2 and madit crt show, showed that women have less inappropriate icd therapy compared to icd shock compared to men uh, heart failure patients Following the, the probability of death following a first appropriate shock was less in women compared to men. So why are women underrepresented in CRT trials? This could be because women tend to have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction where CRT is not indicated. They are referred risks, less refer referral for uh, device therapy because of higher procedural risk complications. Many a time it is refusal from, from the patient to undergo CRT. However, female gender is an independent predictor of uh, greater CRT benefit for reasons like 
non-ischemic heart failure, more LBBB, less atrial arrhythmias, especially less AF, and smaller LV volumes. So uh, coming to CRT-induced LV reverse remodeling, again, this has been found to be much better in women compared to men. Both end systolic volume and diastolic volume ejection fraction was nearly 10% better in women population who had undergone CRT compared to men population. So this is a, this a trial followed nearly nearly for 1,45,000 patients who had undergone CRTD under US Medicare, and they showed that LBBB predicts better outcome in women than men. So women with LBBB had better survival. Among women with LBBB and without LBBB, women with LBBB had better survival. So coming to MCS, the clinical trial, trial in, uh, enrollment in women with heart failure is very less again, less than 30%. This could be because of anatomical issues like uh, women are too small to accommodate large ventricular assist devices, especially the pulsatile uh, ventricular devices. And again, they have greater risk of death following the device therapy. They are less likely to receive heart transplant and survival after transplant is less compared to men. However, the newer, smaller, continuous flow left ventricular devices, the survival is similar between men and women. And many a time, women are referred late for the procedure, and very sick patient the outcome and major, with, outcome is less with major uh, complication rate. So this is this um, both intermax and non intermax study showed that women had higher in hospital mortality compared to men following a MCS. Again, listing for uh, MCS is much less in women compared to men. 18.9 versus 29.9 even for continuous flow LVAD. So coming to gender difference in rehab program, program, referral, enrollment, completion of rehab program, all is less in women. This could be because older age, more comorbidities, poor cardiorespiratory fitness, less social support, and higher family responsibility. However, women tend to respond to rehab program better than women, uh, men. So in brief, women have more severe symptoms, poorer outcome, poor quality of life, more psychological problem, more LBBB, they undergo fewer procedures, and they have fewer enrollment in trials and registries. So should gender be a variable in heart failure clinical practice guidelines? Yes, I feel it is yes. And need for the changes, we need to have more women in clinical trials. We need to have gender-based analysis of trials and uh, adverse drug reactions. We need, need to have more elderly people involved in the clinical trials because women tend to be more elderly when they develop heart failure. Maybe we should include heart failure, uh, malignancy-related heart failure in clinical trials and we need to remove the inertia in optimal care for heart failure patients, especially device therapy and heart transplant. So my take home message is gender impacts almost every facet of heart failure. Though prevalence of heart failure is equal between uh, men and women, women are less aggressively treated, highly underrepresented device therapy and transplant LVAD is underused in women and there are certain effective gender specific intervention which should be incorporated in clinical practice guidelines and further studies are needed to shed light on mechanisms and targeted therapies we should not limit opportunities for women with heart failure so are women with heart failure treated equally i feel no the gap is huge and the path to equality is very long and but however i feel that with all the therapeutic targets available the path to equality is going to be sometime in the future she will have the, reach the path of um, peak of equality thank you Uh, 
so thank you for uh, this very uh, condensed speech. Um, the questions will be at the end of the session, and uh, we're looking forward to the next presenter uh, to tell us about uh, HFPF, a disease more common in women. So um, uh, the floor um, is for Dr. Cecilia Mary Magella to tell us uh, the reasons why this is so. Respect to chairpersons, um, I thank uh, Dr. O. Abraham Moment, sir, for his, um, uh, giving me this uh, great opportunity. So heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, a, a disease more common in women. So the sex differences in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, I can very well tell to this crowd that this is one of the most unmet medical needs in the field of cardiovascular medicine now. The female preponderance in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is a distinguishing feature of this disorder, but the association of the sex difference with degree of diastolic dysfunction and clinical outcomes among individuals with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is still an enigma. Clinical perspe perspective, what is new? In patients with heart failure with preserved LVEF from the pursued heart failure preserved ejection fraction trial, which is a multi-center observational study of patients in Eastern Asia, real world heart failure patients. Female sex was independently associated with the presence of echocardiographic diastolic dysfunction according to the ASC and the EACV imaging criteria. Although the incidence of the clinical endpoint did not differ between women and men, female sex was independently associated with increased risk of the clinical endpoint after multivariate adjustment. So what are the clinical implications? Sex differences in heart failure with preserved EF, the need for further research to understand the underlying pathophysiology including contributions of sex hormones, sex hormones deficiency is the need of the future. Heart failure with preserved EF versus heart failure with reduced EF in women. It has been shown that women accounted only for 20 to 25 percent of the subjects in clinical trials evaluating heart failure with reduced EF, whereas the clinical trials assessing heart failure with preserved EF account for as many as 50 to 60 percent of the trial cohort. The pathophysiology of heart failure with preserved EF, the immune system and inflammation has thought to be the central to the development of HFPF. Several comorbidities including hypertension, diabetes, atrial fibrillation, obesity and ischemia are known to be associated with the development and prognosis. Inflammation driven by such comorbidities may be the fundamental mechanism for myocardial dysfunction in these patients. Coming to the various mechanisms which includes LV remodeling, diastolic as well as systolic functions, limitations, RV dysfunction, especially pulmonary vascular diseases and the contribution of atrial fibrillation, volume overload, as well as obesity and other comorbidities, especially anemia. Why is HFPF more common in women than in men? For instance, the hypertension increases the risk of heart failure by three times in women compared to twice in men. This is reported by the AHA 2021 journal. Diabetes mellitus has more pronounced effect on heart failure in women with increasing heart failure risk five times in women when compared to 2.5 times in men. Atrial fibrillation increases the risk of heart failure hospitalization 1.63 times in women as compared to 1.37 times in men. Women have stronger immune responses than men, which may contribute to the different impacts on the development of diastolic dysfunction and subsequent clinical outcomes between the sex. So the common characteristics of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction usually tends to be a female, an elderly female who is obese with a higher NIHA class more cardiovascular comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, AF, 
and valvular heart disease and non cardiovascular comorbidities especially anemia ckd copd cancer peptic ulcer and other psychiatric diseases so the six differences in heart failure with hfpf have been definitely proved there are both extra cardiac as well as intrinsic cardiac mechanism which has to be understood for evaluating the treatment protocols so baseline characteristics the women are older af cad and diabetes are more common in women in men hypertension or obesity are more common in women so likewise we are able to understand that elderly persons especially women atrial fibrillation hypertension renal are relatively more common the echo characteristic increased la size is very important and the clinical outcomes are non cardiovascular cause of death whereas in men especially young age group who are more obese increased lvh increased filling pressures cardiovascular cause of death and sudden cardiac death is so the final result of the pursuit hfpf trial which is a prospective multi center east asian registry women accounted to 55.2% of the overall cohort women had echocardiographic diastolic dysfunction more frequently than men female sex was independently associated with the presence of echocardiographic diastolic dysfunction the clinical endpoint of all cause death or heart failure readmission did not differ between women and men however after multivariate adjustment female sex was independently associated with increased risk of clinical endpoints so the diastolic dysfunction in women another cross sectional study with sex differences with cardiometabolic profile profiles and exercise hemodynamic profiles among individuals with hfpf there were 295 participants in this study who met hemodynamic criteria for hfpf on invasive cardiopulmonary exercise testing this examined the sex differences in hemodynamic parameters during uh, exercise with the right heart catheterization which gives us more knowledge about why this is more common in women the exercise capacity was similar in men and women but women had worse biventricular systolic reserve and diastolic reserve even after multivariate adjustment this is the root cause why this hfpf is more common in women the other issues are the impaired diastolic reserve in women is not the same but correlated with the diastolic dysfunction in echo compared with men women have higher pulmonary capillary wedge pressure index to peak exercise workload which was found out by the right heart catheterization and lower systemic pulmonary arterial compliance at exercise women had higher mitral inflow velocities to diastolic mitral annular velocity at early filling ratios and peak exercise along with higher ef and smaller ventricular dimensions so as recommended by the ac and eacvi as already been mentioned the important four echocardiographic variables septal e prime less than 7 or a lateral e prime less than 10 and average ea e by e prime more than 14 and an la volume index more than 34 ml per meter square and a peak tr velocity more than 2.8 which includes all the diagnostic criteria with an ef of more than 50% and a raised nt pro bnp or a bnp so women versus men in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction the impaired diastolic reserve during exercise but without the evidence of echocardiographic diastolic dysfunction is also presumably larger in women than in men and also on the other hand male patients had a higher prevalence of ckd 4.6% versus 3.2% which uh, 34% which was statistically significant with a p value of 0.001 with and peripheral arterial disease was more common in men which is 8% versus 3.1 3.9% than the female patients these extra cardiac deficits may more predominantly affect the systemic vascular resistance and abnormalities in peripheral oxygen extraction in men than in women as for cardiac function deficits in contractile reserve rather than lv diastolic dysfunction might play a more important role in men than in women but however these points needs further investigations therefore the sex specific cardiac features suggest that a kind of sex specific pathway exists with myocyte with differences in myocyte stiffness 
including sex difference in calcium handling, myocardial substrate metabolism, and activated renin angiotensin aldosterone system in response to low estrogen, a drop in nitric oxide with menopause, protein kinase A, and extracellular signal regulated kinase 2 activated by progesterone. Therefore, it is likely also supported that this sex specificity, that is, the results of the heterogeneity with a possible benefit of succubitol valsartan seen with women in the paragon heart failure. So, anemia and obesity. The systemic inflammation has been thought to be related to the development of diastolic dysfunction. Anemia and obesity are independently associated with the development of diastolic dysfunction. It affects the immune response, cardiomyocyte metabolism, and oxidative stress. Another possibility is that anemia could be just a, a surrogate marker of multimorbidity. So coming to the conclusions, in the pursuit heart failure with preserved EF trial, which is a multi-center East Asian trial registry, women accounted for 55.2% of the overall cohort, proving that heart failure, HFF is related more common in women. With Women had echocardiographic diastolic dysfunction more than men, with worse clinical outcomes, and sex differences in HFF suggest a need for further research to better understand the underlying pathophysiology, including the contributions of hormones, sex hormone deficiency, therefore thereby identifying novel preventive and disease modifying treatments in the treatment of HFPUF. Thank you so much for patient listening. Thank you, ma'am, for the excellent talk. Uh, I now call upon the next speaker, the topic being cardiomyopathies in women, Takosuva syndrome, peripartum cardiomyopathy and cardiogenic shock. And Dr. Asha Mail Maran, please. Greetings from Chennai. And uh, my topic is Takasuba cardiomyopathy, peripartum cardiomyopathy and cardiogenic shock. Takasubal cardiomyopathy is a syndrome characterized by reversible left ventricular regional systolic dysfunction in the absence of obstructive CAD or obstructive CAD is not the cause for this regional wall motion abnormality. It was first described by Hikaru Sato. Takasubo refers to an octopus trap in Japanese which has a very narrow base and a, a big uh, rounded portion. So it is also known as several names like apical ballooning syndrome, stress cardiomyopathy, broken heart syndrome and uh, other names like ampulla cardiomyopathy. The incidence is about most common presentation is like an acute coronary syndrome. 1-2% to of patients presenting as acute coronary syndrome are actually Takasubo cardiomyopathy. Uh, can we go back to the slide? Can we just go back to the slide? So, and uh, the predominant presentation is uh, women. In the Takasubo registry, about 88.9%, close to 90% were women. And the average age is postmenopausal women, most, uh, most common age group, mean age was 66.4 years. Next slide. The common uh, etiology proposed are all which are common in women, like increased catecholamines, coronary spasm, microvascular dysfunction, inflammation, low estrogen levels, and this is one of the causes it is most common in postmenopausal state, impaired myocardial fatty acid metabolism. So multiple uh, etiologies of these increased catecholamines seems to be very, very important because the precipitation by emotional stress and physical stress is very common. So heart failure association and ESA criteria is that it's a transient regional wall motion abnormality precipitated frequently, but not always by a stressful event. About 30% may not have a precipitating emotional or a physical stress event. What is specific about the regional wall motion abnormality is it does not correspond to a territory of a coronary artery. It is more circumferential and it extends beyond the coronary artery territory. Absence of obstructive CAD, plaque rupture, thrombus and uh, myocarditis is also uh, one of the important criteria as per the ESC criteria. Uh, back to the previous slide please. ECG changes are of ST elevation, ST depression, T wave inversion, left bundle branch block, and QTC prolongation. QT prolongation is a, 
uh, very specific for this condition, uh, we should look for QT prolongation. And one of the important features is it presents like an MI with ST elevation, but you will not have a reciprocal ST depression. That is a unique feature of Takasubo. An elevated BNP is present, but there is very mild elevation of troponins. Usually, it uh, is marginally only elevated, irrespective of the market ECG changes. And left bundle branch uh, block presence has been found to be one of the poor prognostic markers in a Takasubo cardiomyopathy. The international Takasubo diagnostic criteria has also been established. And what is the difference between the ESC criteria and the uh, international Takasubo criteria is it involves significant coronary artery disease is not a contraindication to Takasubo and Takasubo need not always involve the left ventricle. It can also involve the right ventricle or you can have biventricular presentation. And the uh, Takasubo score, diagnostic score has been proposed based on females, emotional trigger, physical trigger, absence of ST segment depression, psychiatric disorders, neurological disorders and QT prolongation. And if the score is more than 50, it is likely to be Takasubo. And if it's less than 30, it is more likely to be an acute coronary syndrome. Takasubo cardiomyopathy, there are two subtypes uh, based on the clinical presentation. The primary Takasubo cardiomyopathy, which means that the presenting features uh, because of the Takasubo. The secondary Takasubo patient is admitted for other illness like sepsis or other uh, injury, trauma or surgery. And during the course of illness, they develop a secondary uh, LV dysfunction that is called as secondary Takasubo cardiomyopathy and there are four types based on the regional wall motion involvement the typical one is the apical ballooning syndrome which is present in about 75 percent the mid ventricular form is the next common which is about 20 percent and the least common is the reverse Takasubo or the basal uh, type and you can also have a uh, focal uh, uh, can we can the slides be synchronized you're moving too fast uh, the basal uh, segment or you can have focal hypokinesia has also been reported as the fourth type. Can we go back to the slides? Yeah, next slide. So the precipitating factors for Takasubo cardiomyopathy, the commonest are uh, emotional stresses like loss of a loved one, domestic abuse, major illness, accident, trauma, financial loss and also cocaine or amphetamine use. There has also been a description because if you're very extremely happy, also Takasubo can uh, occur. And this is called as happy heart syndrome. The associated conditions, autoimmune diseases may be predisposed to Takasubo because there's an underlying inflammatory milieu. What is uh, interesting is it is absent or low in diabetic mellitus because the autonomic dysfunction prevents the catecholamine from becoming increased. And this kind of protects against Takasubo. And this is called as diabetic paradox. And even if a diabetic develops Takasubo, it's uh, found to be milder. And the risk factors are female sex, postmenopause, anxiety, depression, uh, mood disorder, schizophrenia, COPD, and substance disorder. Next. The presentation, the commonest presentations is like ACS, chest pain, dyspnea, or syncope, and mild raise in troponins. They can present with tachyarrhythmias, bradyarrhythmias, heart failure. Stroke or transient ischemic attack can occur because of the apical thrombus embolization and cardiogenic shock occurs in about 10% and even cardiac rupture has been noted in 1.8%. So it's not a very benign disorder despite the fact that it is occurring in a transient fashion. A 78-year-old female with chest pain, epistaxis and hypertension, you can see the ST elevation is uh, dominant in all the leads. There is no reciprocal ST depression. Next. And uh, can we play it? So uh, the LB angiogram shows a typical apical ballooning and the coronaries show no obstructive uh, disease. The next. And there is an apical ballooning which is very well captured. And the recovery usually takes a few days to weeks. Next. So the management of Takasubo cardiomyopathy, there are no specific guidelines. It's usually supportive. Inotrops, try to avoid dopamine because it can precipitate arrhythmias, diuretics, AC inhibitors, beta blockers. Beta blockers should not be given when there's an impending pulmonary edema or cardiogenic shock. Anticoagulants because of the left ventricular thrombus formation is quite common. In extreme cases, you may need in cardiogenic shock, mechanical cardiac support, IABP, Impella, ECMO have all been used and LVAD has been used in these cases and there are reports for all these. Next. So outcomes are similar to that of acute coronary syndrome. The one-year mortality is almost similar to that of an acute coronary syndrome. 
10% developed cardiogenic shock, ventricular septal rupture, ventricular rupture has all been noted and elderly have worse prognosis. The one-year mortality is higher in those above 85 years compared to the 65 to 75 group. And the in-hospital mortality is lower in the primary tachycardia cardiomyopathy as compared to that of the secondary tachycardia cardiomyopathy. Uh, though it is less common in uh, men, when it occurs in men, they have a fourfold higher mortality and higher cardiogenic shock and arrhythmias. Takasubo cardiomyopathy can also recur and in the GIST registry, which is the German-Italian registry, there was a recurrence rate of 4% and 6% uh, of cases, even two or more Takasubo cardiomyopathy has occurred and different patterns occur when there is a recurrence. It need not be the same pattern. If you look at the mortality graph over a period of time, it uh, matches that of non-STEMI and STEMI uh, uh, ACS. And this is uh, a little unexplained because even after recovery of LV dysfunction, they continue to have a worse mortality in, uh, in these studies. Next. The peripartum cardiomyopathy, the current de uh, definition of peripartum cardiomyopathy is uh, uh, patients with uh, uh, is an idiopathic cardiomyopathy presenting with heart failure secondary to left ventricular dysfunction which occurs towards the end of pregnancy or in the months following delivery where there are no other cause of heart failure found. Next. The etiology, several mechanisms have been proposed, nothing is finalized, viral my uh, myocarditis, autoimmune response to pregnancy, maladaptive response to hemodynamic stresses, uh, cytokine production, excessive prolactin and prolonged tocalysis are all reported uh, etiological causes. Next, 0.1% of pregnancies are complicated. It is more common in uh, the blacks, uh, in the African women, it is much more common compared to the uh, Western, the Japanese and the older maternal age, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and multiple gestation are important risk factors for peripartum cardiomyopathy. The recovery can be incomplete and in about a quarter of uh, patients may need uh, cardiac transplantation and death may also occur. The antipartum management Let's go to the next. Relapse can occur in future pregnancies as well. Next slide. So the antipartum management, the most important factor is we have to avoid AC inhibitors, ARB and ARMI and uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. We can use hydrolazine nitrate combination, beta blockers, diuretics, digitalis and low molecular weight heparin should be used whenever the EF is less than 35% because of the high incidence of thromboembolism. Postpartum, you have AC inhibitors, ARB, ARNI, beta blockers, diuretic, digitalis, warfarin. Bromocryptin can be used especially when the LVEF is very low and MRA can be used post-lactation. Next slide. The prognosis is 30% have partial recovery, the rest recover by 12 months. Over a period of 12 months, they recover and one year mortality is 4%, five year mortality is 7%. There can be 18% incidence of arrhythmias including ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation and cardiac arrest. Future pregnancy recurrence is high in patients with residual LV dysfunction and EF less than 25% at presentation. Next slide. There can be an overlap of tachycardia cardiomyopathy and peripartum cardiomyopathy. It has been shown in a study by Kim et al. that 30% of patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy turned out to be tachycardia. And Yang et al. 43% of cases of uh, uh, Takasubo uh, was um, peripartum was actually Takasubo. This is one of the cases which is a peripartum Takasubo cardiomyopathy. Post LSEA, she presented with acute pulmonary edema, and uh, uh, you can see that this is a reverse Takasubo cardiomyopathy. Uh, you can play the video again. The bases are not contracting compared to the apex. This is a very rare form of Takasubo and Takasubo cardiomyopathy is especially in the peripartum period following a uh, caesarean section is more common and it tends to occur within few hours following a, a caesarean section. This patient had extreme acidosis, lactates were high and mildly elevated drops and elevated BNP. Next. Uh, just, one, uh, just one minute I'll take. Just go back to the slide. Just the previous slide. So, but within uh, recovery was within the five days. You can see the uh, X-ray is nicely cleared. And can we play the uh, LV? This one, the video. Okay, the video is not playing. I think, but uh, she recovered within five days. The LV function was absolutely normal. It improved to sixty-two percent. Next, cardiogenic shock can occur in patients. Uh, the previous slide. A cardiogenic shock can occur and may need mechanical cardiac support. 
Inotrop support with liver cement and a calcium sensitizer has been found to be useful in peripartum cardiomyopathy. You can also give inhaled liver cement done as per the recent reports. IABP, ECMO and LVAD has been used and LVAD patients 6% recovered and 48% went on to cardiac transplantation. Wearable defibrillator is recommended in patients with EF less than 30% and AACT may be required in patients with persistent heart failure and heart transplantation may be required in 9% of cases. Heart transplantation in uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy is associated with higher risk of uh, rejection and poorer outcomes than the other patients. Thank you for your listening. May I ask a question? The end of the session, sir. End of the session, okay. End of the whole session, I mean. Uh, thank you, Dr. Asha. Uh, we call upon Dr. Purna Pushkala Natarajan to give a talk on LVAD therapy and heart transplantation in women. Can I manage my own slides? Is it okay? Thank you. A very good afternoon to one and all present here. Um, <clears throat> Uh, LVAD therapy and heart transplantation in women. Is it the same playing field was my topic. Um, I didn't think much of it initially, but when I started looking at data, it was not very satisfying, meaning there were so many reports and I looked at data from the United States, data from Europe, data from India. Um, we, don't, we don't have a lot of data and the data that is presented says opposite things. So I decided that I will present what I feel. So some things to ponder about is that there are um, <clears throat> there are gender disparities that exist in patients undergoing evaluation for advanced heart failure therapies. Um, there was one um, study that I will show next that looked at um, the representation the representation of women that were uh, in clinical trials. So only 20% of participants in Momentum 3, which is a HeartMate uh, 3 uh, LVAD device, were women in that trial. And fewer women were referred to advanced heart failure therapies. Only 26.6% are females out of the total number that are referred for heart failure therapies. But then it also says there is no differences in the referring physicians or primary clinical reason for referral between cases. So it's a little confusing. So this is an article that talks about disparities in practice patterns by sex, race, and ethnicity in patients referred for advanced heart failure therapies. So as you can see, the average age between men and women seem to be similar. LV ejection fraction less than 20. So it is true that sometimes men present with much worse heart failure at presentation that they kind of take away uh, a lot more uh, uh, opportunities for heart transplantation. Based on the Intermax profile, uh, which is classified from one to you know um, six. Uh, it looks at patients, uh, the differences between men and women. And in that, I think more women are in intermax higher classes, which means that they're ambulatory heart failure patients. They're not very sick. On the other hand, men seem to be in worse intermax profile. That is high, uh, you know, intermax profile one, two, three, which are higher. Uh, you know, um, mortality and they're, uh, you know, given more preference than somebody who is ambulatory with heart failure for a transplant. And uh, location of evaluation, I think there is more men who are admitted who uh, undergo evaluation for heart failure uh, and outpatient evaluation for heart failure therapies in women seems to be a little high. Again, the p-value is not, you know, really significant for most of these. So in the heart failure etiology, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy seems to be more common in women than in men who present with ischemic cardiomyopathy. And uh, out of that, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy seems to be a little bit more in women than in men. And so is restrictive cardiomyopathy and congenital heart diseases. Um, so, <clears throat> so looking at uh, LVAD, ventricular assist devices in women uh, who, un who undergo LVAD implantation. In general, it is known that women have smaller chest cavity compared to men, 
And so the LV end diastolic dimension is also relatively lower compared to LV end diastolic dimension of a man. So what happens with LV unloading with a left ventricular assist device is that the LV end diastolic dimensions becomes too small. The interventricular septum, which is supposed to be in the midline for good, uh, you know, heart failure management is shifted more towards the left. So because women tend to have a smaller LV end diastolic dimension or a smaller LV cavity, when, when you use a left ventricular assist device, their cavities become much smaller and the interventricular septum shifts towards the left. And this results in right ventricular distension and leads to more right heart failure, which is seen most often in women who undergo LVADs. So when the LV becomes smaller and there is a lot of suction, which causes hemolysis in these left ventricular assist devices, and there's increased incidence of ventricular tachycardia that is mediated by the smaller and you know LV cavity size in these patients. And they're also more prone for uh, blood pressure fluctuations. People who tend to have hypotension with uh, upright postures and hypertension with supine posture because of the increased LVAD flow. So we've seen all sorts of these things with women. So, so this study <coughs> looked at post-operative RV failure and three-month mortality in women with adjusted for their LV end diastolic dimensions. And they found that women with lower LV end diastolic dimension adjusted for their body surface area had higher incidences of RV failure and higher incidence of mortality. So RV failure is a direct predictor of mortality post left ventricular assist device implantation. And the reason women have this is probably because of their, one of the reasons is probably because of the smaller LV end diastolic dimension. So this is adjusted based on their body surface area when it is lower than 2.03 and this is when it is more than 2.03. In both cases, there is higher adjusted odds ratio for women to develop RV failure and increased risk of mortality. And this was a study that they did a translation study where they created heart phantoms of different sizes and put in ventricular assist devices to see how the septal curvature changed with different kinds of heart phantoms. And they did find that the, 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 the interventricular septum was shifting more towards the left hand side and causing RV distension and dilatation in hearts that had a smaller uh, cavity. So data in India regarding heart transplantation in women is sparse. However, there are anecdotal reports and media interf interviews of physicians from the transplant world that report that women are more often donors than recipients of transplant. The rate of heart transplant in women is on the rise from 10% of organ recipients to up to 25% recently. And there is likely geographical variation in the incidence of transplantation in women. So looking at our own data at Apollo hospitals in Chennai, when I looked at the data, they said that heart transplant in women was 22% of the total and heart lung transplant is 38% of the total people who got heart lung transplant. So some of the issues pertaining to heart, transplant, heart transplantation in women is uh, because most common cause of heart failure in women are probably non-ischemic related to rheumatic heart disease or congenital cardiac diseases. And most of these people have undergone some amount of surgery or some palliative procedure for those. And uh, the scenario is probably likely going to change with more metabolic diseases occurring in women. And this is probably followed by coronary artery disease and hypertrophic cardiomyopathies and other genetic cardiomyopathies. So when somebody has had two or three surgeries, putting them through another transplantation surgery is probably also on the higher risk because multiple surgeries increase the risk of scar formation. And then the other thing to look at is immunosuppression in women of reproductive age group. There are some challenges uh, depending on the age and what uh, you know cycle in their fertility they are there can be interaction of these immunosuppressive medications with fertility enhancing drugs, which can be a problem in some women. So, and once somebody in their reproductive age group is planning to get pregnant and they are uh, a transplant patient and on immunosuppressives, we have to think about switching to alternate immunosuppressive therapy to avoid teratogenicity and neural tube defects. So steroids are most often given in these women, but uh, you know, mycophenolate is a big no, so they have to be switched over to azathioprine. And, uh, <clears throat> and that causes bone marrow suppression and a lot of side effects related to that. Increased risk of gestational diabetes and preeclampsia in these women who are on steroids and on immunosuppression. 
And steroids increase the risk of premature rupture of membranes, increase maternal fetal risk of infections, and delayed wound healings in case these women do need uh, cesarean sections. And increased risk of graft rejection in the post-delivery phase, because I think when they have the fetus, there is some sort of protection. Um, and then post-delivery, there is a lot of immune response and uh, the alteration in their uh, you know, blood volume status and all of these can contribute to increased risk of rejection. And uh, these women need to consider or think about freezing their eggs or embryos and alternate modes of contraception in women of reproductive age group after undergoing transplantation. So somebody is in chronic heart failure, their entire uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal you know, ovarian axis is suppressed. And once they get the heart transplant, they actually start having their regular cycles and they're actually in fact uh, fertile. And if they don't want to get pregnant, they have to think about modes of contraception, which is very important, so that they don't interact with the already existing immunosuppressive medications. And premature metabolic bone diseases in women um, is more disproportionate than men in some situations, uh, like you know, uh, in women in their 30s and 40s. So in other words, LVAD therapy and heart transplantation in women are not the same playing field, but so is it for men. So. We need to tailor therapy for our patients based on their unique needs and be able to practice mindful medicine for each and every one of our patients. That said, I, I really feel that we need to collectively join together as an organ transplantation team to collect data regarding transplants, the registries, the wait list times, you know, who qualify for LVADs, who qualifies for a transplant, the numbers, in order to be able to better understand our limitations and to continuously strive to do better for our patients. Thank you. So uh, the next topic uh, will be presented by a single man representative in this session. So it's about heart failure in women. Uh, interestingly enough, um, presented by a man, the data from Chennai. I think this is very important also to share uh, the data from the country and from the local region. So Dr. Justin Paul, the floor is yours. Yeah, very good evening, all of you, and thank you uh, for uh, this opportunity. In fact, looks like I think I got this opportunity myself because when uh, I think woman was telling me uh, we are going to have a talk, please tell your PGs. I said fine, but ensure that somebody is talking on heart failure in pregnancy. Then he said, I think Asha is talking on peripartum cardiomyopathy. But then why don't you talk on heart failure in pregnancy, Chennai data? So then you know that was the time our uh, I just got the info that. Our article was accepted in the European Heart Journal, but it was not yet published. So then the, three days back it got published, and uh, but the thing is, uh, it was uh, not on heart failure, it was an overall maternal cardiac outcome. But then uh, the last two days I did analysis of a heart failure and presenting some of the data. So briefly now, uh, this over a period of three and a half years, we enrolled 1029 pregnant women with heart disease. And what we found was, very briefly, the outcome was 15.2 had maternal cardiac events and the death rate was 1.9, 20 women died. And the fetal outcome, you know, adverse events happened in 33.7 percentage of pregnancies. So we found that the event rates were high in patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension, patients with LV dysfunction, patients with mechanical prosthetic valves. And the first time diagnosis of heart disease was uh, uh, predictor of adverse maternal outcome. 60% of women got their heart disease diagnosed for the first time during pregnancy. So this was our uh, take home message that you know we need to focus on a cardio obstetric approach and early diagnosis and preconception counseling are necessary and we need to train the system to offer lesion specific uh, uh, <coughs> counseling care and we need to develop our own uh, customized uh, risk scores. You know, the traditional scores that we have, like CARPREC score, Zahara score, and we also have the MPAC, uh, MWHO classification, but we don't have something in India. We need to generate something based on our own data, but thankfully now we have one of the largest single center study in the world from Madras Medical College. Now, this is a profile of our heart diseases, and I will not uh, <coughs> go too much into it. And uh, this is the profile of uh, the overall heart disease. Uh, and we find that, you know, uh, 39% of these women were delivered by Caesar section. And this was less than women without heart disease in the corresponding period. This probably was because we were 
focusing on you know giving a guideline based uh, management that only patients who really needed a uh, caesar had a cesarean and this was our uh, in 91% had live births so conclusion we concluded that uh, maternal mortality in women with heart disease is high first diagnosis of heart disease in pregnancy is 60% and predictors of maternal heart cardiac events are there like uh, and mortality predictors are primarily prosthetic heart valves lv systolic dysfunction and pulmonic hypertension and when we analyze the ability of mwho classification in predicting our uh, outcome we found that it had a moderate discriminative power and a, a low discriminative power for fetal events now coming to the topic of the day uh, i analyzed this in the last three days uh, this is said to be published. Uh, this is from the ROPAC data. In the ROPAC, of the 1,321 pregnancies, they had 13.1% heart failure. This is our data. Out of 1,029, we had 12.4% of patients with heart failure. And if you look at the CESA section in the ROPAC, in the second publication uh, presented, I think published in 2019, with 5,400 patients, the seizure rate was uh, 49%. If you look at the patients with heart failure, the seizure rate was high, 58. But in our case, it was 46.5% of the seizure rate. If you look at the etiology of something wrong, etiology of heart failure in our patients, one third of them had peripartum cardiomyopathy, one third of them had rheumatic heart disease, and congenital heart diseases was only 11.8%. Unlike this, I'm sorry, this valvular heart disease that has to be removed, that's not our data. Uh, unlike the data in ROPAC where we find that congenital heart disease has contributed 27, 21% of heart failure. This is the usual case in Western uh, data where more of the patients will be having congenital heart diseases, unlike our data where most of the patients will be having rheumatic heart diseases. So overall 12.4% developed heart failure. If you look at the HEFREF, these were the causes of HEFREF in our patients. Peripartum cardiomyopathy was a predominant cause of HEFREF. The others were uh, scattered cases here and there. HEFPEF, rheumatic heart disease and congenital heart disease were HEFPEF. And uh, <clears throat> we use the usual ESC definition of uh, HEFPEF and HEFREF. So outcomes, you find that of the whole cohort, uh, in the patients with heart failure, 15.7% was the mortality. We found that all patients who died had heart failure in some form or other. And adverse fetal events, we find that in patients with heart failure, almost half of them had adverse fetal events. Fetal death was 12.6%, but preterm birth and low birth weight was very high. But this is very high compared to the Western data. For a comparison, I'm giving you the ROPAC data, we find that the preterm birth and uh, the low birth weight is only about 13 percent but ours are quite high so we looked for the predictors we did a multivariable analysis on uh, predictors to find uh, how we can identify heart failure in pregnancy women who present with any noha class more than two three or four they were very highly likely to develop heart failure in pregnancy and those in modified WHO classification more than two, that is three, two to three, three and four, they have a high likelihood of uh, developing heart failure. Patients with pulmonic hypertension, patients with prosthetic heart valves, and patients with LV ejection fraction less than 45. These are the group that are significantly likely to produce heart failure. Did a ROC curve analysis to see whether uh, the CARPREX score, I analyzed the CARPREX score to see whether you know, we can find out whether it is better than MPAC score for our population, our MWHS score. Basically, the C statistic value was essentially the same, 0.82 and 0 0.80. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with C statistic, anything less than 0.665 means very low predictive value. Anything more than 0 0.8, 0 0.85 is a very good predictive value. This is sort of a moderate to high predictive value, but both are performing reasonably equally well. So the take-home thoughts, I will say that heart failure is the commonest maternal complication of women with heart disease. This is not only in our registry, but also in the Western registry as well. Heart failure is the commonest complication. And peripartum cardiomyopathy and rheumatic heart disease are the commonest causes of heart failure. 
and heart failure in pregnancy is associated with very high mortality. So early identification of heart failure and using a multidisciplinary management is very crucial. Pulmonary hypertension, prosthetic heart valves, ejection fraction less than 45, WHO classification more than 2, NOHA classification more than 2 are predictors of uh, heart failure. And both MWHO classification and CARPREX score have a reasonably good predictive value to predict heart failure. So thank you for the patient listening. Thank you, sir, for that great talk as usual. And congratulations on your paper and uh, the article in Hindu as well. Uh, moving on to the last talk of the session, it is a virtual talk by uh, Dr. Jyotsna Madhuri uh, on the topic sex-related aspects in device therapy. Heart failure conference and I'm thanking all the organizers who gave me the opportunity to talk about the sex related aspect in the device therapy of the heart failure. I wanted to tell why this topic is important. As we already know, there is a sex difference in the cardiac arrhythmias. The difference is maybe because of a biologically di difference in the sex or culturally defined gender. Biological changes because of the female and the male sex may be leading to the cellular electrical properties differences and leading to the arrhythmias or maybe because of the effect of the sex hormones or some of the arrhythmias are more frequent during the pregnancy or may be precipitated during the pregnancy long, like a long QT syndromes. If you take that culturally defined gender, as we already know that the females are underrepresented in the clinical trials and a lower utilization of the, all the devices in the females when compared to the males. So this causes major dis disparities in the clinical cardiovascular care. So the potential solutions for these addresses, which are going to talk as an end as recommendations. So I wanted to concentrate uh, mainly the four device therapies, uh, which are very important in the advanced heart failure management. Those are the ICDs, biventricular pacers, mechanical circulatory support and heart transplantation. I concentrate uh, mainly on the sex differences. I'm not going in the details of the efficiency of these uh, four devices. First, coming to the implantable cardioverter defibrillators, the landmark trials have demonstrated that ICDs causes the uh, reduction in the sudden cardiac death in the case of the heart failure. But mainly, major drawback of these landmark trials are they are not included the female cohort separately and the women were underrepresented. We are extrapolating the same data to the women, which is not correct. Actually, there is no difference in utilization between the women, that is about a 63.1% versus in the men, that is 62.3%. But one fact is true that the lead displacement is much more frequent occurs in the women than in the men in the ICD implants. Why these sex differences occur in the ICD implantations? The reasons really to say are unknown. Few of the hypotheses we can put forward is the difficulty of the vascular access due to the smaller vessels and the body size of the woman compared to the men. Maybe because of the more bleeding in the woman compared to the men during invasive procedures so the infection rates and hematoma formations are the more frequent. And sex difference in the severity of illness of the heart failure at the time of device implantation. All these are the hypotheses actually to say they are not at proved. Coming to the cardiac resynchronization therapy, ACC AHA heart failure guidelines are based on the landmark trials with the majority of the studies showing that the women benefit from the CRT, possibly more than the men. 
but still it is underused, especially CRTD. Especially the women are less likely to receive the CRTD if they are above 80 years and have an atrial fibrillation, especially when they have a chronic kidney disease. The major study that is companion CRTP masker trials support a greater benefit to the CRT in the women when compared to the men. And in addition, hospital mortality is not higher in the women. It is about a 0.71% for the women versus 0.93% for the men. So this also a favors to use much more frequently in the females and even the hospital stay is not prolonged in the females. The reasons why more benefit is occurring in the women than the men is also very unclear. It may be due to a woman are more likely than the men to have a, a true LVB because at a lower QRS duration, women have a shorter QRS duration than the men in the absence of any conduction disease. So the more accurate estimation of the QRS is possible or maybe sex difference in the heart size with the women tending to have a smaller hearts than the men affecting the distance of conduction travel across the myocardium. Of course, the sex difference in the type of the heart disease at the time of presentation itself may be a playing an important role. Coming to the mechanical circulatory supports, as we already know that VADs have been evolved from the large pulsatile devices to a very small one. Previously, it is one of the indication only when the body surface area is more than 1.5 square meters. But nowadays, with an improvised methods, even smaller sizes of the devices are available, which are specifically done for the females. Still, even though FDA approved all these devices, underutilization in women is very common. And over the decade, there is no change at all. 21% of the women and 79% of the men received these devices in uh, uh, 2006 to 2009 versus even in the next decade also, it is 22% in the women and 78% in the men. The complications, if you see the mechanical circulatory supports, uh, mainly the complications are device failure, bleeding, infection and neurological events. But we don't have any sex specific data to tell that whether these are much more frequent in the females or not. Why would the type of a continuous flow device affect the rate of the stroke? And should women avoid implantation of a continuous flow devices given concerns of a high risk of the neurological events? The difference in the stroke risk may be related to the axial versus the centrifugal continuous flows. And another one is location of the implantation, whether it is implanted in intra-abdominally versus intra-pericardially. And of course, anticoagulation management also contributes for these neurological events. Despite the potential risk of the neurological events, the incidence of the stroke remains low for women when compared to the men. The mortality benefits outweigh the risk of the neurological events and the VATs should be implanted in eligible patients who had failed the medical therapy in the case of the females. Coming to the heart transplantation, there is a difference in the different stages of the heart transplantation, like in the pre-transplantation, during transplantation, and the post-transplantation. Coming to the pre-transplantation phase, there is no significant difference in the percent of the women, that is nearly 22%, versus the men, 78%, waiting a transplantation. Over a decade also, this percentage is not changed. It is still 22% in the women and 78% in the men. Means listing the women for the transplantation itself is very less. Among the patients who are waiting for the transplantation, women are more likely than the men to be younger, non-Caucasians, and have a lower body mass index, more likely to have a dilated cardiomyopathy as an underlying cause, and a medical insurance is less for them. Despite of these differences, that men have a more of ischemic cardiomyopathies, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, and ICD implantations in the men. Among those listed for the urgent transplantation, that is classified as a UNOS status one, women are less likely than the men to be a mechanical circulatory support and more likely to be an inotropic support as a bridge to the transplantation. Sex differences in the use of the left ventricular assist device continue to exist even after the FDA approval for the smaller continuous flow devices. 
there are the sex differences in the survival among the patients awaiting the transplantation and these exist even among the patients with a similar medical urgency at the transplantation if you take what is the what is the sex differences although there is no significant difference in the frequency of the women and men initially listed urgently there are significant sex difference in the rate of transplantation even though they are not they are listed they are not taken for the transplantation machine learning identified 10 sex related associated with the possibility of a why the females are not going under transplantation other than the sex is the body mass index age blood type o hemodynamics functional capacity serum albumin and renal function all these interactions are very complex and goes a more unfavorable situation to the females in the transplantation during the post transplantation period women tend to have a better long term survival than men lower risk of coronary allograft vasculopathy and malignancy but has a higher rate of antibody mediated rejection although the sex differences in the post transplant survival depend on the time of the assessment patients do better when recipients receive donor hearts matched with the sex rather than mismatched why these differences probably it may be hormonal factors immunological factors or cardiac size mismatch but there are no clear answers for this there remains some controversy regarding the efficiency of the icd in the women with the most heart failure study showing no sex difference in all cause mortality but lower likelihood of appropriate icd shocks in women when compared to the men especially this is dem demonstrated in all primary preventive icd trials those are the defined scd heft dynamic must and married to this curve shows that a men receives a more appropriate shocks than the women inappropriate shocks are the also less in the case of the men when compared to the women so when we see the causes why this difference is occurring is slightly the differs the occurrence of the arrhythmias like these people are the less likely to have the ventricular arrhythmias females when compared to the male not only that there is a difference in the survival of the continuous flow versus in a pulsatile flow within the lvats survival has improved over the both the men and women with an implanted ventricular assist devices and there is no sex difference in the mortality continuous flow devices are superior to the pulsatile devices when with the 1 2 and 4 year survival say about 82 70 and 50% compared to the 64% so coming to the end of the presentation and knowing a few of the recommendations suggestions uh, for this disparity will come down is with the first thing we had to realize is sex and gender influences the epidemiology care and outcome of the cardiac arrhythmias in addition the true the truth is multiplied by the usage and the efficiency difference of the devices of the heart failure like in icds crt mechanical support devices and heart transplantation the disparities can be ameliorated by promoting representation of the women in the clinical trials and adapting sex specific evidence based guideline recommendations thank you all thank you uh, dr jyotsna for this presentation uh, i'm uh, i think all of us know that women are underrepresented and probably under diagnosed and under treated but i think the scenario is certainly changing and uh, there cannot be more emphasis uh, than you know assessing the diastolic function as well as right ventricular function in patients presenting with heart failure seem to be the uh, i mean which seem to play a major role in women with uh, uh, heart failure and uh, just because uh, women uh, present differently or uh, respond to the therapy differently uh, it should not be uh, putting a hold on uh, the benefits of therapy such as interventional therapy such as left ventricular assist devices crt or even heart transplantation and uh, nothing can be more uh, emphasized than having a proper registry and i thank dr justin paul for this uh, presentation uh, on women specific uh, uh, disorder 
and I think every one of us should have data and uh, research is very important and that is going to help uh, women get treated in a better manner getting all the benefits of wonderful therapies that we have for treating heart diseases and questions uh, yeah questions are allowed uh, Not I have two questions one minute after the questions I request Prof. Mijja to summarize and give his viewpoint uh, I, I thought it's more important to uh, allow for questions, but okay. Yeah, after anyway. the questions, sir. <laughs> after so they'll have the questions, and after <laughs> we'll give so you the opportunity uh, to let to have the questions. After that, we would like you to summarize and give your viewpoint and what is the European perspective and like Indian perspective, and do they match or they differ? So that is what uh, we would like to hear from you. Uh, well, I, I believe uh, all around the world we are faced with uh, the same uh, challenges, uh, that is that we uh, actually include less women in the registry, in the, in the trials, they are less well treated. Um, there are many reasons for that, some of them um, can be understood, but some of them not. So I, I believe in clinical practice we should make the best we can to uh, harmonize the therapies. Uh, for the both genders. Um, then again, we need to appreciate uh, some differences that were nicely elaborated by uh, Dr. Paul, showing that uh, causes of um, heart disease uh, during pregnancy are, co are completely different on the globe. And uh, this has uh, a theology behind it. Well, maybe one, uh, one issue that was only briefly mentioned, and that was um, I believe in the transplant talk, uh, we know that medicine is getting uh, more and more feminized, at least in Europe. Uh, maybe not so much within cardiology field, in particular in cardiovascular surgery, at least in, in Slovenia that is the case. And also there are more men cardiologists than uh, um, women cardiologists in Slovenia. So I'm not well aware of the studies whether there are differences with, uh, if, if the gender of the doctor plays a major role or an important role. So I believe this should also be something we should dive in because in GP, um, among the general practitioners, we know that there are more women and they actually handle the bulk of the heart failure population and they are the gatekeepers before there is full-blown disease. So I believe that could be one aspect we should first investigate and then to intervene, and that would be my comment to the topic. The questions also you can take. We are well on time. I have a few questions. One is, uh, what's the percentage recurrence of uh, this postpartum cardiomyopathy in the second pregnancy? Should we uh, um, um, uh, advise against next pregnancy? And another question is, what are the drugs we can give during pregnancy for the heart failure? And for the cardiac transplantation, what is the oxygen consumption uh, levels which we recommend uh, normally are same? And what is the Indian uh, statistics for the cardiac transplantation? Postpartum cardiomyopathy, Dr. Asha will take up. is higher if the patient continues to have residual left ventricular dysfunction. And at the time of presentation, when the LVEF is less than 25%, they say the recurrence rate is higher. If they've totally recovered, then the chances are lesser. It is not nil, but it is lesser. So if somebody has recovered completely, then you can also do a strain rate imaging. And if the strain rate imaging is or a dobutamine stress echo, and if the patient does not develop abnormal strain on a dobutamine stress echo, they are likely to, they are likely to, tolerate the next pregnancy better and they can be allowed to go. The ones with residual LB dysfunction or an abnormal strain rate, they should be strongly discouraged from a second pregnancy. Uh, the drugs to be used uh, before uh, antipartum, you can use hydrolazine, you can use beta blockers, you can use diuretics, you can use the loop diuretics, you can use the thiazide diuretics. Digoxin can be used and you have to use low molecular weight heparin because there's a very high incidence of thromboembolism in these patients. So if the EF is less than 35% before antipartum, you have to use low molecular weight heparin in them. And 
uh, till the pregnancy and just before 36 hours you stop the low molecular weight apparent before the uh, delivery. Digoxin can be used. Digoxin can be used. You have to avoid uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists because they do interfere with the sex hormones of the child. So you have to avoid uh, the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. Of course, the ACA, RB, and RNE needs to be avoided. Among the beta blockers, metaprolol has the highest uh, uh, evidence. So safely use uh, metaprolol. Uh, I don't think we have data on that. I'm not very sure. Maybe uh, a chairperson can enlarge on that. I think postpartum we can use it, but I'm not very uh, sure of antipartum. I don't think there is uh, any good evidence to support the use and then uh, we avoid it until we know that uh, we can use it safely. So that, I believe, is the current state of the art. If there are no more questions, uh, we'll conclude the session. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for people to wait so long. So uh, today was the CARMI day. So we are trying to have multidisciplinary approaches to heart failure and be here from the critical care specialist perspective. Because general meetings, we talk cardiology, cardiology, cardiology. We don't take the, the viewpoints of others. So I invite Dr. Uh, Narasamy Santil Kumar on the podium. Arun, Dr. Arun Kumar Subaya has he come uh, and Dr. Sandeep Bansal is on the way. He's in Kapra Kumar. Is he there? So yeah, I think Dr. I'm virtually Dr. Women and forward, forward. And uh, we are on time. So we can do that. Over to Dr. Sandeep. Miginum Korayinum Noisulum Nolor Valimudala in Niamundre. Excellent session. Pearls for cardiac intense twist. We'll have excellent carry-on messages, which will be translated to our prescription in our day-to-day -day practice. The first topic is diagnosis and treatment of hypertensive pulmonary edema. When you think about hypertensive pulmonary edema, there are four questions which will arise in one's mind. A, B, C, D, E. So A is whether it's an acute onset diagnosis whether it is a re renal artery stenosis, diastolic dysfunction or other, whether it's a progressive pulmonary edema. B is investigation, blood investigations including LV function, whether it's a normal LV function or an uh, LV dysfunction with hypertensive pulmonary edema. C is coronary syndrome, whether it's associated with acute coronary syndrome. D is diuretics, E is emergency drugs, which uh, when you should start IV drugs, what are all the anti-hypertensives you should start. So with this 30 seconds introduction of the five important questions which one will have to answer. I invite Dr. Raymond for this session, for this topic, hypertensive pulmonary edema, from whom we'll get the answers for this above said five questions. Thank you. Uh, this, I should say, notorious opportunity of making an intensivist talk to an elite cardiology gathering about a topic which both of us think it is our domain. So, just kidding. Okay. So, <clears throat> not really. Uh, and thankfully, uh, my topic happens to be slightly on the lighter side, the topic per se, not the real challenge of a bedside management. And I think the more complex topics are to follow subsequently in this session. And given the 
luxury of time, I would like to touch upon a few uh, key points within the perspective of managing somebody with uh, hypertensive pulmonary edema. Of course, I was impressed about the A, B, C, D, E that almost summarizes it in 30 seconds, what I'm not even going to be covering in 15 minutes, hopefully. So when somebody does a literature search, okay, about hypertensive pulmonary edema, uh, it's equally interesting and disturbing to note the number of confusables, okay. There are so many uh, overlap syndromes, the nomenclature is not clearly distinct from each other, but for the purpose of today's 12 minute or 15 minute session, I would like to limit myself to uh, a person presenting with respiratory failure because of pulmonary edema, that is basically extravascular lung water in the alveoli and the interstitium. The person has hypertension and the person has preserved cardiac reserve. Again, we can argue, okay, somebody with a compensated heart failure can develop a hypertensive pulmonary edema. So, does he not come into this definition? I don't know. Again, somebody who has a common etiology like a sympathetic storm, okay, can produce hypertension, can also produce a transient LV dysfunction, okay. Again, I don't know, but let's uh, try to keep it as simple and I'm going to give you a very physiological based strategy to manage treatment which might apply for any situation and the confusion only gets worse by like, you know, more and more new syndromes that we keep adding on as we get uh, like, you know, uh, advanced in our medical uh, therapeutics. So I'm not going to be spending too much time on each one of this. Um, Okay, so we have an ever expanding scope of etiologies which present with us uh, or which present very, very unique challenges and varying combinations of these hypertension, uh, LV dysfunction, maybe systolic dysfunction, maybe diastolic dysfunction uh, or without dysfunction, all of those. Okay, we have an ever ending list, but I think we should just be in a position to be able to uh, tease it out from the non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema for now. Okay, so the rest of them all we would like to call them cardiogenic pulmonary edema with or without uh, systolic dysfunction. Okay, so this is how the intensivist looks at it, whatever it is. When somebody comes with a cardiogenic pulmonary edema, what's happening to the preload, which is basically the venous return, which governs the diastolic filling, which governs the pressures inside the pulmonary vasculature, and then how the contractility is. You do whatever tests, okay, you do whatever bedside assessment to detect, uh, uh, analyze these things. What happens to the afterload, the force against which the heart has to work and what's happening to the heart rate. The heart rate is going to have a sort of a detrimental effect on all of these physiological components, the preload, afterload, contractility and to top it up by reducing diastolic times, it's also going to screw up or mess up with the myocardial perfusion. And ultimately at the core of this hypertensive cardiogenic pulmonary edema, we have the culprit that is a LV, uh, LV or yeah, filling pressures basically, okay. I don't want to classify further and like anything else that happens in the ICU, you know, everything becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. You never can say which uh, came first, the chicken or the egg. So let's assume it starts with that red arrow mark over there, a rise in systemic vascular resistance for whatever cause, okay, produces a huge increase in the afterload. But this also reflects on the venous system. So there is venoconstriction also goes on, therefore the preload increases and then the pulmonary perfusion increases. The heart begins to, uh, you know, really stumble under an added preload, added augmented afterload. Again, the filling times are going to be less. So the LV uh, end diastolic pressure goes up. That reflects on the LA pressures. That reflects on the pulmonary hydrostatic pressures. Fluid is going to seep out. And this also overwhelms the capacity of the lymphatic drainage. And therefore, finally, at the end of the story, we have a respiratory shunt pathology created over there. There is a gas exchange abnormality and the person becomes breathless. There is a problem with the compliance also. And he presents with acute respiratory failure. The most characteristic point in favor of hypertensive pulmonary edema is the rapidity of onset and the potential for reversibility with treatment. Okay. And yeah, we intensivists like to flaunt our um, uh, like, you know, experience or our abilities with the ultrasound. So, uh, this is one thing that I would like to immediately do. Of course, after the initial stabilization, getting a line, putting the oxygen on, I want to know the cause of respiratory failure. I may not be able to go into the details. This is a lung ultrasound guided blue protocol, which kind of tells, you can see the algorithm there. I can get an idea whether it's a pulmonary edema versus the rest of the pathologies for respiratory failure. Mind you, this can be cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. 
I mount on a cardiac uh, POCUS. POCUS stands for point of care ultrasound and that sort of gives me an idea. Uh, just to tell you what is normal lung and what is the abnormal lung. So what you see here is what we call the A profile. Basically you see a whole bunch of horizontal lines. That's how a normally aerated lung field looks on an ultrasound. Versus here you see these vertical lines, a whole lot of comet tail sort of lines. So that indicates that the lung is wet, as simple as that. The lung gets wet uh, because of pneumonia as well, can be because of non-cardiogenic edema, can be because of cardiogenic edema. But typically it happens when the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure goes beyond 12 to 15 millimeters mercury. And there are ways with which we kind of tend to tease out between the different causes of pulmonary edema. You can see that if it's a cardiogenic pulmonary edema, you need to have a universal picture in all the fields. Let me we move on further. Of course, we need to do a whole bunch of corroborative tests basically to be able to identify if there's anything that requires specific treatment like a STEMI or all that was discussed earlier. I'm not even going to touch that. And coming to the more important aspect that is therapeutic. Again, the same physiological uh, reasoning behind treatment. Okay, this is how we treat. This is how we look at somebody who presents with a cardiogenic pulmonary edema. How do I optimize the preload, the contractility, the afterload and the heart rate? You can see that NIV, non-invasive ventilation, scores brownie points almost universally across all of the stratas. Okay, and these are things of course you are all masters at. I'm not going to be going into the details. Again, I may have one or two points just to talk about each one of them in the following slides. I really don't think I need to go into the details of this, but have this kind of a physiology guided approach. Okay. Now, how does non-invasive ventilation help in cardiogenic pulmonary edema? There's a big list of things. These are all the cardiac advantages. These are all the respiratory advantages. It basically converts what usually is a negative pressure process into a positive pressure process. It changes the intrathoracic pressure into a positive pressure atmosphere, which is going to reduce venous return. That reduces the preload. Okay. By the same way, it augments the cardiac contractility as well. There is something called the transmural pressure, which is a force required for the stroke output. So the intrathoracic pressure becoming positive, the heart doesn't have to work against a negative pleural pressure. I again don't know if I have too much of time to explain this in detail. We can always discuss during the Q&A if required. <clears throat> okay, so the transmural pressure gets augmented, the cardiac contractility gets better. And how does it improve the afterload? It creates what is known as a distal runoff. Basically by the same concept, it increases the intrathoracic pressure, the pressure around the vasculature is slightly higher than the peripheral arteries. So there's going to be a distal rapid runoff that improves the, or that reduces the afterload as well. And by doing all this, there is some sort of a sympathetic benefit, I'm sorry, symptomatic benefit and that becomes like a sympatholytic mechanism. So the heart rate comes down, the patient agitation comes down, so much improves, okay. We are not going into the respiratory part of it. These are all in a nutshell how NIV works. Arriving at the correct EPAP, IPAP, the size of the mask, all that is an art, more than a science actually. Uh, we can run that over. That's the first uh, largest scale trial of NIV in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, after which NIV got its class 1A evidence for its role in cardiogenic pulmonary edema. The next thing again, control of hypertension, you are all experts. There is just one thing I would like to say, uh, hypertensive emergencies, according to any of the guidelines, we are supposed to be reducing the MAP to say uh, by 20 to 25 percent over a period of one to two hours. I personally feel that could be a little too long for somebody presenting with a cardiogenic pulmonary edema. <clears throat> of course, these things we know very clearly, it needs to be pretty rapid. For certain other instances, it needs to be slower, but maybe cardiogenic pulmonary edema as well because time is oxygen, oxygen is tissue. So I don't see why we should not rapidly reduce. Having said that, keep in mind all other problems and possibilities as well. And it is not with the conventional, I might take another two and a half minutes if that's okay. Uh, not with doses of say five to 10 or 10 to 15, 15 micrograms, 20 micrograms per minute. That's not the role of nitrate, which is to be used. We talk about 100 and above, a maximum is 400 micrograms is what is recommended. 
you may want to give that as boluses or you may want to run it as a controlled infusion. I would personally go for controlled infusion. I usually start with at least 100 micrograms. The typical patient presenting with a respiratory distress because we are talking about wanting to avoid intubation and mechanical ventilation. Okay, so there is reasonable amount of uh, safety assured by way of poor quality evidence. Case series and uh, I think, yeah, this is a recently concluded trial. Again, I wouldn't even call it a trial. It's more like a personal experience. 67 patients where they show that this kind of a dosing is safe. That's all they say. There's no uh, outcome data over there. Moving on to the next fancy, which is furosemide. Everybody gets a bolus of furosemide. Please remember that more than 50% of our patients could actually be hypovolemic or they can be just about euvolemic. Uh, getting them to diures can actually be counterproductive. We could be making them intravascular volume depleted. Okay, the hypervolemic patients, yes, definitely they benefit. But the others are probably going to land up with a cardiorenal or, you know, the, 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 we are going to mess up with the rest of the organ perfusion. So we need to be very careful. And most of this practice, for that matter, even nitrates or whatsoever, have all evolved over years of experience only. There is no hardcore or very promising evidence for any of these. Okay, nobody can now do uh, a placebo control trial for furosemide in cardiogenic pulmonary edema. I don't think there is one. Okay, there are uh, trials that compare different kinds of doses, different kinds of uh, uh, like, you know, between infusion versus bolus, all those things are there. But nobody would now dare go and do a furosemide versus placebo. So I'm not saying it's not to be used have a reasonable idea as to the volume status of the patient before we push that bolus inside. Uh, there are a few other controversies which I thought I would discuss maybe during the Q&A. So thank you. Thanks for your kind attention. Excellent talk, uh, Dr. Rahman. Starting from the basic physiology of preload, afterload, LVEDP, and then coming to the diagnosis and how to clinch the diagnosis and what, uh, what are the things you should do and what not to do. One basic question uh, which arises in the uh, uh, mind of a resident uh, freshly come uh, after finishing the MBBS. So when you compare in an acute situation hypertensive pulmonary edema based on your uh, your experience you have very clearly told there are no trials and uh, evidence based. My question is based on your experience when you compare furosemide and torsemide in an acute pulmonary edema which will you choose? Continuation therapy okay acute in casualty in emergency triage okay uh, so there are two ways of answering this i can close this answer by saying there is no evidence towards this or that but uh, in the lack of evidence well i suppose it's just what you are comfortable with because head to head between furosemide and torsemide the bulk of whatever little bit case series and uh, uh, cohorts that are available have all uh, looked into furosemide only uh, personally, I am not somebody who has used a lot of torsemide because, again, maybe my days it was always furosemide and uh, therefore I don't have uh, an answer. But yes, it has to be an IV therapy. <clears throat> Between these two agents, I would, if you can just go into the pharmacology of these two agents, I should say that both of them are going to be equally effective. Excellent. Same school of thought. We'll take one question and we'll go to the next topic, please. Yeah, so thanks again for asking me this question. I told you I like to brag about my ultrasound skills. So it's been long that we use stethoscopes. We would love to carry the ultrasound probes on our shoulders. So with that, I can virtually answer uh, any of my practical bedside uh, problems. We have a way, yeah, we have a focus for vascular assessment. I can tell you based on various, uh, see, of course, therapy happens side by side. We don't wait for an ultrasound examination to finish. We have certain things called dynamic indices of hemodynamic monitoring. At the same time, of course, with so much of tachycardia, it would be difficult for me to assess VTI and things like that. But those are all things that we uh, do day in and day out to assess cardiac output. I can look at the IVC. I can look at the collapsibility index. 
uh, so many other things we can look of course everything starts with clinical obviously how will i manage lasix sorry yeah yeah so uh, that's the reason i said this is hypertension pulmonary edema and reasonably preserved cardiac function so when you say hypotension i think the next talk is that cardiogenic yeah, shock so maybe next talk is about yeah so i will leave that unanswered because we have the next session yeah. coming in uh, furosemide i don't think you should be using it when there is hypovolemia okay so when there is hypovolemia most of the times it's because of intravascular volume depletion hypovolemia can be uh, say or maybe there's a cardiogenic reason to it so those situations i wouldn't dare use furosemide thank you and most of the times you know what if you really want to produce diuresis you improve cardiac output you improve the renal perfusion that generally pours urine out very nicely thank you dr raymond uh, for an thank you so excellent uh, talk and uh, excellent carry on messages with a good discussion uh, we'll go to the uh, next topic uh, cardiogenic shock uh, actually we should congratulate the organizers and uh, exclusively dr abraham momen for having selected this topic uh, in an hierarchy way so i think the floor will agree when you have encounter a patient with hypertension pulmonary edema 99% 99.9% the patient will go away the patient is safe the treating doctor is safe the hospital is safe whereas when you treat with uh, cardiogenic shock hypertension pulmonary edema of task for uh, dr ajay starting from the house surgeon cardiogenic uh, shock keep the organs running the house surgeon will say urea is elevated pre renal azotemia next the pmd pg will come he will think uh, he will start about congestive hepatopathy the uh, the senior pg will come cerebral hypoxia the patient is disoriented we have uh, dr ajay to answer all these questions cardiogenic shock keep the organs running dr ajay please thank you sir thank you for the introduction so when they gave me this topic cardiogenic shock keep the organs running this is the image that came to my mind <laughs> so to begin with uh, on, a, on a more serious note cardiogenic shock is a serious condition very high mortality uh, extremely severe critical complex presentation and as you can see in this graph um, in the era of revascularization the incidence of cardiogenic shock had started reducing because incidence of acute myocardial infarction started reducing due to improvement in medical therapy but you can see since the current age even in this revascularization age there's an increase in the incidence of cardiogenic shock this is from an european data basically um, this could be because there are more older set of population more complex presentation but what is significant here is the mortality mortality is more or less stagnant and according to some data it's around 30 to 60% so this is a seriously Ill, uh, Ill condition that we are dealing with and the other problem is the more complex the presentation more heterogeneous and more different phenotypes are what we are encountering uh, as i said incidence of acute myocardial infarction related cardiogenic shock has reduced but it still remains the most common cause but with the years you can see that in this data the incidence of non mi related cardiogenic shock has also increased causes include pericardial disease valvular disease cardiomyopathy um, i mean multiple reasons being but what we need to understand here is acute mi related cardiogenic shock has standardized protocols it has performance metrics like door to needle time it has uh, you know more use of uh, support devices experiences more but when we have non mi related cardiogenic shock uh, it's more difficult the phenotypes are more different and making life in general difficult so in my talk i only have 15 minutes i'm trying to just going to concentrate on the contemporary management of cardiogenic shock so i'm going to briefly discuss about how to phenotype the patients i'm going to just talk about the recent updates in the shock classification i'm not going to discuss much about reperfusion because i think the revascularization which is an it is a settled question early pca helps and culprit vessel pca helps early cabg also could help so i'm not going to discuss about that we are going to briefly discuss about vasopressor inotrope support and also a brief about mechanical circulatory support 
and as well a certain organizational aspects as well like establishing a shock team. So the different shock phenotypes, as we already discussed, the presentation of cardiogenic shock is complex and heterogeneous. I just want to give an example of how things could be. So we have a patient A, he's a young guy, young patient, he has no major comorbids, his normal EF, normal cardiac output, normal hemodynamics, he comes with an acute MI and we have another patient, a patient B, he's an older patient, he has acute ischemic uh, heart failure, he has a low EF and is already on medications uh, for heart failure and he has a low cardiac output per se and hemodynamics which are adapted to that. So this patient now presents with an acute MI. I'm going to say this patient's mortality could be higher. The reason being that this patient has had a, a, I mean, he's had a low cardiac output state for a long period of time and there is compensatory physiology, neurohumoral changes that have already happened, which means that this patient is more adapted to a low cardiac output state. Well, this patient had a bigger drop in cardiac output from a normal 5 to 6 liter per minute cardiac output to a 3.2 liter cardiac output. Well, this patient eminently only dropped from 3.5 to 3. The presentation is about the same, but the, the, the management could be different. So this is the difficulty when dealing with phenotypes. And this is a problem even when you analyze the data from cardiogenic shock. Um, we have different phenotypes, different presentation, and there's no common language. So to solve this, is what came up by the uh, classification. Generally, shock has been defined, it's a clinical definition. There's a, um, a, a state of hyperperfusion, maybe hypotension, low cardiac output definitions are there because of cardiac etiology. Now, the problem with this definition is it tends to miss a lot of uh, early shocks. So what has been done recently, and this is a recent update, the Society of Cardiovascular um, angiography and uh, uh, intervention, ACAI has come out with this new guideline for defining and classifying shock based on severity. So it's come up with this five classification system with A being the most uh, stable one, with E being the most at risk, with the survival progressively dropping, A being the higher, uh, you know, surviving group and E being the extreme. So the purpose of this is it might establish a common language while classifying shock. We can now go back retrospectively and look at the data differently and based on this classification and maybe future trials and randomization will be better. Also, it might help guide therapy as we'll be later discussing. So this is a f just a brief on these five stages. A is basically at risk where there is neither hypotension or tachycardia but, or hyperperfusion, but there's a risk. Maybe there's a large MI. Uh, maybe there's a valvular pathology. So B is beginning of shock. This is hypotension without signs of hyperperfusion. Maybe no increase in lactate or urine output yet, but it is at risk. So C is the more classic presentation um, where there is hypotension and hyperperfusion. And this is the usual definition, you know, described in most studies. And D is deterioration where the initial presentation has been managed, but it is not responding. And E is in extremis, so where the hyperperfusion and deterioration is not responding and the patient is gravely ill and has a refractory shock. So, so that now that we understand the different phenotypes, now the first drug we think of while starting, uh, you know, management of uh, cardiogenic shock is going to be vasopressors or inotropes. Again, the data is marred by an extremely heterogeneous population. And... Um, the choices are going to be difficult. So even starting vasopressinotropes is not that straightforward. Yes, it increases MAP and restores systemic perfusion, but also the catecholamine induced increase in myocardial oxygen consumption, increase after load arrhythmia are also problematic. In fact, there is data to say that use of vasopressor inotropes independently increases the mortality. So does this mean we stop using them? No, it's probably this reflecting the severity of the condition. But it's, there is a warning here. So basically, as the number of vasopressors inotropes are increasing, we can see that the mortality is also increasing, especially with the shock getting more worse. What this means is, once you start someone on a vasopressor or inotrope, we'll come to the choices, don't just relax and sit there. If the patient is getting added on in more vasopressor inotropes, 
more higher doses, it's a point to worry and you may need to call support offer for a mechanical circulatory support. So the choice is just briefly discussing the evidence. Um, there is one trial comparing dopamine with epinephrine. This is the largest RCT. This compared in general shock, but in the cardiogenic shock subset, where the most benefit was, was that norepinephrine was better than dopamine. With regards to epinephrine, this is a registry study showed that epinephrine caused increased lactate levels and increased myocardial oxygen usage compared to other vasopressors. Then we, the more we prefer drugs that are inotropic, they increase the cardiac output and vasodilate. So the best choices we have left with us are dobutamine and milrinone. A trial comparing milrinone and dobutamine, the Dorami trial, which this was published recently, has shown that there is no difference between the two. So what do we do here? So again, I'm going to say we are going to individualize based on the shock phenotype and the presentation. But essentially, I would like to remember this. The first choice has to be norepinephrine, but maximum dose must be remembered. Target a map of around 65. The second choice could be dobutamine, especially if the low flow state is suspected. And the third choice should be vasopressin. But if the number and duration of uh, uh, dose of vasopressors are increasing, you need to call for mechanical circulatory support, which comes to the next point. I want to have a brief discussion about mechanical circulatory support. So the rationale behind using mechanical circulatory support is it offloads the heart, improves myocardial oxygen usage, and also can increase coronary blood flow. It can increase cardiac output, reverse or improve multiple organ dysfunction and less perfusion, and increases MAP. But the purpose is to improve tissue perfusion rather than maintaining MAP. So this point has to be remembered. Once the patient is placed on a mechanical circulatory support, we can either look for a bridge to recovery, bridge to a more durable uh, ventricular assist device, or a bridge to decision, which could be transplant or um, you know palliation. So these are the various options before us, and probably you are better experts than me, but IABP, Impella, Tandem Heart, ECMO are the common choices used. Um, we'll just briefly look at the evidence. IABP, in the IABP shock trial, uh, clearly showing that IABP does not improve outcomes in this subset of cardiogenic shock. Um, with that use of IABP has progressively reduced and the use of other devices such as Impella ECMO has increased. Uh, just briefly look at the summary of the other uh, mechanical circulatory support devices. We have the IMPRESS trial which compared Impella with the IABP. This is, a, this is the one of the few RCTs that actually exist and it's a small RCT and what it showed was there was, not, there was slight hemodynamic improvement early but did not result in improved outcomes eventually. So that also showed that there was a higher risk of bleeding. And But this is the trend in general with these studies. Most of them show that um, you know, um, they don't improve mortality, they don't improve outcomes, but they are also underpowered to detect anything. So also the timing of mechanical circulatory support was studied. One registry-based study showed that when the mechanical circulatory support was initiated early, there was benefit, maybe before PCI, because it could offload the heart, support the organs better prior to PCI, resulting in better hemodynamics during the PCI. This was the proposition, but this again has not been supported by other data. So what do we do and what do we choose? Again, I'm going back to the phenotypes. Now this patient has an acute MI, large drop in cardiac output. This is a patient with a decompensated heart failure, a smaller drop in cardiac output. Maybe this patient will can get better only with a device which improves the cardiac output more with those higher flows that can be generated with something like an impella. Well, this one will need some, an IABP should do a 0 0.5, 1 liter increase in cardiac output could be probably enough for a patient like B patient B. Again, we could uh, choose various devices based on the phenotype prefer to use Impala RP for RV failure while IABP tandem heart Impala LP for LV failure. When there is biventricular failure, probably VA ECMO. And if there is a coexistent respiratory failure, again, probably a VA ECMO. So there's some guides that we want to use. I, I already discussed about the SEAA recommendations. So we know that A to E is more, E is more severe, A is the initial presentation. Persons presenting with A probably need to go to the cat lab, get revascularized first. Well, person presenting with E probably is not going to respond to any therapy and maybe salvage is necessary. So once that is decided, 
we have to start them on vasoactive medications and when they are not responding maybe consider mechanical circulatory support and early mechanical circulatory support should be considered in these conditions where there is persistent instability due to hemodynamic uh, electrical or any of these causes or but again there must be caution you must be familiar with it you must the, the organization that is using should be used to it and they should not delay the primary free perfusion therapy which is the pci and then individualize and decide on the outcome just some organizational aspects um, it's not so, uh, okay i'll just finish with the last slide let's skip this a shock team of, that can be formed with multi specialists has shown to be uh, you know beneficial in terms of outcomes and uh, this is my last slide so when there's a suspicion of cardiogenic shock based on the clinical parameters if there's an acute heart failure or a mi based on that you both start vasoactive support if there's an acute mi probably an early pci choose vasopressors according to this guide you need to probably activate the shock team assess the cardiogenic shock phenotype in if there's a persistent hemodynamic instability if there is no persistent hemodynamic instability you can transfer to the ccu if not you need to initiate mechanical circulatory support and iabp for a heart failure and a, um, acute mi probably a impella would be a better choice and a v ecmo in case of a biventricular failure thank you excellent uh, talk uh, dr vijay uh, your classification of the uh, start starting was excellent so and non coronary causes pericardial disease myocardial disease and valvular heart disease and your, and your ending flow chart was excellent with the carry on message thank so you one basic question which will arise in an house surgeon's mind yes, sir. you had told about initial therapy about vasopressor norepinephrine yes. and second about dobutamin my question is about dobutamin dobutamin has an peripheral vasodilatory effect so initially if the patient comes with cardiogenic shock what will be your choice whether to combine norepinephrine and uh, dobutamin because we, when you straight away start with dobutamin there is a chance of more reduction in uh, blood pressure because of peripheral vasodilatation can you enlight enlight uh, i think that's this? a very good question sir um, that's why we probably uh, what i could look at the literature experience and uh, in you know based on personal experience probably start with the noradrenaline norepinephrine and choose dobutamin as a second choice when we see that noradrenaline not at all probably improved the hypotension but probably did not improve the uh, signs of organ perfusion maybe urine output remains low maybe lactate remains high maybe at that point consider dobutamin as the second choice um it may be difficult to consider dobutamin as the first choice because these patients present with hypotension maybe in early shock the stage a maybe we can consider dobutamin over norepinephrine Excellent, uh, Dr. Vijay. Any questions from the floor, please? If there are no questions, uh, we, we will, uh, thank you, Dr. Ajay, for uh, this excellent presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, next topic is liver injury from transaminases to secondary sclerosing colon injuries. I welcome Dr. Balaji Vengarachalam. Welcome, sir. Good evening. I thank the organizers for this opportunity. So I'll be discussing 24 slides over a period of roughly 12 to 14 minutes. So I'm going to talk everything from a intensivist perspective. So the references, basically my talk is based on multiple articles from Hepatology International as well as up to date. Okay. So we have a patient, 50 years old gentleman in ICU, who is a long-standing COPD, elevated right heart pressures, pulmonary atrial hypertension, core pulmonary, admitted in ICU with urosepsis, exacerbation of COPD on NIV with appropriate antibiotics. You see that the patient has on day three has a bilirubin of three with a direct more than indirect bilirubin and enzymes transaminitis but mild transaminitis not more than 400, SGOT at 330, PT at 210, alkaline phosphatase is very little elevated, alvin is not much low, it's 3.2 a normal coagulation profile. This we commonly see in the ICU when somebody is admitted with a right heart failure. So here you are dealing with congestive hepatitis. So the management principles are very straightforward. 
we are not going to do anything specific for the liver what we are going to do is to treat the basic cause of the hepatic congestion which includes optimize the cardiac output optimize the hemodynamics maintain mean arterial pressure of more than 65 to 70 where you have good organ perfusion you target a urine output of 0.5 ml per kg per hour with the normal lactates gentle diuresis only if the lung is wet be cautious with diuretics monitor lactate and coagulation profile this bit straightforward until this point of time we are going to manage like this what if in day five in icu the same patient has worsening sepsis gets into septic shock where this patient is already on three vasopressors say noradrenaline dopamine vasopressin and stress dose of hydrocortisone 50 milligrams sixth hourly all the vasopressors going in spite of that you have a map of only 50 and you have done adequate fluid resuscitation ivc is full lung is full of b lines you cannot give further fluids but still map is low patient is oliguric altered sensorium high lactate everything fits in with the septic shock now you see liver function you see that total bilirubin has slightly gone up 3.1 but the enzymes are sky high more than thousand when you see enzymes like this more than thousand only three possibilities come here either it's because of a toxin or a drug commonest drug is acetaminophen parastamol because the patient is an inpatient you have not given parastamol what else could be there it could be because of viral hepatitis that can become more than thousand we normally do a viral markers to rule out that the third possibility comes here which is ischemic hepatitis this patient already has congestive hepatitis on top of that because of shock ischemic hepatitis has superimposed superimposed ischemic hepatitis on congestive hepatitis again the basic principles of management are very straightforward and simple restore the cardiac output optimize the hemodynamics maintain mean arterial pressure map goals more than 70 maintain organ perfusion avoid aggressive diuresis be careful with diuresis cut down unnecessary vasopressors very very important no need to give unnecessary vasopressors so if you see what will be the effect of dopamine on hepatosplanchnic blood flow you can see that this is as early as 1980 after that many papers have come most of the, the late, latest evidence also fall in line with this evidence you can see that dopamine can increase the renal blood flow as well as hepatic blood flow the large increase in renal blood flow which occurs with dopamine is not at the expense of hepatosplanchnic blood flow in other words both liver as well as renal blood flow increase independently so dopamine is expected to increase the hepatic blood flow they have also uh, another couple of trials and meta-analysis looked at multiple vasopressors dopamine dobutamine dobexamine all three increase hepatic blood flow fair enough now when we take up epinephrine be careful epinephrine impairs splanchnic perfusion in septic shock we are going to give large dose of epinephrine it's going to cut down the hepatic blood flow which is already compromised so to cut down the cut the chase dopamine has a positive effect on splanchnic blood flow adrenaline and noradrenaline may have a ne negative effect on hepatic blood flow but having said that whether this translates into clinical benefits no you can use dopamine but it's not going to Im improve the transaminitis it is not going to take the patient out of the ventilator it's not going to cut down the ICU stay. It's not going to improve the mortality. Nothing is there. It is just improving, improvement in hepatic blood flow. It's similar to what it does with renal blood flow. I'm sure all of us are aware of ANZIC's trial, which came somewhere in 2000, which showed low dose dopamine for renal protection is not, uh, should not be practiced because you give dopamine, renal blood flow increases, but it will not translate into a reduction in creatinine or reduction in dialysis requirements or reduction in mortality that's what happens with hepatic blood flow too so if you're going to use dopamine or noret don't use just for the sake of hepatic blood flow use only if you're not able to achieve the map target no benefit with supraphysiological targets of map or cardiac output in other words somebody has a map of 70 or 75 with a good urine output no need to keep at 90 or 100 it's not going to help so supraphysiological targets are not going to help us. There are no hepato or reno protective effects of low dose dopamine that has to be kept in mind. Should I use n cysteine here? That's a million dollar question because 
N-acetyl cysteine as an antioxidant, as a glutathione precursor, has a very high quality evidence in parastamol overdose. Whether the same can be used in other causes of ischemic hepatitis is a million dollar question. To answer this, the Hepatology International has a very good editorial. In 2020 editorial, it's a very good editorial, discuss the complete evidence. It says, can be tried. And there is a single center, RCT, from India. They have published, it's a very good RCT, high quality, but unfortunately, it's a single center. It has shown that if n cysteine is used in patient with cardiogenic shock, even without transaminitis, ischemic hepatitis can be prevented. It can be even used for prophylaxis. So we have data. So definitely we can consider n cysteine for all cases of transaminitis. Okay. So if you see that uh, n cysteine has, has a very good evidence base in acute variceal bleed also. Variceal as well as non variceal bleed with any hypotension it has a value. So it can be tried. So may have a role in the prevention and treatment of ischemic hepatitis. Evolving evidence may have a role in the treatment of acute liver failure, non parastamol 2 with mild encephalopathy. It can, it's worth trying because n cysteine is something cheaper, easily available, has an IV dose and it's not toxic. Only if you use inhaled n cysteine, it is going to cause bronchospasm. If you use oral n cysteine, it will go into a lot of GI side effects, but intravenous is expected to be safe. Another interesting observation from a study, statin therapy is associated with reduced incidence of hypoxic hepatitis in critically ill patient. This is before the patient even walking into the ICU or wheeled into the ICU. Somebody who is on statins for a long time for some other indication, either for a CVA or a whatever indication, they have less incidence of ischemic hepatitis when they are admitted with cardiogenic shock. This is very interesting. So statins have a protective effect. Uh, uh, you can see that statin treatment prior to ICU admission was the only protective factor regarding the new occurrence of hypoxic hepatitis in critically ill patients. So that has a value. It's worth or important to note that 30% of the patients with ischemic liver may not have a documented shock or hypotension. You'll be wondering, when the patient became hypotensive, you'll be looking at all the nursing records or even the, you know, the map recordings, arterial tracings, because this patient never had a documented hypotension. It can happen 30% of the time, ischemic hepatitis can happen in spite of an apparently normal mean arterial pressure and acute liver failure in ischemic hepatitis is less common. Ischemic hepatitis per se entering into a ALF or becoming fulminant is less common. On the other hand, Ischemic hepatitis superimposed on a congestive liver, like what happened in this patient. More chance of the patient landing up in acute liver failure. So poor prognostic factors in ischemic hepatitis include duration extent of hemodynamic compromise, development of jaundice, because you'll be seeing that jaundice, the bilirubin levels are just three, not more than four. If you see seven, eight bilirubin going up, that is a poor prognostic factor. Severity of the underlying systemic disease, renal failure, coagulopathy, prolonged mechanical ventilation with low PF ratio. That's a marker of hypoxia. When you have a PF ratio less than 150, high PEEP requirements. We know that when PEEP is high, it has a lot of hemodynamic effects. It can further worsen the hypotension. So these are all poor prognostic factors. The same patient, we are in the last part of the presentation. Day 12 of the ICU, hemodynamics are better. Patient has a good urine output, normal blood gases, normal lactate. So you are very happy that clinically, you know, the patient is better and the markers are also good. But the patient complains of persistent right sided abdominal pain and jaundice. Another uh, six more slides. Right side abdominal pain and jaundice. Total bilirubin is seven now. Enzymes are not that high, but you are worried because GGTP is very high, alkaline phosphate is very high. This is where you need to worry about an entity called secondary sclerosing cholangitis in critically ill patient. Secondary sclerosing cholangitis is well documented in the literature, but this SSC CAP is a new entity, new entity in the sense known for the last decade because it's a separate entity. It's not, it doesn't behave like a normal secondary sclerosing cholangitis because these patients are expected to have poor prognosis, much poorer prognosis compared to their counterparts. So this is a chronic polystatic biliary disease affects both intrahepatic as well as extrahepatic biliary tree. 
the patient will not have prior history of liver disease no other liver injury will be there inflammation obliterative fibrosis stricture and biliary cirrhosis will come and the patient will have persistent jaundice pruritis right side abdominal pain and the only lab marker will be of that of cholestasis that is elevated ggtp in sap transaminases will be improving you will be puzzled because enzymes are coming down but alkaline phosphatase will be going up one common mistake all of us do including me we always monitor with enzymes we do when we ask liver function we ask alkaline phosphatase on day 1 but we keep monitoring every 3 days or 4 days only with otpt or ast alt okay so that's a mistake all of us do you will be wondering because enzymes coming down but patient becoming more recreate right side abdominal pain when you only when you ask for alkaline phosphatase and ggtp you will find out this otherwise more chance of missing and another interesting observation when these patients survive and get discharge within a year you will be seeing a very high cholesterol again because of you know the metabolism and cholesterol is closely linked with liver and all this you will see very sky high cholesterol when these patients survive come back to you as an outpatient the differential at this point of time include cholestasis associated with sepsis phalangitis and drug induced the only way to differentiate to do an imaging either you have to do an ultrasound which may or may not show or you have to go for a ct abdomen with or without contrast that's the only way because if it is sepsis associated cholestasis or drug induced you will have normal imaging on the other hand phalangitis will have dilated ducts stones and pus it's the right time to do an imaging to clinch this diagnosis if the patient has a secondary sclerosing phalangitis because of polystatic jaundice it you will see imaging findings will be like this ct with the contrast will show multiple hypodense and if you do an ercp you can extract a gall bladder or a biliary cast from the tree because you will be uh, because the bile gets stuck in the biliary tract like this and the outcomes are going to be very poor because these patients have rapid disease progression in critically ill very limited therapeutic option unfortunately there there have been trials with some attempts with ercp like you can do endoscopic dilation sphincterotomy of body intermittent stenting everything has been tried they have removed the cast but you cannot do anything for the fall in the liver function nothing could be done and whether arso deoxycholic acid has a role nobody knows you can try that ultimately these patients require transplant because the transplant free survival is only 70 to 40 months lower than that of other causes of secondary sclerosing cholangitis that's a point worth noting suspect this when there is an unexplained cholestasis in the icu or suddenly an acolculus cholestasis develops in a patient with improving hemodynamics and the hemodynamics are bad you can blame on sepsis when the hemodynamics improve cholestasis worsen this is what is happening thanks hello thank you dr balaji sir a wonderful presentation on the management principles of the liver injury as well as the drug therapy and the investi investigation procedures any questions dr balaji on my own basic question uh, when you as a cardiologist when you think about liver and heart four to five drugs will arise in my, in my mind one is statin second is amiodarone third is uh, Uh, oral anticoagulants, fourth is, fourth is ranalozin and ticagrelor. These five drugs will arise in my mind when you think about liver disease and cardiac. So in an ICU patient, when the patient requires a statin therapy with the underlying uh, liver disease, so which two questions? Which which statin will you prefer and what will be the dose based on the liver enzymes or alkaline factors? Actually, all the statins can cause transaminases, sir. And generally, the indication to stop statins will be a five. We 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 can wait until five times elevation of the normal enzyme when it. climbs beyond uh, for example otpt jumping beyond 200 we become cautious that's where we try to withdraw the statins and all i, I think all statins can cause transaminases i don't think there is evidence to show that one statin is superior to other in terms of transaminases risk uh, what is the incidence of this uh, sclerosing cholangitis sclerosing cholangitis incidence yeah, in septic patients i mean the kind of patient that you have shown In ischemic hepatitis or uh, se severe septic. I'm sorry, sir. I don't know the numbers. Because such know. a such a rare thing. I'm almost listening to it for the first time. So I'm wondering I, if I missed it. I have seen two patients in my 14 years of ICU. 
So I'm not sure about others' experience. I don't have statistics on this. No, if somebody knows, they can share. Common problem. They raise their bilirubin to three and over, all indirect. And you can just uh, understand that this is happening ischemia to liver. To which, which vasopressor is there? But you have to give some vasopressor then. So you finally okay. not. Didn't For the sake of ischemic hepatitis to protect the kidneys, I will not give any vasopressor. That's what I want to highlight. Just for the sake of increasing the hepatic blood flow, I will not give any vasopressors. Vasopressor choice, I tend to give, depend, depends upon the MAP goal, urine output, lactate. Somebody has a good sensorium, lactate less than 2, MAP goal of more than 70, urine output of 0.5 ml per kg per hour for an adult patient. I won't give a vasopressor because the end organ perfusion is good. I won't go for a vasopressor at all. I think I answered your question. Just for the sake for of protecting the liver or kidney, I will not give a vasopressor. That's my approach. Thank you. How do we decide upon? So map, uh, they say that map of 70 uh, uh, ensures organ perfusion. Now, it's just a number after all. So let us not chase the numbers. Let us go by Holistically, we can see whether the organ perfusion is good. When somebody has a good sensorium, urine output, lactate, everything is good, then MAP gold correlates well. So we don't, let us not chase the numbers. As intensives, we look at MAP gold of 65-70 as standard, but that goes along with other parameters, not just the number. Yes, yes, we should not give a start. I mean, uh, that's what we, we, we should not be looking at that single value map and titrating everything. I agree with that. When somebody has a map of 60, for example, but his urine output will be good, lactate is okay, patient sensorium improving, I will try to taper vasopressors. I mean, I will not be looking at only at that number. Can, uh... All the more when somebody is on non invasive BP monitoring in the ICU, NIBP, we know that it's quite inaccurate. Unless he has an invasive arterial line monitoring, again the numbers are even more, you know, misguiding you. No, that along with other parameters. All of us write MAP goal 6570 just to alert. All of us write as intensive is all of us write MAP goal, but again that should be with urine output and lactate. Probably. Yes, sir, that we need your help. You are the experts. <laughs> okay. Great. Uh, thank you very much. We are running short of time. And uh, for the last talk, I'd like to invite Dr. Meghna Matthew uh, to tell us how to identify early and tackle renal failure. At the outset, I want to thank the organizers of HFAI. And uh, as you rightly said, sir, Dr. Abraham has chosen the topics very rightly, heart, liver, and then the kidneys. So I'm here the last. So my topic itself is going to take 30 seconds. So maybe exempted from the total duration of 15 minutes. So my topic is kidney failure and renal replacement therapy in patients with acute heart failure and cardiogenic shock. So what I thought of doing was have this, um, you know, the main core questions to be answered. And that would be outcome of cardiogenic shock and heart failure associated with AKI. What's the mechanism? What's the role of biomarkers? And what are the treatment options available? This is a very enthusiastic prospective observational data. What they found was post MI, whoever was ending up with a acute kidney injury, they followed up these patients over a period of like 10 years. It was interesting to see that almost only about 7% of patients with severe acute kidney injury after MI after a cardiogenic shock survives. That's really bad. So if you're really wondering what happened to this 10 years, if there are any other confounding factors, I totally agree with you. There were a lot of confounding factors. But in the first few data, in the first few 30 days of the immediate hospitalization, when they tried to remove all the other confounding factors, they found that severe AKI was actually contributing significantly to death as compared to mild and moderate. This is a retrospective analysis. Now I told you AKI, uh, following our MI is bad. What about renal replacement therapy? So this is a retrospective data on patients who had MI 
had cardiogenic shock, had AKI and ended up on RRT. What was clearly seen was patients who had ended up on RRT, they were much sicker, they ended up dying much higher as compared to patients who never required any form of renal replacement therapy. Now this data doesn't stick to first 30 days or within the hospitalization. It was actually translating to almost five years post the index hospitalization. What am I talking about here? I'm trying to tell you that there is something happening in the heart, there's something happening in the kidney, and the two organs seems to be talking to each other. And that is nothing other than the cardiorenal syndrome. And I'm here to talk basically about the type one cardiorenal syndrome. Basically, it's an acute kidney event after an acute cardiac event. You must be wondering why am I just restricting to cardiac event? Because I do believe that any kind of cardiac event like um, pulmonary edema or it could be cardiogenic shock and it could be an MI, everything can be associated with acute kidney injury. Now let's understand the mechanism. Traditionally in the medical college we've been told low cardiac output, low renal perfusion, hence your kidneys have shut down. But I disagree now. We know that this is just one of the mechanisms in cardiogenic shock and there is much more beyond it. The other mechanisms are venous congestion. So this is the data in patients who presented with acute decompensated heart failure. And what they did was they placed these patients on pulmonary artery catheter right at the time of admission. And what were they monitoring? They were monitoring the systolic blood pressure, they were trying to mod mod monitor the cardiac index, trying to monitor the CVP. Clearly, patients who had worsening renal function, WRF, refers to AKI basically, had higher CVP at the index, index uh, admission as compared to patients who did not have the worsening renal function. That goes to say that, look at the cardiac output, look at the cardiac index. Clearly, patients who had worsening renal function did not have a low cardiac index. So there is something else. This particular graph is just a representation of all the parameters that they compared. So they compared cardiac index, they compared the systolic blood pressure, they compared the wedge pressures, and clearly it was seen that higher was the CVP, higher was the incidence of developing a worsening renal function. So now we know it's just not cardiogenic shock, it is just not venous congestion, which is resulting in acute kidney injury. Because of this, there is a whole complex of RAS activation, sympathetic system activation, all of which results in a vicious cycle of having more and more fluid congestion. There is more and more pulmonary edema setting in. Now, along with all this, what also happens is most of these patients would have been on ARBs, ACE inhibitors, diuretics, they might be going for an angiography, contrast per se, all of this will also add to the in incidence of acute kidney injury. If you go back and see the nephrology literature, the classification of acute kidney injury is based on these different classification system. You have KDIGO, you have ECKIN, you have RIFLE. But when I was reading the cardiology literature, I found it interesting that the mostly the preferred term was worsening renal function. So basically what we are saying is anything more than 3.3 rise is bad. I agree with all of you. I do agree. The other advantage with this worsening renal function classification was you can clearly see that they have started using the biomarkers. You can see that a rise of more than 0.3 has been defined as a worsening, uh, worsening renal function. That brings, that brings my thought, what about the biomarkers? Now kidneys have got a lot of nephrons, they are very interesting organ. Everywhere there is a hit, you have a glomerulus, you have a tubules, anytime there is a hit, there are a lot of biomarkers being released. If you go back and see the literature, other than non-cardiac literature, when we were seeing sepsis, when we were seeing um, related to toxins, there was clearly some role of biomarkers. But when we saw it in the cardiac literature, it was clearly shown that it's only creatinine and urea that you have to monitor. So at present, we do not believe in monitoring the biomarkers, especially like um, uh, you have your NGAL. It's unlike our cardiac biomarkers where you have a lot of role. You have troponin, you have nt P, which you closely monitor. Now I'm telling you, I'm left with no options. I don't have biomarker, I don't have any data. How do I tell you that this patient has got acute kidney injury? So this is a simple uh, algorithm. So what you can see here is, when the patient gets admitted with cardiogenic shock or a heart failure, clearly there could be a forward failure or a backward failure. All of which can result in a very simple definition of worsening renal function for me, which is called as acute kidney injury. The patient stays longer little longer, maybe a week or so, you can see that the creatinine further rises. We all get anxious, oh my god, the creatinine is rising, what do I do about it? Simple. There is a simple algorithm to follow. 
Now, as you all might be rightly thinking, this patient could be in ICU, must have had a sepsis, must have been given contrast, some angio would have happened. To negate the effect of all this, you basically what you do is just look at the function of the tubules. You really want to know, is it a pseudo WRF, pseudo worsening of the renal function, or is it a true WRF? What you do is, you look at the ass assessment of the diuretics. So after giving a loop diuretics, if you see any of these parameters setting in, your kidneys are functioning. Do not worry about the rising creatinine. It's just that the decongestion is happening. Creatinine may rise. Do not panic. Now, is there anything else? Dr. Raymond has been telling. We have forgotten our steps. I do agree with him. We are carrying our ultrasound. So we have our renal ultrasound. Clear where we, where we were trying to see if there is anything else that we can try to pick up these patients a little earlier because we know creatinine can take a little longer. It might take sometimes 48 hours to start rising. The urine output may take a little longer, you know, yeah, the AKI would have set in much earlier, but the but your urine output starts dropping a little later. So you can actually do your renal venous flow and see what is happening to the flow. Now, if you have this intermittent kind of flow, which is shown in the picture, you know that your renal, your kidneys are getting congested. Now, when to consider RRT, the fourth question of my talk. I know now that AKI mostly happens in the patients who have got cardiogenic shock or heart failure. Other events can also predispose. I know about it. I know renal replacement therapy is bad. I need to avoid, I need to do something to avoid the renal replacement therapy. I don't have biomarkers. I know that I have given loop diuretic. If my patient is responding, there is all those parameters are being met, I'm safe. But if my parameters are rising, and if my patient is, if the, if the diuretic response is not good and my creatinine is rising, then I'm concerned. What is your optimal decongestion? You have been using loop diuretics. We now know that decongestion is good. Having a de good decongestion by the time of discharge has, this, has been associated with decreased hospitalization and decreased all-cause mortality. The dose AHF trial has already been discussed. There is no difference between using it in the bolus or in the intermittent form. Another one trial which clearly showed the same thing. No difference between intermittent or bolus form. Now, beyond one point, you will see that the patient is actually congested. The creatinine is rising. The acute kidney injury is there. Or maybe the patient is in cardiogenic shock. Uh, you have been starting a lot of hemodynamic monitoring. You would have started your inotropes, which we all discussed about. And in case the patient is in heart failure, your diuretics fail to work. That's because of something happening there. Either it would have been because of the decreased bioavailability or because the patient has gone for hypoalbuminemia, there is not enough binding of frisamide happening with the albumin, not enough to target to the tubules to work. Many a times, after a certain period of time, there is no such, there is no such timeline beyond which we have seen the patients develop diuretic resistance. So if you were to ask me, is it one week, is it two weeks, I really don't know. Something called breaking phenomenon happens. Basically, it says that the diuretics don't work. You can see it clearly in the graphical representation. There is no much natriuresis being achieved. Also, what happens is your distal tubules go for a lot of hypertrophy. Your, your uh, diuretics may not work. Maybe now renal replacement therapy? Yeah, so what was happening is there was a tendency that if the patient is fluid overloaded, congested, let me start the renal replacement therapy. Karas HF trial was very interesting. So it, it took patients who had creatinine of less than 3.5, they stratified or they randomized into patients who were initially started off with a good diuresis. They compared with, and on the other limb, you had patients who were started on with renal replacement therapy. It was clearly shown that it was of no use. So ultrafiltration was working as at par as your drugs. So you do not have to worry. If a patient comes to you, is congested, you can start using your diuretics you look for the response. Remember the picture which I showed you, look for the tubular response. If the tubular response is good, that means your kidneys, your nephrons are intact, continue to do so. This has been vouched by so many other studies in the recent times and all of which had shown clearly that if the creatinine is very early, early stages of AKI, you can still go ahead and continue to diuse your patient. So where does my renal replacement therapy stand? Remember I told you about the breaking phenomenon. You know that diuretic efficacy has failed. Consider to have renal replacement therapy and the ultrafiltration done, especially in patients who have got refractory volume overload and acute kidney injury. Now, the next big question, when do I start? I know that I may be starting renal replacement therapy. When do I start? Now, this data is actually not the cardiac ICUs. It was actually from the general medical ICU. And you can see a lot of studies, LAN, Ekiki, START ICU. And then you had your ideal 
uh, idealized uterine. All of them showed that there was not much difference between starting dialysis. Once you have thought of dialysis, you, they had different uh, early criteria, late uh, criteria. If you were to if you were to ask me roughly around what time, anything after 48 hours, they roughly said that there was not much difference. So you can actually wait and start your dialysis a little late. Give your time, if you are of the opinion that your kidneys will start functioning meanwhile, yes, you may be correct. Of these trials, the one which I have arrow marked here is the Elaine trial. Now, this was very interesting. This was the only trial which showed that early RRT was better. And actually, I will show you something interesting about this trial. It had mostly cardiac patients. Now, when I went back and read more about this, most of the cardiothoracic journals, most of the cardiology journals, clearly showed that once the patient has been decided on renal replacement therapy, if you start off early, they tend to do better. So how do I summarize? Just two minutes more. If I have a patient with acute heart failure and I start my decongestive therapy, I see that the creatinine is rising. What do I do? Um, if my creatinine is not rising, I am I'm good to go. I will continue my diuretics. But if, I, if my creatinine is rising, I will make sure I get an ultrasound done, make sure there are no post-renal uh, post causes. What do I next do? I will assess the diuretic response. Remember I told you about the tubules. Look at the tube, give the diuretic, see the urine sodium. If it is good, that means your natriuresis is good. Continue the diuretics. It is all pseudo WRF. The creatinine has gone up only because of the effect of the diuretics. You need not worry if the patient is continuing to diurese well. But however, if you see that the patient is not diuresing well, patient remains congested, what do you do, need to do next? What you can do is, in case you have patients with significant ascites, you can put in a needle, do a parasad. That's when we were talking sometime back about the hypotension, hypoperfusion. You feel that there is no hypotension, hypoperfusion, along with the diuretics, add on your NTG. NTG. Someone was asking about NTG here. So you add on your nitroglycerate. In case you see there is hypotension, hypoperfusion, you need to add on your inotropes. Now, at this point, if your patient improves, good, you're on track. In case the patient is congested, your hemodynamics are okay, hemodynamics are poor, you are not having enough diuretic efficacy is poor, clearly the time for hemodialysis and that's when you consider hemodialysis. I hope you found this talk useful, 15 minutes was definitely truncated for me to cover up everything. If any questions, I'll be happy to take it. Yeah, very elegant. Uh, <clears throat> is there a role for NGAL in this? So yes, sir. so NGAL actually has been studied, the most of the data was from the uh, non-cardiac literature. We couldn't find, I couldn't find much in the cardiac literature. Whatever I could find, especially in the AHA recommendations and everything, it was clearly shown that it was not adding to the, uh, it was not adding to decision making, it was not adding to improving the outcomes. So NGAL may not, it, right now we don't have an evidence for the NGAL. So. Right. So, uh, how does uh, how does renal replacement therapy versus a sequential nephron block it? See, one of the reasons for lack of diuresis is that you, if you use a single type of a diuretic. Yes. But if you have a sequential nephron block, that's one of the ways to get over the. Yes, sir. I agree with you. When you have breaking phenomenon happening and you are worried about the diuretic effic efficacy taking a setback, there is data on adding on some other class classes of diuretics especially like metallozone has been tried. We have even looked at adding spironolactones as well. Uh, but if you have come to the point that all of these are failing, renal replacement therapy. But I agree with you. Yes, there is a role. In fact, in cardiology literature in the last one and a half years or so, there are a number of papers, there are a number okay. of drugs actually which are being used as, you know, uh, loop sparing mm -hmm. kind of agents, yeah. acetazolamide, Yes, sir. Even uh, chlorthalidon has been used. Acetazolamide had a very recent trial. I agree with you, sir. IV acetazolamide was actually tried in these patients. Uh, but it did. It was just one study. And I don't know why it's not getting promoted much. But it, I agree with you. IV acetazolamide is the most recent one. Then the, the third point was you showed in a slide that uh, those who go actually for RRT anyway yeah. have a worse prognosis because yes. they are already sicker. Yes, sir. Uh, so, how is it that you intervene early and you, um, you know, do better, those patients do better if you intervene early? I, I sir, mean, I don't reconcile those two things. Okay, okay. Even I don't know if, how to, when do we intervene early? Can we pick them up earlier? I do agree. We really don't have biomarkers. Yeah. We do not, we cannot predict that this person or this patient can end up on renal replacement therapy. We don't have. Great. Dr. Sastri has a question. Yeah, it's more of a comment. Yes, sir. Uh, I think 
pure heart failure without other complicating phenomena like sepsis or yeah. some other problem renal replacement requiring acute kidney injury is uncommon it is well, sorry it is so. uncommon uncommon yeah, yeah yeah so if you require if you, you, there must be some tubular damage due to some other cause like acute tubular necrosis some other ischemia or nephrotoxic agents yeah i that, agree with you sir when is, i was reading about it it was seen that it was only 3% of the population and yeah. i was wondering how do i talk so to you a so person much about with heart failure requiring renal replacement yes. therapy is really you know very acute, very rare yes okay, acute sir. cardiogenic shock if you can reverse it that will be better and True, second sir. thing is in a cost sensitive market like india our society cost sensitive society like india Uh, considering lack of difference in between the outcomes yes, between sir. the renal replacement and conservative therapy yeah. i would be very hesitant actually very often i stop my nephrology colleagues from doing dialysis okay and okay. wait for few hours they start pouring out urine and uh, you save a lot of money and potential complications dialysis is not without complications i agree with you sir i totally agree with you on that that's what i was just mentioning that uh, caris hf and all those trials have been fa- in more in favor of using diuretics in fact as sir is telling stepping of diuretics using the alternate sites for using the diuretics i agree totally with you one question that came to my mind when you were kind of making a presentation was that uh, there was a talk of increase in the creatinine yes sir it is it is very well possible that an acute mi patient comes yeah. has a cardiogenic shock doesn't have a baseline creatinine at all and uh, if the creatinine is raised and there is a decrease in urine output how do you is, is it important to differentiate whether it is a acute or chronic or um, uh, no sorry just the change in, just the change in the creatinine that's what i'm saying if you yep. don't have the baseline we don't have the baseline so the admission day so what they were doing is 24 48 72 hours every day they were monitoring the creatinine for all the study patients whoever have been included and they were just looking at the change in that 24 48 and 72 hours if the cha- if the rise was more than 2 or if the absolute creatinine had gone more than 3.5 is that's when they cons- even thought of getting a nephrology consultations so till then they were not keen on getting a nephrologist consultation you you also mentioned uh, increase of more than 0.3 yes, and sir. we also consider increase of more than 50% over the baseline yes sir those two are the main criteria for ati that cardiologists use actually they we use the gf and yes you know put okay thank you thank you thank you great talk thank you sir thank you very much and we'll close the session thank you thank you very much uh, it's uh, not often that we have for here from critical care specialist on topics which are very important to us so next topic uh, is uh, by all our titans so i invite professor mitska who's come all the way from slovenia again i repeat he has spent 14 hours traveling to come here and tomorrow he is going so again as i say no bharat darshan no uh, visiting relatives or friends he's just come for the conference again once again thank you sir and as moderators i invite Dr. K. Subramanian, my mentor, Dr. Leraja, my close friend, and the speakers would be real heavyweights uh, intellectually. Uh, Professor, Professor Kerker, Dr. Satyamurthy, Dr. Akesh, and of course Dr. Sandeep Bansal. Over to uh, Professor Bidja, Dr. Subramanian, and Dr. Leraja. I will start with the first speaker, Dr. Raful Kerker. Yeah. I don't think he needs Hi. any introduction to the <laughs> audience. Very senior cardiologist and close friend. Well, respected chairpersons and dear friends, and thank you, Oman, for the invitation and the organizers of this show. It's all set? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Perfect. Hello. Ah, hello. It was.
I'm sorry, I had to put in my laptop just because some movies wouldn't play. Well, you can see it's a quite a challenging topic at the end of the day. And I am no heavyweight as he introduced myself, <laughs> as he introduced me. But yes, we need to stay abreast of what are the recent developments. And I have also decided to move at times and accepted this talk. But at the outset, it was that young bloke there, Dr. Bhavik Shah, my fellow, who helped me with all the slide making and my fellow colleagues from Mumbai, who deserve the acknowledgements out there, Milan Fadke and Nitin Burkule. So the typical case scenario, not necessarily typical, a 22-year-old male, progressive DOE class 3, symptoms and signs of heart failure. Sister had had a sudden cardiac death due to dilated cardiomyopathy and no neuromuscular deficit. So this is the ECG out here, very, very, very abnormal ECG. You've got a leftward axis, you've got an atrial enlargement, predominantly right. You've got a sinus tachy going on, you've got a right bundle, and you've got probably LVH there also with strain, and if you want to call them sort of infarct-like patterns or whatever you have. And this is the, so there is hypertrophy, there is biatrial dilatation, normal-sized ventricles, and in the setting of hypertrophy, maybe mildly depressed LV function and not much pulmonary hypertension, though there is mild to moderate TR and there is that low, volt, low amplitude deflections in the tissue Doppler, 5 by 5 by 5 sign, as we call it. And add to it, meaning my people are very good, they've done the global strain also, 3.1. So what do you call this a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? or a restrictive cardiomyopathy. Therein begins the challenge. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is a heterogeneous group of diseases characterized by a restrictive left ventricular pathophysiology that is a rapid rise in the ventricular pressure with only small increases in filling volume due to increased myocardial stiffness. And there can be many etiologies to it. And good old European, we have an European with us, 2008 classification divides it into familial and non-familial, but gives scant regard to the heterogeneity of the myocardial substrate. Remarkable heterogeneity when you look at it histologically. And histologically, the mechanisms can be interstitial fibrosis or intrinsic myocardial dysfunction, typically in a primary idiopathic cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy or radiation-related one, infiltration of extracellular spaces, typically cardiac amyloid and sarcoid, accumulation of storage material within the cardiomyocytes, when we call them the storage diseases like the Febreze disease or the hemochromatosis. And mind you, restriction can occur just due to endocardial involvement alone. And then in, we have endocardial myocardial fibrosis, that is Loeffler's or EMF. So the dilemma, another dilemma out here is that the evolution of phenotypes over time. Many disorders do not show the restrictive pathophysiology throughout their natural history. In the initial stage, they could be, meaning uh, they could be restrictive with an evolution towards hypokinetic and dilated phenotype later, or at a terminal stage, they could manifest often progressing from initially hypertrophic phenotype, maybe ours was that. Or maybe you could have combination of both, that's more likely with our case, both hypertrophic and restrictive phenotypes may coexist. And mind you, these phenotypes could get expressed by the same mutant gene. So pretty much an overlap there. So more precisely, the, def the defining features of restrictive cardiomyopathy is the co coexistence of persistent restrictive pathophysiology, along with diastolic dysfunction, biatrial dilatation, non-dilated ventricles, and mind you, regardless, regardless of ventricular wall thickness or systolic function. And, and in addition to this hallmark of a, a hemodynamic disturbance that we talked about, the phenotypic spectrum of RCM could be wide. So the starting point in the diagnostic workup is the identification of a restrictive, pheno, uh, restrictive hemodynamic profile and importantly, its persistence over time, for example, over six months. And the signs and symptoms of heart failure are typically there, nothing much different there over months to years. And 
uh, atrial fibrillation is quite common about 30 percent of the cases heart failure is most often right-sided or even for that matter biventricular with enlargement of liver lower limb edema and ascites but when do you suspect on history with symptoms and signs of heart failure prior history of chest irradiation prior exposure to medicines uh, like hcq and anthracyclines family history is important as it was in our case history of multiple myeloma amyloidosis sarcoidosis or hemochromatosis and peripheral blood eosinophilia in lofflers as i spoke about so the electrocardiogram again can be non specific afib i mentioned to you is very common pscs av blocks intraventricular conduction delays lv hypertrophies talking about lv hypertrophy i was specifically asked to stay away from amyloid so discrepancy between the degree of ventricular wall thickness and qrs complex voltages on the surface ecg aid in differentiating hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or other storage disorders from the cardiac amyloid which i will show you in the next slide and the presence of av block should point to sarcoid and amyloid so here is that al amyloid that we picked up and notice the ecg low voltages and whereas the echo is significant significant hypertrophy there is an av block as well there and the chest x-ray again the cardiomegaly comes from significant atrial enlargement standard pulmonary venous congestion and pleural effusions but if you get mediastinal lymph if you have mediastinal lymph nodes that could be revealed with sarcoid patients and watch out for pericardial calcification again that's a different topic by itself where the differential would be cp so lab testing are usual add to that bnps and cardiac troponins and ion studies and also yes monoclonal protein studies for detection of free serum milling for detection of al amyloidosis so lab testing could give certain specific diagnosis like light chain amyloidosis wherein in addition to the detectable monoclonal proteins you'll have abnormal counts and impaired renal function or cardiac amyloidosis it's not diagnostic but very often mild elevations in cardiac troponins you do get hemochromatosis polycythemia elevated serum ferritin levels abnormal lfts and for eosinophilic myocarditis or emf a persistent elevation in absolute eosinophil count echocardiography we talked about the typical features in the first case that i showed you but doppler recognition is extremely important for this restrictive pathophysiology and it's a good sign to remember these four features right the abnormal cutoff values of e by e dash it's a good idea to put it in your echo lab itself e by e dash more than 14 or the annular velocities the septal and the lateral you should know their upper limits and that they if they are less than 7 and less than 10 their tr velocity of more than 2.8 which will suggest pulmonary hypertension and LA volume index less than 34 mm and more than two of these suggest the restrictive filling pattern and diastolic dysfunction and that's what it is after you have diagnosed on the basis of clinical lab x-ray and echo you diagnose that restrictive pathophysiology now the echocardiographic pattern whether there is LV hypertrophy as was there in our case or normal wall thickness now this was a patient on the left that is showing you wall thickness normal yes electric to physiology certain certain of these group of disorders will come to your mind or ventricular cavity abnormalities like lofflers and then we move on to cmr and emb so cmr in rcm i think it's high time at least i haven't become one but for the younger generation out here it's high time that you become cmr meaning cardio radiologist we all call ourselves cardio diabetologists cardio nephrologist but cardio radiologist is very important because this is extremely extremely important and you have not only the gold standard for the for the measurements there the rv rv involvement or the lv edv and all that we know about but add to it these last five terms out there the lge whether it is diffuse or whether it is restricted to some areas or it's global then the native t1 T2 mapping and ECV, all these are important because they serve as tissue signatures. You can actually figure out the lipid accumulations, the iron loads, etc. within. And this was the CMR in our index case where you can even on a CMR get global strain and you can see the global strain was reduced here. And the, the T1 and the ECV were increased suggesting interstitial fibrosis. But 
Typically in an iron overload, there is low native T1 and in the cardiac amyloid, there is a high native T1. And like I mentioned to you, this is a French case wherein a syncope patient presented with echo basal enthoroceptal hypokinesia and you can see here the central hilar nodes and in such a scenario with an AV block in a young patient, think of cardiac sarcoidosis and look at this kind of a patchy LG not corresponding to a coronary distribution. The role of cardiac MRI to speak in terms of the Jack editor who was recently in Mumbai, CMR has something that no other modality has, precise tissue signatures and then he talks about every other thing that he is able to diagnose in CMR which is extremely important, dilated cardiomyopathy, amyloid, ischemic, endomyocardial fibrosis, LV non-compaction, restrictive and so on and so forth. Replacement fibrosis detected with LGE, then edema imaging with T2 W weighted mapping, the interstitial fibrosis as we saw in our case with T1 mapping, all that is possible. So since my time is up, in conclusion, restrictive cardiomyopathy should be suspected in patients with a restrictive pathophysiology and no ventricular dilatation. The restrictive pathophysiology should be confirmed in repeated evaluations. When restrictive cardiomyopathy is identified, the echocardiographic patterns of normal or increased LV thickness or evidence of endomyocardial involvement may orient towards a specific diagnosis. Look for red flags in the clinical ECG imaging findings to get a specific diagnosis and rarely, rarely today we really need to, especially in a cardiac amyloid with add to it the PET imaging that we have, meaning the bone scans that we can do. With that, we do not even need biopsies, especially with ATTR amyloidosis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kerkar, for a very comprehensive coverage in such a short time. Um, I think we are running behind time, but maybe just two questions. More than questions, maybe our foreign speaker could give some comment because, well, I am the old school guy from the first slide that I showed you. These are our new times, you know, the CMR business is so relevant and so important that we all should get into it and try and eval be able to evaluate it ourselves. At least some of my cardiology colleagues, the names that I mentioned, they do it themselves. I Meaning they go to the lab, CMR lab, they have it along with them and they go and, you know, we're talking about Burkule, my colleague from Mumbai is there, Rute Jadav is there. Yeah, go ahead, sir. So uh, what I would emphasize, um, again, uh, patients should be in the center stage. So whenever you, uh, have good old-fashioned symptoms and signs changes in ECG, um, uh, chest x-ray, uh, this should raise suspicion. But in the end, I would also agree with you that CMR is nowadays the state-of-the-art tool for these patients. Um, and as you pointed out, uh, cardiologists should also take the lead here. Uh, with all the respect to radiology colleagues, they are not clinicians. They, can, they don't see the patients. They are very mechanistic in their way. They have more experience, more knowledge about radiological views and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the physics behind the method. But we know the patient. Yeah, so at our university hospital, at least we have started a little rotation for the people to go into our CMR de departments also, you know. And um, in Slovenia, uh, for instance, uh, the cardiology is six years and one year is elective. So what we do now, we try to identify people who have interest in imaging, so they do the sixth year of CMR and to also to attain a European license. Uh, and that opens the door for CMR to uh, cardiology in practice, not only radiology. And I believe that's, that is the step where, which we should make, that we also embrace uh, this new imaging methodology, at least for, for some of the car cardiology colleagues, and not leave this to a radiologist. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have one just yes, sharing, sure. Go sharing ahead. a doubt as such? Um, very uh, comprehensive, excellent talk. Uh, in reality, uh, differentiating restrictive cardiomyopathy from uh, constrictive pericarditis at times really difficult. 
and uh, we we burn our hands even referring the patient for you know pericolectomy so honestly sharing uh, uh, some of the quick uh, suggestions from you uh, you know to differentiate uh, constrictive pericarditis versus uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy practically what you are trying to do Practical. Still, we still can do that on echo. I mean, if you're good at your diastology, as you say, we can manage to do that. But at the end of it all, meaning we go to CAT, we do everything, then you go in and you have surprises. That still happens. Maybe you could share your well, thoughts. Well, because unless you're good at your echo, you're able to do your respiratory variation business, you get to do all that. So the entire physiology, we would catheterize the patient by and large. When in doubt, we would catheterize. If it, how else do you control it? Thank you, Dr. K. Thank you so much, Thank sir. You, sir. Thank you. Uh, the next topic is another interesting topic, LV non-compaction. And to speak on that, it's none other than my, my, my close friend and former colleague, Dr. Satyamurthy, a very senior cardiologist from Apollo Hospitals. Mm -hmm. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to be here to discuss on left, ven left ventricular non-compaction. Actually, the topic given is left ventricular non-compaction. It is a misnomer. It can be even right ventricular non-compaction or biventricular non-compaction. How to... Okay, okay. Sorry. And it is a forgotten cause for heart failure. And the task given is to remind you all that such thing do occur and we have to keep in mind. It is a rare genetic cardiomyopathy due to the arrest in final stage of myocardial morphogenesis. <clears throat> the exact incidence is not known, particularly in patients of heart failure. But in echocardiography, one study echocardiographic uh, follow-up of retrospective data, the incidence is 0 0.05 to 0.26, this is from Mayo Clinic. The compaction of trabecular layer begins by 10th week and ends by 12th to 14th week and completes by 4th month. So what it means is that this condition can be detected by fetal echocardiography. Multiple genetic phenotypes have been identified. The familial occurrence occurs in 30%. And in one large study, the gene mutation has been found in one, six, uh, one, one third of cases and family history of without any mutation was there in one sixth, uh, one sixth of patients. It can occur sporadic, which is almost in 50% of people. The clinical pre presentation is as shown here. The most common is it is asymptomatic, depending upon the percentage of non-compacted myocardium and 
many times it is detected during routine echocardiography or when we are evaluating for for valvular heart disease or congenital heart disease <coughs> next is heart failure rarely 2% of patients can present with thromboembolic episodes similarly 1 to 2% of people can present with tachyarrhythmias particularly ventricular tachyarrhythmias the routine investigations are ecg holter 2d and 3d echo then wherever echo is we are in doubt regarding echo then we have to go for cardiac mri cine angiography is only indicated if you got associated condition like tetralogy fallow or we have got we had one patient of tetralogy one single ventricle like that or patients who present with associate coronary artery disease who need, requires whatever for example there is mitral regurgitation you want to see why there is so much of lv dysfunction in such cases we can do lv angio and there no role of cardiac ct or endomyocardial biopsy these days what it shows is majority of the patients will have narrow qrs that is why the data about crtp in uh, non compaction is very very uh, sparse not not much data is available the percentage the ratio of compacted to non compacted myocardium at end diastole should be more than 2 is to 1 to make a diagnosis particularly in parasternal short axis view by echocardiography not only that at least you require three trabeculations protruding from the lv apex towards the papillary muscles that is towards the base and it should be perfused by the lv cavity and also there should be presence of multiple prominent trabeculations like finger like projections and even in end systole these projections will be patent they won't get compressed these trabeculations move in asynchronous fashion with the compacted myocardium and this is very uh, commonly seen in 3d echo when it is usually a abnormal rotation which is seen but in uh, non compaction both the compacted and non compacted apex and base will move in one direction that is called asynchronous movement one must always keep in mind the different diagnoses like multiple thrombi false tendons apical hcm at late stages when fibrosis is occurring that's patchy fibrosis apical fibroma endomyocardial fibrosis intramyocardial hematoma cardiac metastasis and intramyocardial abscesses in end stage endocarditis patients the wherever there is doubt one must do cardiac mri and the uh, lge reveals fibrosis and the the uh, ratio should be more than 2 2 is to 1 2.3 is to 1 compacted versus non compacted myocardium that is at di end diastole in one study uh, a multi ethnic study of 1000 subjects 43% of uh, patients without systemic hypertension or cardiac disease had at least in one out of the eight regions trabeculated to non uh, trabeculated to compacted layer more than 2.3 but in one region if it's there you should not at least it should at least it should involve one fourth to one third of the myocardium to make a diagnosis of non uh, left ventricular non compaction this is a four chambered mri cardiac mri this is two chambered mri showing the ratio more than 2.3 to 1 the trabeculated versus compacted uh, the non compacted myocardium recently we had a patient of uh, the epstein anomaly who came with biventricular failure very mild cyanosis we were really we could not make a diagnosis on echo because it is borderline it is inconclusive so we did an mri which showed that there is non compaction of the biventricular non compaction that is the reason why patient presented with biventricular failure with epstein anomaly this is a patient who came with severe mitral regurgitation and he is about he is a teenager and a mitral valve prolapse with mr and and lv function was 30% and when we did the echo there is severe non compaction here there no controversy
I don't know how to do that. Yeah. This is the short axis. Wherever there is curable condition, though there is severe LV dysfunction, better to get, get him operated. This patient has undergone uh, the mitral valve uh, ring repair, mitral valve repair, and he is doing well. After the procedure, ejection fraction came down, uh, came up from 30 to 45 percent, and he is of course on anti-congestive medication, but much better than what he was. The management involves in uh, beta blockers, particularly carvedilol, for severe heart failure, you require guideline-based medical therapy. Whatever is the uh, like those four fantastic four pillars, uh, anticoagulants wherever there is thromboembolic episodes, ICD. I will be coming to the uh, indication ICD in next slide. Role of CRTP is very limited because majority of them have narrow cures complex and cardiac transplant, of course. Whenever there is family history of sudden cardiac death or history of syncope or pre-syncope, ejection fraction less than 35 percent, that's primary prophylaxis, NSVT by a whole tear, these patients need ICD. Anticoagulants, whenever there is stroke, which can occur in 1 to 2 percent of these patients, exactly, you know, the incidence of non-compaction is so less, very rare, we can't really give concrete recommendation, but wherever there is stroke or any thromboembolic episode, these patients require anticoagulation. There is not much data available of about NOVAX, but those patients who got paroxysmal, paroxysmal or long-term AF, they definitely need anticoagulation. You can decide whether NOVAX or vitamin K antagonists. Some patients have visible left ventricle apical clots. In these conditions, you have to definitely give them on vitamin K antagonists. It is not uh, incurable or anything, but there is some data to suggest that at least one third of the patients can have some amount of regression as they grow, particularly patients uh, where uh, LV non competition is detected in children or in adolescents. And this is because the non compacted area can slowly get compacted, particularly from the base to apex. The, their regression can also occur in patients who have got severe left ventral hypertrophy uh, because of hypertension and fibrosis, patchy fibrosis. In such cases, if you treat them, this can happen. But one very important uh, point or warning is that during pregnancy and postpartum, there can be non compaction. You should not take them. This is called physiological non compaction because of hormonal imbalance. So they have to be assessed three months to six months after the delivery and uh, then only you can really make a diagnosis of non-compaction. We had about uh, 26 cases which we published in Indian Art Journal in 2010. These patients are collected during a period of eight years. Out of these 26, 16 patients were isolated left ventral non-compaction. So some of them can have associated rheumatic which is coincidental or can have congenital heart diseases and and the age, their ages is one day to 63 years and six of our, only six of our patients had uh, cardiac MRI. Another couple of slides, I'll be finished. This is a patient who has got single ventricle with uh, non-compaction, single ventricle with non-compaction. This is my last slide. The people will call it LV non-compaction or non-compaction cardiomyopathy, LV hypertrabriculation, or spongy myocardium. What is in the name, which we call a rose by any other name, would smell as sweet as it is by Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Great talk, sir, and I am one of your student. Uh, that's an interesting article, sir, by you. And uh, basically, this is an inheritable disorder among those uh, uh, patients. Uh, uh, any you know, family history or what kind of uh, genetic testing they are subjected? Any other interesting information from their family members, uh, the affected patients? Sir? I couldn't get your question. It's basically an uh, inheritable disorder. Yeah, in, in the in the study, uh, how, uh, what about uh, uh, the any investigation done on their you know, relatives 
Correct. I understood, but we didn't look at it. Actually, it's a retrospective study. When we started getting more and more cases, we went retrospectively and saw which are all the patients of non-compaction collected the data. And I concluded also only in five patients we did MRI because initially the MRI only started in 2014 or 15 here and we started recognizing and using it of late only. So in some of the cases, maybe borderline cases which you must have included. So we didn't look at into the genetic or family. This it is a retrospective analysis, one time analysis. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Sathya.
गुड इवनिंग डॉक्टर पांडे गुड इवनिंग कैन यू हियर मी वेल या आई कैन हियर यू वेल या ओके आई थिंक द लिंक इज स्टिल नॉट एक्टिव फॉर द I think uh, their digital has two auditoriums. Oh yeah, is it? Hmm. Hall A and Hall B. Actually, I have a talk recorded that is there in Hall B after one hour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. How come your talk was not recorded, or is it recorded? No, they they told me, but they told me pretty late. They told uh, me. Ah, Doctor Pandey sir, your voice is very low, sir. now is the voice better now ah, yes yes it's better yeah okay because uh, i think that was with the headphone it was not coming right headphone may be defective i don't know yeah so they they told me uh, uh, yesterday late afternoon around 4:35 i said baba yesterday was my on call day so i can't <laughs> do i go on live only yogesh you are there from the uh, reddies lab uh, and i am going to invite uh, doctors okay yeah. uh, vinay uh, vinay is our technical person so vinay can you just check all the uh, slides whether they are playable uh we can start with the uh, dr sikhe pune sir and after that we'll check for the dr pk sau sir vinay are you there yes yes yeah so so first we will start with my presentation where i will introduce all the speakers along with the chairperson followed by that we have the first session from the dr sikhe pune sir and followed by that we have the session from the dr pk sau sir Uh, sir, uh, Doctor Pandey, sir, you can share your. Yeah. Can you see my screen now, Vinay? Yes. Vinay, please confirm. Can you see my screen? Yes. 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 Yeah. Take care. My voice is clear. Yes or no? Your voice is clear. Perfect. Yeah. Then we can start with the Doctor Sikhe Pandey, sir, uh, for the testing. uh dr prashant sir uh, can you uh, can you check your slides sir if you are available no what's it Uh, can you share my screen? Let it go. Yes, sir. Is it coming? Yeah, yes, sir. It is coming. We can see it clearly. Oh. And your voice is also clear, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Hello, Jabir. Yeah. Hi, Doctor Sahu. Oh, How are you? I'm fine. 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 I'm fine. You are in Chennai, or you are not in Chennai? <laughs> I am not in Chennai. <laughs> so, we are all. Namaste. Are you in Chennai, uh, uh, Sahu, Doctor Sahu? Are you in Chennai? No, no, I am not in Chennai. I am in Bhuvneshwar. Okay. And uh, uh, what? Doctor uh, uh, Pandey must be in Mumbai only. Yes, yes, he must be in Mumbai. 
so vinay can we uh, can we start like it is 8 o'clock and hall a when we are going to stop the streaming stop we can start uh, we, we have only two talks isn't it one person is uh, not there yes sir so we'll start off with dr ponte and then dr sahu yes sir all right Uh, so sir uh, we'll start with my presentation i just give the introduction of the speakers along with the introduction for the moderator that is for you and then we'll hand over session to dr sekhe pundey sir for his presentation will that be okay uh, dr jabi sir right 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 theek and after that the dr pk sahu sir will come each session will be like 20 to 25 minutes and last 15 minutes will be the uh, uh, kind of a panel discussion yes yeah we are like we can start vinay please give us go ahead uh, once the streaming starts It start. We are live. You can start. Mr. Yogesh, your uh, internet is low. My what is low? Internet. Your bandwidth is low. My bandwidth is low. Yes, yes. Uh, you can start. You can start. Yeah, I will start session. I will be very quick in my introduction so that uh, I will be not be for the long time. Yeah. <laughs> Anuragi is not there, I think. Uh, no. Yeah, he is not there. I just give small introduction. I will uh, go go for the next slide immediately. So, uh, good evening, all the doctors. Uh, good evening, the speakers and the, and the moderator. Uh, we are having a fantabulous session, which is going on for the HFI as a physical uh, conference right here in Chennai. On the offset of the physical session, we are having the virtual session with the with the HFI. The first virtual session that we are going to start today, that is right from the eight pm. and on that we are very privileged to have the speakers like dr sikke ponde sir dr pk sahu sir as well as dr dr jabir as the moderator uh, dr anurag sir unfortunately is not available because he is traveling to lucknow because of some emergency work so we are going to start our first session with the, with the dr sikke ponde sir on arni in reversing ventricular remodeling in hrs a uh, reduced ejection fraction followed by that we will have the session from dr pk sahu sir he is going to talk on the hospitalization is a negative event in the heart failure journey steps to prevent and manage hospitalization due to heart failure and followed by that we will have the panel discussion all our speakers are the uh, eminent speaker so there is no more introduction is needed because everyone of you are knowing about them so i will just add few uh, words for the dr sikke ponde sir he is practicing from almost for four decades and currently is a consulting international cardiologist as well as the practicing electrophysiology and head of the department in the pd hinduja hospital in mumbai uh, sir has delivered more than 500 lectures he was a part of the various symposia along with that the national conference in india as well as in abroad and not uh, and not not only that the sir has published more than 100 publication in various national and international journals so we are we are very happy to have the dr sikke pundey sir with us and who is going to deliver talk on arnie and the reversing in heart failure followed by that we are having dr pk sahu sir so we are we are, we, are, we know him as the best cardiologist from the odisha that he has awarded in year 2015 not only that he has also been awarded as 100 top great leaders in asia by the asia one magazine he has also been awarded as the health leaders uh, from the uh, in the excellence in international cardiology we also know dr pk sahu sir for his excellent talks and the and the teaching skill in various various institutes and not only that he has been awarded as the best teacher as well as the post doctoral guide by the national board dr pk sahu sir also has more than 70 publication in both national and international publications and not only that he is a part of the uh, chapters in various books medical journals as a reviewer as as a co investigator and principal investigator in severe severe, severe uh, several multi uh, multi center clinical trials and lastly uh dr jabir uh, jabi sir he is a consultant cardiologist in lisi hospital in kochi his field of the interest are majorly the coronary intervention lipidology and heart failure we know sir for the various clinical trial publications as a part of the investors in the trials like engage as well as edoxaban as a phase 3 trial dr jabi sir is also part of the uh, so, uh, the fellowship of the society of fsci along with that again the fellowship in the international cardiology so we are very proud to have the uh the eminent speakers on the panel and definitely this discussion is going to take us and more insightful uh in the in the next one hour session so i will hand over session to dr sikipan bondi sir for the for the talk yeah thank you all very much yogesh uh can i share my slides now yes sir please yeah i'll share the slides can you see the screen 
can you all see the screen the first slide yes yes uh, uh, yes sir uh, we can see the slides the voice is also clear very sir. clear very clear yeah okay so i am going to talk upon <clears throat> reversal of remodeling in heart failure role and promise of ani what is remodeling remodeling was a term coined for the first time by hockman and bucky in a myocardial infarction rat model this term was aimed to characterize the replacement of the infected tissue with the scar tissue later paper used this term of remodeling in the current context describing progressive increase in the left ventricular cavity in experimental model in rats and then paper and brunwald published a review on cardiac remodeling following myocardial infarction the term was widely adopted later for further studies in 2000 there was a consensus statement from international forum of cardiac remodeling it was published and they defined cardiac remodeling as a group of molecular cellular and interstitial changes that clinically manifest as changes in size shape and function of the left ventricle resulting from cardiac injury and there were two types described physiological remodeling that happens in athletes and a uh, you know those robust workers versus pathological remodeling which happens in uh, disease states so this was the beautiful um, review one can read on cardiac remodeling by none other than kohn and ferrari how does adverse remodeling begin so when there is an injury you have myocyte loss you have toxic and inflammatory effects on myocardium or there could be a pressure overload or a volume overload such injuries to the myocardium cause biochemical changes molecular changes cellular changes ultimately leading to structural changes in the cardiac myocyte and that causes ventricular dysfunction initially asymptomatic later on symptomatic and the various cellular energy metabolism extracellular matrix changes and neurohormonal regulatory changes have been described very vividly in this article it is extremely interesting to read this article for three reasons one one must understand that neurohormonal changes start as a second step the first step are cellular changes these are progressive cell loss and collagen matrix destruction so normal muscle cell can have in the remodeling can undergo apoptosis and autophagy when apoptosis over regulates or over smarts outsmarts the autophagy reverse the adverse cardiac remodeling begins there can be physiological hypertrophy like in athletes or heavy lift workers etc or there could be concentric hypertrophy which occurs in patients with pressure overload or there could be eccentric hypertrophy that happens in volume overload but in chronic pressure overload is a peculiar phenomenon you have decrease increase in the interstitial collagen decrease in the number of myocytes but increase in the thickness of individual myocytes and decrease in the microvascular density so you may feel that the muscle has hypertrophied but the hypertrophy is actually at the extent of collagen at the expense of collagen deposition and worst decrease microvascular density producing a stage of continuous subendocardial ischemia there of course a tremendous contribution of ras activation in ventricular hypertrophy and fibrosis does ventricular remodeling affect prognosis adversely yes of course as you can see here progressive cardiac uh, uh, dilatation leads to recurrent hospitalizations which dr sahu is going to enlighten us about and finally a bedridden patient who sinks into uh, death neurohormonal activation or neurohormonal adverse remodeling begins with number 1 baroreceptor dysfunction ras activation sympathetic nervous activation activation and vasopressin secretion if you look at this scott solomon's article in 2005 in circulation one can see that every 10 ml increase in end diastolic volume increases mortality by 7% and every 10 ml increase in end systolic volume increases mortality by 12% every 10% decrease in lv ejection fraction 
increases HFH heart failure hospitalization by 40% and cardiovascular death by 55%. So that is the impact of adverse ventricular remodeling on clinical outcomes. Reverse remodeling and outcomes, if you compare heart failure therapies that lead to reverse remodeling, foster significant improvement in prognosis. And this was first shown by Kramer uh, in a small single center study uh, from Canada. How can we actually measure or quantify remodeling is the next question which we should ask ourselves. And here, the best index which came earliest in the literature by Dracus in 2012 circulation was the um, decrease in the left ventricular end systolic volume of more than 15%. That is an index of reverse ventricular remodeling. And if you plot your patients, like for example, this red, red square, there is neither a decrease in end systolic volume nor a decrease in end diastolic volume. Both increase proportionately and progressively is adverse modeling, remodeling. Both end systolic and end diastolic volume decrease together concordantly is excellent reverse remodeling. When your end diastolic volume increases but no change in LVS, LVESV, it is compensated remodeling. And to add to the cherry to the top, I mean cherry to the cake, we also, in, we also came to know that there is a biomarker to predict remodeling. An anti-proBNP level of less than 1000 if you achieve, that is where the remodeling begins. Reverse remodeling begins. It accelerates at an anti-proBNP level of 1000 or below. So if you see patients with anti-proBNP less than 1000 versus those above 1000, you see the reduction in end systolic volume, reduction in end diastolic volume, and improvement in ejection fraction is much better when your anti-proBNP is less than 1000. How do we measure these facets of remodeling? Structural, like volumes, relative wall thickness and left ventricular mass index by ECO and CMRI. Hemodynamic, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, pulmonary artery systolic pressure, LVDP by DT by ECO or cardiac cat. Increased wall stress and neurohormonal activation by NT-proBNP. Fibrosis by soluble ST2. Cell death and apoptosis by HS tropi and interstitial collagen deposition, Mimican. Proudly, ours is the only lab in the country which is uh, measuring Mimican in patients with heart failure. Are there any clinical or eco -bio biomarker predictors of reverse remodeling? Yes, there are. And if you look at excellent predictors of reverse remodeling, non-ischemic etiology of heart failure, shorter duration of heart failure of less than six months, lower LVEF less than 35, no LGE, late gadolinium enhancement on a CMRI, and falling anti-proBNP are predictors of reverse remodeling. Whereas if you have a male sex, male patient, ischemic etiology of heart failure, longer duration of heart failure, uh, lower LVEF, LGE, no LGE on, on uh, late gadolinium enhancement on a CMRI and increasing biomarkers predict adverse remodeling. And to that, three, by, three parameters are still added. Absence of left bundle branch block, GLS of more than minus 10, and early guideline directed medical therapy instituted within three months of diagnosis. Again, predict excellent reverse remodeling. Also, the Yon Jung's paper in Jack has clearly shown that GLS was an independent predictor of left ventricular reverse remodeling. Any GLS of more than minus 10 predicts that this patient will probably have reverse remodeling at a greater extent than those with a GLS of less than minus 10. That is in single digits. Then there are biomarkers available. We have nt -BNP. You have soluble ST2 as a biomarker of myocardial fibrosis, high sensitivity cardiac troponin, and collagen markers like Mimican, etc. I will, sorry.
I'm sorry, I hit the wrong. What is known about Arni and remodeling? Martens et al. in cardiovascular therapeutics had a three center study of 125 patients in whom LVF improved, volumes decreased, and diastolic function improved in a dose dependent manner with Arni. This was the first evidence of reverse remodeling with Arni. And of course, guideline directed medical therapy improves remodeling indices in HEPREP. And here, if you see, ARNI has a very, very, very strong evidence. If you look at the other uh, modalities that got reverse remodeling, one is CRT, second is LVAD, and third is possibly mitraclip. The earlier studies had shown that beta blockers outsmart ACE inhibitor in terms of remodeling. This uh, blue line, sorry, green line is carvedilol. You see the kaplan meyer curves of carvedilol change in ejection fraction and fall in the volumes is better than this blue line, which is ACE inhibitors. So historically, beta blockers are the only drugs which have shown very uh, robust evidence of remodeling in multiple studies, including the substudy of Copernicus and the substudy of CBS3. Now going ahead, NT-Pro BNP and goal achievement. Guided RCT was clearly shown. This was Melissa Dobbert's beautiful, absolutely phenomenal paper in Jack. And they clearly showed that as you achieve an NT-Pro BNP, or I mean decrease or delta change in NT-Pro BNP, the higher the delta change, higher the delta change reduction in NT-Pro BNP, uh, better the reduction in volumes and better the improvement in LVTF. And then came the proof heart failure trial. In this trial, there was improvement of ventricular remodeling during Entresto. This trial um, enrolled symptomatic adult patients with hep rep, ejection fraction less than 40 to ACE inhibitor, uh, sorry, to uh, ARNI versus an AC, uh, versus an ARB. And this showed clearly that rapid and significant reduction in NT-ProBNP with ARNI starting as early as two weeks after the institution of therapy. And from baseline to 12 months, there was a significant correlation between the delta change in NT-ProBNP and cardiac remodeling parameters, just the way I showed. And here, the most impressive was a mean increase in 9.9 points in LVEF at 12 months with 25% of patients experiencing an LVEF increase of more than 13 months, 13%. And this has led to change in guidelines. Today, the guidelines say that if you have a patient in whom um, you have diagnosed the hep rep and you are considering primary prevention of sudden cardiac death with implantation of an ICD. You should wait with all the Fantastic Four on the board, slowly uptitrated for a period of minimum three to six months, re-evaluate ejection fraction by 3D echo and cardiac MRI. And if still it is less than 35, you can possibly go ahead. But the studies have shown that as many as one third of patients come above the cutoff limit of 35% and no more qualify for ICD in primary prevention. About secondary prevention, there is no question if the patient had documented VT or VF resuscitated and has a prep, must receive an ICD. Look at the reverse remodeling. LA volume index goes down, E by E prime, which is a surrogate of pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, goes down. And this increase in LVF of 7.5% at three months is um, great and is <clears throat> also correlates with 42% increase in global longitudinal strain. And this is very strongly seen as compared to other subgroups, groups in which the patient is ACE ARB naive. What do you mean by that? A patient in whom the neurohormonal axis of RAS system was virgin, untouched, respond best to our so let us give up the concept that you should you should um, 
use ace first if there is well tolerated then shift to arni no more true at all ace naive patients respond better to arni in terms of increase in lv ef drop in volumes decrease in la volume and decrease in e by e prime which is a surrogate of pulmonary capillary wedge pressure patients with largest reduction in nt pro bnp and lv es lv end systolic volume index by 6 months also have lowest risk of death and hospitalization by 12 months so what i am saying what you see on echo what you see on mri what you see in your echo lab in terms of contractility in terms of volumes in terms of la strain reservoir strain which is my favorite you have hit or you are actually watching the surrogate end points reduction in clinical outcomes like cardiovascular hospitalizations and death which is the hardest clinical end point in any given clinical trial so pro heart failure trial clearly showed all that um all those end points in uh, remodeling and then came evaluate heart failure again 465 patients randomized to sacchi bitel versat and versus analapril and uh, similar parameters were studied and you can clearly see here that end systolic volume reduction end diastolic volume reduction la volume reduction was far more impressive with arni compared to analapril and the exploratory end point of quality of life again uh, translated in the same manner with arni compared to analapril a meta analysis to compare the effects of arni versus angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or arbs the database search for almost 10 studies <clears throat> and was published in uh, journal of american heart association 2019 by wang et al and this clearly showed uh, that rd is superior to ace or arb in reverse ventricular remodeling rd distinctly improved left ventricular size and hypertrophy compared to ace and arb with better improvement in ejection fraction and uh, reduction of volumes both end systolic and end diastolic patient appeared to benefit more in terms of crr treated with arni as early as possible and for at least 3 months if you look at the left atrial reverse remodeling now we talked about left ventricle let's talk about left atrium again arni group has better left atrial reverse remodeling as compared to as arb and a another lovely study earlier published but this is not a randomized trial this is a, a three center study by mathias and this study showed that when your left ventricular remodeling and left atrial remodeling are concordant the outcomes are better when they are discordant the outcomes are not as good so now coming out of the left ventricular shadow we have to look at the left atrium as well and though the fantastic four are here there are some other uh, uh, molecules which are trying to show the same reverse remodeling with uh, their effect and notable amongst them is verisigot there is a small sub study of uh, uh, just like victoria which has appeared which shows uh, uh, not as impressive as arni but yes some improvement in uh, remodeling parameters then we have the independent prognostic value of soluble st2 as a marker of myocardial fibrosis in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and here again arni resulted in greater reductions in soluble st2 so it reduces progressive myocardial interstitial fibrosis and the transition study remember this study started arni in hospitalized patients with heart failure both de novo and acute decompensated chronic heart failure patients and in this study in this study here arni reduces myocardial fibrosis and here this study showed much better reduction hs drop i which is a indicator of myocardial cell death and apoptosis so arni does all this and that is why we are able to see the benefits like increase in the domestic activities increase better sexual activity better quality of life score increase in peak vo2 consumption and increase in 
six minute walk distance with sacubital versatan starting as early as six weeks of therapy. So the QOL as well improves. And if you see LVEF improvements with reverse remodeling with different drugs, ARNI almost is comparable to CRT. No other drug comes to this range. Possibly the next best drug is beta blocker. Whereas improvement in EF with SGLT2 is very, very marginal. Very, very marginal. Their benefits are on a different track altogether. Uh, this is not the topic of that. This is not the time of that discussion. And left ventricular size reductions again are very impressive with ARNI, just like CRT. So I would say using ARNI is like pharmacological CRT, pharmacological cardiac resynchronization therapy. And I will show you our data in a while. So sacubital versatan not only reduces myocardial stretch, it reduces inflammation, myocardial injury, neurohormonal activation, including reduced aldosterone and reduced markers of fibrosis. We did a single center study in 152 consecutive patients with HEPREP 98 on ARNI and 54 on AC inhibitors. This was in the time where ARNI was patented. So those who could not afford ARNI form uh, went on ACE inhibitors. And here, we all measured, of course, the medical therapy. We all measured uh, the LVEF at baseline. And after 180 days of ACE inhibitor therapy, 2% increase approximately with ACE inhibitors, 5.5% increase with ARNI at six months. You have 14% reduction in indiastolic volume with ACE inhibitors and 18% with ARNI. We had uh, a five-point decrease in E by E prime and a nine-point decrease in E by E prime, respectively with ACE inhibitors and ARNI. So ARNI causes much dramatic fall in pulmonary capillary wedge pressures. And of course, GLS, barely, barely discernible increase with ACE, significant increase by at least 30% or 40% with ARNI. And of course, Anti-proBNP we could not do in all because of cost constraint. We could do only 82% of patients, 19% decrease with ACE and 32% decrease with ARNI. So that is the promise of this molecule in left ventricular reverse remodeling. I strongly believe that every single patient of HEPREP who is otherwise stable also on ARNI should uh, uh, stable also on ACE inhibitor should be substituted or should be shifted to ARNI because there's nothing like stability in chronic HEPREP patients. If you remember the paradigm heart failure trial, and we all remember that trial very vividly, 17% of patients in the placebo arm had heart failure primary composite endpoint event in one year. Out of those 17%, 17 events, half were deaths. And out of those half, out of those deaths, half were sudden deaths. Keeping this in mind, every single patient who is otherwise stable on ACE inhibitor should be shifted to ARNI. So thank you for your uh, patient listening and uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. I hope I finished in time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ponte. It was fantastic. Uh, you gave an outline of uh, how the ventricle improves or rather the cardiac structure and function improves following various groups of drugs used in the treatment of heart failure and reduced ejection fraction and uh, how ARNI scores or the other drugs. We'll have the discussion at the end of the both the talk, uh, talks. And uh, uh, now, Dr. Sahu, your turn to uh, talk on uh, your talk on how to reduce heart failure hospitalizations. Thank you, Jabir. And uh, after the enlightening talk of Dr. Pandey, I'll just try to highlight on uh, the fact that we all know that hospitalization is a negative event in heart failure journey. Now, each time the patient enters the hospital, we know he has started having a downhill course. So what is the data with us regarding this? And what could be the possible steps to prevent and manage this hospitalization due to heart failure? Now, if you, it has been said that the most deadly disease truly is the failure of the heart. 
and as a this this is you can call it as an epidemic the epidemic of heart failure and we all are fighting somehow against it now ejection fraction has been recognized as a continuum we have no, we know that this is the heart failure reduced ejection fraction to preserve ejection fraction and anywhere in this spectrum in between are the mid range or the recovering ejection fraction whatever you term it whether it's less than 45% more than 45% or in between 45 to this thing 60% so it is this is heart failure and can encompass any of this from reduced to preserved now basically heart failure is a progressive condition if we uh, decide between the clinical risk and the time there is a period when the patient is not is not having heart failure but the risk is very high this is the time whether we have to start picking up this patient so that we do not see that the patient gradually goes to a diagnosis in the outpatient as a heart failure so before as we know as a pre diabetic stage similarly in heart failure also there is a pre heart failure stage where the patient is at risk now after the baseline heart failure risk occurs then what happens the problem starts if the patient is not put on proper therapy there is a residual heart failure risk and the patient starts sliding down and definitely we have to think about this guideline the directed uh, medical therapy which is important now if we do not put this patients on this gdmt there comes a topsy turvy course in which the patient may go to a worsening heart failure or there may be residual heart failure disease so here lies my talk about how we can inhibit this patients from going from this uh, sliding down and going to worsening heart failure because once they go into worsening heart failure finally they'll go to advanced heart failure risk and that is where we have literally lost the battle so our main aim is to detect them early see that they don't go to this stage now we all know that if you see the patient without heart failure versus heart failure not admitted to hospital and those who are admitted to hospital the survival is much less though in especially those patients who have had admissions in hospital those who are managed on opd basis who have uh, well controlled who are the heart failure is well controlled they do not have a very topsy turvy course but these patients who are admitted to hospital have a very torrential course now i'll focus on four aspects heart failure hospitals how important it is why is heart failure hospitals a negative event why is there recurrent heart failure hospitalizations you would treat to the best but still then we see they have recurrent heart failure and finally how can you prevent or manage this heart failure hospitalization first how important it is it is very important because once the patient gets hospitalized approximately 25% of the patients will be readmitted in 30 days after discharge once they are stabilized in post discharge around 50% of the patients will get readmitted in 60 days of discharge and once they go to the chronic stage the mortality during this 30 day period can reach up to 10% these figures are really alarming and this brings us the insight that we have to somehow stop this downhill course in these patients now let us know what we mean by symptomatic and what we mean by worsening heart failure because these are two terms we'll be using for symptomatic when the class patient is nyh 2 to 4 left ventricular ejection fraction less than 45% and is on all available heart failure therapies i mean all four pillars of heart failure therapy till then the patient is in symptomatic chronic heart failure and worsening heart failure this patient may have a recent heart failure decompensation requiring hospitalization and most importantly requiring diuretic use and of course as we know the anti pro bnps or bnps should be elevated next this was something that appeared in the jama in 2013 in which it was stated that worsening heart failure occurs in almost 80% of the patients one in two patients will be hospitalized in 30 days of their worsening heart failure one in five person five patients will die within two years of worsening heart failure now this worsening heart failure event does occur if the patient decompensates and requires diuretic therapy either in hospital in the ed or in the outpatient setting so this is the basic definition of worsening heart failure and we know that the risk of worsening heart failure is very high whether it is mortality or whether it is uh, readmission and this is ultimately it happens that if you don't catch hold of the worsening heart failures they will ultimately go to advanced heart failure and finally die now it has also been seen very interestingly that those patients who were all all the four quadruple therapy also 14.3% patients will quadruple therapy at a primary event over the course of trial that is one in seven patients is dapa heart failure trial 
And if you take the full analysis of emphasis, DAPA paradigm and DAPA heart failure, it was seen that those, there was a sort that the benefits of autotherapy were there, but a residual risk did remain. Now, most importantly, these patients were at extreme high risk or very high risk. These are the advanced heart failure with reduced disease contraction were intolerant or refractory to GDMT, recurrent heart failure hospitalization, or those with reduced ejection fraction, recent hospitalization, worsening heart failure have the highest CV death and mortality. So this emphasizes the conceptualizing risk among the patients of heart failure and how these patients should be picked up so that we see that they do not die soon. Now, this burden of hospital readmission is quite high as the time passes and overall all-cause mortality versus the readmission, it is almost comparable in these patients. And so very interesting, which was seen that there is a relationship between the number of comorbid conditions and the heart failure readmissions. What you see in this brick diagram, brick bars are the heart failure readmission, and this is all cause readmission. You see, there is a constantly resident increase as the number of comorbidities increase. So, higher the comorbidities, higher are the chances of readmission. This is very important. Let us come to our uh, this thing scenario. Of course, uh, Marathra is going to speak on this. But I'll highlight the fact that we have a big challenge for heart failure. 30.2% of our heart failure patients do get a readmission in one year. 24.4% of the heart failure patients readmitted more than once in one year follow-up period. And the most interestingly, in our country, compared to the European countries, the readmission rate was similar for both the males and the females. And one out of every three patients get readmitted once over one year. So this enlightens the, us with the fact that our heart failure population is quite high, rehospitalization also equally high. The next point that I would like to highlight is why heart failure hospitalization is a negative event. I've already highlighted that the more the patient gets hospitalized, the more the chances that the patient will die. And this is what we have come across in many talks which have been shown that as the cardiac function decreases, disease does progress. And finally, with each hospitalization, there is a rapid drop in the clinical status and they may not be fully resolved following the event and gradually the mortality increases. This is very important because, so our main aim is to see where you can cut down this uh, graph so that it doesn't slide down and the mortality doesn't increase. So this is the Indian heart failure challenge which clearly shows that one year mortality was significantly higher in patients who had more than one hospital readmission. This is what it shows that the admitted patients are definitely more this thing that is uh, this thing deaths than those who are not readmitted. Sorry. Now, this challenge is also that the maximum risk is in the first three months, and percent of death is more in uh, patients within one year, patients less than 70 years, and the mortality is higher in the reduced digestion fraction compared to the preserved digestion fraction. So, as uh, Dr. Pondé had already said, that Ultimately, it is remodeling which is associated with it. And what we basically mean by remodeling is that the endastry volume, the systolic volume, and ultimately comes to the ejection fraction. So for each increase in 10 ml endastry volume, there's a 9% increase in hospitalization or death. Each increase in 10 ml of end systolic volume, there's almost a 15% increase death and hospitalization. And each decrease in 10% ejection fraction increases death by almost 45%, and CV deaths by almost 57%. So this enlightens us with the fact that definitely rehospitalization means a negative outcome and means more of death, more of financial burden on the patient. Now, even those patients who are revascularized, it is we always have the idea that patients who are revascularized with the CABG of the surgery, these patients even do have rehospitalized rates and ejection fraction is a strong predictor of this mortality after revascularization. And it was in whether the patient under the PACI or a CABG and whatever be the ejection fraction, the primary risk of primary outcome patients with reduced EF post PCR CABG at three years was higher compared to in the mid range ejection fraction versus uh, this thing that is preserved ejection fraction. So, this clearly highlights the fact that heart failure rehospitalization or heart failure hospitalization is always a negative event. Now, why is there a rehospitalization post or aggressive treatment? The most important aspect that should be highlighted is that it is suboptimal GDMT. Now, it was seen that almost 75% of the patient did not receive the GDMT at discharge. This is really alarming. Possibly, we are not focusing on a very aggressive GDMT, which could possibly bring down early hospitalization rates. And it is not 
specifically to patients of heart failure, let it be idiopathic or even those who have undergone revascularization that has been underestimation of the importance of GDMT. So it is high time that we highlight how important GDMT is so that we can reduce the events rate and also the hospital rate. Something interesting is that these patients who had more of hospitalization had an adverse renal outcome also. 27 to 40% patients hospitalized had acute kidney injury. 30% of the acute decomposed patients have creatine values more than two. And definitely the risk prediction complications are reduced baseline renal function, diabetes and prior heart failure. And these patients basically have a complicated hospital course, higher mortality and longer inpatient stays. So ultimately it is leading to more deaths and more this thing, financial burden on the patient and of course on the hospital. Now, can we prevent or manage this hospitalization uh, problems of heart failure? Yes, we can and let us see. There are certain challenges in this management. We do not follow the recommendation that has been given gradually by, as per the guidelines of the ECC, the ACC or the Heart Failure Rhythm Society guidelines and has been shown that even those patients who are post vascularized, there was a very low incident of GDMT, that is 6% at admins, admittance and 11% at discharge. Because of this progression of atherosis continues, you should remember this fact, even after revascularization, all patients should continue GDMT after revascularization. This is a focus where we all as cardiologists and as cardiac surgeons should focus on the fact that the GDMT is very important in this patient. As Dr. Ponder had said, it is not that we think of a device because ARNI does a better, SACWAL does a better role, almost equivalent role as that of uh, this thing, CRTD that is to be put. Now, it was seen that in heart failure reduced digestion fashion post revascularization, if we use GDMT, there was a 36% reduction of death at one year and 23% reduction of multiple causes of death or MI at the end of one year. So, this shows that GDMT, if you give from one month one and it is sustained of more than five years, definitely we do good to the patient. Then came the big steps, four big steps that the kid had to go. First, it was the four big pillars, so the fantastic four, the MRI, ARNI, HLT2, beta blockers. Now we have enough evidence that these four big pillars do help in inhibiting or prohibiting the patient from getting readmitted. In addition to that, we have to think about iron, we have to think about uh, the black population where hydrogen nitrate has to be used, we have to think about surgeries, we have to think about Berisogat, which uh, Dr. Pondé has highlighted. We have to think about devices where it is required and anticoagulation of the patient is an atrial fibrillation. Now let us try to compare what has been the, sorry, let's just try to compare what has happened using various drugs. ARNI, almost heart failure hospitalization alone decreases by 21%, SGLT2 almost 30%, MRS 35%, beta blockers 36%. This was the data from Rufino et al. in 2022 last year. And this clearly shows that definitely if you have a combination of these drugs, you can definitely do more better to the patient. This is a very busy slide. In fact, this tried to highlight the four foundational treatments of and the major outcomes and all shows that whatever form of drug that you use, whatever dose is tolerable, should be given to the patients and they do benefit. Now, this was seen whether you give the comprehensive therapy or you give a conventional therapy, always the cardiac death, hospital admission, or uh, all cause mortality were reduced when you use the four pillars of therapy and definitely they did well. Next, if you see the event free survival for the comprehensive therapy, it was much lesser. The event free survival was much lesser, and the, this thing that is uh, death rate was also more, whether the patient was from 55 or was more than 65, whatever the age group, if you try to put them on GDMT, definitely the patients do good. And the long term survival with comprehensive therapy, you have to see in the blue. Our line is definitely better than the conventional therapy so far as death and overall survival is concerned. Now, something that we forget in GDMT is that how to uptitrate the drugs. We stick to a particular dose because we know that uh, we do not, uh, we feel that our, it is costly for the patient. In fact, now the off patency of this fact well combination, we have definitely, we have facts that uh, we can go to uptitrate it. And we go to the, it has been shown that whatever amount of SACBAL the patient tolerates. It does well to the patient and one has to uptight it or escalate the drug. So inpatient initiation of these therapies has to be done. Since the day of admission, you know, beta blockers are important. If the patient is hyper or volume, you can use ARNI. Then with close monitoring potassium serum, you can use MRA here. 
and hld inhibitor are definitely better in acute decompensation heart failure so the all four pillars can be gradually started on the day of admission starting with two drugs then gradually switching over to one or the other but we have to have a close follow up for for kind and continue titration to target or maximally tolerated dose monitoring the blood pressure heart rate potassium serum treatment periodically now this is a present concept of heart failure treatment it is a four pillars that you have to use and depending on whether there is a low heart rate low bp you think of devices there is a high heart rate you think of evaporative inner beta blockers there is atrial fibrillation you think of digitalis arni or anticoagulation with low bp you think of uh, low dose beta blocker digoxin or anticoagulants is added for normal heart rate normal beta blocker go on up titrating it and if there is a high heart rate normal blood pressure you can this thing that is go with all these drugs finally if the heart is less than 60 you can only go to arni on beta blocker so your four foundational therapy has to be subsequently followed by the subset by what we call the patient characterization and then the treatment layering this article 2021 does not mention much about vericogat and the other devices other uh, this thing iron etc but these are all associated therapies that should be given now the recent years have brought us with a wealth of data about this four foundational therapies paradigm heart pillar and sacubitril valsartan dapa heart pillar and dapa giflogen victoria and verisagot emperor on empagliflozin and the galactic galactic heart failure on olmesatib olmesatib have we approved and since 2014 to 2022 the last 8 years have given us enough evidence that we can use these drugs as required so we have this four pillars where ras inhibitor has to be used arni has to be used as a beta blocker has to be used hl2 inhibitor has to be used and if the patient goes on deteriorating there is worsening heart failure we have very sugar which has been proved with victoria trial that it can be added especially in patients who have worsening heart failure so this is important now the armamentarium should be added and of course in the comorbid conditions now these are the contemporary heart failure outcome trials we tried to show what was the death rate how it decreased and annual this thing that is the uh, this thing uh, absolute uh, rate reduction rates has been shown to be significant the paradigm heart failure is of arni dapa empa omesamtiv or vericogat all these drugs have to be used the subset has to be chosen properly and accordingly it has to be used whenever these patients do get admitted one has to see about the comorbid conditions you have to see about associated copd treat hypertension angina seek for renal dysfunction correct diabetes mellitus keep it under control anemia cachexia obesity depression is a major cause which you have to think sleep disturbances and of course hyperlipidemia iron deficiency gout all have to see the uric acid levels and have to treat so these comorbidities may affect the use of treatments of heart failure drugs used to treat comorbidities may cause worsening of heart failure if you use too much of diuretics there may be uric acid may increase and there are other causes also to drugs used to treat heart failure over may interact and reduce patient adherence most of morbidities are associated with worse clinical status and predictors of poor prognosis of heart failure so always keep an eye on the comorbidities and try to treat them that is most important so chronic heart failure worsening heart failure even when is the best time to intervene initially you should have a gdm initiation if you see there is some residual heart failure even try to act fast when the patient starts deteriorating you have to up titrate your drugs and if you see that the patient is worsening try to do a risk reduction try to see what are the comorbid condition and see that the worsening heart failure doesn't further worsen to a chronic stage and you have to give optimize your medical therapy and finally when the patient has gone to advanced risk, risk of heart failure becomes in uh, means refractory to gdmt definitely to think of devices and other therapies to prolong and give the patient a good quality of life so in conclusion the current paradigm is to be revisited we have to start therapy in the ed and then uh, as the patient goes in the icu in the ward as before the patient is discharged you start with all the drugs so that as quickly as possible four drugs in four weeks has to be given and in fact post discharge you have to follow them up very quick uh, uh, meticulously and put them on a chronic care and most important is the timing of each intervention and secondly up titration is important which most of our physicians don't do so if you ask me the question that can heart failure hospitalization be prevented or treated definitely the answer is a big yes and the data that have shown proves that we can prevent hospitalization and we can treat it effectively if we start treatment early and we apply the treatment properly thank you very much for the patient hearing
thank you dr sahu yeah it's an incredible talk you have gone uh, you have given what uh, uh, you have discussed about what is the impact of heart failure hospitalization how to prevent the heart failure hospitalization and what should be the current strategy to reduce recurrent hospitalization so uh, both these topics uh, uh, dr ponte's topic of reverse remodeling and your topic of how to reduce heart failure hospitalization both are interconnected if you i think the if most effective method to reduce heart failure hospitalization is by changing the structural and the functional alteration which is produced by the myocardial injury or rather if we can reverse the remodeling heart failure hospitalization should come down what do you think dr ponte Ah uh, yes, of course, sir. yes, of course. That was a brilliant talk by Dr. Sahu. Absolutely brilliant, stupendous, very nice. I I loved the talk. I uh, I mean, every comment that he made was very very relevant. And I think uh, in my institute also, after uh, we started having a physician assistant to remind us about uh, what we are omitting or what uh, what mistakes of omission, not commission, uh, we started having more adherence to guideline directed medical therapy. So that is very very important. Starting the drugs pre discharge. So that the patient sticks to it. My my one question, uh, Doctor Sahu, is already yes. uh, it, yes. it, it is uh, sort of uh, uh, in my mind this worsening heart failure business. You know, <clears throat> where we talk of uh, molecules like varicocot and all. See, uh, uh, as far as my single center data, uh, one of our DNB uh, students had done a uh, dissertation on this. Almost forty to forty five percent of patients who come with uh, acute decompensated heart failure or worsening heart failure. Have a precipitating event, either usually it's intercurrent infection, either urosepsis or low respiratory infection, or so on, or anemia, yes. or some surgical, non-cardiac surgical stress. So, will they be classified as worsening heart failure? Is my always, uh, uh, Dr. Jabbid, what, what do you think, sir? Uh, now, I think it's a, a this worsening of heart failure definition is a difficult one because everybody has found that there is no, it's all a therapy related definition. It is not a biological yeah. definition. That is a major yeah. drawback in this thing because yeah. they do not know whether it is due to withdrawal of the drug, inadequate drug, inadequate yeah, treatment, yeah. failure of yeah. treatment, precipitating reason. So, a lot of uh, interplaying things are there. Lastly, I think uh, there was an article by Javed Butler. Recently in Jack, uh, Jack, uh, so he was trying to define what is worsening of heart failure. So worsening of heart failure, his definition is a deterioration of the symptoms and signs of heart failure, uh, which require an escalation in the therapy, which could be as uh, Dr. Sahu mentioned, a IV outpatient IV diuretic therapy, emergency room visit without admission or hospitalization, and the, that that means it is irrespective of the location of treatment. This is all uh, they can say. As you said, it's a very, very complex thing. Uh, and that is the limitation of this thing. And Dr. Ponte, I, want, uh, I wanted to ask you one more thing. So when you presented your uh, data, you, you, you told that ARNI is the most effective anti-remodeling agent or reverse remodeling yeah. agent. And yes, compared sir. to ACE inhibitor, it may be around 3% or 5%. The improvement was around 11% or 12% with ARNI. And the yes, proof HF data, 25% had a 13% increase in the LV ejection yes, fraction. Yes, Is yes, there sir. a difference between ischemic heart disease group and a non-ischemic heart disease group, the reverse remodeling? Yes, sir. The reverse remodeling is far much better in the non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy as compared to ischemic. Though we are not really done the separate analysis. The, the paper is already already in publication. So we have not done any separate analysis. But uh, I can tell you offhand that the, the remodeling is much better with uh, non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy as compared to ischemic. Ischemic uh, patients usually, usually have some degree of scar already. Some degree of scar already. More often than not, they are male patients. Uh, and more often than not, the, the, the story is like this. CABG in 2013, two plasties in 2015, and then heart failure in 2019. So they have even longer duration of heart failure. These are not the patients which who will show very impressive remodeling. That is what uh, I have seen. Uh, I also will, because we may require a study where we have to look at the scar burden, residual ischemia, and the improvement in the LV ejection fraction. These may be the two important factors that predicts reverse remodeling in uh, uh, the, this uh, ischemic heart disease group because once it is extensive scar, then I don't know whether ARNI yes. can help. Unlikely yes. to. Yes. And yes. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sahu, uh, yes. when we look at the, all the therapies in heart failure, you have mentioned the entire uh, gamut of therapy in heart failure. 
there are only three therapies, three or four therapies that reduce mortality. One is ARNI, second is beta blocker, the third is mineral corticoid receptor antagonist and CRT. All the rest do not reduce mortality, but they all reduce as heart failure hospitalization. So a large number of drugs are there, which is effective in reducing heart failure hospitalization. So a patient who is on four drugs, that is all the four therapies, what do you think the reason for heart failure hospitalization? The guideline direct, they are on guideline directed medical therapy. Is it inadequate therapy, inadequate dose? Because all the worldwide data shows that the therapies, though they are on the quadruple therapy, the doses may be suboptimal. They may not be, uh, uh, the penetration of all the four drugs at the maximum recommended dose is not there. So is the most effective way of preventing heart failure hospitalization is the correct treatment with all the four available drugs or rather going for the additional drugs? See, we, we have to, in these cases, as I told you, the clear concept of heart failure treatment. It is not that we just focus ourselves to these four drugs only, number one. And the second part that we have to see is, are there any comorbid conditions? As Dr. Pondé had said, infections is the most important thing. Infections, then your diabetes uncontrolled, your endothelial dysfunction, there's multiple factors which all contribute ultimately to heart failure. At the same yeah. time, we should know that atherosclerosis is a progressive disorder. So are we treating the atherosclerosis very aggressively? Just giving heart failure treatment is not enough because as you said, you just had pointed out that we have to know what is heart burden and what is the this thing ischemic burden because it is just treating the scar burden will not do. Second thing is that we have to also treat the ischemia burden with some amount of component of the heart failure may be due to ischemia also. So you have to individualize the patient, try to see which therapy will help him or her most. Maybe have a short course of hospitalization, put him on inotropes try to stabilize him if it's decompensated, and then again, try to update it the drugs if they can, uh, this thing that is tolerant. So uh, just we, not that these four pillars are sufficient, that is not, that is not the way to go. The, the, there should be the four pillars that should be on adequate doses and as early as possible. That can prevent a heart failure possible because during that vulnerable phase, you showed the vulnerable phase following a heart failure uh, event, an acute decompensated heart failure. During that period, they should be started or they should be on all the four drugs as early as possible, then rapidly escalate the doses. And uh, preferably, they should reach uh, the maximum tolerated dose in a month's time. So that is one thing that can prevent. And as you suggested, we should aggressively uh, uh, search for any reversible causes, any contributing factors like iron deficiency. Uh, all the heart failure patients should be searched for an iron deficiency and should be corrected. And when needed, electrical therapy, the CRT, uh, it gives a, an excellent uh, uh, improvement in a, the, especially the hyperresponder group. And Dr. Ponte, uh, when the reverse remodeling happens, the patient's ejection fraction improves by 7% to 10%. So a patient who had an ejection fraction of 35%, he improves us to 45%. Does that mean that we they, he is now out of the indication for an ICD. So does our medical therapy with anti-reverse uh, or with reverse remodeling capacity can reduce the need for ICD therapy? Because I think uh, these Absolutely ICD concept yeah. was there uh, 10 years before when these yeah. powerful agents were not there. Now not we have there. to reassess the need or revalue yeah, yeah. and the recommendations should change. That is why that is why the original article from the, from the group of uh, uh, workers from which was published in Egyptian, Egyptian Heart Journal and later on the same was published in Lancet as well. She has clearly shown that you must give guideline directed medical therapy for minimum three to six months with as many pillars as possible, depending on, of course, EGFR and all those limitations. And then reassess the EF. And almost one third of patients who initially qualified for ICD for primary prevention of sudden cardiac death in HEPREP will no more qualify for it. So, yeah, so I, I personally believe that, yes, that could happen. So our uh, uh, our aim is to have maximum reverse remodeling so that Absolutely. we can pay away yes, the need sir. for electrical therapy, reduces heart failure hospitalization. Yes, yes sir. Uh, Regarding the reverse, re, uh, uh, the, uh, reverse remodeling, or uh, I may say it is anti-remodeling, once the heart re, uh, reverses the remodeling and it reaches the normal size, normal in systolic volume, normal in diastolic volume, patient is asymptomatic. Will you stop the therapy with RNA? No. No. Not at all, sir. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. In fact, <laughs> unless the cause of the LV dysfunction is completely reversible, like Takatsubo's cardiomyopathy or COVID myocarditis or something like that, or 
we will not stop the therapy there are enough there are three big studies in fact i wrote an article on um, heart failure with improved ejection fraction what do you do you should not uh, stop the guideline directed medical therapy and the worst part is when they stop the therapy and go down they usually don't come back again that is another thing we all must remember so you must continue therapy i think uh, that is the most important uh, uh, take home message from this thing this yes. is only a remission yes. the suppressive therapy should be continued Absolutely. otherwise they relapse yes. otherwise yes. they would relapse and uh, this is one of the most powerful suppressive therapy in heart failure heart failure yes. is something like a malignancy it yes. can remissions and relapses and remissions and relapses Thank you, sir. Dr. Sahu, what is your uh, uh, advice regarding the yes. most effective, we, uh, effective follow, method to reduce heart failure hospitalization? We follow the four guidelines as per the evidence, and then accordingly, we individualize what else is correctable, and uh, that has to be used. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Pondi, actually. Since, uh, yes, as you do ST2 in your centers, now because yes, Verisaport is coming in a big way, and uh, yes. the worsening heart failure definition is as per the Victoria trial. That is what I had yes, mentioned. Sir. Yes. next thing is that supposing the st2 levels are high do you think he is a candidate for verisagot very early what is your take on this uh, no sir i don't know really <laughs> I, i don't know really i asked the same question to uh, dr piotr ponokowski uh, who is the polish uh, guy who came to mumbai and uh, addressed us physically he said i am not a clinician i am a clinical researcher and we didn't have the data of st2 even in the verisagot trial they don't have The data, but they are not done. Uh, but one thing is said, of course, that uh, every worsening heart failure, uh, you should think as a window of opportunity for very sick God because that work, that drug really has uh, works well without any hemodynamic compromise and can be used up to a GFR of thirty. So that is what he said. But sir, uh, I don't. Uh, 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 the uh, uh, yeah, the, the uh, uh, Victoria has another problem. If the NT probin was too high. like more than 8000 there was no benefit yes. of the drug there no benefit they burned yeah. out myocardium i don't uh, it, it the drug is not going to work as so so it's a point we may have to use this drug quite early a little early, early when, the, when the four drugs are not yes. enough to control the patient's heart failure they he is getting recurrence hospitalization or uh, hospital visit mm-hmm. for worsening and certain people are even thinking of uh, this is this worsening of heart failure they have not used the nd prob nb criteria for example a patient's nd prob nb is progressively increasing is yes. that a worsening of heart failure what's the heart failure i have yes. to consider it as a progressive uh, uh, i would think so i would think so worsening yes sir and there are some patients some patients in whom because of prohibitive rise in potassium or prohibitive fall in bp you are not able to give Arne. even more than let us say 50 bd of arni and they are stuck to that dose the moment you increase the dose potassium goes up bp falls you cannot increase the dose and, and you want to give hgt to they develop, develop genital myocardial infections so in whom you are not able to give all the fantastic four can we use verisigot up front i think that is another uh, question think, uh, in my mind that is uh, our judicious uh, what do you call a clinician's judgment, judgment as a, yes. we have been see, uh, treating heart failure for a long time so what i feel is that when other drugs cannot be used because of either hemodynamic restrictions or yes, renal restrictions this is yes. one drug that we can use dr yes. sahu what is very sigat your first choice in worsening of heart failure uh, patients who are already on these four drugs and they he has a worsening of heart failure yes i do mm-hmm. use if the patient as uh, pondes sir has already said that if there is no contraindication for vesigot it's a very safe drug Since the cost of this, the cost it is costly. Start with two point five milligram and upgrade it up to ten milligram. You can go. In fact, around eight or ten patients of mine are on Versegard, and uh, it's still early to assess whether how much they are improving what yes. they are doing. I ask the question of ST two because ST two is a marker of fibrosis. Fibrosis. So if it is a marker of fibrosis, can Versegard help? That was the question. But I'm I'm not sure exactly. I am still in a dilemma. But definitely yes. worsening heart failure. We have data that definitely Versegard should be put early. and this very sigat is a anti fibrotic drug so yes, whether exactly. actually this is the, this study used it in the later phase of heart failure had we used it in the earlier phase of heart failure whether it could have prevented the fibrosis we do not know yep. we don't have data yes, yes i think uh, if we go on discussing we can go we can discuss it <laughs> for hours so that because of the time concern i think uh, we may restrict fantastic talk by both the speakers great discussion and i am sure that uh, all the uh, uh, viewers uh, have learned something 
And this might have stimulated the thought process also, which can help in future researches. That is what is important, especially the definition of worsening of heart failure. What is the utility of uh, NT pro BNB? How we can use RNA in all the patients to reduce uh, uh, or to improve the remodeling, reverse the remodeling, and how to prevent heart failure hospitalization. The first task, heart failure hospitalization to be prevented, that should be our aim. Because yes, it is sir. like MR. Each heart failure hospitalization B gets another heart failure hospitalization. And Absolutely. Yes, sir. yes sir. Thank you so much. Great. I enjoyed a lot uh, your, dis yes, uh, your talk and discussion. Yeah, thank you, thank sir, you, for Dr. Great Jabir, sir. Dr. Jabir, sir. Thank you. And Dr. Sahu, sir. It has been always a pleasure and a privilege to be with both of you. It is such an honor and privilege. I'm so thrilled. My day is made. <laughs> thank <laughs> you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was like an academic fist. Thank you, Dr. Jabir, for excellently moderating the session. Definitely, it is helpful to all the clinicians who are attending it. And from the Dr. Reddy's, we always feel the good health can't wait. And this clinical knowledge, continuous clinical knowledge, will help clinicians to, to have the better or great uh, academic fish in the future. And thank you all for joining in. Thank you for the audience, those who are listening to us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jabir, once again. Thank you, Pundi, sir, as well. Thank you, Sahu, sir, for the excellent talk. That was, that was really nice. Thanks a lot. Thanks to HFAI for giving us an opportunity to get associated. In the morning, the, the, the hall was completely full and eventually we feel in the digital also, we could have get a good audience to listen to this uh, academics knowledge. Thank, thank, thank you. you all. Thank you, sir. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Subramanian. I'm a nephrologist and I'll be talking to you about the pathophysiology of concomitant heart and kidney failure with some therapeutic considerations. So when we say concomitant heart and kidney failure, we refer to cardiorenal syndrome. Cardiorenal syndrome, it refers to the complex bidirectional interaction between the heart and the kidneys in a disease state and it's a classic example of organ crosstalk. So originally this entity, cardiorenal syndrome, was recognized as a condition where therapy to relieve congestive symptoms of heart failure was limited by onset of renal impairment. And in 2004, we had the consensus definition of cardiorenal syndrome, according to which an acute or chronic dysfunction in either one organ could result in acute or chronic dysfunction in the other organ. So there are five types of cardiorenal syndrome, what we call as Claudio Ronco classification. Type 1 and type 2 cardiorenal syndrome, the basic abnormality, it begins with the heart and the kidneys are secondarily involved. Whereas in type 3 and type 4 cardiorenal syndrome, the basic abnormality begins with the kidney and the heart is secondarily involved. Therefore, type 3 and type 4 cardiorenal syndromes, they are called as renal cardiac syndromes. In type 5 cardiorenal syndrome, there is a common underlying systemic disorder like sepsis or diabetes mellitus that results in concomitant kidney and renal dysfunction. So in this topic, I'll be focusing on type 1 cardiorenal syndrome, wherein the primary abnormality is acute heart failure that secondarily results in acute kidney injury. So whenever we have a patient who has cardiac failure, it is possible that that patient has pre-existing renal impairment or in other words, chronic kidney disease. So it has been estimated that nearly 30 to 60% of patients with heart failure, they have pre-existing kidney disease. On the other hand, a subset of patients, about 20 to 30% of patients with heart failure, they could develop new onset kidney impairment or incident kidney impairment. So this new onset kidney impairment in the context of heart failure is what is referred to as worsening renal function. And in the course of this talk, I'll be using the term worsening renal function or the abbreviation WRF 
denote this entity. So it's been found that nearly 20 to 30 percent of patients with heart failure could develop worsening renal function. So in the clinical context, this distinction is very important, whether we are dealing with pre-existing kidney impairment or worsening kidney impairment, worsening renal function, because those patients who have pre-existing kidney impairment, they have an adverse prognosis, whereas the prognosis of worsening renal function is much nuanced. So how do we identify pre-existing kidney impairment in patients who have heart failure? So that is possible by looking at the previous records, by looking at the trend of GFR, by imaging studies, we can identify chronic kidney disease. And if the urine analysis reveals significant proteinuria or active urine sediment, then we can make a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease or pre-existing renal impairment. And how do we diagnose worsening renal function in patients who have heart failure? So the generally accepted definition is an increase in serum creatinine by 0.3 milligram per deciliter or by 25% from the baseline. So patients with heart failure, they have a form of pre-renal dysfunction. That means they have impaired renal perfusion. As a result, there is an enhanced reabsorption of urea and sodium at the renal tubules. And that is why patients with heart failure, they have a disproportionately high blood urea compared to serum creatinine level. And their urine sodium tends to be low, that is less than 25 millimole per liter. And we can do a urine sodium profiling for prognostication. That is, after a shot of diuretic, at the end of two hours, if the spot urine sodium is less than 50 to 75 millimole per liter, that means this patient has got diuretic unresponsiveness or a suboptimal response to diuretic and he's at risk of adverse outcome. Now, why do patients with heart failure develop worsening renal function? In other words, what is the pathophysiology of worsening renal function? That is the main aspect of the talk today. So patients with acute decompensated heart failure, they could have a reduced cardiac output that results in arterial underfilling that in turn stimulates the baroreceptors in the aortic arch that upregulates several neurohumeral pathways like sympathetic nervous system, renin angiotensin system and arginine vasopressin. So these are vasoconstrictive hormones. They produce systemic vasoconstriction in an attempt to maintain perfusion to vital organs like the brain and the heart. So there is not only systemic vasoconstriction, these hormones mediate renal vasoconstriction. So the renal perfusion is reduced that accounts for worsening renal function in the setting of heart failure. So not only that, these hormones, they act at the renal tubules to enhance the reabsorption of sodium and urea. And that is why patients with heart failure, they have a high blood urea compared to serum creatinine level. And now it is recognized that high blood urea is a surrogate marker of neurohumoral activation in the setting of heart failure. So there are other important contributors apart from neurohumoral activation to worsening renal function in heart failure. So a reduced cardiac output is postulated to result in worsening renal function. So there was a beautiful trial, escape trial, where they studied patients with acute decompensated heart failure using right heart catheterization. And in this trial, they noted that there was no correlation between cardiac index and worsening renal function. That means those patients who had a normal cardiac index as well as those patients who had a low cardiac index, both of them had a similar incidence of worsening renal function. Similarly, an increase in cardiac index did not translate into an improvement in renal function. So how do we explain that? Even though the cardiac output falls, it does not always result in a worsening renal function. So what is the physiology? So this is a schematic representation of the glomerulus. So whenever there is reduced cardiac output, there is reduced renal blood flow, reduced renal plasma flow. That means less amount of plasma is entering the glomerulus. But in heart failure, there is an upregulated renin angiotensin system that constricts the efferent arterial. Thereby, the intraglomerular hydrostatic pressure increases. So the amount of plasma that enters the glomerulus, the fraction of that which is filtered also increases because of the increase in intraglomerular pressure. So this is known as filtration fraction. So initially in heart failure, even though the cardiac output is low, the increase in filtration fraction 
it compensates for the low renal perfusion and it maintains the GFR. So up to a certain threshold of cardiac index, this adaptive mechanism will maintain the GFR. However, when the cardiac index, index falls below 1.5 liter per minute per meter square, this adaptive mechanism is overwhelmed and the reduction in cardiac output can result in low GFR or in other words, worsening renal function. So this is just a schematic representation of the concept of renal perfusion. Renal perfusion can be conceptualized to be the result of the gradient between the pressure in the renal vein and the renal artery. So we can say that renal perfusion pressure is equal to mean arterial pressure minus renal venous pressure. So whenever there is a fall in the systolic blood pressure or mean arterial pressure, the renal perfusion is impaired. Similarly, whenever there is an increase in renal venous pressure, what we call as renal venous hypertension, we can expect that the renal perfusion could be compromised. So both of these, that is a fall in renal arterial pressure and a rise in renal venous pressure, either of them could result in worsening renal function by impairing renal perfusion. And this has been shown in clinical studies. So in the ESCAPE trial, during the course of treatment of acute decompensated heart failure, they noted that those patients who had a fall in systolic blood pressure, they had a higher odds of worsening renal function. So that was elegantly demonstrated. Similarly, whenever the renal venous pressure increases, whenever there is renal venous hypertension, then the renal perfusion could be compromised. And the surrogate marker of renal venous hypertension in clinical practice is an increased central venous pressure. So both in long-term and short-term follow-up studies, it has been observed that a high baseline central venous pressure, it correlates with worsening renal function during the course of treatment of heart failure. So if the renal, the central venous pressure can be reduced by appropriate therapeutic measures, then we can anticipate improvement in renal function. And this has been shown consistently in the clinical studies. Patients with heart failure can have an increase in intra-abdominal pressure and intra-abdominal pressure more than 8 millimeters is known as intra-abdominal hypertension. And if the pressure goes more than 20 millimeters, it results in what is known as abdominal compartment syndrome. So whenever the intra-abdominal pressure increases, it results in renal venous hypertension. And in a follow-up study of patients with acute decompensated heart failure, the authors noted that by using diuretic therapy, when we reduce the intra-abdominal pressure, the serum creatine also fell. That means there was improvement in renal function when they could effectively lower the intra-abdominal pressure. So from these two, we understand that we have to be very cautious not to precipitously lower the mean arterial pressure while, while we treat patients with heart failure. And we must ameliorate congestion or venous hypertension by using appropriate dose of diuretics. And now there is a chloride centric theory for heart failure. So patients with heart failure, nearly one third of them could have hypochloremia, defined as a serum chloride less than 96 millimole per liter. And hypochloremia is the result of renal chloride wasting. And the loop diuretics, they aggravate or they promote renal chloride wasting. So similar to hyponatremia, hypochloremia it has got prognostic implication. That is, it implies a poor patient survival. And hypochloremia, it activates the renin angiotensin system. Hypochloremia is associated with diuretic resistance and more congestion. So in an elegant clinical trial, the authors demonstrated that supplementation of chloride using lysine chloride, it increased the serum chloride by 2.2 millimole per liter. And those patients, they had better diuresis, better weight loss, a better reduction in N-terminal pro-BNP and a better reduction in blood urea nitrogen creatinine ratio. And there is now increasing use of acetazolamide in heart failure because this agent prevents the reabsorption of sodium in the proximal tubule. Not only that, when co-administered loop diuretic, it reduces the renal chloride loss. So patients with heart failure could have pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular dilatation. When the right ventricle is profoundly dilated, it can reduce the left ventricular filling, thereby it can reduce the cardiac output, what we call as ventricular interdependence or the reverse Bernheim effect. So in a clinical study, the authors noted that offloading of the right ventricle by using diuretic therapy 
it resulted in an improvement in GFR. So whenever we use diuretics, loop diuretics in the setting of decompensated heart failure, the impact on renal function could be heterogeneous. While some patients could have an improvement in GFR because of amelioration of venous hypertension, because of amelioration of intra-abdominal hypertension and because of reversal of the reverse burning effect, some patients could have improvement in renal function. Some patients could also have worsening renal function while some others have stable GFR. So what explains this heterogeneity is the character of the frank Starling curve in a given patient. Suppose we have a heart failure patient whose frank Starling curve is in the flat part. If I give a diuretic at this point, it is going to bring down the preload because the curve is flat, it is not going to reduce the cardiac output. Whereas if I have the patient at point C and if I give diuretic and if I reduce the preload, and the patient comes to point B, that means there is a precipitous lowering of cardiac output. Thereby, this patient can have an impaired renal perfusion and worsening renal function. So to summarize, cardiorenal syndrome is a classic example of organ crosstalk. And in patients with heart failure, it's important to distinguish between pre-existing kidney impairment and worsening renal function, low cardiac output, low systolic BP, venous hypertension, neurohumoral activation, intra-abdominal hypertension, and chloride, hypochloremia, they all contribute to the pathogenesis of CRS. And hypochloremia is associated with worsening renal function and worse outcomes in cardiorenal syndrome. Thank you for patient listening. Good morning to one and all. Um, I am Dr. Rajiv Alochana. I am a consultant nephrologist at the Madras Medical Mission in Chennai. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers and the entire team for inviting me to give this difficult but yet a very important talk in nephrology and heart failure, which is ultrafiltration in heart failure, when and how. So the objectives of my talk would be basically to see what are the indications for ultrafiltration in heart failure, techniques of ultrafiltration in heart failure, a summary of the major clinical trials which we have, and what are the current guidelines telling us what to do in situations with acute heart failure and fluid overload. Now, acute decompensated heart failure and volume overload is a definite recipe for disaster. There is an increased morbidity, mortality, and increased hospital admissions. Pharmacological treatment with diuretics uh, is one of the mainstay of management of fluid overload in heart failure patients. And uh, the other therapy which has been publicized as well as used is extracorporeal ultrafiltration. And we have some evidence to suggest that it may help in uh, lessening the fluid overload and thereby increasing and improving outcomes in patients with heart failure. So let's get to that vicious cycle. Whenever there is fluid overload, there is increased central venous pressure, there's increased pressure in the renal veins, which in turn increases the interstitial and the hydrostatic pressures, which decreases the GFR. Euvolemia is actually renal protective. I think many, of, many a times uh, when we see a consult, we do get scared when we see those rises in creatinine. The patient is doing well, he's off BiPAP, he's off oxygen, he's sitting comfortably, sleeping comfortably, but the creatinine has gone up from, say, 1.9 to 1.8. I think that we need to ignore in the process if there is a good urine output. So uh, the, uh, the decreased GFR is because of the increased fluid overload, and this is what we need to remember and try to alleviate to improve renal as well as cardiovascular outcomes. Now, there is a lot of diuretic resistance in renal failure, uh, in heart failure, as well as renal failure. The reasons being that is Im impaired reabsorption of the diuretics, decreased renal blood flow, azotemia and proteinuria, reduced levels of active diuretics in the tubular lumen. And obviously, the consequences, the symptom relief is not adequate, there's a higher risk of in-hospital worsening of heart failure, increased mortality after discharge, and there's a threefold increase in re-hospitalization rates. 
So the concept of ultrafiltration and heart failure is definitely not new. It was published in the NEJM in 1974 October at the treatment of severe fluid overload by ultrafiltration. At that point of time, drip chambers were used to calibrate the amount of UF. Five patients were treated and all of them had renal failure. And they concluded that ultrafiltration may actually remove the excess sodium and the water more efficiently and rapidly as compared with IV diuretics. Now, what are the modes of ultrafiltration that as a nephrologist, we can offer our cardiology colleagues with all these sick patients with fluid overload and heart failure? I'm going to put peritoneal dialysis as my first one because I am a proponent of it as well as uh, seeing the real benefit, especially in our center. Slow continuous ultrafiltration, which is widely used, which also we use, continuous venovenous hemofiltration and hemodiafiltration, Slow, low efficiency dialysis, especially when we have a concomitant renal uh, failure or an acute kidney injury, which is oliguric. Hemodiafiltration, which uh, is kind of a hybrid therapy, which utilizes the um, uh, benefits of both hemodialysis as well as ultrafiltration and gives us a larger uh, UF uh, benefit. And intermittent hemodialysis, which is not widely used, especially in patients with hemodynamically unstable heart failure. Now, what is the difference between diuretics and ultrafiltration? Loop diuretics, because of their action and increased renin release, uh, basically lead to direct urohormonal activation and the cascading bad benefits. Uh, elimination of hypotonic urine, unpredictable sodium and water excretion, diuretic resistance is well known. It can cause electrolyte imbalances like hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia, which in turn increases the risk of arrhythmias in these already high risk group of patients. It is, uh, we do need a peripheral vascular access, but there is no anticoagulation, no circuits, it is actually less expensive. What are the benefits of an isolated ultrafiltration? There is no neurohumoral -humor activation technically. We remove isotonic plasma water. There's a precise control on how much we can remove uh, fluid. There's a restoration of diuretic responsiveness theoretically. There is ideally no effect on potassium and magnesium if it is done carefully. There is a higher sodium removal uh, for the same amount of uh, ultrafiltration, uh, but we may need a central venous access. Anticoagulation may be used. We, we will need an extracorporeal circuit. More Overall, it is more expensive and needs a good hospital setting and an ICU setting to do it. Now, this uh, cartoon basically uh, gives us the entire benefit or the proposed benefits of ultrafiltration and heart failure. Whenever there is a decreased cardiac output, there is uh, activation of the RAS, the sympathetic nervous system, there is a renal hypoperfusion. Now, whenever this happens, the kidney also takes a hit. And uh, when we use diuretics, we produce more of a hypotonic urine. At some point, we are going to face a diuretic resistance, as all of us have seen. And there is a decreased water clearance and actually a reversed increased sodium reabsorption and the volume overload increases. And in turn, this le leads to another cycle of the same activation, where at one point you are left with no benefit with the diuretic. At this point, ultrafiltration, what it does is, there's a water flux as well as we try to remove the uh, plasma water to a semi-permeable membrane. So with a predictable removal of sodium and fluids without any possible neurohormonal activation, we uh, try to reduce the fluid overload in these patients. And uh, definitely as a consequence, we may have an increase in the serum creatinine. Most of the times it may be hemodynamically driven and sometimes it may be due to ischemic renal tubular injury. Now, what is ultrafiltration? It's a convective transfer of water and solutes across a semi-permeable membrane. And this small cartoon actually tells us what exactly happens in ultrafiltration. Basically, uh, in the patient, uh, you may have a central venous axis and he is connected to a dialyzer. So through the central venous axis, uh, I will go to the next slide to have a better view of this. So uh, as you can see in the vascular axis, this the blood is drawn through the vascular axis, goes through an arterial sensor. Then you have the blood pump where you regulate the blood flow, and then you have a blood volume sensor, and then it enters the dialyzer. 
and uh, when these this is made up of many many hollow fibers and where uh, because of the uh, diffusion process as well as convective process Mm, the ultrafiltrate uh, is made and after we adjust the tra transmembrane pressure, then it goes back to the venous pressure sensor and then uh, is, uh, the blood is returned back to the patient with some amount of ultrafiltrate gone. So this is a summary of all the trials uh, or the major trials we've had uh, regarding ultrafiltration versus diuretics in patients with fluid overload and heart failure. In 2005 or as early as 2005, there was a uh, trial called as rapid CHF where they tried diuretics versus ultrafiltration, a small number of patients of 40. The median furosemide dose used was 160 milligram per day versus UF of eight hours. There was no difference in weight. Then in 2007 came unload. Uh, diuretics versus ultrafiltration, more number of patients, 200 patients. The di diuretic usage was slightly more, a good ultrafiltration over eight hours. So in the UF group, there was a greater weight loss at 48 hours, less rehospitalization rates at 90 days. Then came cure at 2010, where standard diuretic therapy versus UF was measured in 56 patients. UF of at least two more than two liters was aimed at, but there was a better clinical stabilization and less rehospitalization at in the UF group. The CARES HF widely publicized and widely criticized, uh, stepped up the diuretic versus UF in 188 patients. Diuretics were uh, titrated to achieve at least three to five liters of urine output, and but the UF rate was kept constant in all the patients at 200 ml per hour. It was stopped early as a result of the lack of benefit and excess arm and harm and serious adverse events in this group. Then in 2016, trying to uh, mitigate all the problems with the previous trials, the AVOID HF investigators had a step diuretic approach versus an adjustable ultrafiltration. And diuretics were used for three to five liters of uh, urine output and a tailored UF. Again, it was stopped, unfortunately, due to interruption of sponsorship by Baxter. So just the dissecting these trials further, the concept of unload was ultrafiltration before diuretic administration. It was an RCT where weight loss and dyspnea scores at 48 hours were seen. Secondary endpoints of serum creatinine and heart failure rates at 90 days were observed. UF group apparently had more benefit. It had more weight loss, better dyspnea scores. These patients had less unscheduled visits, less heart failure hospitalizations and less rehospitalizations. But there were lack of treatment targets, no cost analysis was done, no blood volume measurements were done, and no independent clinical committee to assess what was actually the admission. Was it really for heart failure? So there may have been a bias in the study. Then came CARES HF, where they kept a constant ultrafiltration of 200 ml per hour versus a stepped pharmacological therapy. The primary endpoint was the bivalent increase in the serum creatinine and body weight at 96 hours. The UF group and the diuretic group had a similar weight loss and increased serum creatinine in the UF group and increased serious adverse events, but it was fraught with limitations. 39% in the UF group received only diuretics and some of it was analyzed even before the 96 hours of UF therapy was done. And 90% of the subjects not, were not actually decongested properly. And the MD had basically decided when to stop the therapy. And there was increased free, uh, filter clotting in almost 36% of the patients, probably due to the excessively kept low blood flow. Then came the avoid HF. They tried to mitigate all these problems, which were already there in the other studies. They did a multi-center, one is to one RCT. Uh, the earlier thing was eight, 10 patients, but unfortunately stopped early at around 256 patients itself. Adjustable UF was used in these patients. So it was basically individually tailored, which made sense. But there was a lot, and there was a longer time to the first heart failure admission, though not statistically significant. Independent clinical committee was there to assess the clinical events. There was no difference in the serum creatinine in the diuretic versus uh, ultrafiltration group. But even in that small number, even though this, you had to stop early because of other reasons, the ultrafiltration group had more serious ad adverse events of 14.6% versus the 5.4% in the diuretic group because of infection in the CVCs, hypotension, hemoglobin drop, and acute coronary syndrome requiring intervention. 
So how do we actually select patients for ultrafiltration? These are all gray zones which need to need better RCTs and better studies, especially in an Indian set setting and scenario to assess diuretic resistant patients, oliguric AKI. I think it is fairly kind of uh, uh, clear that we need to do ultrafiltration in one of the modalities that we have. Some of the studies have used urine sodium concentration less than 100 milliequivalents after administering adequate diuretic, diuretics, which again, we are not very sure of. So I think this is largely individual and clinician based and in diuretic resistant oliguric AKI, it's fairly clear we need to do ultrafiltration therapy. Fluid removal targets and monitoring of UF, UF rates of 200 ml per hour will, can be harmful. In RV dyslexia with preserved ejection fraction, they may be pro, more prone to volume depletion. So basically the funda is lower ultrafiltration over prolonged periods, slow UF may be useful. And it may be useful to use a focused ultrasound to see the IVC diameter, lung ultrasound, to see how much fluid we are actually removing and whether the patient is benefit benefiting or not. Unfortunately, all the RCTs and all the studies we have till date used clinical-based parameters to do these um, settings. So we don't have actually objective-based fluid removal in any of these RCTs. So this is a very uh, complicated or rather uh, uh, where avoid HF investigators used to, um, uh, you know, uh, to uh, ultrafiltrate where, where they use the, uh, this um, blood pressure in order to titrate the UF therapy. How do you actually measure the blood volume and fluid excess management? Online hematocrit sensors may be useful, but have, they have so many variables. Bioimpedance analysis again can be useful, but not all centers have the facility to do it. Albumin labeled with iodine 131 is too expensive and cumbersome to do to measure blood volume. Role of biomarkers, yes, we have a lot of studies, but none of it is actually very conclusive on how much can we use these biomarkers. Natriuretic peptides can't be used to guide therapy. Serum creatinine, as we all know, is not such a great marker. And NGAL may be useful in some of the settings. So is there anything better than just ultrafiltration? So let me just illustrate that with two patients, 80-year-old lady, very low EF, failed CRS therapy. She was on a pacemaker. Creatinine was 1.8. Uh, so we were called in to see her. She's very, very frail. And uh, the family was fairly intelligent, knowledgeable. And we explained to them about peritoneal dialysis. When they agreed, we inserted a bedside CAPD catheter under local anesthesia. And we started her on short supine APD exchanges with UF for around 1.2 liters per day. Patient's attender got trained and uh, presently she is on one exchange of icodextrin at night every day. On the other hand, there was a younger guy with congenital heart disease, tough with infective endocarditis, very sick, BP of around 70 over 50, planned for surgery. He went into sudden onset aneuric renal failure two days before the surgery. Creatinine rose to 5 milligram per deciliter and with a urea of 200, he was extremely fluid overloaded and breathless. Because of his low blood pressure and he had a lack of resources, he was actually quite financially, uh, he had a lot of financial issues. So we decided to do a bedside PC, CAPD catheter insertion under local anesthesia. Immediate exchanges were started with APD. We used around 8 liters of fluid, supine low volume exchanges, UF of 1.5 liters per day. He was taken up for surgery under the cover of peritoneal dialysis on day 4 of PD, which was again continued postoperatively. The wife was trained and they were doing three exchanges a day. And he was discharged on day 10, very comfortable with a urine output of 300 to 400 ml per day. Now, my elderly lady, two years later, she's still on one exchange at night of icodextrin. She has got a good urine output. She has had no hospitalization since then. Latest DF is 50% with a creatinine of 2.6 milligram per deciliter. She is mobile, eating well with a good quality of life. Patient NT, on the other hand, uh, had a two-week post-discharge, good urine output. He had a recovered AKI. One month later, his creatinine was 1.2. We removed the PD catheter. One year later, he's still well, no edema, with a creatinine of 1.1 milligram per deciliter. So peritoneal dialysis for ultrafiltration in heart failure is even older. In 1949, Shinison reported the successful use of PD in the treatment of intractable edema of cardiac origin. 
Data from extracorporeal method of UF, on the other hand, as we've already seen, has quite a mixed results. So what is the advantage? It has a gentle ultrafiltration, doing it every day, removing 1 to 1.2 liters of U, uh, UF every day definitely has its benefits. It has lesser impact of neurohumeral when compared to extracorporeal UF. There's no myocardial stunning which occurs in extracorporeal UF as seen in many, many studies. Effective continuous salute removal and they actually allows us to uptitrate the heart failure meds, including RAS inhibitors and other, uh, other uh, medications. There is no need for a vascular access. There is no need for the anticoagulation. There's a better quality of life and definite independence, especially when the patient and the relatives are motivated and it is less expensive. Um, and this is like, for example, uh, PD prescription and heart failure. What we exactly do is that the water and the solutes are removed over the peritoneal membrane by a dwelling dialysate solution in the peritoneal cavity. Osmosis driven peritoneal ultrafiltration can be achieved. Convective solute removal also can be done and colloid osmosis, especially in icodextrin scenarios. What are the disadvantages? We need nephrologists and nurses who are trained and experts at peritoneal dialysis. We need motivated patient and caregiver, especially when in chronic heart failure settings. Early leaks, especially with concomitant ascites and abdominal wall edema can be there. Regular fine tuning of dialysis prescription, especially in the early stages. Mechanical co uh, complications like outflow obstruction can occur. PD related infections can be the Achilles heel, but again, easily treatable. And we need better head to head RCTs. So what are the current guidelines that we have? The ACC says that ultrafiltration may be considered for patients with obvious volume overload to alleviate congestive symptoms. It may be considered in patients with refractory congestion not responding to therapy. Veno-venous ultrafiltration, Canadian Cardiovascular Society says, particularly in diuretic resistant patients, and veno-venous isolated UF and sometimes used to remove fluid, it says the European Society of Cardiology. So what are the take-home points? Individualized decision making is the key. Current data, there is a potential risk of UF in patients without refractory heart volume overload, diuretic resistance, and renal failure. And the American ca ca cardiology does not recommend UF as the first line therapy in patients with good urine output and diuretic responsiveness. Peritoneal dialysis, in my opinion, is underutilized and may have a greater benefit in management of fluid overload in the longer run in these patients, but we need a good head-to-head -head RCTs comparing this. Low UF rates extended over longer periods of time may be safer methods of doing ultrafiltration in heart failure patients. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Preeti Meena, working as an assistant professor in the Department of Nephrology at Ames of Neshwar. Today, I'll be talking about effects of heart failure drugs on renal functions. As we can say that the patients of chronic kidney disease are prone to develop chronic vascular diseases and it is also true that patients of heart failure can have up to 10% of these patients can have severe reduction of GFR. In my talk, I am going to be talking about four important drugs which have been proven beneficial according to the recent evidences. These are beta blockers, RAS blockade drugs, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists and SGLT2 inhibitors. These drugs are also known as four pillars, major four pillars in the management of heart failure. So let's first talk about RAS blockade. There is now plenty of evidence that shows that RAS inhibitors significantly improves outcomes in heart failure, especially in the patient of heart failure with reserve ejection fraction. This is irrespective of the occurrence of worsening of renal functions. Mounting evidences now suggest that AC inhibitor and ARB should be standard of care as a strategy to preserve renal functions. 
how the how these drugs works basically the ac inhibitors and arb dilates the postglomerular efferent rather than afferent arterioles thus decreases glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure and initially with the initiation of these drugs there can be a slight rise in the creatinine of up to 20% which is usually seen but this initial reduction in gfr does not persist for a longer time rather on a longer term they help to preserve renal functions the mechanism of these drugs basically glomerular hemodynamic and non hemodynamic but the primary essential important mechanism here is glomerular hemodynamic effects we now know that angiotensin 2 this angiotensin 2 has lot of role to play in increasing proteinuria pro inflammatory markers pro fibrotic markers aldosterone level so we need to block effects of angiotensin 2 in order to prevent glomerular and tubular fibrosis this evidence has shown that with the help of ac inhibitor and arb there is reduction in porocyte nephrine and porosin levels which is induced by angiotensin 2 and also with the arb treatment it has been seen that there was emulation of high glucose induced hypertrophy of cultured porocyte and arb treatment helped in attenuation of angiotensin 2 induced cell proliferation so at the molecular level also we know that ras blockade helped in preventing decline in renal functions so these drugs help basically help in reduction of proteinuria there is slow decline of renal function with the use of ras blockade drugs and there is decrease in the renal fibrosis further more in the patient even in the patient of end stage kidney diseases they help to prevent residual renal function and obviously they help to treat hypertension we do not have to add more antihypertensive drug which do not have that much of morbidity and mortality benefits even if we talk about peritoneal dialysis ac inhibitors and arbs help to reduce decline in ultra filtration and uh, residual renal effect and basically also some studies have also shown that they effectively protect against peritoneal fibrosis in long term peritoneal dialysis arnis are basically new kids in this arena this has been seen that neplycin inhibitors as compared to enalapril showed that they, there is a lesser decline in the renal function and and this effect was also more prominent in the patient of diabetic rather than non diabetic this is again a forest chart showing with the meta analysis of different studies it showed that arnis help in prevention of cv deaths hospitalization all cause mortality and initial trials also showed that prevention of egfr is egfr decline was also present with the use of arnis this is again a trial which showed you know protective effect of sacrobital and valsartan in heart failure patient the, but these trials were also challenged with the recent trial which was uk heart trial the trial did, did not show much of prevention of decline in renal function thus we before saying that they help in preservation of renal function we need more rcts more long term data so that we can use these in a patient of chronic kidney disease but definitely they are helpful in the patient of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction so let's talk about different kind of drug which is uh, beta blockers not have much of data on beta blockers and how they help in preserving decline in renal function but we know that they help by in, by in the patient of kidney failure there is increased sympathetic activity which is basically genesis of hypertension and contribute to cardiac complication in ckd so by this hypothesis we use beta blocker in our patients we can see the result of our trial which showed that there was no actual difference significant difference in the main clinical outcome but when we see the difference in metoprolol and amlodipine they have shown a lower risk of esrd or death then uh, the new class of drug is aldosterone antagonist as we had already discussed about angiotensin 2 aldosterone here also plays an important role in fibrosis of kidney vascular and heart they help in increase beta tgf beta reactive oxygen species and other collagen gene expression so basically further leads to fibrosis 
So various studies on mice models, animal models and human clinical studies have also shown that mineralocortical receptor antagonists help in decreasing renal inflammation. For example, this trial, this trial with, in which spinal lepton was used along with a combination of ACE inhibitor is further reduces the proteinuria when given added on ACI inhibitors. Thus, we, we also now have plenty of data which suggests that even the long term effects of spinocrinidone on renal function, but there was, in, when we use these in the patient of decreased renal function, a decreased level of GFR, there are chances of increasing in the potassium or hyperkalemia level. So we are kind of spectacle before we give these drugs if, if the GFR is less. This is now, this was a uh, post hoc analysis of uh, emphasis HF trial which showed that the drug help in all the kind of high risk patient, for example, in the, if the patient were more than 75 year old, history of diabetes, estimated GFR of less than 60, which, which we can hear zoom and see that even in the patient of EGFR of less than 60, epilinone help in reducing primary composite outcome for HF and death from CV cause. We have already discussed this that in the emphasis HF analysis of emphasis HF trial, it was shown that that the epinone is equally beneficial and should be used in the clinical practice. But at low level of GFR, we can use it with the lower doses. The new class of drug, which is phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is basically non-steroidal mineralocorticoid antagonist. We have now two major trial. One is Fidelio DKD and another one is Figaro DKD which showed the effect of, effect of phenylalanine on renal functions. In Fidelio DKD trial, we can see that the primary composite outcome was primary renal outcome, which was reduced by 18% of the drug. So that this drug had shown a new hope in the diabetic kidney disease patients. If we talk, so if we analyze all these primary kidney outcomes separately, even, even then the phenylalanine was effective in improving renal failure, end stage kidney disease, sustained decrease in the GFR and renal death. Now, on analysis of second, an analysis of Fidelio DKD secondary kidney as secondary kidney endpoints here also, it support the use of phenylalanine in diabetic kidney disease patients. The here, here is you can see more ma major, major trials basically landmark, these are all landmark trials which have shown that the RAR blockage was actually effective despite there was slightly worsening of renal function in the initial part but the overall mortality was reduced with the help of RAS block. Coming on to the different class of drug which is LGLT2 inhibitors. The primary mechanism of SGLT2 inhibitors is they reduce hyperfiltration, they constrict afferent, afferent arteriole and thus help in reducing hydrostatic capillary pressure. So we can, as as we see in RAS blockade here also, we can see that there was there's initial dip, which could be about five ml per minute, or it basically reached nadir in one to two weeks, then returns slowly, it returned to its pre-treatment levels, and it has also been seen that eGFR subsequently declines slow slower rate with the use of GFR trial in longer term. So there are various mechanisms involved. They could, there is, as we discussed, reduction in the intraglomerular pressure, there is neurohormonal improvement, reduction in inflammation, fibrosis, and also there is reduction of renal metabolism, hypoxia. With the clinical effect with these mechanisms can be seen as GFR preservation, blood pressure reduction, less tubular and glomerular damage, and eventually it decrease in ischemia renal damage. Thus, they are improvement in renal function on longer term. Now we have also a mounting body of evidence in the patient of heart failure at risk of heart failure. There are a lot of trials, important ones are Emparec trial, Canvas trial, Credence trial, then Impact MI, DAPA MI. These are basically trials which were done in heart failure or patient at risk of heart failure. In if we talk about the kidney patient also, we have three landmark, landmark trials. First is Credence trial, then DAPA CKD, then the most recently Ampa kidney trial. 
In the DAPA kidney, DAPA CKD trial and EMPA kidney trial, we have also seen that the drug was used even in the non-diabetic patient. Then, then also, the drugs help in improving the primary renal outcome. This is more detail about the EMPA kidney trial, which is the most recent one. It was a follow up of two years. It showed that as compared to the placebo, EMPA was shown to reduce progressive kidney disease, CV death, hospitalization due to CHF and CV death and all cause hospitalization. Another evidence which showed that the reduction that SGL use of SGL2 inhibitors was associated with a reduction in the major adverse CV events and CV death and also preservation of renal function. So now we can say that with the with the evidences, lots of evidences with the upcoming drugs, for example, ARNEs and SGLT2 inhibitors superimposed with the improved outcome in kidney function with the RAS blockade, we can say that there is hope for the, in the future that the morbidity and mortality in the CKD and heart failure will improve. Let's, I'm hoping for that only. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you all. Yeah, good afternoon all. I would like to thank organizers to give me the opportunity to present this important topic, which is Diagnosis and Risk Certification of Acute Kidney Injury in Heart Failure. Myself, Dr. Saurabh Naik, I am working in the Department of Nephrology at Ames Matinda. So often we have a perplexity regarding when to decongest, how much to decongest, whether to prevent kidney dysfunction happening or to do more decongestion. This perplexity is very important in these patients because their outcome depends on kidney dysfunction. And I would start with my subheadings like what links heart and kidney, problem statement of the topic, shared risk factors, worsening renal function and pseudo worsening of renal function, attributability of outcomes with kidney dysfunction, diagnostic pitfalls and biomarkers in ATI. So what links kidney and heart? Basically, it is hemodynamic perturbations in heart failure patients which lead to neurohormonal cascade activation which comprises of sympathetic nervous system and ineffective nitrogenic peptides. So this uh, the sympathetic nervous system do vasoconstriction and natural peptide do diuresis. They both cause kidney stress and that will lead to acute kidney injury. This complex interplay is not limited to hemodynamic as well as neurohormonal cascade activation, but also with vascular bed abnormalities, which is shared between heart and kidney, where we see that endothelial injury and atherosclerosis, which is coexisting, which impairs the health of both heart and kidney together. So this traditionally is classified as cardinal syndrome which is nothing but acute and chronic dysfunction of one organ which affects acute and chronic dysfunction of other organ. So we see the most common type is cardio syndrome type 1 which is also having poorest prognosis whereby the heart failure which causes decreased cardiac output and hemodynamic perturbation ultimately will lead to decreased perfusion and kidney injury. Sympathetic system activation also will impair kidney injury and endothelial activation because of cytokines also damages kidney microvasculature. Chronic heart disease also impairs kidney by similar uh, findings. However, hemodynamic perturbation and neurohormonal cascade improves here and ultimately kidney disease will progress. This is a very important that type 3 is more concerning about our uh, topic where acute kidney injury by any other cause could lead to decreased GFR, sodium water retention, hypertension followed by sympathetic activation and endothelial injury can cause heart. Apart from this, acute kidney injury also causes uremia, acidemia, hyperkalemia, electrochemia, and hypoglycemia, which also dampens heart. People have found out in animal studies that by inducing kidney ischemia, mitochondrial injury can happen in myocardium directly. Type 4 heart failure. Uh, type 4 cardiac syndrome is nothing but chronic kidney disease where all the milieu setting to cause cardiac dampening in slow manner. The problem statement is whether you have having reduced ejection fraction heart failure or mid-rate ejection fraction heart failure or preserved ejection heart failure, the most common comorbidity is chronic kidney disease, which is seen in almost more than 50% of the patients. It is not only a bystander, but also affects all-cause mortality and early hospitalization rate in heart failure patients. The problem statement goes like this, that acute kidney injury is found in around a third of patients. However, 1-2% to patients received uh, kidney replacement therapy and Chronic kidney disease as a comorbidity coexisted in almost around 50% of patients. The incidence of acute kidney injury in heart failure patients goes to 3.3% per 100 heart failure patients. And with every decline of 1 ml per minute in GFR, there, there will be rise in heart failure patients mortality by 1%.
Often there is an underappreciation of kidney dysfunction in heart failure patients. Most of the therapeutically potential therapy trials have excluded kidney failure patients. And there are fear of kidney dysfunction among treating uh, cardiologists and physicians. That is called as renalism. And almost all uh, heart failure drugs are nephrotoxic. That will pose a challenge in treating these patients. Underappreciation of baseline kidney dysfunction. Kidney function is also important because clinically we may not assess what is the baseline kidney function. There is a good test available that is echo to detect how much heart is functioning, but there is no such test existing which can tell you what is the kidney health. So we have to see patient as a whole and heart and kidney may share the common risk factors. So if heart is working as a 20%, kidney may not be working as a 100%. How, why I say so? Because there are disease related risk factors and there is coexistence of kidney disease. Hemodynamic effect during organ dysfunction also affects another, other, other organ health and therapeutic uh, misadventures are very common. Often which led to misinterpretation of appropriate kidney response and kidney injury. This misinterpretation will may lead to premature termination of good drugs or over enthusiastic decongestion. So who are at risk of developing kidney dysfunction? Lean BMI, elderly women, already hypertensive, diabetic, chronic kidney disease patients who have been given more diuretics and anemic patients. Basically, it will cause nephron underdosing, which will put, put them on risk of developing kidney injury when they present with heart failure. So whether it's the baseline kidney function, whether it's a trajectory of kidney function, it all matters in heart failure risk stratification. Important thing is to be known that loss of function is not equal to kidney injury and both process risks to kidney uh, to heart failure patients. Severity of kidney dysfunction, whether they are requiring renal replacement therapy or not, also matters. And dynamic kidney response has to be observed. That is important. So we have to go back to a study where they have found out that baseline reduced kidney GFR or chronic kidney disease progression affects all cause mortality. Normal baseline eGFR is not protective. That is a very important finding of the study that they found out that when patients had more than 90 ml per minute GFR and when they had acute kidney injury, their outcomes were poor. As the, there is a rise in decline in GFR, the mortality odds will also increase. So it's very important to monitor kidney function over a period of time. We have to differentiate between loss of kidney function and kidney injury. And we know that decongestive therapies and all neurohormonal blockers, they do cause decrease in urine output and rise in serum creatinine, but that does not mean that kidney is injured because and this study had shown that rise in creatinine or lower in GFR is not equivalent with the tubular injury marker rising. So the tubular injury markers were normal despite there is a low fall in GFR or rise in creatinine. These two old studies were very important because they have shown that there is a mortality improvement with aggressive decongestion despite a little bump in creatinine. So we should not worry about a small rise in creatinine and keep on giving them decongestion because it saves life. Escape therapy is a uh, escape study was a study which is very important and that's why I'm bringing it here because it uh, it was actually shown that in those patients whom kidney dysfunction was improving and in those patients in whom kidney dysfunction was worsening there was no difference in mortality so they were perplexed and they found out they clubbed these two group together that worsening kidney function and stable uh, and improving kidney function group they have clubbed it together and they found out that that hemodynamic perturbation in these two groups were not different and their mortality was also not different and they found out that improved kidney dysfunction patients have been given less decongestive therapies and they have found out that greater weight loss is in worsening renal function. Probably these patients who have been uh, given more decongestive therapy uh, because their cardiac status was low. So they found they, when they clubbed this group together, they found out that their mortality was significantly poorer than those patients whom GFR remain stable throughout the period of treatment. So they compared dynamic kidney dysfunction and stable kidney dysfunction. They found out that dynamic kidney dysfunction patient had lower cardiac index, lower check infection. They were treated with more anotropes and vasodilators. They received more loop diuretics and adjunctive thyroid directives were more used. Basically, they found that patients with dynamic kidney dysfunction did bad. They did uh, worse. So the kidney impairment was here just a bystander and it was marker of those patients who were actually more sick. They were actually more cardiac decompensated and that's how they, they had a poor outcome. High loop diuretic, this was another trial where the magnitude of kidney dysfunction was not different between low dose diuretic group and high dose diuretic group. However, high dose diuretic group had more mortality when they had working in a function. 
so it is again because patients had more flu double load they require more high dose loop diuretic that's how they died so kidney dysfunction here is also identifying only a sicker population which is more at risk of poor outcome so diuretic resistance very common in heart failure as we can see 10 times low response of diuretic can be seen from as compared to healthy controls now there are several drugs which cause kidney injury diuretics among them is the most important and most worrisome drug and this study showed that when diuretics are given in kidney function kidney dysfunction patient they did actually worse and kidney and the mortality increased when loop diuretics were given to patients with worse kidney function while when they give spironolactone the mortality was prevented and the similar finding was uh, noted with beta blockade however in lesser intensity and kidney dysfunction patients when they given beta blockade and spironolactone their mortality was improved however there was no change in ras blockade so these drugs are also re can reduce filling pressure over a period of time and probably we have to use these drugs in kidney dysfunction patients however loop duct is also important so to so summarize there are shared risk factors kidney injury do have short and long term implications worse renal function only identifies sicker population normal baseline function is not protective kidney function monitoring is important a lot of therapeutic interactions should be known and misinterpretation should be avoided to use drugs appropriately to diagnose of acute kidney injury we have certain traditional markers like urine output creatinine and cystatin and there are certain biomarkers in heart failure patients similar to pregnancy because of volume distribution and low bmi creatinine interpretation is maybe wrong certain times so we should always worry we should always vouch for trend and trajectory of creatinine rather than a single value with the help of some biomarkers kidney stress or kidney damage before happening kidney injury can be known and these biomarkers are very important because they uh, they can predict acute kidney injury development in heart failure setting before traditional markers tell that there is a kidney injury and these markers are either filtration marker tubular marker or neurohormonal markers and these biomarkers in this graph i have uh, summarized but if you see uh, the, the, the traditional markers are doing better than the novel markers and creatinine urea urine albumin and diuretic efficiency is uh, they are more prognosticating than the newer novel biomarkers so what is the bottom line so there is no bottom line for the use of biomarkers still we are nowhere and if i have, if I'll have to summarize urine and gel did do better and that can predict or uh, prognose your patient of heart failure Nephrocheck is important as to be used. Statin C can be better than creatinine for routine practices. Pro encephalin and pro BNP are also better. They have performed better in heart failure patients. So, which is the best tubular function injury marker? It's again the low diuretic response what we have seen in this patient. Urine NGAL can predict acute kidney injury, and blood level can predict the adverse outcome of heart failure. Urine cutoff is 12 nanogram per ml, and these levels are unchanged with diuretic therapy. The problem with nitrotic peptide markers like anti pro BNP is they change with diuretic therapy, and hence urine and gal can able to predict acute kidney injury better than them. 48 hours is the time period when we have to do urine and gal because its predictive value is highest at this point of time. Nephrocheck is a freely available test, and it, it's a urinary test with cutoff of two. In isolation, it cannot predict the outcome. However, it can predict acute kidney injury development. But if you want to compare with the outcome, we have to combine it with acute kidney injury loss of function test. That is traditional markers like decreased urine output and elevated creatinine. So statin C in heart failure patient is better than creatinine, but it's more of a diagnostic marker than prognostic. Its uh, area under curve is highest among all other novel biomarkers. This is another important uh, finding in non cd state that is kinetic EGFR. Like traditional GFR monitors, they use single keratin value, while kinetic GFR utilizes three creatinine value. It takes baseline creatinine into account and then the su subsequent creatinine levels. And the interval between two creatinine levels is also important. And it's a simple test, you can calculate it on mobile. And it actually outperforms traditional GFR in non cd state. And it gives you more freedom for uh, drugs to be utilized because it does not drop immediately with the rise in creatinine and it, once it is dropped it remains steady in non steady state so in when the rise in creatinine is uh, when there is a rise in creatinine we often do uh, we, we often overuse or we often so medication toxicity is prevented when you use kinetic egfr in non steady state so there is 33% higher egfr which is uh, derived from the uh, kinetic egfr model and which gives you freedom to utilize drugs uh, and do more decongestion when we are worried about uh, kidney dysfunction. Antipropion can also be used for to predict 
acute kidney injury risk and it has been found out that it also uh, predicts a stage 2 stage 3 k development or dialysis requirement other potential biomarkers are less utilized like interleukin 8 and kim1 or fabp then there is a proencephalin which is also utilized it's a cardiorenal connector its cutoff is 80 and doubling of uh, proencephalin actually predicts acute kidney injury development or mortality in heart failure patients in a hierarchy score it, it topped the score among all other biomarkers and it's a good um, predictor of acute kidney injury as well as cardiac mortality thanks for the patient listening Uh, good evening. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. I am going to talk on the problem of hyperkalemia in heart failure. Why should we care? The flow of my talk is as follows. According to the available literature, the incidence of hyperkalemia is around 2 to 3 percent. It is 9 percent in acute heart failure patients, 55 percent in hospitalized patients, and 73 percent in CKD patients. According to a UK registry, in a cohort of new onset heart failure patients, the incidence of hyperkalemia was 11% over a period of four years. According to the European Society of Cardiology,